Wait, what were you saying about Achilles? Achilles, if you were, um, I, I, I get curious about like headshots and video games sort of with the same concept where if you are Achilles and you're running around, uh, Troy or wherever you, you know, have it, you have a gale time, right? Everything's great. Yes. Running around. I'm so great. I'm so great. Look at my Myrmidons. Aren't they beautiful? Mm. And you get shot with an arrow, but it hits, it comes in from the front, right? So like maybe from the top. So an arrow comes down and enters your foot from the top and then comes out of the heel on the backside. Does that count? Oh, so which part of the body did it hit first? It hit the it hit the top of the foot and then top it went the through the heel through the back. That must still count. I'm sure they're not say, that. If picky. you're shot through the you know all parts of the body that are included along the way by like a rail gun, I think you that's what people would say, right? You shot through all those things. Yeah, if it hits your Achilles. Yeah, even if it is from the back. Like, if you were... I don't know why. (laughs) If you were (laughs) speared through the ass all the way up into the skull, I think it would still count as being speared through the skull, you know? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Usually, when people say they were shot in something like that, or shot in their heart, or shot in the head, they're always referring to the part in which the projectile hits first. And so, all right, let, let, let's push this to the furthest degree, okay? Yeah, someone's aiming at you from top down, bird's eye view. They shoot it. It enters the head, goes through the body, through the leg, all the way through the leg, like completely straight, and then out the heel at the back end. But I think people would say at first he was shot in the head. I think yeah, I think then colloquially isn't it the most right. Vital yeah. organ? Like you said, shot in the heart, not shot in the chest. So uh, isn't it the most fatal the thing heart. that gets hit? That's probably true, actually. Yeah. Good. Good point. Good point. Like it'll whatever the most vital supersedes all the other parts. The, like the bit that kills you. What yeah. if you're shot from the heart up through into the brain? Which do you choose to say, or, or vice versa? <laughs> <laughs> a surgeon had forgot a gun inside you when he was sewing you up. <laughs> like wow. I want to say he, he fucked up. What if uh, what if he was shot in the penis <gasps> and then it went through the heart and then through the head? I Everyone would know, say I shot in the dick because it's the primary yeah, yeah, weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the, it's the opportunity yeah. to say shot in the dick. That's, that's yeah, yeah. You're not gonna you're not gonna miss that one. <laughs> primary I mean, organ. Okay. Coroner's certificate might be different. But you're <laughs> shot in the dick. So if you were just blown up by a nuke, what would you, you say? Shot in the head? Shot in the heart? It's like. Probably just, probably just dead. <laughs> yeah, it's just eviscerated. Just it hit my enough, everything. Which is, yeah. which is what Galadriel should be after episode six. Hey! What? <laughs> See, this is how I know you know you hate women because you didn't specify everybody should after feel that way. You just one. said her. <laughs> well, she's the only one we saw go into the death cloud. I, 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 everyone, you, I the still death cloud think you hate went, women. Covered everyone. That probably covered I don't, yeah, everyone. You're right, but, but yeah. I mean, what would she, it, she it would annihilate like, the building too. It. Yeah, it she, did annihilate yeah. the buildings. You saw it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I love how we, we all probably want to talk about that well, area of I'm the two episodes buildings. right now, but it's like, well, we'll be able to talk about that in like eight hours. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> they could have easily have made that better as well by just showing it to be a cloud, but they made sure that you knew how hot this was, how destructive it was. It's got fire. Yeah, it's like setting fire trees on it. fire. Yeah, it didn't even rain down. They did it once with the uh, with fucking Fallen Kingdom a long time ago, and everyone made fun of it. I don't know. I knew I remember. Well, that it from wasn't somewhere. that. What that's a difference because in on Isla Blue Boy or whatever it was, where all the dinosaurs lived, that was just a normal volcano. So the pyroclastic cloud that was rolling down that came from the the you know belch from the earth itself, that that that's fine. It's normal volcano, Mount Doom. You have to remember, is evil. Oh, it's an evil volcano. Oh, so it's cold. So, so, it, you know, in this in the topsy turvy world of Lord of the Rings, I'm just gonna be honest. <laughs> it very well might be really cold. I mean, we've seen well, fire in this show, so it cracks. might be cold. <laughs> I need to correct you. In the topsy turvy world of Rings of Power, do yeah. not smirch the name of Lord of the Rings <laughs> with this crap. Let, let's be the shape of the Earth changes because of a magic fucking spell. All right, let's 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 just. That's perfectly let's consistent. Roll with it. Oh my god. Right, let's roll with it. All right. It's fine. Yeah, even, even still, Rex, we can that. separate our rings of power and laundering, surely. We'd be like, Legolas, what's your elf I see? He's like, well, ever since those assholes made the earth round, I can't see nearly as far as I used to. This is a soft nerve to elf vision. <laughs> Why'd you gotta go fuck everything up? <laughs> so, uh, we got we got us a new guest on this wonderful new 
EFAB 207, Mr. Mr. Disparu over here on the furthest left, who I met, I believe, on Open Bar a couple times, been talking all kinds of media and stuff. It's time you visited the my abode, which is EFAB, held, held, held together by myself, a doggo, and a uh, witch, I was about to say witch doctor, plague doctor. I, heard. I wouldn't want to offend. Um, so, hello, mm -hmm. hi. Hi, yeah, great to be here. Um, this will be the, the fourth time that I've ended up watching each episode. <laughs> except this time it'll be in even more excruciating detail than well, you have <laughs> I even did myself. Four times. Yeah. I know. I, I watch it, then I watch it to record, then I watch it through to edit what, it. What, why oh, do you not no. just watch it to record the first time? Because it's funnier if you know what's coming. Because you, oh. like, you can put things at the start of the video that pay off later on. Oh yeah, I guess so. So, like, that's that's like, I don't do it deliberately, right? but videos tend to have like a theme joke going through them. <laughs> They're just like, uh, just how I start. You can have a lot of those sorts of, I hope they don't do thing, and then they do it, and you go, oh, what good even, god. What even is the theme of <laughs> Rings of Power? What's the theme? That's actually a good question. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's the theme of the writers. Evil always Very wins, meta. okay? Or evil yeah, always I like wins. how all the good people are evil. Like, they Galadriel genuinely do not know the that the Harfoots are evil. That's my favourite part of the show. <laughs> oh, I miss I, no Harfoots for Allegedly. episode 6. I was so looking forward to hearing about the cannibalism and stuff, but no, no more details. We'll get there. Are there two episodes left? We're going to have to eat the sunshine yellow berries again. <laughs> Thankfully, there are only two episodes there. left, yeah. Cause yeah, only two God. hours left of this insane nonsense. Yeah, the Harfoot sections yeah. were very Short. I say that as if there's no more seasons on the way. <laughs> Can you imagine well, if you like yeah. went as a group to Tesco or something and they didn't have as many mushrooms as they did last week? You're like, oh, better kill the children. <laughs> better kill, like, kill the doing? tall guy. It was his fault. <laughs> Wait, if they go for all five seasons and there's nine episodes a season at around an hour long, have we got 38 hours more Rings of Power to look forward to? Um, Is my math just? I thought it was 50 down? total, right? So. Well, to be fair, I'm basing that off of an idiot, so I, I don't actually know if that's true. <laughs> it's, uh, if it's just five seasons, it's, like, reported. it's probably, yeah, it's probably just the length of this season times five, right? I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. In total, I mean. Like, the finales might be longer. That's what I'm worried about. <sighs> oh, the like an hour and a half finale or something. Yeah, because I thought they had just chopped up the... Because if you have ten episodes in an hour, that would make sense. Eight episodes means each of them are an hour with change to make up for those two across the eight. I was hoping that we just had that. Not that we're going to get, like, a two-hour fucking last episode. Jesus. Yeah, because it's not going to add up. They're about, what, an hour and five minutes long? Unless they're including the credits and stuff, which... I Maybe. Them. That, could, that could actually save us. <laughs> Please. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, I don't, actually, I'm assuming, I don't know who he hasn't met. I think you've all met before, right? Because Shan Disprew on, you were both on Friday Night Tights, right? And Full Platoon and Dispro. Uh, I've not and... met Rags before. Oh. Well, probably not Fringy either, right? But, okay. Well, everyone's well, saying no, hi. I've, I've met Raggy. Uh, uh, on yeah, I've met Fringy on. on the play, oh, yes, Prey, I remember. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think you're probably all relatively familiar with the format here, but we're going to go scene by scene, detail by detail, and... Uh, Complain. Uh, talk about uh, everything. There's, there's one or two things to praise, right, guys? Like some. There is one or two uh, things to praise. Yeah, there I'm is. Sure. I'm sure of it. There's one or two there's things a, to praise. There's a nice sword. That's I all. Think, I you know, I've got to say, <laughs> well, like, <all> right. <laughs> at the end of episode five, when they have these big shots of uh, Numenor as they're all set in sail, I was just struck by like, my God, this show is expensive, and yet I just. <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh. care what's going. I don't care what's happening. It has. So, we have yeah, a horse on a crane. It has some nice shots. The so crane what? horse. You're right. There was a horse on the crane. crane horse. The crane there, horse. There's a crane horse. <laughs> I thought it was one. flying at first, and then I noticed See, it was this... it was secured by literally nothing but rope. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, like, oh, ow, uh, but I mean, crane horse. I was like, oh, episode six. That's the one where I'll, uh, it'll be tough to, to stop talking. We can get through five. And I was like reminding myself, like, oh, five. The Fucking ships getting blown up. Oh, yeah, that was wine. <laughs> Nearly half their fleet gets blown up. <laughs> that was anyway. Yeah, I said and that, that those barrels fire. were full. I said those barrels were full of oil, and people kept correcting me. No, actually, it's wine. I'm like that makes it worse, not better. Yeah. Wait, they're all what? <laughs> That's what? not wine. That's not wine. It's you saw wine. thick that. It was That's no. A you thick saw wine. thick wine. <laughs> also, a... why the fuck are they just stacking their warships up with wine? Chardonnay. Okay. I still don't know why you'd need that much oil either, though. 
We're going to introduce Pinot Grigio to Middle Earth. Mm. Yeah, that shit does not look like coffee. wine to me. But that wasn't wine. That's like lamp oil. You have to or drink something. something on the way over there. Yeah, oil. <laughs> Enjoy. The ocean's <laughs> water. Just drink that. There you go. Yeah, I hear it's drinking seawater. <laughs> drink the seawater. It's good for you. Yeah, it's well, good. No, Water's good for you. You said you can't see water. You can't. That won't make you better. Another yeah, you can't out. satisfy your <laughs> thirst with seawater oh, or something. Like, Goga said that they do say that it's wine in the show. Do they actually say it's wine? <laughs> Wine Seriously? doesn't explode. What the fuck do they put? No, in no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I, when it's on fire, you know, crazy. That, I that doesn't look like I guess, wine. It's, it's they, fantasy uh, wine. I'm, right? sure, I'm pretty sure they call them casks, uh, yeah, and yeah, usually yeah, it's a do. cask of wine. I'm um, not uh, like well, a, a cask, cask of oil. Is, you'd have a cask of oil, I suppose, because it had because it even had the little the little spouts, the little spigots. Right. Can we, are we you allowed could to say do that with, anymore? with oil, right? You could, you could. Or is that well, really? Could, yeah, oil. there's there's nothing that would stop you from using a a, a little spigot cask to well have either way. We can all agree it's retarded. Because yes, it's not friggin' TNT. <laughs> Michael Bay's wide uh, dice. What? <laughs> what he swims the back to shore. Greatest sin in the what? What? When he, when he swims back to shore, the guy actually says a cask went up as well. It's like they just thought one <laughs> it's up very just common, randomly okay. exploded you. explosive well, cask. Well, I, I, can, I can believe that their ships randomly explode all the time, considering <laughs> that they leave unattended lit lamps. We gotta stop. Right next we, to their... We're labeling all the issues with something we're not even here getting to. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Father said that there's there wasn't to talk about in five, but he lied. What are those, <laughs> what are those, it's really yeah. dumb. <laughs> call this a chronological breakdown. Gosh. There's a fight scene in that episode, and it killed me. We're gonna be. We, well, I'll get us started. All right. So we 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 join back with good old Nori and uh, fucking what's it? Not Gandalf, Oldman. He's uh, an immediately we'll call him meteor man because he begs Spaceman. to differ. This, this, oh, nice. There's there's all kinds of uh, things you could take issue, I, I imagine, on everything, but I was surprised myself. I was like, let's see how long I can go. And, like, the second this starts, the idea is she's, like, teaching him English, or the equivalent of whatever they call oh, it in this world. I and already that. I was like, no, none of this makes no, sense, no! That's <laughs> how you teach people English. It, there's First off, we have subtitles, so, you know, he could just look at those if he's confused. Yeah. But Idiot. that's why you, you teach you just talk to them, and then they pick out the useful words that you then have to explain with more English. He's from space. Oh, guess, what does he understand? They speak English in yeah. space. Have you not seen Star Trek? Yeah, it's worse than that. He do, it's not just that he doesn't know English. He doesn't know the concepts of the words to begin with. But the moment she says the word, all of the concepts relating to that word spring into his brain. So he doesn't know what death is. When he killed those fireflies, he didn't know he'd killed them until no. she like says the word death. Then he understands what death is, and then Applies he's like, it to oh, them, peril, yeah. I killed those fireflies, That's they can't be people learn. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's like the moment they someone tells him a word, sexually. he doesn't understand it, and then five seconds later, immediately does. It's he does really have that line, doesn't he, when he says, he says, why am I good? And the audience is thinking, yeah, why are you good? <laughs> Yeah, why are you good? <laughs> why, why are we here? So? And Nori's like obsessed, he's like, you are a good person. It's like, what, what do you, you have no clue what you're dealing with. He fell from space, bro. Like, what, why are you assuming everything? Like, you could argue it's like a hopeful thing or whatever, but at the same time, why don't you ask him who he is, where he's from? Lots of normal questions. Do you have a name? And then she point, like, she, he does the me me jane you tarzan thing yeah where you point and then say the thing but no we don't get a lot of that instead she's and like you know what a book is and he's like figure. book and then she's like lots of pages written word tell stories or information then he goes oh yeah totally get it now yep i know what all of those other things are <laughs> and i now know what book is like that's not a yeah. mm. She uses words that he probably should have no context to understand with to explain words that he should have no context to understand with. Like, all right, speaks great. Clean. Yeah. yeah, like the more complex concept is much harder for him than a simple word to understand, and yet it's the reverse here for some reason. Like, oh, I was frustrated to watch because I was just like, they're not going to put any effort in this. He's just going to be able to talk completely fluently in a couple of episodes later. All right, that's that's that'll be it. Yeah, but the stupid people who watch this and think it's good. They will see that and they'll go, oh, he couldn't talk at first. Went on a journey. And now he could talk a little bit. Wow, that's so clever. Because it makes sense he wouldn't be able to talk all at once. He had to learn how to talk and she's <laughs> teaching him. Oh my God, it makes I've seen so them. much sense. 
the defenses of it being like, no, he knows a lot of English, just not all of it. It's like, he doesn't know death and kill. He doesn't he... know his own name. Yeah, it's like, what, 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 is it, what is this? Like, contextless English that he has. Like, oh, whatever, it's just too difficult to make any it's level It's a problem they made for themselves. There was no reason that yeah. he wouldn't be able to talk when he just came down. They could have skipped all of this and all of the problems that came with it. Makes what? him more mysterious. Makes people wonder if he's evil. Yeah. We should do a lot of that this episode too. <laughs> Love baiting. I think, I think that's a lot of what they're doing. It is just so, oh, who's Sauron? And that's the mystery they want to keep going at any cost, even if it's just destroys characters. Or This is exactly what they did in Wheel of Time. Oh, who's the dragon? So they ruin those characters and they're doing the same here. And so, fortunately, oh, you know what? Before we highlight the song, Rags, you you pointed out when we were watching this, so fucking true. The way she is moving her little, I don't even know what to call it, like the carriage of, of whatever. The the way they've got this uh, set arranged to pull. Look at where her really... look at how her arms are and how she's walking. It's like God, that's so not efficient compared to like the person in the best position at this point is probably Gandalf doing the. Pushing yeah, it from the back. It, yeah. But she should probably have a bar, right, that goes across and then yeah, she can push she's it. Grabbing it. She's grabbing it in a way where her hands don't have anything to catch, so to speak. So she just, through sheer grip, she yeah. has to pull this cart instead of there being like a crossbar to push or pull um, or or something to stop her hand or something like that. I don't know. She's She just has a, a grip like it's a, iron. The custom made and they made it horribly inefficient. It's like, ugh. It's custom made, as in you'll cuss when you try to move it. Wouldn't it. the most efficient for him to be at the front of the truck and then lift and pull? With oh yeah, he, he probably should he's be. He's having in their to position. push if, down and can't so really push forwards. Doing, if all they're doing is lifting, that's not too bad, especially because it's on the wheels. So I suppose it gives them something to do, and he doesn't have to lift while he pushes. I'm trying to rationalize this <laughs> so it makes some level of sense. Well, so the. This was something that I had no, I had no expectation of this, and I, I don't think you did either, Rags. Uh, but the, the sheer journey these fuckers are on, I had no idea. I thought it was going to take like maybe two days, maybe. Oh, it's two weeks. Yeah, the director said it was two weeks. When it zooms out on the, on the map, I was like, "Fuck me!" Miles. They just went around a whole mountain, and that's like a fifth of a third of their journey. Like, what the hell? <laughs> The, why? Can't, I mean, why? no one notices these little friggin' guys walking across the the, the yeah, landscape. Filled, they have strong filled with hats. perils that apparently they avoided all of it, except this time where they just walked themselves into a swamp. Why? Yeah, when they could have just got, <laughs> stayed on the solid ground that you see in the context of the show. I don't like when it zooms out and there's like this destroyed caravan next to him. You're like, oh, that's that last group of people they killed when they came along here. <laughs> <laughs> Just left the them behind again. <laughs> They'll head back there to check for bodies, for, for food, if you will. It's, oh, shit. That's how all the people got in the marsh. Those are just hobbits. <laughs> the, or, or Harfoots who fell in the swamp. Hey, is they only swamp seen, water they only... always right? Or is it yes. different? Oh. Yeah, and the reason that they look very big in the water is because, as we all know, whenever you put a um, hobbit or a harfoot in the water and you leave it, they start to expand as they soak up the water. So it looks like a normal sized person after you leave them in there for a while. <laughs> yeah, they're just. This, is, this explains everything. They're panning across this whole map. And, I was, the fuck? and then there's this shot, and I legit was like, Where are you? Like, what even? What part of Middle Earth have we gotten to now? Are they heading to Mordor? I don't know. The, this is and the why, if you're. If you specialize in hiding and camouflage, why would you ever make a campsite in the middle of a beach where there's no cover around you at all? I don't because know. There's, because that's that's not what they'd be looking for, right? If you're looking for Harfoots hiding, you're not going to be looking for carts with, you know, where, where they're partying in the middle of the the open area. That's not what they were looking <laughs> for. So they'd be, they'd, they'd be scanning the horizon, sight. looking around, they'd see the cart, and they're like, nah, no, nah, no, nah, that's not them. We're looking for Harfoots hiding in the grass and stuff. And this whole thing reeks of saving budget for the fact that you never see the other hobbits. In this no. entire thing, there's about two other ones and that family. And there's supposed to be a whole village here. They even made them park away from them for basically no reason, just so it's like, wow. Which was we weird, right? Because week. they weren't that far ahead of them when they started using uh, uh, Spaceman to, to move the, the carriage. So why did they fall behind so far that we can't even see them like miles ahead? Sabotage. Oh, it's, it's through the magic of <laughs> editing. 
I love the yeah, they are in the distance. <laughs> Several harvests, like you can see them um, chopping away yeah. their wheels to fuck them up in the night. It's like well, I mean, the, they drop right, pins no, you, on the floor to make you. We haven't gotten. We haven't gotten to any lines yet, right? Chronological, everybody. But we of sabotage. People behind. So, uh, I'm betting you you all at least love this song, especially the part where she said, not all who wonder or wander are lost. That was a that's great, right? It was a fun little... I think that's a great reference to a great man. Uh, and if he saw this, this episode of Flim, he would he would really enjoy what's been done with his work. Absolutely. He would appreciate Galadriel as a very strong character. He would appreciate Nori as a strong character he would really appreciate bronwyn as a strong character yep and and the queen regent is a strong character yep and i think he, i think she'd really really like that she'd like he, he i don't know why i said she um I'm, I'm losing <laughs> it man she would like home he'd, he'd like homer the most sorry I don't know if I'm just not big brain enough uh, to Probably understand the show. Definitely. Yeah, it, it's very likely. Uh, so I, I get if you wander, you might l get lost. But is the first one wander is in y your thinking about things? Oh, and yes, a, not yeah. all who it's wonder wonder, or wander. Wonder and wander. So, so how does thinking about things inherently lead to possibly getting lost? I'm not sure. Because uh, wandering I think makes more sense. Yeah, I think it comes you... down to they're meant to hide and keep to themselves, and so you're not supposed to think about the outside world or get <laughs> lured into it because that's dangerous. You just live in your own little bubble. Don't think about the outside. Don't go off don't the trail. Get that's curious. Right. The tallest barf thistle gets snipped or whatever the the fucking Harcourt proverb was. Hey, it's um, it works well enough as a statement. It's just the context. Yeah. Thing in this little tune while everything around it is incredibly annoying and frustrating and stupid and uh, everyone do you even know her name? I don't. Um, Fat one. What Podge? Is that her name? Did you say Poppy. Pudge was her name? Brandy yes. Fox, I think. He's a brandy foot. Uh, hang on. Right? Nori or just Poppy? A friend? Not Nori, Nori is the fat one. Nori's the main one. No, no Poppy's not... the fat one. Ah. Poppy. So she's Poppy. Nori then. That's a good, it's easy to remember because you're like, you think of a balloon can pop, right? And she's pop, kind of yep, balloon right. in shape. Yeah. So you're like, oh, you're poppy because you can pop like a, or maybe I need poppies to enjoy this show. Per happeths. Oh shit, I forgot about this scene. Next, doesn't it? The dinner plate people. Uh. <laughs> the dinner plate people? Yeah, the, uh, I, because I, I only know meta things about these people. They're looking for Sauron, right? Well, the show hasn't technically contextualized that. Yeah, they haven't really given us much. Looking, yeah, they're just looking at thing, and and they look nefarious. Yeah, right, look at those eyes. They're like, evil. Uh, those are I'm evil. And who... when she looks around at the camera, <laughs> it's like that's, we we really want you to make sure this is an evil glance. And who uses dinner plates outside of a dinner setting? Evil people. That's who. You know what I'd love? It's actually not evil. It's like, they meet her. It's like, no, 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 we're, we're really good, I swear. Then why are you looking that way? Why are you assuming it's... <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really prejudice well, at, of you. At the circus, they have the people who balance the dinner plates on the big sticks, and these people are dressed like clowns. So uh, I think, you know, you put two and two together. So this is the traveling That's circus, it. and they're looking for a tall person. To help them out with, like, you know, oh, look at the oddities of the world sort of thing. Did the tall Makes man sense. fall from the sky? Is the prophecies foretold? For I have something on the top shelf, and it has been <clears throat> a, an age and a half since I've been able to get it. They even do the, they flash like a memory, like a flashback of, of when he fell and all the fire and stuff, as if like, just in case you forgot, just in case. No, 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 that's, <laughs> that's like, that's an is this Sauron moment. Yeah. That, that's like the meteor thing being the eye of Sauron. This is Steve's, is he Sauron episode. Um, and so, like, they, they keep doing those flashes. I mean, flashes, they've been doing that the whole then, time, though, haven't they? Well, yeah. I think this is the third time, I think, they've been doing it. And it sort of happens as a few of those across this episode where you think, oh, this guy's... We're now supposed to think that he's an evil man. Um, uh, and he's not, because the next episode is somebody else's. Is he Sauron turn? Uh, I'm, I was trying to know. think, like... 
from the perspective Sorry. of someone who who's never read any of it or even really seen much of the films like would this mystery thing actually work from that perspective like is there anything even vaguely intriguing about it given that you already know that well there's only really two answers and two people who can fill those answers um i don't know what you guys sort of felt about the uh, the actual success of their attempt to intrigue you very confused yeah i, want, <laughs> I think that there, there's something that intrigues me like on the still picture you have here Mola. see the person holding the dinner plate right yeah and then and then look at the person's hood that's over them and like what is underneath that oh. hood do they have like giant bat ears <laughs> or something <laughs> I, yeah. just, Holy crap. I, I only just it's noticed that as you said it. I, wow, that is a strange hood. Uh, it's like a Batman. Yeah. <laughs> Mahler's not familiar with the hood. No, no, I'm not. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty hilarious. Uh, it looks like it's built into the thing itself. Like that would take some work. You'd have to build in like a little metal hole maybe to keep it up or hard plastic. See the... I don't think that's standing up on its own if it's just cloth. Then maybe if you fold it up enough, and it would. Yeah, good so for them. Confused. I'm going to opt for that instead of the, the ears thing that you're going with. But then again, this is Rings of Power. Who knows what's going on yeah. under there? Yeah, exactly. could be anything. Could that's be true. that because they suck. Um, but yeah, with very little context, it's just like so. We just don't know who the old man is, and these these guys are interested in him. That's basically all we have, and we don't get anything for the rest of this episode or the next one about this. Why does he have blackened fingers? Is this like Evil. some crazy smoker that smokes tar or something? I don't know. Digging, digging through all the dirt, looking for, looking for goodies, and now that yeah. could be harvesting like meteor clay to build new cutlery with. Mm. That could be. Uh, a it's a very, it's very rare when you have like meteors and you could make things out of them. It's very special. Like, you could sell that stuff. I mean, the meteor market is is very, very. You know, it's uh, I don't even know what to call it. They're looking for meteors. All right, yeah, things out of, yeah. The dwarves pay extravagant prices for meteor metal. So yeah, or, well, or tree metal, but we'll come to that. Oh yes, yeah, the darkhold fingers. I remember when the darkhold does to you sometimes. Doesn't do it to everybody, and doesn't do it to everybody all the time either. Um, go over to Adar because the the theme of this episode is a bit of a like we take a step back to go two steps forward in the next episode okay but the, we we can't go yet the the war seemed to have started sort of and then it was like not really no we're okay hang on a sec and then it's the same like all around middle earth story wise so this is like adar is like oh man i like the sun it's going to be sad when it's when i kill it and it's like huh. well he also tortures his friend there oh well, yeah we we've, we've all been there I don't my know only why he theory, does that. Well, my only theory as to why he does that is because the Harfoots were so evil in the previous episode. He's like, well, I'm supposed to be the really evil guy, so I'm going to have to make up for Because he was really yeah. nice to his orcs in the last episode. Well, the Harfoots were horrible. He's like, I've got to have to top this. Can't let him be the most evil. There's a particular moment regarding that sort of concept that I can't wait to get to. That's episode two. So, the, or the episode two of our coverage. But yeah, the you're right. The, this, this does feel like one of those, um, look how evil he is. He's, even if he's the boss of orcs, you might have thought for a second there that he's not Super evil. So he burns his own subjects, and they do it happily because they uh, believe in him. I read that differently. I think that, I mean, it might be in the case of being way too charitable to the writers of the oh, show. Right. Probably is. If you're being charitable to them at all, it's way too charitable. But um, I know I sort of read that as like, th this is an attempt to portray his sort of, he, he, this is an attempt to show you what he's about to sacrifice himself. So, like, obviously, he is like progenitor orc guy. He still has sort of the pull toward the sun. He is much more elvish than the orcs under him are. He's almost trying to make them see what it feels like, but obviously it hurts them, so they're not really going to appreciate it. But that's his, that's the setup for him then saying, when the sun disappears, look, I'm going to kind of miss it, but you will not, you won't suffer for long, because when the sun is gone, you will be fine, and this will be your world. I wouldn't suffer at all if you put my arm in the sun. <laughs> that's what I mean. I think, I, mean, uh, I, this... I, I have no idea what they're actually trying to say. Obviously what his... their intentions are. His POV isn't that I'm going to be evil for the sake of being evil. It's that I'm 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 suggesting that this scene exists for that purpose to try and give us more of a sense of like, look, he's burning his own men. Oh, when I from his POV, don't... he's like doing some weird thing about the sun. I, you know, it's the same with a lot of like evil leaders it's, and um, stuff like that. It is, but I don't think it's evil. I think this is this is literally it's an excuse for them to sort of foreshadow the plan, the dimming of the sun, because like the only reason this scene really exists is so he can then portentously warn. 
that the sun Kills will no sun. longer be a factor very, very soon. The sun is going to dim, and then you will be fine. Um, I don't. I don't think well, I didn't read people into it at all. But... Be more than enough. The fact that he's like the the orc is like, Nyeh! and that he can clearly see the skin yeah. is starting to sizzle, ow, ow, but he ow, ow, keeps ow, doing ow. it. It's like being mean. You are kind of just yeah. being a jerk. See, look at that old face. Oh, it's like wow! Yeah. Like, yo, dude, <laughs> I... stop! You know what the this sacrifices is? I make for you, buddy. <laughs> Why? I'm not ever gonna. I'm gonna have someone else do this job if you're gonna <laughs> burn me. I haven't even. I haven't even done anything. I've done everything I'm right. Like, this is uh, preemptive punishment. I haven't fucked up yet. I just can't Doug stand how inconsistent everything. they've been with the orcs in the sunlight because there's so many shots of them in sunlight and they're yeah. fine and then they're burning and then they're not and then they're in overcast and then they won't come out when it's overcast. It's like ah, oh, come off it. I just hate that, again, I think I mentioned this in the last one, the fact that the only thing you need to do to make your army of orcs work in the sunlight is just put them in clothes, because that, that works in this universe. So just give them hoods and they will be fine, and then they can go around rampaging throughout the daylight and they'll be okay, because I mean, they're supposed to fear the sunlight, they're not supposed to fry in the sunlight, so the fear of the sunlight sort of weakens them and it makes them, it makes them weaker in a, in a sense. They're not supposed to just like literally burn up, because if it is just sunburn that they're uniquely vulnerable to, well yeah, just give them factor 50 and put them in a hood, and they'll be fine. Army's ready, go and kill some just people in daylight. Gotta have that yeah, one orc per five that has the giant parasol. He's like, yeah, I got you boys! <laughs> <laughs> Gotta make sure you stay under it, okay? It's effective and stylish. Yeah. But they'd be evil. They go black. They keep hinting as well that all of this is that like run by higher powers. So in the last episode you had lots of talk about the Valar and how you people mm. pray to him and stuff. But when it comes to the sun, in multiple scenes, the sun either just goes away the second when they need it to, or just comes out the second that they yeah. need it to. And that's either the most ridiculous of writing where it's coincidence, or they are trying to say that it's deliberate by somebody else. The god of the sun. Well, I think you actually have to say it's deliberate in order for it not to be ridiculous, and they haven't yeah. done anything to say it's ridiculous. I mean, um, the sun is, is technically, it's, it's a god being stewarded around the world by Elrond's dad um, up in space. But unless, yeah, you're, yeah. Right, unless you're like actually going to say, um, unless you're actually going to say or do something later, which very clearly indicates that there is a higher power battle going on, saying between the Valar and, and Sauron, then yeah, it's just going to be contrived. I mean, and as someone who's not as familiar with all of it, I thought it was absurd that he's just casually announcing on top of everything else we're trying to accept that he's just going to destroy the sun. That sounds like a, <laughs> a Doctor Evil type of thing, um, and it's, it's really funny. I get, I can we really watch it. This is, it's got that Gru, I'm going to steal the moon interview. <laughs> I'm going to kill the sun. And like, I think, yeah, okay, it's the responsibility okay. of the show to contextualize that a little better. Like, it, as someone who, you know, it was not led into this very easily, it just sounds so like, oh man, you're evil, aren't you? I'm going to kill the sun. You, you watch. You, it's like Mr. Burns and Simpsons. Power plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fiddlesticks. Electrical lights and, and all... heaters running all day long. To be honest, building, the... building a big sun shield thing is actually more, sort of... I, I could believe that more than what they actually do. Well, yeah, because I don't even know what the plan to destroy the sun even is. Or even if it's destroying it, is it blotting it out? Is it sucking it's, it? It's, it's the volcano. It out, yeah. yeah, they just want to spew ash into the air, and that is going to stay oh. forever, which isn't exactly how volcanoes work, uh, and uh, block out the sun, unless they're evil. trying to oh. say... Like yeah. So that's tied to the oh, volcano yeah, plan. Evil... I didn't even realize that. It yeah. is. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's why. Going going for, yeah. That's why that's all of this. I thought they were activating but... the volcano because that's yeah. where he'll make the one ring, and that's why he needs that. Listen, if yeah. you if you put the sword in the key and turn it, it makes the sun go. We away cannot noise. even really, joke really about talking about that yet. <laughs> like uh, what about oh my god! This doesn't make sense. Oh jeez! So back. many things. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But hey, I don't, I don't, I'm not complaining about trying to get there, right? So next up, I uh, see the, because uh, this is loads of setup for the big old payoffs where we're heading toward, okay? And this was bizarre. Right, that's what this is, yeah. Um, this, this is the scene where Bronwyn's the leader now. She, that's her dialogue. She's like, I know you don't want me for your leader. And it's like, so fuck off. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very Galadriel esque line. Where it's Who like, are this you? is just your life now. Accept it. I'm your leader. 
I, I, like, I, when was there ever a sense of, like, these people believing in the girl who makes stuff with flowers? I don't even, when well, did that happen? It's bollocks, but it's, I think it's the last episode. It's when they, the first episode where we see them in the tower and they have that conversation between her, uh, her kid and the old man who goes evil in this episode. And he actually raises the point and says, who voted you leader? And she says, you did when you chose to follow me to the tower. And if you hadn't done that, you'd all be dead. That's... So, which it's is bollocks, even... but they did at least sort of, yeah. That no, My but let, it'd I'm be like now. when were you leader? And it's like when I decided I was leader. That's what that is. Like it, there was no okay. decision to make her leader. There was a decision to be like, oh, her plan to go to the tower probably is a good idea. Which is it's, it's two different things, okay? Yeah, yeah, and also <laughs> it, impl it implies that there was no leadership structure in place in the village no. in the first, which is ridiculous. Of course, there would be. Who's the mayor? No, they well, they operated, is there a they sheriff? operated efficiency. I, they have a representative republic that runs the village, <laughs> and they make sure that everyone's dirty and grimy, and no one is, you know, has to go around clean. Whenever someone and has a bath, there's always someone there with a bucket of mud ready when they get out. Just <laughs> 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 Yay! Thank you so much. I'm dirty again. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'd have to address because everyone else is, is highlighting it. Okay, this, this is the scene that there's a couple memes and morality for. Who's for um, color. She always is. Uh, yeah, the, there's a couple repeated extras by the powers of CGI, and uh, the the uh, the conversation I saw was basically everyone laughing at that, and then lots of accounts quote tweeting that and being like, "That's a that's a tactic used in literally everything, even good things." So you guys are all stupid. So. Talk amongst yourself. What do you think of this as a criticism? I'll try and point them out where I can, I guess. It, it is a flaw. There's no getting around that. Like, you can yeah, see that's, you did it present it in the... Yeah, well, it reminds me of one of those things where someone's like, fucking, you know, it's in another thing. And it's like, what, is it, what does that mean? The, the, doesn't it just mean this is a trick of, the, of filmmaking to try and hope you think there's more people here than there actually is? That's what it is. I mean, of course. I mean, your mind can't help when you think about how expensive this show is. Like, you didn't, you couldn't get enough extras to just fill out the space. Well, just you change can't the get camera a bunch of people angle. to look I mean, like dirty peasants. Mm -hmm. I, I think well, the thing, like the thing that, that makes this, people, yeah. the thing that makes this a bit more irritating, I think. I mean, I wouldn't even cite it as like it's not a significant problem, but I think the reason you can't say, well, other shows do the same thing, therefore it's the same whenever other, another show does it, is that it's unnecessary in this case. All you need to do is pull the camera angle down or have it set lower so you don't see as many people but you get the impression of depth or have fewer people in the crowd because there aren't that many villagers anyway and we don't ever need to see this many villagers later on even in the big fight scene we get to. There are not many villagers involved in that fight so just cut the number of them a bit. But cut the number and lower the camera angle and you've solved your problem. It's different from say Peter Jackson's films where you have 10 thousand orcs to cgi but you can't say because they cgi ten thousand orcs therefore it's fine for them to cgi in random beard people in two shots where they don't need to be there these I guys think the same guy they look like the same they do look like the same guy or maybe that's look just for the guy in the hood there's horrific racism coming out <laughs> there's a guy in a hood that appears like like i see three of them already um Wait, is i it... think we're the main this guy it... Um, uh, when you no. say a hood, I'm trying to uh, tell who. He, he's he's wearing a hood. He looks like you know he's got a big beard and he's wearing a... ah, right there, right. You had him before. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll... There are so many that are yeah. just copied. Um, like if you go yeah. through this, there's so I've many. Sent, I've been sent this. There actually is quite a few. Oh wait, yeah, hang on. It's yeah. like if, half the crowd. If someone's done the um, thing already, yeah, hang on. Oh yeah, there's loads of pictures where they come. And so, the, I think the main criticism is about the budget, right? I could excuse this if it's you know uh, a smaller budget or is an SG one or something like this. Amazon had an insane budget, in telling me they couldn't get a hundred extras or something for this shot. It's bizarre. The defense is that this was all done during the sort of the lockdown times, and so they oh well, we would have done it, but we just can't. But the thing, like, as has been said, it's the camera shot. They had one that decided to film it in sort of, like, ultra-wide um, ratio as well, because it's definitely not 169. Um, and there's so many different... They don't even bother to change the hats on the people. They're literally just picked... It's it's not just they've copied them. They've copied them in the most low-effort way possible. There's a triangle of people that's just repeated all over the place. Maybe you know what? Yeah, looking you... in a slightly different way. I think yeah, those are the um... Wood Brothers. I think that cracks the criticism perfectly. If you'd even switched the nature of the triangle they form, that would have been something. Take a hat off, 
have them put, put like you know just a bit more mud on one of their faces to try and make it look a little slightly mm. different but no you're Even right they, more mud whoa they, is a room they managed to just sort of uh it's, it's, it seems like it's just copy and paste um which is lazy uh, compared to what you can do, even in restriction times. So. And this is the thing: if some... my head canon is that this village is just full of twins and triplets, uh -huh. and that's just the nature of this particular village. Lots and lots of essentially just copies of people because in inbred you know, people just... villages have very very small gene pools. Yeah, there you go. I can believe it. I mean, half the village does look the same from this shot canonically in universe. <laughs> in so universe, does, they uh... look the same. <laughs> Yeah, um, this was what they did. Was, and and if and if one of your three plots is essentially that, I guess three or uh, four plots, one of your big plots is, a, you know, concerning a village of dirty peasants, you probably have some extras, you know? Is, is that is that Homer right at the front as well? Our Homer from, from the last stream we did. Wait a second. <laughs> Why can't they take all the people from I Numenor think, think you're right. and dress them up as peasants? No one would notice. I don't, yeah, this is the thing. There are so many solutions to this that I don't understand because even COVID restrictions doesn't exactly answer this in terms of like, well, yeah, you don't have to record them all together if you're po pasting them, but you can record different people at different times, right? I don't I mean, know. Surely, you, you, yeah, you've got people. And I mean, they could around. have recorded the same people, just dress them in different clothes, give them different hats and put them in different positions and then compo composite the shot together. They, as we mentioned, they didn't even do that. They actually did that. I think there's um there's a British TV show called Countdown, um, which is what old people and students watch. Mm. But they would record multiple episodes on the same day, and they would have the same audience members in. They would just have this box full of different coloured jumpers, and then in between episode recordings, they'd send them away to change the colour of their jumper and then have them sit back in different places, and then no one would notice the difference. Um, yeah, and that's an option. Just change the colour, as was mentioned. Ooh. Uh, uh, as was just pointing out, Homer's but there, Rags, just to the top right of her head, but there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That is, he's uh, he's the he's the real hero. Probably Unironically... worth saying favorite character, best developed so far. Uh, you wouldn't understand yeah, if you haven't he... seen our coverage previously, but he's quite a quite an in depth, meaningful character to the show. I would say. Yeah, Fringy pointed out that he looks staggeringly like Homer to the point of potential copyright infringement, and mm -hmm. we all agreed with his astute assessment. And as a result, we he sort of become our our crowd favorite. So to speak. Yeah, his adventure um, uh, in these next two episodes, uh, I was told about it ahead of time. Like, oh, Homer's Homer's really going to go on quite a journey, and I was like, oh, well, that's that's at least we got that. But we will judge it for how good it is. Anyway, yeah, she's leader now. Shut up. Um, and she nice. says we got a fight. Uh, this for like standard right. fight. This watch that uh, just you may have like a just a normal person thought of like, well, well, you, you leave. Right? You could like, leave and not die. <laughs> probably leave. We are a bunch guys, of peasants. There's an not, army of orcs, right? Yeah, you're not locked in. You have no necessarily... Like, there's no... You can just go... You, you guys are all really not prepared for war. Let's just put it that way. And, uh... You know, these orcs, this army, they've already fucked up all your elf, like, you know, watchtower people. So... Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I'd like to entertain that thought. And then someone speaks up. It's Waldrig, the stinky old man. And you're like, oh, maybe Which he'll, one? Uh, well, you know, you know, the the stinkiest, oldest one. There you go. Oh, uh, that narrows it down <laughs> a little bit. I got him on screen. Who was help wearing you. the? He was wearing an apron in the first episodes and looked like he was wearing nothing else, and he just like, <laughs> go around. <laughs> the oh yeah, that's right. He does. Yeah, he was the among the dirtiest and smelliest of the peasants. And so he's like, I suggest a second option. And there I am like, ooh, here we go. Let's leave. And then he says, let's swear fealty to the orcs. <laughs> what? <laughs> There's what? only two options. Stay in the tower and fight them. Or swear allegiance to them. There's nothing you could do. That's it. The thing, thing is, they don't even the use those options themselves. No. They do actually leave. <laughs> so maybe the people would have stayed if she said, actually, this is a better plan. This is the thing, you need you need more you need more like alphas in this this crowd. It's just one person to just be like, you're both insane. Nobody listen to these people. Oh, Fuck them. Yeah, Throw how them come out. blue dressed ladies in charge? I didn't vote for you. Because she's the only one that has any color. She she gets to be in charge. That's how it works. Everyone else is dark gray. <laughs> it's a the field of dark gray. The brighter your clothes, the more respect and power you God command. bestowed upon her blue. Oh, it's blue. it's a leader color. 
Uh, and she dabba dee dabba died all over the townsfolk. Exactly. So Hell, the, the orcs are at a massive disadvantage. If they wanted to run away, just run away while the sun's out because the orcs yep. can't follow you while the sun's out. And also, being human, you know, you can just stay up all night and run during the night as well if you want to. You can make double the distance the orcs can, and they're not particularly quick. It's just that the show sometimes forgets that the orcs can't go into daylight. So maybe they were anticipating the show forgetting that the orcs might this time go into the daylight? I don't know. But yet, just do anything except maybe hiding in the tower, or just doing something at this point, because even when they do enact their weird little plan, half of them just stand around watching, so they're not exactly the most proactive group of villagers in the world. No, none of them want to oh, seem goodness. to live. Remember, they all left their village without taking food. What is wrong well, with you people? I mean, can you blame them for not wanting to live <laughs> <laughs> in this world? <laughs> Like, yeah, what secretly, I... <laughs> each one of them wants to die, but they don't think anyone else thinks that. They think they're the only one. So I just realized something, and I might be skipping the chronology, but I was thinking about the tower, because we're all talking about why don't they just leave the tower, and then I was thinking about Adar's plan. What does he really want? He doesn't necessarily want to kill the people. He just wants to get the sword key thingy. And then I was like, and so why does he want the sword key thingy? To put it in the key slot. But the thing is, hang on, the show actually revealed that Adar didn't know what to do with the key. He he saw the mural when he went to the tower for the first time, and it's like oh, a reveal that it's just real. I thought he and just. Sorry, uh... I, the show's basically implying he didn't know what to do with the key because he found out when he went to the tower, and so it's after the key, but he doesn't know what to do with it at this point. I, I still don't get how when they're lo when they reveal the thing on the wall, why they don't think, oh, I wonder what this is, and then look down at the ground and see the big yeah. gaping hole in the no, floor. No, no, no one would do that. That would be ridiculous. It's it's like, no, that's just that's just a hole. We don't we don't talk about it. It's just there. Also, the if it's so I've important, heard why is does... what if the tower collapsing actually showed the hole? In which uh, case, that's even more contrived. I don't think I don't know because the t the hole with the tower is is next to it. I thought I didn't think it was inside it. And also, if it was inside it, wouldn't the elves have noticed that there it's was a it. sinister... Yeah, we're not on that yet. Door. We're the not on that yet. <laughs> okay. We're bringing it, bringing it back chronologically. The elves have da, da, da. That's a good point. Bringing it back chronologically, though, they're leaving at this point in the show. Mm -hmm. um, and For sure that old, old man... how amazing elves are. They're not that amazing. No, they're pretty shit. But yeah, old man in, in this scene, just, he already knows cleaner. that the sword's important, and yes. he already knows where the sword is and who has the sword. Yes. And rather than get the sword and steal it and go away with it and take it to Adar, which would be a logical thing to do because you'd get in his good favor, True. he yes. just sort of yeah, randomly calls out to Theo and says, come with me. And then Theo just sits there like a moron because that's basically what he is and doesn't do it's anything. Too... But yeah, yeah, why, why did you not prioritize? Yeah, why did you not prioritize bringing that sword with you? You, you like basically had it. Yeah, and, and, mm -hmm. and I thought it was funny because he's like, all right, everybody, let's go and join the orcs. Woohoo. And this guy, the Nyphias guy, is like, yeah, yeah, woohoo. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> What's wrong with you? You were terrified of them seconds ago, but you're like, oh, no, yeah, this is totally going to work. 100%. Waldrig is correct. Any enemy of the Nyphias is a friend of mine. That's probably it, yeah. And then when he's like, come on, Theo, come on, follow me, come on. And then he doesn't, and he just gives up on it. And it's like, man. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to cause a social, you know, faux pas here by... I just, I, I just would have thought he'd put more effort in, you know? Yeah, and the yeah, sword yeah. at this point in the story is the equivalent of the one ring. So this is like mm -hmm. a Nazgul looking at Frodo and saying, come over here, my child. And Frodo's <laughs> saying, no. I have cookies. And then the Nazgul is saying, okay, fair enough. You keep that it. Raised. We'll leave. Here's our is, is that free will it's the very <laughs> thing that they've been digging up the landscape for however many hundreds of years looking for. And uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> and it has the same, it has a similar effect on the wielder as the wandering as well. It makes them feel powerful, it makes them desire it and crave it. So he should have always been angry at the kid for stealing it off him in the first place. If anything, yep. he should be going mental at him. Yeah, not only did he seem chill with the fact that he had stolen it, he like explains vaguely that, yeah, we're gonna be joining Sauron. But the kid is clearly like, what the fuck are you talking about, old man? And he's just fine with it, like... Oh yeah, this kid's probably creeped out, has no idea what I'm talking about, but whatever, it's fine, the plan's working, I guess, question mark. Yeah. Like, Maybe if he I can was keep the sword. He'd follow me. <laughs> Just yeah, like Waldrick pocketing that stupid hilt would have made way more sense this whole time, but they can't have that happen because we need some other things to happen first. All right, everybody, it's gonna be great. Fine stuff. Um, so yeah. far, so good. And they finally explain why they didn't take food with them to the uh, to the watchtower from the villages because when they're told to do a thing, they do it instantly. There's uh, they don't collect their food. They just leave. Uh, they're gonna go Wait, join what? the orcs. It's like. Uh, you, you're already leaving? You do it. Don't you need to, like, say, the things up? Have say, food. The orcs will feed oh, us. Oh. 
I, I see a guy holding a, a sack. You know to... A guy picked up a sack of. We've got stuff. a carpet it's... for there, I think, <laughs> or a blanket. So <laughs> That's something. Carpets. That's wonderful. There is. You're right though. There is a very decorating. small sack there. That could be several potatoes. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if you can't go out in the sun, you would really appreciate good interior decoration. Spend um, a lot of time indoors. Wouldn't that have made a lot more sense if Adar's message was join us, we have provisions and stuff, we're not going to kill you, we're just trying to find a new land, uh, you know, something like that. Then I could better believe That's these people, we... but at this yeah. point I just find this absurd that half the townsfolk are like, yes, let's join the orcs, that's a good idea. This requires yeah, I mean... no debate or deliberation or thought whatsoever. This is clearly the right move. <laughs> I think... Oh, very well written. That's my opinion. I know I'm going to get roasted <laughs> for that. Here I we go. Think you should reserve judgment until the end. <laughs> until season three. <laughs> Sometimes you got to get some rough setups to get those big, amazing character moments and incredible plot payoffs. This is true. Yeah. We are only we're only five hours in. There's not really enough time to spend. And I mean, yeah, yeah. this could. This this could totally be setting up a great fight scene, right, guys? Oh, so <laughs> funny you say that. When when we watch this, uh, Rags, I think you said this, and I totally agree. Whenever like a scene ends and it cuts to this is like an obvious like, oh, we're at Numenor again. It's such a like, ugh. but then it's like, well, no, there is no place in Middle Earth right now where I go, ooh, it's all just <laughs> like we're here again. <laughs> Harfoot's great, Numenor, great, fucking whoever it is, it doesn't matter anymore. It's like. It's like, what are, what are we doing over here, that vine? Yeah, and we find out that uh, Isildur is mad, because he's like, I want to be on the cool people part of this this uh, thing. But, but like, we were almost on the shot of the ships, because you can count oh. them, and they have at least eight ships they're preparing for war, and then uh, later on they only have four. It's like, oh, what and happened to the other? Three. I think the last then... line in the previous episode was, we've got five ships and 500 men. Which is, I mean, you might think not the biggest army to send to guard your queen as you go and invade a brand new continent against hundreds yeah. of thousands. Liberate, uh, liberate, liberate. Even yes, absolutely. Very liberate. important That's what terminology doing. here. Not colonizing um, it, okay? No, although they actually should be. But well, Farazon yeah. is clearly a, <laughs> he's, he's yeah. looking to have some benefits of that. He's like, I will have trade partners when this is done. Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. This really shows the incompetence of just the production because clearly the writers, they thought, oh, four ships and, you know, ignoring the fact that this is Numenor, they should have a massive army, but yeah, five ships. Mm -hmm. But then the people who were editing the shot or doing the visual effects is like, this doesn't look good enough. We need to put more ships in to make it look more impressive yeah. and not paying attention to what was written in the script to say they only had five and they throw in like eight. No, those were just uh, ships that, I mean, this is a harbor. This is just where the ships live. They're just there. They're like extras, but ships. Yeah, it's, ah, think of them as ships and the ship's kids who don't actually go off to war. They just <laughs> play in the shipyard. They run around doing ship things. But you're right. If we go by the visual of these, like, sails, like, so that's one, two, three, four, five for there, and then six, seven, but if you eight, let the, nine, ten. If it plays out, yeah, that's great. If it plays out, you even see more. There's, like, more to the left um, and stuff. And this is from the perspective of a ship. And so there's a ship that's yep. right in front of us. So it doesn't seem like the count's right, unless that explosion took out a lot more than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say two ships. It took out two ships. Oh, rags. Two could mean anything in Numenor. Yeah, they even said they're lucky it didn't take up more. Yeah, they were lucky it didn't take up more. This should raise some hazards about ship design for them in general. And like, but... why <laughs> would we believe that this is every ship Numenor has in just this, this shot, you know? Surely they have more. Just oh, of different... course they have more. Like, some will be out doing work or patrolling training, or being used for fishing. practice. Yeah, I've yeah, seen a couple out doing the training thing. But the, the thing is, that, they just the problem decide to only spend five. Yeah. But, it's or worth they're they're sending five. the army, but it's only yeah. worth it to send five ships. That's how much it's worth. Also, it's they have other cities as well. They should have, like, a fleet of at least a hundred, if not more. It's insane. That sounds excessive. But that's the thing, because that's not been set up, so that you have to assume that Numenor has more cities, and it should have more cities at this point in its timeline, but then at this point in its timeline, it should have cities in Middle-earth already from which to get the yeah, troops. Yeah, no, yes. I want to remind you, Ragnar. This colonized ages I wouldn't, ago. I wouldn't as far consider... as we know, there's one city on this place. I wouldn't consider this excessive at all to have a hundred ships just showing how huge Numenor was when one of the wider shots we had at first. Like this, this is far. This is a tiny part of Numenor in total from what we saw of the the huge landscape when when we first got here. Like when they had the bird's eye shot almost of all the like, islands. 
the yep. if you've got that much space and then presumably as many cities to reflect that and uh, as many docks and stuff it's just like yeah there should be a lot more ships and this is a people who were born of war right like that that's that's they won a war with the elves and that's what created them so surely they would have they've got so many disciplines that relate to war that you'd think they yeah, they are supposed to be the greatest warriors in the world at this point. Um, <laughs> if we get to see how good they are at fighting. Yeah. <laughs> the, the richest, richest Galadriel city, is the born in war, in most experienced. They're all very long-lived, so most of them would have lived to see, or lots of them would have lived to see the war that gave them the island in the first place. Um, and they're just portrayed in this as just like, yeah, the, their entire fighting force is just dweeby teenagers. And then I'm... Isildur was is kind of the worst of the bunch because... He's, you know, he's not allowed to go on the mission despite the fact he volunteered in the previous episode because he got distracted because he really wants to go to West Numenor to find where his family were. But in this episode, it's, now I don't care about that anymore. I, I want to go on this expedition and fuck you for not letting me go with you. And I, there must have been some development in between those two positions, but there isn't any of it. <laughs> he's just, been. it makes no sense from character motive point of view. Well, and the worst thing about this shot as well is you actually see the size of the horses in relation to the boat. Yes, and so I was gonna bring the that up. stable <laughs> cannot physically fit in because I'm not even sure you could fit two horses lengthways across the sides of the boat. Numenor, as we learn, is the home of the horse lords. So they have extra large horses. That's why they have to move them with cranes. Not just the horse lords, <laughs> right? This is the Time Lord technologies in here. They are TARDIS ships. They are bigger on the inside, and all the horses can fit them. <laughs> It's more like we teleport ships. later on. They teleport them in because they got to fit through the doorways. It's, it's like this is crazy yeah. technology, Numenor. This is great. Weapon, and people it? were saying maybe there's just multiple levels beneath the water, and that's how the boats. It's like no, because they go up river, so they're like shallow bottom boats as well to even get up there that, in the first place. I was thinking that that the yeah. that they want us to believe these are like double decker buses underneath them or something of space, but I was like, I don't think so though. I mean, if it's a deep river, you could have... I mean, I imagine there's, there's quite a lot below the waterline, but not enough... Even when you see it, the inside of it later, when they go and do the, the whole sabotage thing, um, it's still... The, the, even then, the space looks too big to be contained. And I, I've spent quite a lot of time on boats over the last few years. There's quite a lot below... There's more than you'd think below the waterline, but there's not enough on these ships, especially if they are going up anywhere, like, high up a river. Or even in a harbour, which tend to be sh sort of shallow water anyway. You couldn't fit horses on there and you couldn't fit the people and the store provisions as well if you're taking all three if well, you pack we... them in right you know you gotta <laughs> you just gotta arrange them like um like tetris. like horses they're yeah like they're like tetris blocks where they're, they're a little bit longer <laughs> than they are wide so you have to just sort of fit them in you gotta pack them in that's the thing if you turn them at right, right angles to each other and then you can lie well, their you, bellies, you lay them... belly to belly but then right angles and then the legs sort of go around themselves and then they actually become much more condensed yeah you, kind of, them in like that. you lay them on your their side and then you just sort of stack them on top of each other they, apparently you, the horses find this uncomfortable them. that's not relevant to tetris something. it'll make them all the more happy to run at full speed when we get up to the other side of the ocean it's either that or like plastic garden chairs you know when you stick them over each other and the legs are sort of drop down the sides I'm sure there was ways. Numenorean horses are special, so exactly, maybe there was yeah. a, like a flat pack option. So we're doing 500 soldiers. How many horses are going? Um, as many as the soldiers. They're all dry. Are they they all all as yeah. Numenorean, are, uh, Numenorean cavalry, they're very talented because they can ride two horses at once. Whoa. So really, you have 500 soldiers, that's a thousand horses. That's how they get. That's how they get to Middle Earth so fast. That's how they get to the South ones. There's so horses quick. under the boats powering the the, the boats. They run on. <laughs> oh, horse! Yeah, literal horse. They're power. not even on yeah. the water. It's like so. <laughs> how so, many knots can this baby get up to? Slaps hell. But, yeah, so yeah, presumably a hundred horses in each of the five <laughs> ships, and that's before a tragedy occurs. That means that more have to. Fi God, it's so impossibly absurd. They didn't give a shit. They uh, actually measure their sailing power and horsepower. They're the only nation in the earth to do it. It makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. One horse is equivalent to, oh, well, I guess one horsepower. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Generally, <laughs> <That's where> it's, <laughs> from. it's been working out. Um. So yeah, the math in my head, the conversion. Celio's all mad because he's not allowed to go into the the fighting portion of the people. I guess, or is, is it that he's not even allowed in oh at all God. at this point? Right, he's not allowed. Do you understand? Do you understand there's an incredible joke that could be made here? Do it. Where we, we've been talking about horsepower. They are a sea people. Here's the thing. It, it's only worth explaining because it involves knowing. So 
You know, um, the Latin word for C is mare, M-A-R-E, which is mare, which is what a female horse is. And we talk about horse and this is seafaring people. So there's like, it's it's really it's really something it's something to consider honestly that's where we get like marine and uh, mariner from but it's just something to consider as we move oh, so on you try to say it should be mare power is that, is this where it's going no 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 oh, horse okay. he wants to make but, a pun I mean, just, but he hasn't got one yet work on it right no, it's not it's not really a pun it's not it's not really a pun it's just it's something to think about but yeah, i'm saying it's you haven't got anything yet about. you'll have a pun eventually you're working on it I mean, maybe I'll have a pun. Do you have a notepad where you write down some of your pun ideas, like, and start to sort of workshop them and, and figure out? I probably out? should. Whenever something comes I, to look, mind, I should I, just write it down for later, put a little bullet I'm point, because, like, needs work. I think that's, uh, I think that that's probably the, because, I mean, many of the puns are pretty strong if they're right off the bat, but think about how great they could be with tweaks and refinements if you write it's them like down. Working... And, with a past you and you at the same time. Two punners. Exactly. Going at full speed. Two punners working together. That's right. I was in the joke army. It's called two punners, two... It's just called two... Uh, well. So, um... Yeah, Tunnery it's, sergeant. I think it's a seal that wants a particular, like, area of, of fighting, and, and Lendil's like, well, but why? Why, what, why should you? And I think he even appeals to the fact that he's his dad at one point, which is Really fucked up in terms of how war ranks should work. Nobody likes nepotism. Piece of shit. And uh, the thing I actually, this is one of this small, small thing I liked when Elendil is like, uh, you basically like shirked all of your duties and you're an asshole while all the other men here have been like working their whole lives to yeah. actually do their jobs. So fuck you. And I was like, hey. Uh it's true. Instead of actually quitting, which is what he wanted to do, he purposely sabotaged his own work and got other people fired in the process. This guy's an incompetent idiot. So why would you want him on board? Well, yeah, exactly and so. his entire story, his entire story up to this point doesn't make sense because he was part of the military. He was a sailor, so he could have been on the ships anyway. He That's a sailor says, in training, I... right? To get kicked down. Yeah. yeah, he's like, I don't want to do that because I want to go to this land over there in the west or wherever where on I can see and I'm like vision. drawn to it. And then the moment this happens, he's like, yeah, I don't care about that anymore. I want my original job back. It's just, yeah. make up your mind. I'm sorry, was, but was... no, you fucked up, like, on purpose. And you even fucked up your friends' careers, too. Which, which you haven't sense, really but... <laughs> apologized for. Yeah, it's like, that That was an unprecedented move by the captain to do that. <laughs> but unprecedented see, nonsense though, move by the captain that, for some reason, nobody has stopped. Everyone has accepted that's just the case. It's like, okay. It. And, I mean, you, you raise the point, like, oh, yeah, that he hasn't even apologized to his friends. I think it's the scene next, right, where he goes to talk to them. The first of many scenes where a character's like, I'm sorry, but now do something for me. <laughs> right, like, straight yeah. Straight away, um... if they immediately ask for the thing that they want. Like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, but do me a favor. It's like, oh, so are you really sorry, or do you just want something from me? Oh, so you're just a bad person who's really selfish. Well, it's just, we see it later with Galadriel when she's like, oh, I'm sorry I used you, now help me. It's like... Hey, <laughs> how, how, hey, no, she yeah, is... No, it was worse than that. It's, I'm sorry approach. I used you and manipulated you, but here, let me use you and manipulate you. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That seems she's great. Awful. That's a great one, yeah. They're really good we at characterizing her in one particular way that I don't even know they're aware of. They do it with Elrond, too. Yeah. Like, when, <laughs> with him as well. It keeps happening. So oh, these uh, these two episodes were really piling on the 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 conclusions we already had about the dialogue. Like, I think that's one of the this biggest was... takeaways I've had from this whole season. The dialogue writing is hideous, just terrible. It is shit. Yeah, we we ended it... up pausing a bunch when we were watching these episodes yesterday. Yeah, because um, there was just you have to you have to figure out the dialogue, but not in the sense of oh, it's so multi layered and there's subtext here and it's very meaningful. No, no, no it's just like what are what the fuck are you saying? Why do you mean drinking well, they, seawater? What do you mean? <laughs> oh, it, it's uh, it's so laden with these bizarre like analogies and parables, and 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 I mean generally the characters don't even feel like they're talking to one another, like they're talking past each other or they're talking at each other. The conversations don't flow naturally because they're not real people, or at the very least, like they're not even trying to come across as believable people. It's almost like, it's like amateur dramatics in that way. It's like when you yeah. see a Shakespeare play properly done at the Globe, then it all feels exactly as it should and you're really, you're drawn into it. But you see the same play put on by amateur 
uh, like Amdram performers in a, in a local village theater. And they're all, they all seem to be, they all seem to be very, very aware that the lines they're speaking are grand and what they want to convey is the grandiose nature of said lines. But they do, as you say, end up speaking past each other because what they're really focusing on is just delivering the line and not actually what the line is supposed to mean, how it's supposed to be conveyed, what it's supposed to convey either. Um, and it just gives it this this really weird sort of self... Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how you describe it. It's, it's very self-aware when they're doing it. Um, I think I'm saying it's effect based. It, fe- it, it comes across as dialogue that you read off of a script, not a thought that you had, and then conveyed to somebody... It's it's like it's oh, like yeah, absolutely. As you're watching, it's like this is dialogue. This isn't two characters having a conversation. This is dialogue in a script for a um, television show. One of the things Anthony Hopkins has said famously on many interviews is that's how he's always done his approach with his movies is that he reads the script, reads the script, reads the script until he's memorized the entire thing and it's his like deli- it's 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 things he's saying as opposed to things he's reading and saying like off a script. It's going to be owning it all as though he's the character saying it and it's just like that's probably not a coincidence, considering he's one of the greatest actors ever lived. So, you should probably the, the uh, process you know. yield some good results. <laughs> Look into yeah, it. Yeah, it's maybe. kind of um, you know how like uh, I'm not trying to. So like um, I think it's often a common thing, right? Where like when when people perform on on a stage, that they're meant to sort of sort of tilt angle themselves towards the audience. Like that, you you never want to have like an actor like pointing away from the audience, or generally they're meant to be facing towards the audience. It's kind of like that effect here, but it doesn't work. Where it's like every single time they're talking, it's like they're very aware that there's an audience like off to the side that they're trying to communicate everything to. Yeah, and there's boxes to check. Like we've got to have our lofty dialogue that means a lot that people can quote. I think mm-hmm. that's part of the directing though, because the problems with the way one person delivers it are the same across the entire cast. Everyone talks like this all the time, yeah. and so that's mm-hmm. not just one person delivering a line. When it when it's widespread, you're like, okay, you think that sounds because there's normally um, politicians are told to speak like that because it, it makes people easier to understand and everything. So they're not only sort of underestimating their audience and thinking, no, this is so difficult to understand. We're going to say it slowly so you appreciate it. But they, someone said that was dramatic. That's impressive. That will leave an impact on you. And I, I just don't. It, right, it's like too it, widespread it, to think the actors did that on their own. I mean, it's it's got to be direction. It's yeah. If everybody's doing it, it's got to be direction. I don't really direction. know how you deliver a lot of the lines very well. Like when you say seawater's not gonna, I don't know, fix you or like rock. <laughs> They're so proud down. of that. They repeat it. They uh, they do that they a lot with all of this it. stuff. It's they repeat funny. their yeah. shit tallest milkweed but i mean the, the, i think that i think we, we actually might have mentioned this in the last one but actually i, I would say that's more writing than directing in that case i mean if you can't conceive of a way in which a line would be conveyed properly um yeah or, and as well and also if if the particular type of line you're, you're referencing is the sort of metaphor or the simile which every other character from every other background in the show is conveying um and there's no difference between them there's no difference in speech pattern or conveyance then i'd say that that's just that's a problem with the writers who have put those same lines in the mouths of disparate peoples and not just there's only so much you can do as a director if you're given a line like that which sounds like it should be coming from the mouth of an elf but is in fact in this scene coming from the mouth of a hobbit uh there's only so much as a director you can do to make that seem natural i don't think you can make some of these seem natural no uh, yeah probably not and i mean like you said a lot of the characters sound very similar you've only got a handful of characters who i feel generally say things that are reflective of them as an individual rather than something that could just be taken and given to any other character and you wouldn't even notice. Like, you'd never feel like it was out of place that somebody said anything because every, everything everybody says feels out of place all the time. You know, uh, one of the things I was going to ask about this scene as well, it started to make me think, like, if we consider uh, Isildur's journey right up until we see him at the end of episode six even, all of this is like, all the complications he faces are all, they all start with him making that retarded decision on the boat where... If he hadn't made that retarded decision on the boat, like, even at the time, surely he would have been like, oh, it's a couple of days till I get my, like, let's call it official license to do see things. I can still not do them, right? I'm assuming it's not like you're locked in via contract to do that. You can abandon that job or whatever, but you'd still have the qualification. So, like, abandoning it right at the end just seems like a really dumb move. Like, there's, what do you gain? Kind of where I'm at he with that. He says himself that he can take a gap year. He says to his father, I can just, de- like, delay it for a year. And it's only his father that says, no, I won't let you do that. But Wait, can there was no him? power there. He could have just... 
No. I think yeah, he, I think you're right. Actually... I, don't, I don't think he could stop it. <laughs> I, just, I don't see why. I don't, I don't see why he would. Yeah, well, really, first of all, he shouldn't do it. Like, Elendil seems like the kind of character that would allow his son to make that choice. But secondly, he shouldn't even be allowed to just... His son's a fucking adult, surely. You don't get I don't to... think he even said you can't do it. I think he just said it's a stupid thing to do. Well, <laughs> that's, that's another good point, probably. But, hey, it's better than fucking sabotaging yourself. This is the thing. What he and did, it could have gotten him, like, put in jail at worst case. Like, he's such a dumbass. I'm still slightly gobsmacked about how they did that, though, given that they showed him do the same thing by accident in a, a couple of scenes prior with no comeuppance, and then they see him do it, and it's deemed to be deliberate the second time, but he's never been seen doing it before, therefore he must be off the team, even though he did it ten minutes ago, uh, and no one cared. That was that was kind of astonishing. But I, I was trying to think about this one and sort of where they're going to take his character, because he's got to be in it, of course, for the, like, the entirety of the run of this show, and he, I assume they're going to attempt to tie him into the seal do we see at the beginning of... Um, of the Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah. And so maybe what they're going for here is this sort of this sense of selfish impulsiveness. Uh, this is supposed to sort of, this is like the germinal form of the flaw that leads him to take the ring, even though actually the ring corrupts him and would have done whatever his flaws. But I was sort of thinking about that. And is, is it really even framed that way? Because he's not really, it's not selfishness here as in like self-motivated selfishness. It's kind of, it's almost like wistful, romantic selfishness that he conveys. Like he like looks starry-eyed over at West Numenor and decides he wants to go over there for reasons. And then, no, 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 the next grand thing is he wants to go off to Middle Earth. Um, but that's not sort of, that's not bitter, sort of cold, calculated selfishness. That's just, that's very sort of teenage, wistful selfishness. And I, I kind of, I'm wondering whether they are going to try and build that toward the later depiction, and if they are going to try whether they have the talent. And the answer to that question is no, but I'm not sure about the preceding one. So, next up we have... Oh yeah, that just sort of ends awkwardly. Um, Farazon may be the only one who can stop the, the war from happening, and so uh, Isildur's daughter is like, hey, Farazon's son, tell him not to. He says. Also, why? Like, she, she was, she was introduced five minutes ago. What? Why did she? Where did this anti-war uh, sentiment come from? He doesn't like war. All right, we don't need to know why. Uh, doesn't no. like war. The way, she, the way she describes it, um, in the after thing is she saw her brother go off to war and that she didn't want him to die and leave her. So that's why she doesn't want him to go. Doesn't explain does, that. In the show. Does she care about? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is the thing. I've got criticisms everywhere, but like, it's just, does she care about the the current narrative, which is that there's many people who are about to die if they don't go and save them? No, that? only or... a family. Oh, okay. Specifically, oh, a family. <laughs> is it, this is what I mean. Uh, as has just been pointed out in terms of just noticing motivations. Like, should, doesn't she? Hasn't she earned that scene where she can explain her position on this? But no, it's just nah, war, boo. You're like, okay, all right. They, they no, even I, hint. There's no that real these reason two... for it. Why is he so anti-war? You'd think you'd have... Well, just, yeah, as, as was mentioned, it's I just... I can't remember. Does this guy have any reason to oppose the war apart from trying to get into this girl's pants? Like, It's funny you say that, Shaq. Cause... Something that I didn't like about this, and a lot of people are making fun of the line alone, right? Which is, when I speak, his ears close up, and then she yeah, says... I've got so wrote that down. <laughs> no, speak louder. Speak what louder. does she do before <laughs> saying that, though? She grabs his hands, and I was like, are you, are you, are you doing like a... Like, do it for me, buddy. All right. Yeah, I know. Right? Like, <laughs> and in which case, I'm just like, what does he think? What is his position? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> there is something weird happening between these two, even off screen. I, like, Disbrew, your video where you have their interview. That guy <laughs> was trying his very best to not look down. He's just like, right, can you blame like, him? <laughs> 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 keep eye contact, keep eye contact, because she was wearing a very interesting dress. <laughs> I, I had to comment on that dress that just a timestamp followed by, pause it. <laughs> that, that was it. <laughs> yeah, this, so... This shot should be shown in every film class, though. Exactly. All of them should be. Every second of this show should be to teach people how to do things wrong. And, um, okay, there's some nice things. But, I need, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, so we were complaining we don't exactly know what her position is. What the hell is his position? Again, I only know it that because guess... the actors have said so. Ah. So, like, <laughs> great. This is his, they've both said that essentially both of them are using each other, and he's getting, um, like, he approached her not accidentally. It's part of the family's plan because of what her family's doing, and that the father has been put next to Galadriel. And so, because Farazan has kind of got his, like, little tendrils all over the island, he wants to get someone close to that family so he can manipulate them in the future. 
None that's of that's said in the show. I said no, it's so. not said in the show, but it also doesn't make sense because the next thing we'll Stay see from him is going deliberately him. against what Farazon wants as his plan in order to further the anti-war aims He's not of like other his sons. prospective bint. So I, I don't understand any of this. No. Well, I don't. I need to give. What's the personal reason for the son? Like, what? What is his? What is his character? Who is this guy? Well, the what problem is, is we we haven't had a scene with him that's not just he and her developing minute chemistry in order to justify talking, them being in a relationship talking. at some point. Yeah, yeah like we haven't heard them actually. Weird, yeah. All their scenes together are weird, awkward flirting, kind of, and they don't have a scene where they talk to each other and have their perspectives and they chat about. Oh, have you heard about this elf? Yeah, they're sending five ships. Oh my gosh, that's so many. Where are they going to put all the horses? I don't know. We could pack those things like fucking sardines, but I just and then they talk about that for a while or something. There's got to be. I I don't know who these people are. I've got all. I've got six hours of content, and I barely know who anyone is. I thought of another way they could do it: a giant net behind the ships, and you throw all the horses into it, and you just drag them across the sea. <laughs> and you hope they can, you hope they can breathe underwater. Oh, you give them little good. snorkelers; they'll be fine. Those special ones. I'll just strap them to the sides of the boat as armor, actual <laughs> horse armor. Horse armor, yeah. Uh, so, oh yeah, this. So, Halbrad, he's got his forging crest, mm -hmm. Smith now. Like, yeah, he's a smith now, which I'm sure everyone else in the guild is thrilled with. How did it, like how much time has passed? So that's the first thing I was was gonna try and grab. But how, do Who we knows? have any idea? It could be, it could I be that it could be the third age by now. We don't we don't fucking know. Because <laughs> this is the thing about I just don't vibe with the timeline at all. So am I supposed to believe that when we followed the Harfords for that incredible journey, is that all of the world moving forward in time, or is that just them? As in, like, when we go to someone else, have we now moved forward two weeks? Is that what's happened with, with uh, Numenor? Is, is, did, does anyone have a line for it, that? It can't be, because, I'm um, again, skipping forwards, but they specifically say two days to get to that town, and only one day crap passes in the town, so they have to be different timelines. Right, they have to if be. If they want it to make sense. God, it's so confusing. Um... But, like, so, basically, I, I would hope that a decent amount of time has passed to account for all of the things, including, but not limited to, he had to actually complete, the presumably, the course for getting this crest and earning um, it. He had to... No, I think oh, no, it's, it's, revealed, it. it's revealed later that he was given yeah. it because he shopped Galad not Galadriel to the Queen, which is how the Queen knew what? that Galadriel was going to visit her dad. Mm -hmm. I uh, that's, that's what they tell me, so that's but, what So the Queen with. said, alright, so all of these guys that you assaulted and injured and everything and then stole from them, it, well, I'll make you a part of their group. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, a good like, Queen. Sorry, so he, so he got the crest for an unrelated to forging thing that he did. It was yeah. in um, it was in the prison sequence when not Galadriel somehow manages to get four guards into the cell behind her <laughs> like one, yeah. in one go, and then you see I think I think you see Farazon falls against not Sauron's or definitely Sauron's prison door, and then they have a little whispered conversation when he tells her that he knows where she's going. And so, in between episodes, that's what justifies the giving of uh, to him of. Uh, the but, guild crest. I they guess. Don't, yeah, Galadriel, Galadriel brings it up when she confronts him, like uh, when they're talking with the queen. And the queen leaves. She says, "You know, ah, oh, that's what I was wondering. How the queen waylaid me in her bedchambers, um, implying that ah, it was it was Sauron. I well, mean, not Sauron. Is, who told <laughs> that worked out incredibly sense, well for Galadriel. In in fact, it worked out better that way than it would have otherwise because the queen. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she would have known anyway. She got thrown the into the prison for hell. For demanding to see the father, so the moment she breaks out of prison, you think, well, she's yeah, going to go to see the father. But a guard so, on the father, yeah, that's true. It, it um, made... But not to mention, like, I'm just still a little bit baffled. Like, ah, you've completed an almost political favor for me, or a bit of security, cool. And he's like, I want a crest for forging. It's like, oh, you have to go complete the course for it. I don't, I can't just give that to you. It's fucking dangerous to just hand it. There's a reason why those crests exist. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, um, it, it, it's not the same kind of favor I would expect. This is very strange. Just, I could see her just being like, well, can you? Forge, then go in it. I can't imagine it would have taken that long, especially if he's I mean, that, that might be what this is, because he's like he makes a sword and then shows it to. Oh, he's already like, got it though. Owns the forge. Like yeah, he's... but maybe this allows them to train in the first place because they did say you're not allowed to forge at all. Yeah, maybe that. if I'm being really good faith, maybe I'll just say that she fast tracked him. He still did the course or whatever, something like that. 
nice. All right, show sure, be nice Defin to you. Because I'm gonna be mean I to guess. you later. I guess he would imagine that this sort of thing would take years and years. And Maybe years. I have no clue because they didn't tell us anything, and he decided mm -hmm. to fucking try and uh, like steal it b before trying to earn it, even though he intended to stay here for the rest of his life at one point. He's yeah. not. He's <laughs> not a bright lad. Wait, which one? Which character is not bright? Sorry, which one? Oh my god, you're right. I should have been more specific. As <laughs> referring to in this instance. I mean, whole whole brand. Whole but, uh, brand yeah, is not bright. As he's a, either not bright or he's the brightest person in the world and he's just playing dumb. All of this just, will lead to his victory, okay? So. Man, I'm just annoyed at how quickly he made that sword. It went from him quenching it to now it's fully polished, it's got inlaid gold and everything. I'm like, no, this was a montage. It took weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, no, this took have. years. This has taken decades. It took decades. Centuries. Mm -hmm. What's after the century? Millennia. Millennia. It's a big jump. This guy's still alive because he's, he's a hearty Numenorean. All of them are. That's real long. It took. The rest of the world is many, dust at this point. Many, many Ds. So, uh, yeah, as Rags highlighted, I just want to make sure we've mentioned again that um, you'd think that there would be huge pushback from not only the guild members, but also just, I don't know, guild leaders to be like, he fucking broke that guy's arm. Uh, hey, he came yeah. here. We took care of him. He assaulted people, stole from him, is in cahoots with that elf. We, we don't hate like elves him. here. They steal our jobs, so we don't want anything to we do with this like guy. don't like elves. <laughs> Yeah, they and steal this guy our jobs. Is stealing someone's job at this point. Yeah, the dude, the, the dude with the broken arm is not forging right now. He is healing that thing. He's fucking furious. That's going to ruin his career to an extent. Like, surely and it would, right? Place, a broken arm would yeah. fuck your ability to forge for a decent amount of time. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I, I've only got one. I got to use the little hammer now. This sucks. Exactly. I got to jerk off. Well. <laughs> Poor Smith. No, they designed something for that, Rags. The Smiths. <laughs> the, 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 the forge. The, the Smiths of Numenor. <laughs> the, <laughs> oh, yeah. Elvish Good secrets. for him. How wonderful. And, uh. Uh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, fuck, so you've got know. visitors, and then they take him to visit somebody. <laughs> I know, I know. Someone's here to visit you, but we're taking you to visit them. It's like, all right. <laughs> This reminds me. I will never stop mentioning it. It's one of the best moments in fucking TV show history when Vader takes all that effort to turn up to Obi Wan to say, "You've come to destroy me." <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Fucking Instant brilliant. Try, instantly gets off the shuttle, tries to gaslight Kenobi, and thinking this is all his fault. That's what we call like an instant classic line. It's just like, "Thank you." Thank you for you having me. You turned you against me. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Holbrand is, is taken to the Queen and Galadriel for talking about, like, plans and stuff. And, um, I guess he, they ask him, hey, where are the orcs going? And he says, uh, toward the Watchtower of Osterith. And it's like, how does he have any clue? It could be anything, right? They right. Be... And, that, and even then, that information would be months old. It's like, oh, okay, so the tower's destroyed then, if it, like, you know. Yeah, that's, a, mm -hmm. you're right, actually. He should assume they've done that already. Yep. Yeah. So unless he knew something about that tower specifically, like why they, he knows don't... exactly the timeline because figured it all out. Well, a... oh, then again, yeah. If he's Sauron, he would know the timeline exactly. But then again, yeah, I would have thought that it would be subject to pretty significant change when he's not there for that long. You know, anything could happen, right? Isn't it determined by how also, long it takes to dig the trench, and that's determined by how many people they capture and keep alive? So. And also, if if, you, if the only way he could know the timeline is by being Sauron, the one thing he wouldn't do is reveal to everybody else that he knows the timeline. That's because... actually true. This is the part that I don't understand. I feel like this show is going to absolutely collapse if they really do reveal this guy was Sauron the whole time, as opposed to Sauron possesses him at the end or something? I don't know. What, what they're honestly doing, I feel, is that Sauron at this point in time is legitimately on potential redemption arc. He's actually wanting to mm. put away all the evil is done, and he's not actually up to date with the plan of Adar or anything. Um, which is okay. stupid beyond belief, but that's what uh, I think they're doing. I'll be curious about that change that. of character then. <laughs> I think he's he's doing he's doing a Sheev Palpatine and Galadriel is his Anakin, so he is already evil and he's trying to turn her over to his side. See, I think if you're yeah, right on that, saying, there's going to be a lot of questionable decisions throughout this whole season, if that's true. Yeah, but, but, but that scene saying, with him in Glendru where he there. says, yeah, he's like, I never wanted to go back and, you know, and all that crap. And the scene in this episode, oh, I But feel... then he says, I do. And that's what happens for this episode. Uh, yeah. Well, look, yeah, they contradict <laughs> well, everything, so. 
only after she came and manipulated him into it. He, he's yeah. he's going back for her, but his own personal wishes to stay. There. And he talks about, I've only wanted to stay here to find peace. I just don't want to go back. You're luring me back into a life that I wanted to leave behind. So everything he's saying is, I don't want to do this. And she keeps coming back and basically emotionally blackmailing him into going against his own will. So well, that's one of the problems with this, mm -hmm. the dialogue in this show. There is no, there's never any ounce of pragmatism from anyone. It's all just, oh, the signs, oh, I had a vision, or oh, the, your emotions and your feelings, and oh, because mm -hmm. I can't stop. And I, it, 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 shut up, stop. <laughs> Does anyone <laughs> do something quit. intelligent quit. instead of, quit. let's quit. give ourselves up to the orcs? That's a good idea. <laughs> no, and then I, they just uh, do it. And it's like, what, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Uh, seriously, we'll get there in that scene, but when Gladriel says her reason for keeping fighting is because she just can't stop. It's I like, can't Whoa! stop. Are like, you right. kidding me? Yeah. Like, this, that doesn't change anything for me. Like, all of your, all these appeals to emotion, and uh, it's it's like, it's, 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 no, you have to give me a reason. I, yeah. This is a big decision for me. And even you know, though in the end, I, I fucking, I don't know, I guess I want to be king for, I, now, I guess, because of these appeals. I don't see the connection between mm. these admit, dots don't have any lines between mm. them that have been connected. Back in the day when people were being overly emotional, not seeing reason, the go-to thing to do was just give them a good slap and just like, wake up! It's like, <laughs> yeah, pull yourself together, woman. They're like, oh shit, what? <laughs> oh, so it's always a woman. <laughs> if there are plenty of stupid men in the show. Will let go of you. I need um, to work on my... The, so, actually, the film Hail Caesar has like a guy do that, but he does it to like he does it to a woman at the beginning, but then there's another guy's being unreasonable. He just slaps the guy. It's like wake up. <laughs> it's <laughs> like that scene from Airplane, where it's just a line of people ready to slap him. Yeah. <laughs> now uh, the, we need to bring that practice back for the characters in this show. There are so many people need a good logic slap. Everyone just. I just, you need someone who has this basic intelligence, who understands cause and effect, and he just needs to <laughs> grab him by the, the shirt and just slap him. No, damn it. <laughs> Reasons. Think. Use your brain. Use your brain. So on the topic of really shitty dialogue, uh, this is something that I'm, uh, we've pointed out too many times, myself, Rags, and Franny, to not feel like this is, this is becoming a very real thing. You know, like, really shitty choreography can be an indication that the writing may be bad, too, or really shitty armor work, you might be like, because if they didn't care about that, maybe they didn't... Not necessarily true, but it can be sometimes, but there's this Could thing... Be. There's this From the raises thing... Brow. There's this thing that's, like, not necessarily connected at all to whether or not something is well-written in, in terms of how dialogue goes, and it's just been really interesting to notice. Feels to me, the shows that land on the good side versus the bad side, when it comes to dialogue, will have characters just noticing each other and what they're saying versus not noticing each other at all and what they're saying. Now, yep. in this show, they've done it plenty of times already, but this scene has a really fucking big example where uh, the queen is like, so, you, big man over here, uh -huh. you're going to be... You're going to be leading all of your men, your yeah. humans, into a big old fun kingdom. You're going to be king, right? And he goes, uh, hmm, you know, I said, wait, what, what, what have you been doing? She's like, wait a minute. You, you, did just, are you... you did just let me in the guild yesterday. Um, yeah. And so she's like, wait a minute. Are you, are you like, are you like a bit flea me right now? And then Galadriel's like, oh, uh, my companion is totally fine, actually. He just, uh, he's, he's, he's fine. And the Queen Regent's like, well, okay, I hope you are ready. He's by just the time. a little nervous. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's not how humans mind. work, just at all. Yeah. And I, was, I was saying to Rice, right. if we were in a call right now, and uh, Lil Batoon is like, yeah, Fringy hates wait, 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 Mario wait, and Sonic, wait, okay? We are wait, in what? a call right now. We are in a call. So it right shouldn't now. be too hard for you to imagine then, Rex. Keep up. Jesus. <laughs> so Lil Batoon okay. is like, Mario and Sonic, Fringy hates it. Absolutely fucking outright hates it. And I'm just like, that doesn't match at all with anything. Fringy, do you actually hate it? And then you go, uh, <laughs> uh, and then Lil Batoon's like, no, he does. And then I go, oh, okay then. Oh, okay. Well, that settles that. Like, the, nobody talks Next this scene. way ever. Nobody. I don't know why shows keep doing this. It's like to, to be like, oh, look at that conflict that we can't yet resolve. And it's like, no, it would be resolved right now. This is incredibly important. This is a, if you're going to be rescuing. Sending hundreds of men across the ocean to a foreign yeah, part, land part as of a liberating army installing, on the of an elf. Installing their king. That's like a big element to encourage everybody that this is a really important move and stuff. Um, I think, uh, the simplest way to like, in the case of the queen, it's like, okay, so do you believe her? 
or do you not and you don't care? Because it's one of those two. Like, and and she'd just... be retarded on either one because she'll be retarded to believe Galadriel here, and it's so obvious well, that Albrecht doesn't yeah, want to do it. It's um, it's it's disastrous either way. Either she's an idiot, yeah. or she actually doesn't care about this, which is completely contrary to everything that's been established about her up to this point. This conversation is not over, but like they felt like it was over. They didn't want to deal with it anymore. They had the drama that they wanted to relegate to the lighter half of the episode. So, like, the conversation oh. <laughs> just ends before it even began. And also, just think about what Galadriel is doing here. She is taking away this guy's freedom completely. It's like, look, he's going to do what I say no matter what. She's a freaking cow. I hate her so much. Oh. Do you think the old queen regent would be doubly sceptical and doubly on the ball, if you can be doubly on the ball, because uh, these, pe these are the people that she's just let out of prison yesterday? Uh, she she is pin she's hinging her entire plan on people that she had imprisoned who broke out of prison and then did exa exactly the thing they were imprisoned to do. To Here, there's another. There's more evidence yet now that you you can't trust what they're doing and what they're saying because they're they're clearly being shifty and there's something going on. Would you, as as has been said, would you as the queen say, ah, eh, fuck, I'm just going to accept that. That's all good. Sure, surely that would make you exceptionally doubtful if you weren't already, which you should have been. In the Queen's defense, the symbol did vaguely look like mountains from somewhere. So oh, there we are. I guess I think um, that tips the it, scales quite a bit. It's it's a little bit lame because I mean I don't really expect much from this show, but in a better show, you got three characters here who all have different objectives that they want to achieve. Uh, and there's some unresolved issue. This is like a really good opportunity for like an interesting scene with a bunch of dialogue laden with subtext of like these three people kind of trying to it, like essentially all of them trying to push for whatever goal they have with the queen being like, well, I want to actually, you know, like achieve some sort of broader political objective here. Um, Galadriel just wanting to go off and do her battle to like so resolve her own personal issues. Uh, and then dude, <laughs> keep forgetting his name. Um, Sarah. Not being particularly interested, yeah, I guess we, yeah. <laughs> not at least as far as we can tell, not being particularly interested in doing it, but maybe being careful to not throw everything off. Like maybe he's kind of dials back like his apprehensions to make sure that he's still got a foot in the door. It's an opportunity, but like these opportunities keep getting um, they they just keep they they keep letting them slip away uh, because they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> it's, it's, it, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, kind of crazy, honestly. So the, the the part of the reason I was bringing up that uh, comparison, by the way, is just because of the the counter example, which uh, rewatching a little bit a bit of House of the D, because I'm showing Mister Mister Rags it now. Gonna gonna get him, try and get him caught up eventually, possibly. See what he thinks of it. Could be interesting. This that way the other. Who knows? In episode two, it was Man. it was shocking. It was unreal because I had almost forgotten it, but I remembered. Oh yeah, as it was happening, and it's just that opposite direction. So. One of the characters says, "How do you how do you feel about Situation X?" And the other character replies, "How uh, the situation's happening for very specific reasons for someone else's motivation." And then the it goes back to the other character who says, "I didn't ask you that. I asked you how you felt." And it was like, "Whoa! <gasps> you listened to what they said." They did and that in Andor they, too. They ignored I your question, it. and then you addressed the actual question. Wait, it's just wait. you gotta you gotta answer my question because, here. That's why I asked. Ever. There's there's nothing wrong with a character being evasive. Indeed, yes. that's, uh, that can be really useful in terms of characterizing somebody or setting the tone of a scene. But it's also important that other characters, you know, sort of recognize these attempts to... I, I mean, sometimes they don't have to, but I mean, a lot of the time they should. I, I, I guess it, you would imagine that when the writer is coming to write this scene, they have a pretty clear understanding that like each of these three characters has some objective that they're after. And what should be informing their dialogue, like for all of them, is how do I best achieve that objective? But like, that's not the point of the scene. The scene has an objective, which is to essentially establish that there's drama, but not resolve it yet because they want to do it later. Yeah. Problem is that that scene just can't play out the way that they want it to. I think that's a problem. With, I mean, yeah, I guess that's one of many explanations for why the dialogue is so broken in the show is because there is an objective for the scene. And, like, whatever that objective is, we don't care at all what the characters in that scene actually would want to achieve with these conversations. Um, they're entirely sure. secondary. I'm not sure Muriel even has an objective in this scene. 
like the only reason she's going abroad is a tree told me so because of uh, fell. Yeah, that's, that, that's literally that's her only true. motivation. Well, I would agree mm. that the motivation is shallow, but even even if that exists, it's like uh, you got to use it. You know, you got to like you got to do it's something some... with that. The problem it's to me what is what annoys just, me. It's it... tied as well. It's not just the petals. I mean, it is tied to the vision from the Silmaril, and then of course you have the prophecy, which hasn't really been very well explained. No, in the, show. the prophecy it's is not anything about be, it's. The prophecy is supposed to be that um, by turning away from the Valar and by extension by turning away from the elves, then you're inviting Numenor's destruction. And so, having seen the vision of destruction, uh, what they are doing is going to try and hopefully, in in her mind, uh, rekindle the love of the Valar and save Numenor. So they're going to try and save the life of their city. And the petals is kind of like their their inspiration to go, or the instigating factor. Um, that I think I think the show has tried to say that. I don't think that that's a purely lore derived thing. It's just that it's I, I don't know that I would have necessarily understood any of that had I had not already read the book. Uh, I, really I, don't think it's, I don't think that's what the show is saying. There's, there's, like she knows the island's going to be destroyed, but she doesn't know why or what's going to cause it. So at first she tries to stay because she thinks that will prevent the disaster. No, and she then... tries to send Galadriel away, right? Yeah. Yes. yes, like she, right, yeah. she thinks if I go over there, it may like backfire on me and cause the disaster. So at first, her plan is to just get rid of everything, and that'll keep us safe. And then when the tree petals fall, she's like, "Okay, we that's that's a sign that I'm doing the wrong thing. So I've got to do the opposite of that." But I don't think she knows anything about following the elves or. Uh, yeah, the sign well, no, is so. There's a, a lot from the elvish question. I mean, given oh, the gradual presence, I think that there's a larger context here because we know Numenor will be destroyed. Like, like we we know the larger story. They're not going to break that canon. I wouldn't think they would. No. And so <laughs> the, by the petals, because uh, the instigating incident for me, which is what causes Numenor's downfall, is the queen leaving and letting Al Ferrazon then get all his evil things in the, and control the government and stuff. But she's leaving because the petal is telling this, oh, it's important that you leave. So it's actually the petals. It's like the greater god of this universe telling <laughs> que the queen to leave, which is <laughs> causing the destruction of Numenor. Dude. Hey, we all yeah. just... It's all poorly explained, ambiguous, like prophecy, fate, destiny, God, religion stuff. Mm. And it seems like every decision is based around this very poorly explained element of the universe. And there's in it. And I just I'm like, I don't know what why you're anyone's doing what anyone's doing. Just the, these vagaries of supernatural things. and I, I can't follow this. There, there's no connecting lines for me. To follow oh, yeah, as an um, audience member the leaves I, dropping when galadriel's leaving she's like oh so we're supposed to fight the war in middle earth then it's like whoa 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 that could mean many things if you're taking it yeah. literally that the leaves dropping is the god of your place saying no it could just mean keep galadriel here it could be that here or do we send her with troops or like do i need to go do exactly to... like like i have a whole kingdom if... run i have what no if the leaves <laughs> What if the petals meant that she's doing the right thing and she was doing such a right thing that, that like, you know, all the petals is like, yes, you're doing it. <laughs> you're doing so no, good. No, no, no. <laughs> you're getting the wrong impression. Don't tell you. Oh, damn it. It's like, it's like oh, I'm just trying to give signs and they just miss. Yeah, the, there's only so just, many times the tree can say no. To me? You know? just show up and tell me what to do instead of giving me these vague guide direction things with tree flowers. Hey, it's a god, like, okay. What do you need to do? <laughs> See, I think god. Just come down and can... tell me what to fucking do. You can do that sort of as a narrative device. There is, um, I don't remember where it's from. There is an old sort of parable example of um, there's a man and he lives, he lives in a city and he gets his fortune told. And the fortune tells him that he will die in the city that night. And so, of course, he gets scared shitless and he runs away to his brother's oh, house in the time. next city where he is then killed because the city was not specified. So, like, the idea that you can't escape fate, but that you're only able to judge your or prejudge your fate by the available information, you can therefore be surprised, is something you can do. It's a legitimate dramatic thing, but you have to earn the audience's right. patience and understanding for the payoff then to be worthwhile. Otherwise, it just seems irrational to be making these Yeah, because I was going to say that in, in your example, that he's avoiding a city and ends up in a city, that's, that's something. But this is the, the petals left when Galadriel was leaving on a boat. So that means we must go to war. It's like, wow, that's a jump. Like, we... Yeah, because I, yeah, I, no, I agree with that. Here, here. I, I think the vagueness in this is deliberate. I think it's part of their whole mystery box thing that, oh, we'll just draw them in because nobody's quite understanding what's going on. And it also has a side benefit of a lot of people will think it's deep. 
simply because they don't comprehend what it is. So they think yes. there must be something more there yeah. that you just can't comprehend yet. But if you keep going, you'll definitely find out this really complex plot will reveal itself. And then you've got the other side where uh, people will use that and their knowledge of the books to explain things that may not even be in the show. But like, no, you just don't understand. If you take this bit from this book, then... And so you, you create this little army of people that will defend the show for things that it hasn't earned or doesn't deserve and probably yeah. will never happen. You're absolutely right. This vagueness is smoke and mirrors that idiots use to try and feign, you know, greater intelligence and wisdom in when they lack the capacity to achieve it naturally. It's really frustrating. It's being invited by the show as well because it does keep throwing in mentions of things like the Valar. And there's a few names in this mm. episode. I think it mentions Aule, for example, some of the Valar, which, well, they're only understandable if you've read the books. And so they sort of appeal to people who have and say, yeah. ah, so this is all part of the grand design, isn't it? Um, even though the, the, the entire design has been uprooted and shifted around and the timeline's been fucked and actually there's no guide you can take from that anymore because they can change any of the canon they, they choose to. Mm. Um, so th they are inviting that kind of sympathy from a, a certain sort of class of the audience. Uh, it's sort of dishonest and, and a bit shameless, but they are trying. And I gather for a couple of people, at least they are succeeding. So separate to the conversation we're having, there's another thing that bothers me here with the queen and what she does. From an outside observer, she, all these people distrust elves. Oh, that's an elf me. arrives. <laughs> an elf arrives, right? And she's like, no, we won't do anything for the elf. We distrust you. Then the elf sneaks into her bedroom, and now she's committing an entire army to the elf's cause. <laughs> I'd be thinking, holy crap, this elf just, like, mind controlled our queen and the government is completely subverted what the hell is going on uh, but no one reacts with any logic about what's happening they're just like oh we're going to war yes let's do it we're all we good i mean we, we had mentioned it Muller and i when we watched these when the soldiers are leaving the city i'm like man like do you do you do you all know why you're going yeah <laughs> <laughs> do, do any of you know why you're doing? I almost this? hope why they any don't. Of this is happening because of how depressing if they do. Well, I I assume that they don't. I don't know what they would say. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. How do you how do you justify this? It's absolute nonsense. I think we hear like passing comments in some scenes that are like we're going on the word of a stinky elf and her stinky human. Like what what the, what the fuck? And it's like oh, that guy's right. Mm. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good that's objection. It's like. Scene, <laughs> and so you've got Arf, Arf Arazan, who's going to be this this incredibly integral character and has been portrayed in the show until this point as much more the voice of the people than the Queen is. And you do see him at some point in the show going through a crowd of people who are very angry at the fact that they're going to war. The missing scene is him addressing those people. It's like, what does the demagogue do when he's lost the people who, he's, who support him? How does he win them back around? How does he get public support? Which then explains why the people are so willing to go to war when you see the soldiers actually leave. And it fills out his character if you do that. It fills out the politics of the world as you do that. It fills out Numenor's place in the world if you do that. And it's it wouldn't have taken more than one scene to do that, but they don't do that. And they skip it, and difficult. it's so weird. I mean, they had they had the scene when the the, the chick and the guy were talking, and it was like, oh, don't go to war about all these people complaining about them going to war. And then when they leave, the entire city is cheering, and everyone's on board. I'm like, hang, what happened to the people that were objecting? That, that that's a reasonable objection. But no, now, I don't even know why these people are cheering. Yeah, no, it's bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> They were paid. <laughs> That's the only way to explain. Yeah. I mean, Farazan paid them. He's like, oh, I'll just cheer it, cheer or something. I don't know. We'll get another trade partner. That's cool. So, in conclusion, with this line, given that I've staked my name upon it, I should hope so. In reference to him leading men in, in as a king once they get there, seems to me that she wouldn't even bother being like, oh, he will. Cool. When when it's suggested in this moment that he absolutely will not, she is queen regent. Should be like, wait. Are you fucking serious? I've been told this whole time you're 100% on board. Are you telling me you're not? You wouldn't go, hmm, and then Gladwell go, I no, he an is, army he and is. everything. He totally like, is. We got it's ships ready. Like, it's not even like, you have doubts, even. Like, even if you got a doubt, man, yeah. I'm committing a lot to, like, help here. Exactly, <laughs> this is why I, I hate it. She's the, the, the often not in character, the dialogue never goes the way it probably should, judging from what people... Because that's the thing, you have plenty of room with dialogue, you don't have to have, like, one line in particular out of all lines possible. I just, I just hate it when they, they just give up. There's a part in this episode yeah. later where two questions are asked and they're completely ignored, and and I'm so tired of it when they really like, they're questions that both the characters very much want the answers to. Um, 
But like it's it's the way of the writers like avoiding concluding that that a uh, drama at this at this point they don't want to do it just yet. Yeah, because they're not ready to do it yet. So we can carry on <laughs> from this scene. <laughs> Uh, at least I think. Yeah, he, he fucking slaps down his, um, his little thing to symbolize that, like, he's the the king or whatever. If I were Gladriel, I'd be like, Jesus fucking Christ, if the queen sees this, oh, like, god, she's oh gonna god, be oh pissed. Oh god, oh god, <laughs> This is all going wrong. Maybe I could just dress up some random elf guy as a whole brand and be like, no, this is him, it's fine, we gonna we got the king, it's all good, we're going. And that, that is the only thing that links him to being that king. He's yes. got a pouch that... He says himself he, he took stole. off a dead man. <laughs> and they're like, oh no, you're definitely the king. It's ridiculous. No, and it no, is he... insane that the assumption Gladwell's doing here. Uh, I, I can't I couldn't believe it. It's like holy crap. She assumes rightly so, though, that this universe will bend itself towards her will, regardless of yeah. how much sense it does or doesn't make. And so it seems to be in character. Yeah, you are so right, about, by the way, about the whole never occurred to me you'd hand me over for a guild crest. It's kind of funny because if that scene with Farazon, he doesn't say, if you give me a guild crest, I'll tell you where she go where she's going. He just says, he just tells Farazon. Yeah. So it's just like, was he then later like, hey, you know, I helped out with that. Can I have a guild crest now? I could see Farazon be like, no. No, I don't. I literally <laughs> don't. I I can't just make you a guild. Why I'm not even, would you even? Yeah, I'm not even remotely to connected to any. Why would you? No, bye, prisoner. Do you know how bad that would make me look if I gave you a guild crest, you crazy person. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, it just doesn't even seem to make sense. And like, even from Galadriel's perspective, she's like, "Wow, did you crack that deal in the seconds you spoke to Farazon? <laughs> like, that was quick." But it's like, no, actually, I'm a but, very yeah. quick deal maker. Uh, I'm in the deal guild. Yeah, and so he's like, you've used me. And then she went, I've convinced them to send armies to save your people. You manipulated me, really. <laughs> oh, that friggin' line! What a... Actually, she's actually, she's downright you know abusive uh, in how she, she speaks is. to people. Fucking cunt. He's, he's like explicit in how much he doesn't want any of this, and she's like, I've gotten all this I, for you, you're using me! It's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't like, I'm taking you away your freedom. King. But yeah, I'm taking away your freedom, but because the prison I'm putting you in has cushy, like, nice cushions, you should be thanking me for doing it for you. It's like, holy crap! This is a slave master telling a slave they should be grateful. I couldn't believe it. I was like, yeah. you cow. She's just so staggeringly unlikable in every way. Mm hmm They really fucked this up, because it's not just one scene, two scenes, three scenes, it's every single one. It's she unbelievable. She is just a turbo cunt. And, yeah, when the, the and when they're shouting this shit at each other about how much they don't get on, how much he has to be convinced to move out of the fucking Smith's stable or whatever, like they, you got the the queen could be around the corner. She just she she could have just been there, like, wow. So this is way worse than you guys let on, huh? Like this well, presumably the guards are still waiting for him to escort them out. Oh, they they would never tell anyone anything. Okay, they keep it to themselves. <laughs> I'm sure. Certainly not loyal to the queen. No, yeah, because they're listening to the future king of man in in the Southlands or whatever. Just say like, I don't want anything to do with this shit. Fuck this. And it's just like, wow, that's that's awkward. That's fine though. We'll just keep it to ourselves. No worries. And don't worry, little but, platoon uh, will be back momentarily. And uh, just and just so we like the when you know Rags was saying that she's so unlikable. It, I ca I can't believe how truly unlikable it made her. Like think of that line in episode three where she's like, "Who is this mortal who speaks to me as if uh. he has the slightest idea of who I am?" I couldn't believe it. Like <laughs> and, it, and it just keep going. Yeah, and then this this is like I'm taking you free to be grateful. It's like you friggin'. It's like, and you, do you know that like the polar opposite of that is when you have someone like Yoda, who's considered the greatest Jedi of all time, sort of thing, and he's pretending to be a fucking idiot in front of Luke, and when Luke is actually aware of it, Yoda's like, "Yeah, I'm pretty awesome actually, but that's okay. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. You can talk to me however you want." That sort of vibe where you're like, "Oh man, this guy's kind of cool," versus the one who's like, "Stop talking to me like a normal person. I'm better than you." It's like. Oh. I think you're. I think it's just pretty standard, right? Everybody's generally going to take a liking to these cool, humble characters who are much more competent, intelligent than they let on, versus characters who have to constantly declare how great they are. It. It also. It's like you could only behave this way and get away with it if you knew that the person had no other choice but to do what you were saying. Because otherwise, like you don't need them to like you. You don't need them to agree with you. They will just do it because of who you are. So. Apart from the fact that she's read the script and knows they're going to make that decision, you couldn't act like this to anyone because you would just immediately put them off what you're trying to do. Because she's not clever. She's got nothing on him. 
she just assumes he's going to do it and so she can treat him however she wants and however crap she wants to treat him like because he's basically dominant well, she's the him. protagonist she is the protagonist so she knows that well, everybody's going to bend to her whim <laughs> which is but again she sh this she's a person in a world filled with people who, with their own goals yeah, but... uh, like seriously, this is the type of character who you would have built up as the villain to make the audience just crave to see them defeated. Because that's what I want. I want to see Galadriel just get what's coming to her and humbled and uh, defeated in some way. And uh, I, I, that's not what you want for your protagonist. You don't want me rooting for her destruction. The destruction. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish everything gets in her way. And hey, they yeah. they did kill her in the, la I mean, the latest episode. So seriously, cool. yep. I, know, I cheered when that pyroclastic <laughs> cloud hit her. I was like, all right, I'm good. Rings of Power is done. Uh, and that's my head cannon. Everyone saved. died. Yeah, that's the credits so rolled after served. it. It's a six that's episode good ending. <laughs> six episode se a series in total. This was a weird adaptation, but fine. You know, it's whatever. It's done. She's dead now. She had a good run. <laughs> Quote, unquote. How are they going to explain why everybody survived that? I'm sure they will. They're just yeah. going to have them survive. She's going to be walking yeah. like, you know, covered in Cheeto dust and oh, she'll like be like, fire. Like, it's not <laughs> hot or something. It's magic. Magic. It's cold fire. Just, cold smoke. You know, cold like, everything. There's a, there was electricity in it. Oh, it come on. We've all been there. System. It had its own weather systems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, oh. Well. Over to the Harvards, which once again, I was like, oh, God. Here we oh, go. we got yeah, some cannibals. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Keeping that in mind, right, because there's lots of memes that have been made from when we last talked about it. It's like, it really does come across that way. But keeping it all in mind with the fucking dialogue they give us this time around is surprising. We have our team who are like, moving their way through this forest. And it, logistically speaking, they are in the same forest as the other half a selection of people. They're actually quite close by now. Because they bump into one directly. And it's like, oh, okay. It looked like you yeah, guys were just... Yeah, they on the beach. Yeah, yeah. So, I just, uh, I thought they had no hope in hell of catching up, but they have. Uh, so good for them, I suppose. Now, we've got... It's yeah, so manpower. hard... power. so hard to remember the character names. They noticed there's uh, footprints for the, the wolf bear pig things. Uh, and how? Man like, bear the, pig. It's miles away from the road. I don't even They're know how to spot the pigs. footprints. And and you know this this oh, actually sorry. really pissed me off because they they spent a good moment in it was episode one showing that a wolf was watching them when they went to pick berries and everything and they do nothing with it and if they're trying to say that this is the follow up from that setup bullcrap piss off they are miles away from that first wolf there's no way that that wolf tracked them out on entire time no this is a new reintroduction that now they've they're yeah, running yeah. into wolves on their travel which means that scene in that first episode was completely friggin pointless they would Did tell nothing. you nothing they would tell you that was introducing the wolf the problem is this introduces the wolf so it does exactly the this again. is the introduction oh so, yeah i agree uh, what's the point of all of that if you were just going to do it again uh and as you said, like, it's not like it was the same fucking wolf or anything. Like, it's like, he's back. Jeremiah the wolf. Go get you. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was... just shows the incompetence of the creators of this show. Oh. And I think, uh, Rags, did you say um, the, the, the way they shoot this is like, they all just, they just walk toward the footprints directly as though they've been told to go there instead of, like, it's very yeah, unlikely you would have noticed it. They're on the road. They're walking around, and then we just see Nori and Fat just arrive there. They're just at the footprints now, looking down. Oh no! Yeah. They're like, yeah. how did you even all know the way over that? Yeah, over you got the here? road you there. Just teleported here. So there's no reason for them to walk all the way over here and find these, but the the, the show is just like, no, they did. And you're like, oh, okay. They even walked that... past a set of footprints which are closer. I only just <laughs> noticed that as it scrolled down. It's actually true, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, okay. Well, you know, be scared, wolves. Then. And we get the next bit, which uh, was, I was so fucking shocked that they did this. This is just doubling down. Basically, Lady Henry's like, oh, being told by this lady, I don't even know who this is, his wife maybe, something, I don't know. But she, she's like, oh, not a good harvest right now. Must be because of that tall guy they have. And he's like, I don't know, I don't know. what do you want me to do about it? And then she's like, we should have taken their wheels and left them. <laughs> It's like, yeah, oh, Jesus like, oh, Christ. I don't know, like, like oh from God. all the implication that these guys are psychopaths, they really wanted to confirm it in this episode. Yeah. It's, it's not Sabotage their cart to leave them to die in the wilderness. 
<laughs> what is wrong with you? Why would anybody continue to oh, live Especially in this if they're band? keeping up. Like you're just hey, yeah. evil. You're I don't know why evil. evil. Why do they bother giving us the also, shocked sorry. expression from Lenny <laughs> Henry if it's normal enough for her to suggest it? And on top of it, right, this isn't for an actual crime or anything. It's for eerie portents that they're reading in the, like, it's, ah, oh, we, we can't find food because they yeah. they got a person with them. And yeah, that's this... validation <laughs> enough for them to, like, kill people. There's fewer, birds in, there's fewer birds in the woods today. Must be his fault. Kill him. <laughs> I, I'm really, I can't think of another show that's done more damage to one of its groups of characters in so short a space of time. Remember... Because we've had like maybe 20 minutes of screen time during which the not hobbits have gone from kind of charming, kind of lovable, just vaguely irritating Irish gypsies to, oh, actually they abandon their sick to, oh, actually they kneecap people they don't like and leave them to wolves <laughs> because the yeah. woods scared them. Just... I think they were... I, I think, think they um, were meant to be comedy relief because you had that whole chair rolling down the hill and it was yeah. very yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 70s kind of comedy kind of stuff. And then we've got the... And in the, in the very next scene, as it's just pure evil, she's actually talking to the people that she said, yeah, I think we should go and kill him, as if she's their friend. As if, oh, no, just tell me what's going on. She's so two-faced. It is. I mean, I mean we are. The, the last episode, we were sort of joking about the cannibalism thing, but actually on the current trajectory, exactly. they will be eating each other before the end of the show. I think what makes them particularly contemptible is we keep saying, oh, they're going to kill them. It's like, it's kind of like, they don't even, they're just going to leave them to die. They're going to sabotage them and leave them in the woods to die. Like, they don't even, that's, that is that's the, the kind of group that they are, you know? Like, they yeah, that is the most the accurate interpretation. Them. It was a meme interpretation to say that they would eat them, but we're getting there. <laughs> it's just like, how are we getting there? That's insane. And, uh... It's crazy as well because like these kinds of like this this little like group of people it's very reminiscent of the, the, you would expect them to be the most welcoming the most friendly and chill the most wholesome like oh there's this guy oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. but they're like the most evil they as we were saying the orcs are competing with them right now to become more evil yeah. it's insane I don't know how we got to this point and the other thing that I really don't get is that they all seemed incredibly sad that uh you know the they were gonna fall behind how sad that's that's really yeah. upsetting oh. By luck, the spaceman has actually made it so that they can catch up with us. Instead of celebrating that, even for a second, being like, oh, it's so good that they won't die now. They instead are like, we're not getting as much food as usual. We have to kill them. It's like, whoa, now. <laughs> like, what? And so what I'm trying to say is like, uh, if someone said like, oh, you're being absurd. This is just one person with one criticism. It's like, yeah, but what else have we had from the Harfoots in this episode? Nothing. It's just this lady saying something absolutely crazy that characterizes the Harfoots as just being these insane killers that's all you've given and us no one pushes no one pushes back he doesn't yeah, go he, don't be stupid we're never gonna do that yeah he just goes oh <gasps> that's it that's <laughs> it's like all I right mean, you're not supposed to say that out loud that's yeah that's probably what it is so let me ask you this who is a kinder leader sardok or adar well adar is about adar, a a adar mourns their dead and you know there is that Whereas but he sardok also burns somebody the dead. Yeah, Adar took yeah, on Sauron because of what was... he was doing to his people. Um, yeah, that, maybe he was burning cool him because he was like, "Don't guy. worry, this will callous over, and you'll have stronger skin for it." Trust me. Maybe, out, yeah. But... Plus, we're out of lotion. Adar has not yet advocated killing any of his orcs. For just well, yeah, if we're talking, which one is the better leader? Like overall, it's definitely Adar, but. Which one's like the more caring? It's like probably Adar, I think. Yeah, I'm also going yeah. for the guy who doesn't say, I don't like you today, so I'm going to kneecap you. <laughs> but it's not just kneecap, it's kneecap them <laughs> in a wolf infested forest. It's like they know that it's death. They, they, they are. Uh, yeah, they're definitely killing know, them. them to death. Yeah. yeah but I, think, I think we would all agree. Them to the wolves. If you needed like these wheels in order to save your own life and someone takes the wheels away from you, they are killing you, right? That's fair. Yes. Yeah. And then they will write your name down a book and then tell you for the rest of eternity, we will wait for you. We will tell lies about how you die. And laugh about why you die if it was in a comedic way. <laughs> and if, you, if you're an idiot, they'll be glad of it as well. So. He was a f yeah, we'll laugh at your horrific demise at the death of bees. Death by bees. <laughs> so funny. I've been killed from that. Oh. Yeah, especially if you're a harfoot and you're little, which may, means bees are like five oh, times right. the size they normally are. Oh, a swarm of them stinging you to death. Fuck me, that must be a <laughs> terrible way to die. They're, They're all so like, oh, 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 what an idiot. 
It's like thanks, guys. I mean, we wait for you. Yeah, we yeah, wait. Oh yeah, we wait for you. Sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's we're very sad. So, uh, yeah, the wolves start attacking. And everyone's panicking, and I, I was saying to Rise, we were watching it. I was like, so I guess they don't have like anything close to a warrior or a scoutsman, hunter, anything among them that could actually like fashion any kind of weapon, right? To the point where they don't, not even like cutlery, anything. Like none of them seem to have any access to any weapons. They are just prey. Like they're like bunny rabbits, basically. Seems kind of dumb. No sharp yeah. stick, no gardening tools, yeah, with, no. They anything. fear these they wolves. Have something. And they always have. They're considered like one of the top tier enemies. They always bump into. It's like make a spear. You'll thank me later. Okay. I mean, they punched yeah. entries in episode one to guard against the hunters, not obviously to fight the hunters off, but at it's least so they could tell everyone coming. they're about to die. Yeah, yeah, that's apparently that's it. <laughs> you just sell the horn, come out, lie down. It's your turn. It, you know, it makes me think of the film Willow with the uh, you know race of dwarves. They have warriors amongst them as well. Yep. Like, like they have a far more rounded civilization and balanced, like you know, society by orders of magnitude compared to these friggin' halfwits. As someone in chat just said, was like, oh, they have a strategy. They throw their weak at them and then run. <laughs> <laughs> I have to outrun you. Yeah. That's why they're That's one of the great. few. They're one of the few Shrugging. communities that are glad to have old and weak amongst them. It's it's like um, yeah. it's like when you have like it's like recharging shields over your health bar. You could just throw the weak and the elderly at your enemies <laughs> before it starts to hurt your actual health bar. Oh. They should have done that in this scene with the wolf chase. If you just like picked one of them up and lobbed her at the wolf, <laughs> they lobbed her and ran. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky for them, they're almost to the point of dying. It looks like Dory's about to try and break off like a branch to use it potentially as a spear, but uh, not gonna be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, I thought it was gonna be the cliche, you know, you hold it and the wolf jumps on it itself yeah. kind of scene. So I thought it was she saw the episodes where Black Elf was, he was just pulling things off trees and stabbing orcs with it. She's like, oh, I could do that. No, right. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure that was yeah. the, wasn't that the knife tree where he pulled a knife off the tree? Wasn't that, isn't that what that was? Because he it stabbed well, right through. Yeah, he, yeah, he pulled off a, a, it just grows knives. That's the <laughs> knife tree. Yeah. Knives are beautiful as a species. They hey, just grow in the wild. Guys, guys. Sticks are very powerful. He just the guy knew it. The elf yeah, knew the power of the well, stick. Well, so powerful she couldn't even break it off, and that cost her. Yeah, this I is. Like, I liked like how what? the uh, they were going to say, "Oh, we, well, the wolves are chasing us. We need to climb a tree to escape the wolves." And then they climb a tree, which is about one foot off the ground, <laughs> and yeah. just stand there in their defense for them. <laughs> that's like three feet to a harfoot. It's like a whole <laughs> like, mile so to high. them. Yeah, look, unfortunately, seriously, though, the wolves are twice as tall as they are to us. So really, they're still in the black. They're so, still in the red when it comes to <laughs> no, strategy. Nori, strategy. From this shot, right? Nori's at ground level. The woman that they were with, she is sitting down, like at ground level. <laughs> Accepted her but fate. On the tree. <laughs> she knows she's dead. She doesn't care. She's like, fuck it, whatever. It's fine. There's, there's plenty of tree to climb. They actually might be able to, you know, get to some level of safety in that tree, but it's just like, nah, it's fine. Yeah, they Maybe. start climbing. They have to be, they have to have a lot of, they had a, you'd have to have a head start in a really good tree. <laughs> this, I, I think I had said this scene reminded me of something from Ice Age, where you have the three critters, they, like, they finally get to them and they sort of stop together and they slowly all close in. Yeah. Uh, Ice Age, Ice Age was fun. I remember that being a fun movie. Yeah, yeah. Good times. So, what does Gandalf do? He turns up, and he's like, I'm gonna get you. And he ground pounds a famous move that from move. the character Mario that he has clearly copied. It's so fucking OP, the ground pound. You could just spam it, and it hits all the wolves. And it's like, ugh. Hey, he gets hurt, right? It. He gives his arm a little fleam, and he's like, ouchie. Small price oh, to yeah, pay. Yeah, he can't keep doing it, right? Him. But yeah, really lucky he was here at the time. Jeez, he could have been torn up. Lucky he wasn't off yeah. doing rambling while eating snails or whatever, you know? You were pretty close to just having a plot line. I know, I know. This show does this no a lot, close. where it's like, your your hated character could get eviscerated and there's no reason to follow this plot line anymore, but no, we you won't like, let it yeah. happen. Like Elfman, he nearly dies like ten times in this show, it's not fair. <laughs> I mean, I really what like him, he's an awesome insane. character. Wait, oh, his plot, I thought you meant his armor in general, and I was yeah. like... Yeah, no, <laughs> well, his armor's crap as well, but no, the Chad. plot armor is ridiculous. Chad, we're here. 
Made it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, context first. They are doing a little sparring stuff. And the first, I think you said it straight away, Rags. Like, wait a minute. Are they the, are they the actual swords? Are they, are they using their actual swords to spar? Like, careful, lads. You fucking... You might want to, you know, watch out and fucking kill each other. I think there's a couple of shows that do this, or even movies and stuff, where they... Do you remember when we watched uh, Troy and they had the wooden swords when they were practicing? And it's like, hey, see? Madness. You should. You you can only practice with a very, very sharp. The sharpest swords are reserved for practice because if you practice with very, very sharp swords, you will really do your best to not get hit. Now, um, I will not say only that. that, like, like, so I've done a, a full video breaking this down, and it takes an hour to try and cover <laughs> everything. So I'm not sure we'll, we'll see go how into we do. That <laughs> oh my goodness! But they're practicing in the middle of a street on steps, and it's like, what? One, they could injure <laughs> passerbys, and two, they don't have a barracks or anything to train in. Yeah, it's so stupid. Yeah, this. Th because it just looks like they just set up randomly, and there even maybe stalls nearby for like merchants. They're just like, "Oh, you do it, you doing this? Okay, that's that's great. I guess my fucking business for the day is shut down. That's fine. Just, uh, you do you guys." Yeah. And yeah, as you said, on the steps as well. Like, what a yeah. stupid way to add a variable where you're trying to teach them very specific <laughs> lessons. And there's people trying to get past. It's like, excuse me, I've got a shop over there. Just to move. Th All right, no, I'll wait. Fine, sure. Yeah, swing your swords around. Oh boy! It just yeah, happens so... to be next to Halbrand's forge as well. Just coincidentally, he's there at the sidelines. But funny enough, I, I think this is, we actually because yeah, I went through this episode on uh, on Friday Night Tights as well, so it's like, it's all very deja vu. But here we go again. <laughs> so it opens with his saying because he, Ellen deals like, oh, you could offer your assistance because you know everything and are really good and awesome and the best at everything. So you tell my men how to be better, please. And then she's like, all righty. There are many ways to kill an orc. <laughs> really? That is her Many opening, train opening in sentence the rain. from this genius of warfare. And <laughs> you're like, ways, <sighs> I thought that was only one. I'm glad you were there to tell me, Gladriel. Thanks. You know I mean? We need was a heckler that... in her audience to be like, whoa, <laughs> never thought of that. Wow. Was yeah, I the special was I the only magical person... ritual? Was I the only person that said outside, out loud when they were watching it, stab them? Like, I, th I was taking the piss <laughs> when she said that line, and I'm like, what's the best way to kill an orc? Stab him. <laughs> like, oh. And somehow, right, those two lines are very close to each other, but there's a little bit of cringe in the middle, too. Uh, oh, one, okay. one more line, which says, but for you guys, I'll keep it uh, strong and simple, did she say? Yeah. yeah. You are <laughs> yeah, so that... man, boys. <laughs> Translation, you're all retard, so i got to keep it really simple for you. <laughs> Yeah, tell also, us what are the advanced now's moves, a good Galadriel. Time to learn about killing orcs. This is the time, like right as we're about to step on the boats, essentially, yep. and go off on this weird war across the world. Now, I, I guess we might as well tell you about killing orcs or something. So, have these guys not had any fighting? Well, they evidently haven't, but should they not have had any fighting experience against anyone? Because it's not just orcs that you can kill by stabbing them and twisting. Like, that's pretty much yeah. most humanoid creatures. You'd think they'd have been training with that basically since they first held a sword, which no, apparently, according to the show, was five minutes think, ago. But... This island <laughs> doesn't seem to have a military. These are just people that volunteered to go out of. Yeah, like, these were traders and merchants them. and stuff a few seconds ago. The Numenorians, people. You know, the greatest warriors in all the world. The Numenorians. Look at how great they are. They have to be taught to stab. Ah. What is happening? <laughs> oh, it's so difficult to watch. Yeah, but as, as that is the first command she gives. But it's stab, twist, gut. It's basically the most, like, tier stab, one thing gut. you may think to do. I thought you do. were talking an orc, right, in the show? Stab, twist, gut? Yes, his name is... Or twist a good, good guy. He's, he's a good What's guy. What's funny about that? Like, that actually, by by the wording, gives us a location of the strike in the gut, oh. which is, means no, that's a slow wound. Like, to, a, a gut wound is a slow death. It wouldn't be an instant kill. It's it's actually well, one she, of the worst places to strike. Him. I think she means, like, to gut something. But, gut, like, but I don't know. Gut, like, if you, if, let's say that you have a sword, right? And it's sharp and pointy and wonderful. And you stab someone with it. Do you want to twist and gut, or do you want to just like pull it out and do that again? The thing, like, do you want to twi twist it? 
the twist and withdrawal of a sword wouldn't do, like, if you're thinking of gut, like, get, throw out all their entrails onto the ground, a stab wouldn't, and a twist wouldn't do that. You need a big slice right down room. their nape. Yeah. Exactly. You need, like, room you need to to a twist around. Open. Yeah, I, it, it's just all retarded. This wouldn't do what you're thinking you're, you're saying it would do. Mm. You're just stabbing them in the gut, and they wouldn't die. They'd still be... <laughs> By the way, Chad... Uh... So you'd, like, stab forward, and then pull back, and then stab again, and then just just fucking have it's a party, man. Just keep stabbing until it's dead. But it's, like, it's none worse than that because I've only just realized. I think this is meant to be like an Easter egg callback because that's how she kills the troll at the start when she's on stab, his head. Twist, she, yeah, stab, twist, gut, and then the blood flies at the camera. Hang I on. think this is meant to be a reference. And to she that. doesn't cut him, <laughs> and she keeps yeah, she stabbing him over and over and over again. She, yeah, she guts his jaw. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. 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 That's what kills him. Guts, guts in the his head. jaw. <laughs> She gets his, that's it's you have a guts technique. gutted someone's head. <laughs> you can that happens all the time. You gut people's move. jaws. Um, and I did like that bit where she gutted it by stabbing it through the skull. That's, oh yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's how you. That's how you do it. You, by the well, way, that's where the twisting comes in. You stab, but then the twist that lets you gut. You if you were if you were some fucking fool and you decided to stab gut twist, it would just. It, it would it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work at all. It, everything would fall apart. It'd be it'd be embarrassing, and everyone would laugh at you for for gutting before you twisted. It simply isn't done. Something. What about what about twist gut stab? That like. What about oh, spinning? don't e we don't even don't e don't even don't, don't even, even get me started on twisting first. <laughs> well, uh, uh, sorry, Chad. Just like so armor. What do we do with that? And she's just like baffled. She's like, yeah, stab, yeah, twist, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stab, 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 twist, stab. I told you the three words. I don't care if I have armor. Stab, twist, gut. You know how this works. It's very simple. What if the orc is surrendering? What if they have information? Stab, 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 stab. Certain other just shows, though, have been telling us recently that being stabbed through the gut is actually not that big a deal, and you can carry on and recover within the space of an episode at most. So. Mm. Is this really even the most effective battle tactic, given that most people seem to recover from being impaled through the spine? I don't know if that's what it's supposed well, to be. Well, that's because they didn't twist. See, we... Oh, God they didn't twist. It, that was they it. They didn't Shit, twist yes. in gut. They did yeah. the twist. <laughs> Vader didn't twist in gut. He just stabbed. And that's the why lightsaber. it didn't work. That's what we should have done, yeah. Well, we, we, I think when we talked about all that, it's just like, if you just keep the lightsaber in for a couple of seconds, they will do the rest of the work, trust me. <laughs> they will take care yeah. of it. And the lightsaber quarterizes them, so as we know from this ep the, well, the next episode, that just magically heals everything if you get True. quarterized. You can survive yeah. all of it. Um, so someone's going to highlight as well, uh, Shad, you may have thought that maybe she's not gutting it, considering she's at shoulder height at this point, but they very handily pointed us out, her shoulder height is actually the average man's gut height. Right there, see. Well, gut gutting is a—it's like a—it's like a verb to gut something, not necessarily to stab in the gut, right? Because you could. I thought you know, to gut something like, is to actually have the guts come out once you've. Yeah, you, you would need to slice them could, all the way down the chest and navel, but to, as we, and then split them open. The troll. This this is called setup and payoff. You fucking plebeians, right? This is why when she kills <laughs> the troll and guts the jaw. It's like it's just the general act of gutting. Well, it then wouldn't that be anywhere. payoff and setup <laughs> at that point? This is how we like we're we're finally learning. Like when we first saw the troll fight, we're like, "Wow, that was incredible! How did she know to to s twist and gut like that? That's incredible! I would have never thought to to execute that maneuver." And this is it. This is this this exactly. Now we're learning how she did it. Everyone in the theater clapped. I'm like, that's how she learned. Oh, of course, it's the technique. Yeah, it's Twist Galadriel's meta knowledge. Yeah. Like, you're on about armor before, but Galadriel knows that all the armor in this is actually just like leather or cloth with printed on things to make it look like armor. So, d like, doing that if on an armor target isn't armor, a problem. It's like, it's like orcs from Warhammer, right? You just draw the armor on and believe in it. It's, it's just, this is, it's uh, honestly, I don't know what the problem with the scene is. Tolkien wrote all about this tolkien often would write in in his memoirs he'd twist and no 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 we want to yes stab stab twist gut stab twist gut it's his most famous quote it's on his tombstone if you go to his <laughs> his grave on his it says james ronald raul token or whatever his name was and then and then Aaron when he died Lufian, stab twist stab gut. twist gut it was an odd funeral but he was an unusual man i thought it was funny that after she 
puts it forward and then pulls it back. There's this girl here who's just like blown away. She's like, "Whoa! I never thought to do that." I've never with a sword. seen that move before, man. Wow. See, see wow. I thought she was more reacting like. And I thought she was actually like, can you believe this crazy cat? She almost stabbed you. <laughs> she almost, killed, she almost, she almost stabbed She almost killed Kevin. <laughs> are you, Kevin, are you okay? But look how cool she looks, Shad. She's so cool. Come on. She even Sad said, twit. come at me. That is something I would totally expect her to say. <laughs> by, the, by the way she actually does the twisting, I'm like, yeah, like, wow, could you could you do that? If you've stabbed in someone with a, a, a straight piece of metal, could you turn it 90 degrees like that that's got to be that's that's got to be well, really she's incredibly tough strong rags okay she's like the strongest person in middle earth i think at this point all right the twist right might open up a wound a little bit more but it could also get your sword stuck in yep. the target which is you don't want to do and usually when you land a strike you want to withdraw it as quickly as possible put your guard back up in case they still follow through an attack and so the act of focusing on twisting every time you land a hit is retarded. And what if stupid. we change the scene? That's why you have scene. to gut. You have to gut. What you can't we... half-ass it and stop at the twist. What if we change the scene so that she's training up, let's just say, a random set of six, Elendil's doing six as well, but they can hear each other's sort of advice and it, it starts bouncing off, and she says, twist, the gut, yeah, stab, woohoo, and then he's just like, he, he hears that, and then he starts telling his guys, like, you don't want to just stab, twist, and gut. There's a good chance you'll actually get your sword stuck, and you need to, you know, he just brings in all the extra information, then offers other alternatives, and then she catches that, and then she's like an unexperienced, but and then and then back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until they maybe give them a fucking fight. I'm bored. I want something else to happen. <laughs> Make something character related happen if you're gonna have shitty choreography, okay? <laughs> have something to offset it. I beg you. Do a montage, and montage of basic training, and then you don't have to show people all of your shitty choreography. Yeah. What's interesting too is that Galadriel is supposed to be like an actual commander of troops with hundreds and hundreds of years of experience at this point. Mm -hmm. The advice that she gives to this unit of fighters has nothing to do with cohesion and discipline and sticking together and covering each other. It's it's just the stab gut twist. They're like, oh, th thanks. I, I wouldn't have thought about that. It's not something uh, to do with, you know, like leadership. Actually, yeah, that's, no, that's it's actually the opposite. Like, so that they're portrayed as being, you know, naive, and they're, they're all volunteers. So presumably, you know, they've never fought before, and they've not done any basic training before, and yet apparently they have all done more than basic training when it comes to horsemanship and formations. Right. Because when it comes to that, they're fine. So which is it? Like, they can't be completely untrained novices or very seasoned, experienced, and well-drilled people. You, it has to be one or the other. But she's actually anti-formation, because she starts saying things like, fight with your feet, move around. Well, you can't do that in a formation. You've got people on either side of you. Oh, oh no, so, I'm sorry, Jasperu. You've already given it too much charity. She didn't say, like, move around. She says, fight with your feet, not with not your hands. Not your arms. <laughs> not your arms. I, 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 yeah. I would be okay. She said, fight with your feet so as true. much as your arms, but not your so arms. True. I was just... See, I your your arms that's, often... That's, uh, uh, your arms get way too much attention when it comes to fighting. Don't even, don't even yeah, think about so your arms, so really. It's on the feet. You should be staring yeah, down. Wacky inflatable. I'm flailing too, man. That's what you should do with your arms. <laughs> Woo! Well, I mean, I, this, this is the strategy that one has to employ. You know, like, there are people who can fight without arms, like cassowaries, for example. They use their feet to fight. So, the, you know, the, uh, of, the Black Knight true. in Monty, true, Monty Python and the Holy true. Grail. Yeah. He loses both Monty his arms Python, and he can yep. carry on fighting with his that's legs. Right. That's Monty, right. That's right. And you can right. be the black you can knight shout to people. Without your legs, it's you incredible shout. how much they have yeah. in common. What about That's a, right. the snake army? The snake army is they don't have. Well, I guess they don't have feet either. But it reminds me of they um, have like I don't know. Good old Batman Begins. A lot of people appreciate the uh, the training scene where the main point uh, Razal Ghul wants to make is just be aware of where you are. He doesn't say mind your surroundings because your arms are useless. Like. He's, he's the, don't care, but he's he's just like no 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 just 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 be aware because your opponent's going to use it to their advantage and you should be doing that too that sort of thing. Where if she said mind your footing, because that could be the difference between you know victory and loss. Like nobody's going to take issue with that. But when you say it's all about your legs, not your arms, you're just like wait what? Yeah, and look, I would have even been okay if she said fight with your feet as much as your arms. I'll be like yeah okay that's fair enough. It's just not your arms. It's like, what don't the neglect your balance. You know you need you need to you need to keep your balance. Don't flail around like a tard. You need to. 
Yeah, just, just little th things that might be useful in a five minute lesson, not stab, twist, gut. Yeah, I mean, Bat Batman was uh, referenced earlier in, in, in this call. I mean, you, you have that scene where he's he's tripped up, and because he's tripped up, that's the opportunity then to say, mind your feet. Have her, have her yeah. trip one of these soldiers up, and then you can give that lesson relevantly without detracting from everything else they're supposed yeah. to be learning, like how to hold a yeah. sword. Presumably, like, she could get around them and they can't uh, get a reach of her because they haven't moved their feet to accommodate yet. And then she, you know, that's how you can be like, see, gotta get, get them get them a bit more fluid. You are correct. They they do not do that, though. And uh, I got another curiosity. I, uh, I want to I go over this. So, Elendil's like, if anyone can, like, hit her, uh, I think it's a score flesh. If anyone can do that on Galadriel, they get lieutenant. Um, score a hit or something, yeah. So, uh, is that, like, common? Because what is what rank is Lieutenant overall in terms of, like, how far up is that compared to just a uh, sort of soldier? Lieutenant is fairly high, I believe. Is that something you um, should just give to somebody because they this, scored a hit? Well, this was my complaint when we watched it, was it, it's that, that lack of a leadership element where if you, if you are able to score a hit on me, Galadriel, the mighty, the, the fair, the incredible, then... I then this guy is going to promote you to a position where you will be like commanding troops, issuing orders, like participating in tactics and mini strategies. Is like, well, why? Because you hit some bitch with a sword. So now that makes you qualified <laughs> to do those things. It's like, calm yeah, down. It's, it's bad it's enough we side. don't have we don't have any training for you guys anyway. I don't even know where the army is. Don't even ask. And we're sending you off to fight, and you have to learn about stabbing, twisting, and gutting. And one of you is going to be a lieutenant. I don't know. It pays better. So yeah. that's something. <laughs> I, I can think it's... of better ways to sort of order military affairs than essentially who wins the game of tag. And then they could just carry that going because whoever tags the lieutenant can become the lieutenant instead. Um, that <laughs> not sure is, is a really good basis for military organization, but it's a and then, basis. And then treating well, rank as well here one. as like a treat as opposed to something you are because you've earned it and that's the that's yeah. the appropriate level More of skill you have you know it's like who wants this something you earn well one yeah, v one would demonstrate skill but this turns into one v five where it's just look yeah, at that uh, yeah point. It, if she happens to be dealing with yeah, someone else while you're, you're behind her like it, it's the, not even what skill they, <laughs> what she achieves in this scene is just you guys suck and I am great she doesn't actually teach them anything of significance and like focusing on all right because, yeah, you can point out mistakes, but then what you should follow up from that is this is how you overcome the mistake. All she is is pointing out your mistakes and saying how, how sucky you guys are and how great I am. Uh, it's just yeah. an ego fest for her. She's... The, the way around it, which I think is quite quick and easy to do, is whilst they're doing like the five on one fight, you have one of them start sort of naturally giving orders that like, you stand there, you stand there, let's surround her. And then as a result of the movement he's on the spot planned, he's the one who scores the hit. And then you you accomplish both things so that you show he's got natural leadership qualities. He also scores the hit. So it established, it, you know, meets the criteria set out at the beginning. And it makes the fight a little bit more interesting because but, at least you can uh, see someone learning something from it. This isn't the first time we've seen this character. So we've had opportunities to show this stuff. Oh, yeah. But he's just like some guy, you know, and and I wonder, is this going to hurt them? By by having them fight against her, who's who's so skilled, the universe bends to her will and desires, versus how you're going to be fighting against orcs. That's is this the point. kind of like? Is they've never been be... over there before, so for all they know, that's the fighting standard they're going to go and meet as soon as they get to Middle Earth. They they don't know she's truly that exceptional. Yeah, like... So if they go over and expect that, holy shit, there's so much over there that we've just not trained or prepared for. That yeah. could be psychologically hitting. Like these guys aren't fighting like that elf at all. Like, oh, yeah. If he stabs the center mass, is, uh, pretty stupid, doesn't it? It's mainly just to show off. Yep. And there's so many things that she could have done that actually would have made sense for the law. Like, say, uh, orcs, they don't respond to pain the way that you'd think. So you have to go for an instant kill. They'll keep fighting, even yeah. with chopped off limbs or kind of things. Or, or say, orcs, they're very single minded creatures. They They'll will always throw attack real knives at you. Yeah. <laughs> They'll attack, say, down a straight line. So if you move laterally and get around them, you can flank them and uh, hit them on the side. Uh, there's so yeah, many like things her. you could do that make sense. But instead, she's like, you suck, I'm great. That like the orcs typically do these like dodges and everything, these like ninja. <laughs> so <laughs> some of them are uh, showing right now is this is when he first starts attacking her and she's doing the dodges because she's so fucking cool. 
Look at this strike here. For a second there, this was getting me lost. I was like, didn't he hit her? He's like swinging and shooting up. And she only dodges oh, after it lands, if you will. Hang on, on top of that, he's doing exactly yeah. what she said. She's stabbing and she's showing him that it doesn't work. So why did you tell him to stab? <laughs> Because yeah, that's worked. how you if kill gone... orcs, not elves. Yeah, elves, elves don't work not... that way. So this is <laughs> relevant to not... orc trading. <laughs> Listen, it's, this is really, it's, it's, yeah, orcs are stab, twist, gut. Now, Urux, those are twist, gut, stab. All right, and yeah. elves oh, are gut, stab, twist. He needs so to gut really, first, yeah. Yeah, it's it's like you got to know the patterns for every enemy that you're fighting. It's it's very, class. she was leading them into making this kind of blunder. You know, they should have been. Oh, like he, he's so clever. He pokes to the top left and then pulls the sword right back and goes back to like a neutral stance, as yeah. opposed to just bringing the sword down on her and then she's dead. That's I point out that Not exact allowed. thing. They, they don't follow up any strikes with anything from. He just has to reset. <laughs> and because what she does is so stupid, and they're acting like she's so great. But Rola, I, I point that out in my uh, fight scene autopsy. If he just struck down from that position. She'd be cut in two, but she's acting like I'm so great when no, it's because he's acting like a complete at, noob. Did you comment on her Just expression? That, Look yeah. at that. Like, oh, I know. Know. what is why, that? If he'd, up, if he'd stabbed her stomach right at the start, she'd be dead because she doesn't dodge enough. And then his immediate yep. reaction is to go straight for her face, which yeah. would just kill her if she, like, these aren't practice swords, right? Or are they just made to look like practice swords? Are they, are they actually... It's... Surely it's not normal to do, like, pr practice fighting like this with real swords. Like, you do that in everything, that. though. That's like the... Real fake one of those swords. tropes where, where real when people... When people practice, they fucking practice with the real deal, the sharp steel. Well, yeah, because, like, what if he actually does hit you? Like, you might be in some serious trouble. I yeah, mean, he even does. if you blunt a sword, and you stab it in someone's face, that's going in. Like, there's no way Wait. that's protected of... Yeah, well, yeah, like, why... Uh, yeah. yeah, and you only <laughs> well, you, narrowly deflects it, and it still cuts through her, uh, her clothing, so it's probably a real sword. Oh, it's a real it does, sword. does, yeah. And what, what happens if, like, when you hold it up to someone's neck, they sneeze and accidentally cut their jugular? It's like, whoops, <laughs> that exercise. Well, it's fine, because well, Elendil's really having awkward. fun, okay? And that's all that matters. Uh, and look... She holds the blunt end of the sword to him, and people might say, oh, it's intentional, but later on in the fight, she holds the sharp end of the sword to someone as well. <laughs> so it just goes to show that she's not paying attention to her edge position at all. Also, it's, it's probably minor, but, like, she's probably have a hair tied in, like, a ponytail. No, right? it looks so cooler if it flows. Looks cooler. I mean... I mean I don't the purposeful know, like missing as well is painful, and he just yeah. Well, yeah, over swinging. Down, it's just like, well, well, there was one before where he swung, and she like did a little like she she dodged it. It's like I feel like if you just swung back, you would have got her. Like if you would just followed it through by swinging again, yep. like you would have. That would have been and it. She, look here, sharp edge now on him. Where before it was the blunt edges. <laughs> it's but she fine. dodges that swing. Was backwards. it the blood? <laughs> So oh, she wow. can't even right. see the swing to dodge it, so she has no idea if she's about to walk backwards into a blade coming straight at her. Have she's you considered like, that all... she has all information at all times? Yeah. Have you, yeah. Have you considered she that this is both, choreographed uh, poorly? And the, and the camera. Dude, this guy going for that hit almost like as a surprise attack as well. She's like, damn. Careful. Like, we really she, are getting he, close to killing her. Not that that's a problem. Uh, he, he goes to stab his mate, I'm sure, with that one. He doesn't even go for her. I don't, need, Looks I don't like even know what he was aiming at then. She didn't move much to dodge. It's like he just aimed at the floor. I mean, she is so smug throughout all of this. Yeah, you can it's... see why they might end up wanting to kill her. If, if I were doing anything, sport, whatever, and the person I was playing against wore the expression she wears when she's going through this. I think, yeah, I, I am actually going to lob this snooker cue at your face by the end of this game. I, I was really like surprised that they actually had him tag her. Um, I really oh. didn't expect that when I first saw this, that she would get tagged. I was like, oh my god, wow. I would have thought maybe yes, that yes, she would allow it to already... happen on purpose so that she, you know, gives them some level of hope or something. Not that it happened against her will. They might have been going for that, though. Maybe. <laughs> Never know oh, anymore. this little elbow sends the guy for like he he's gone. Oh, <laughs> no, he's well, yeah. flying. Her That's a good way to really hurt your own them. guys is to just like swing these wide horizontal swings like that when you're in this melee. Like she must have back twenty inch. times the strength or something because she's blocking full on strikes with the most gentlest of taps, and especially well, when later on she's the reverse grip and it locks face. Her strength must be 
Bryce, how would you not have that face yeah. when you are just a god person compared to everyone else I in every know. regard? Oh, I feel like I'd just be bored all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, you know, what we learned from Saitama is that if you're, like, all-powerful and nobody can defeat Wait, you... he just, he just falls boring. over for no reason. But yeah. So, yeah, and, like, this what... guy's aiming for the middle of them. Don't... Yep. Ah. I, uh, I find it really lame when people say that if you slow down every fight scene that. that they fall apart, because it's just not yeah, true. Yeah, what she, she just, <laughs> he opens his arm, he she opens just, his hand. He just, just grabs the sword oh, off yeah, him, he yeah. just gives it to him. How oh, did that happen? That, one, oh. that one's great. What the what hell was that? And then he walks into the sword again, how did you do that? You had all that time to prep, and you just go, whoop! Oh god, it's so bad. Terrible. And it feels like it shouldn't be this bad. You should be able to. This is like the one sword fight they've probably had to deal with. And like, that's, you that's have all... so much money. Exactly. You know, like, well, you they have said so much money. The director spoke about it. He said this was really easy because of all the time they'd put into practice. Uh, we didn't have to use any face doubles or anything, so we filmed it in about a day. They so, uh, a day. To look, they actually practiced to look yeah. that shit. Well, Ryan Johnson said the exact yeah, same thing about the throne room fight. He said that they had nailed it so hard in the experimenting of it or whatever. Didn't they do it like once he filmed it from multiple angles and then they were pretty much good to go? Or that uh, he filmed them doing it several, several times and it got all because they were just so fucking good at it. He knew that they had it, even though it's trying to like for a while simulate, um, you know, a wanna like like when the when the fight starts and you can clearly see all the errors. And it's like, yeah, but it's a wanna. Like, yeah, but the whole point is that you nail the errors. You don't make errors. That's the whole fucking point that makes a one impressive. And he even, well, yeah, says, like, it, why it is... even says it was such an yeah, easy but... film to scene that not only did it not take a day, but the scene that comes later between her and Halbrand also took a day. So those, they seems those as uh, equal. Between. I, man, that's not the brag that it, it, they think it is. <laughs> like, they only spent yeah. a day filming. That's not a brag. Like, it's because they're so good for me. They they're only so took 11 good. days to write the script. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. Did you because, see that? Uh, she almost kills him. What? Yeah. He just dodges the sword. Just... Good on him, honestly. She would have killed yeah, him. She, she knew it. She, she, she's like, I have assessed his combat capabilities. He's operating at 76% uh, <laughs> maximum potential. Uh, he will slow at inertia level B.6. It, 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 she's like a computer, a supercomputer, untouchable. Cold. I just. Uh... I decided to look it up because when you mentioned the Wanners, so the the hallway fight in Daredevil season one, they only had two days to rehearse it and half a day to film it. It's like, man, and they had a lot less money than you. And look how it turned out. <laughs> Holy that. fuck. He's just I discipline like they he must have had. Ever. Well, it's just, um, what is the... Uh, when I look at this fight, I'm not even sure what it is that's meant to be really exciting and cool about it. Is it that they're fighting in, like, kind of a bazaar and they're fighting through... And all are they all useless? Because it's not very impressive if they're all supposed to be useless right now. Like, they're not trained at all. Which is the thing that we're oh, trying no, to I figure out. She's meant to be amazing. You know what she said then? She says, don't plant roots, keep moving. That's what they've been doing the whole time! They've been they've flailing been all around moving, everywhere! Yeah. <laughs> they've actually that's been, been doing better if, yeah. Yeah, if they plant their feet a bit firmer and focus on where they're trying to hit things. Because they, I like... I, I don't see the appeal of a, a fight scene where it's just, like, abs... Ah, oh, okay, so I am just going to keep talking about how much I like the Daredevil ones. The reason why that everybody likes those so much is particularly because he gets tired. Like, it's really He's clear struggling. that this is for him. It's hard. Like, there's parts where they they all get so exhausted that they have to take, like, five seconds to catch their breath. Like, what's really endearing about it is that it is such an uphill battle that he has to work really hard to claim that victory. But here, it's effortless. It's easy. Is that the point? Like, oh, isn't it cool how, yeah. like, effortless it is to beat all of these people? I don't really find anything, like, particularly enthralling about watching this fight. It's just a bunch of idiots flailing around while she's doing all of these weird twirls. And these strange like moves, I don't get it. I don't. I don't know what the. I don't well, know she's really, why this is really cool. That they want. You think it was yeah. cool? I, I guess like if you think that she's cool, then this probably was a really fun scene. I guess, but you're supposed <laughs> to come away with a sense of awe about what her capabilities, how amazing she is. It sets up everything that she can do uh, in the future. 
the one yeah, that came to, um, yeah. the one that came to my mind when I was watching this the first time is sort of it's Morpheus training Neo uh, in the Matrix, and you, you have that bit where you know, the shipmates go around. Oh, I thought you Morpheus said Morpheus. And Morpheus, and like, Morpheus <laughs> is fighting Neo. Yeah, it's, it's Morpheus time. Um, the, no, the, and they, yeah, the shipmates they go around, they go around, and they say that Morpheus is fighting Neo. This is a really, really big and impressive thing. But the reason that that's a big and impressive thing is that there's actually two characters that you care about. So when Morpheus is sort of bigging himself up by showing his skills. You're also learning something more about another very important character in Neo, which gives you more to invest in. If you're just having Galadriel besting a load of non-entities and people will never see again, or people whose names we won't ever remember, what is the point here? It is just aggrandizing Galadriel. That's the only purpose of this, which the show has done non-stop anyway in every single one of her scenes, so that makes it dramatically unnecessary. Yeah. I'm glad exactly. you brought up the Matrix, because, um, like, why is it Me so too. cool... And f and great when when at the end of the film Neo is like deflecting all of Agent Smith's like attacks with one hand. Why is that so cool? It's like well, this is like the culmination of a journey that he's had across the film of like getting more competent and getting better and better. And so like that's a really cool payoff. This isn't really a payoff. This is like um, I'm not really sure what Bullying. I would describe. <laughs> The well, well this thing are inexperienced boy. trainees yeah. and she's like i'm yeah. so amazing she's rubbing their noses in it it's she, if yeah, anything that's it. it's not complimentary at all because you're right well, like they've already established how amazing she is and so if anything this scene is just made to show how buffoonishly incompetent the numenorians are it's like oh, oh that's what you want us to think about them well done because now that i just think they're complete idiots good good work like, let us can you oh, yeah. imagine if, compare, if you were coach, right it, the but you go first, you go first. Can you imagine if you were coaching, like, a football team of five-year-olds, and you were just yeah, kicking the ball uh, yeah. around them at speed, and you were just this smug little, like, look how amazing I am, and you just grin yeah. them all the time, and until one of them cries because of the way you train them all, that's the same. Well, it's kind of like, um, in the South Park episode when Stan was coaching, like, the, well, the what's it called? Like the, yeah, the Little League hockey team, and then they go and play against, like, a professional hockey team and just get obliterated. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the, the vibe of this as well, isn't it? Because she's there just like taunting them as she effortlessly defeats them. Like they, they don't stand a chance. And it, which this I is guess normally a, like, it's yeah. a trope in character writing. If you want to make a character hateable, you show them in this way. You don't do it because you want people to like them. But there's an old far show sketch with the hyper competitive dad who just takes every single sport against his kids massively seriously. They play cricket and he beats them by 15,000 runs. And he's just, he's incredibly proud of himself for doing this. But you're supposed to hate him. You're not supposed to like him. And that's exactly the, like, the feeling I get every time I see Galadriel on screen. It's just like, I really, really, really cannot stand you. And the show seems to love you so much. And I don't understand why. Well, to me, it feels like this is, you know, wish fulfillment from the creators or someone. Because isn't there like a producer that looks a lot like Gladiel where they just want, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, pr pretend that they are so wonderful and they're better than everyone. And they got to survive. I guess I just, um, I've never really understood the appeal of that. I've always, I like, I, I thought that we generally agreed that what often makes a character interesting is their flaws and the journey to sort of overcoming those flaws and becoming a better person. Struggling. You know, grow. to struggle. Yeah, I mean, struggle and adversity, it's what makes the, uh, it's what makes the victory so cathartic. It's, is um, the uphill battle. But, I mean, we, underdog stories, right? Rather than you're just fantastic at everything and nobody else stands a chance. It's like, what are we, what are we here to see? And I mean, you know, I guess in the case of Galadriel, it can be, it's like, well, yeah, it's a fighter. There's not much that she needs to develop on, but it's more so her personal journey. But I mean, I don't know what, By the <laughs> I way, don't know what, uh, what we're said the first one to score flesh. He didn't yeah, score flesh. Yeah, this just cuts the dress. He scored, he scored cotton, I guess. <laughs> like, close enough. <laughs> You get to be able to now. Elven silks. Doesn't seem like he, and it's he like you said, lieutenant. It's like you said. What is being a lieutenant is uh because lieutenant is second to captain, right? Is that isn't that the uh isn't it captain lieutenant? Uh, I'm mixing them up. It's you're you're an officer, like you're a is one up from just soldier command. sergeant, then lieutenant, then uh, captain. Is that um it? I uh, I'll just Wikipedia, come on, help me out. I I, I presume that it's the same in Middle Earth. Yeah, so there's captain, then there's lieutenant, uh, or first lieutenant, and then second lieutenant. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, okay. so you're basically second. Uh, like, you're nearly a captain. So you, you are, 
you you make decisions like you know you make tactical decisions on the battlefield. Yeah, and he gets it so, because yeah, of the fact like, that he hit her when she was off guard. She was fighting three other people. Like, hmm. Like, if anything, the most important the most important thing when it comes to deciding who's going to be a lieutenant is their ability to command the people beneath them rather than their strict fighting capabilities. Yeah, cheering or whether him like they he achieved something. Like, like, everyone's cheering him like he just did something really impressive and he got he got a cheap shot against yeah. an opponent who's just not facing you. Oh, come yeah, on. Yeah, you're right. I'm pretty sure, because I'd have to check again, but she wasn't fa When he started the attack, she wasn't facing him, right? She, like, does a flip remember. around or whatever. Yeah. And it's while she's attacking, I just, yeah, it's, it's bullshit. It, again, being, like, unduly charitable to the writers, I think the intended effect might have been to say, well, this is this is actually a way of encouraging brotherhood amongst the Numenorians. So oh my this god. This guy has actually accomplished this, and so this makes them look more kindly toward him. It's establishing camaraderie between them. But even that doesn't work from sort of the show's world-building perspective, because these people don't really have any reason to understand just exactly what beating Galadriel entails, because they've been turning away elven ships and they've never met any of them. So it's not as big a deal as it should be for them to have that reaction to it. Um... I like how they store the swords in the scabbards. <laughs> You're separately. right. Keep the blades open where people might run into and cut themselves. And we, the scabbards are right there. Just sheathe them and put them away. Wait, what is going on with this also, guy's I, dagger? But, yeah. Which, where? Oh my, oh my um, eyes fucking with me. What's going on here? Isn't that a sword? Behind a pillar. Behind a, pillar. Behind a, uh, it's a sword pillar. behind the pillar. Oh, it. it Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, fuck, my eyes were really fucking with, with me for a second there. I thought that was the the dagger in full or something. Yeah, okay, I got you. It's behind yeah, she'd the never touch an elf with a, a little dagger like that, no. Anyway, what I wanted to, to just, I just saw it and I was, I was fascinated by it, because I remember, because going through it nice and slow, you get to see more stuff. Muller is getting old, it's true. Um, when, when Holbrand does his super cool kick up the sword to grab it thing, I was immediately thinking, like, yeah, you wouldn't be able to do that if it were just on the floor, right? Because there's no way a sword's hilt is going to push it up hard enough for you to fit a whole foot underneath it. So, like, how is it that he manages to pull that off? And then at first I was like, oh, is it just lucky the sword landed on what begins the steps up to the, you know, up the way there or something? Because that's just, yeah, that's nice and convenient for it. But then I was like, well, it was even more absurd, really. They show you, a, like, a split second of the floor. Look at that. They designed that a, a, a bit of stone to be that absurdly <laughs> protruded in order to get his foot underneath it. <laughs> oh, you're right, yeah. That's pretty funny, not gonna lie. Yeah, like, all over the place. That's a terrible Man. floor. Look, it's all it's, over the place. Dude, that is a huge tripping hazard. Just, how did the stone mason fuck that up so hard? Like, so like he had six know, places where that's all. Well, to, yeah. maybe it happened after he put it down. It, it's we don't know how old it is. Who knows what could have happened? Maybe a, a root grew underneath there, or maybe it was just fucking attracted to the to the gravity black hole that is the charisma of glass. I think that if it gets to that point, you need to get it sorted out. Is that sword public bending? Safety. Uh, I guess the sword uh, bend. They do bend a little bit, right? Yeah, they got flex, but also in motion, it looks like they can bend as well, just because of the perspective. Like, I was looking at some slow motion footage of me cutting water bottles, and while the sword is in motion, this straight sword looks like it's curving nearly 90 degrees. Oh, um, yeah, that really got bad during one of those frames. That was... Yeah. I don't know if it's because... It, is this, It could be CGI for him to able, be able to nail that move. I can believe he it's real and he oh, no, no, that movie I is easy. this, I, I, this I, is an I, isolation, I, so you could just practice it until you it's like Peter with exactly. the pizza. You can just keep practicing it yeah. over and over. It's yeah. not like and it's just part of a bigger it. scene. Like a small like catching a sword spinning like that is no indication of actual sword skill in any measure. It's I like, was gonna oh, ask which about is that. why they'll make yeah. you a lieutenant. Yeah. They'll say, if it, you can flip this sword up like Tony Hawk and catch it. Then it's I'll all make be, you it's, it's, it's all like, seriously, be like flashy, you know, rather yeah. than practical. To show how basic it is in my review, I go outside and just throw a sword and spin it in the air and catch it. It's so freaking easy, right? But they're acting like, "Wow, you're a master swordsman now." It's just so you're unnecessary because when it falls on the ground on a nicely protruded, <laughs> you know, like bit of like tiling, you can kick it. And then catch it in your hand because that's going to be real useful when you're in the middle of a massive battle. Yeah, there's lots of protruding even, rocks uh, when you're in the middle. She even battle. says, like, 
I don't think many blacksmith people can do that. It's like, no, if if you're around swords all the time, I guarantee you, just for yeah, fun, well, yeah, throwing yeah. them around. Remember Will Turner in Pirates of the Caribbean? He was obsessed with swords because he loved making them and practicing with them. Like, the idea that it's like, pff, smiths? They know anything about swords? It's like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, the only thing that smiths do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is smithing and nothing else. They never just, you know, <laughs> sort of play with the swords That's what or, I mean, like, or do anything else in their life. It doesn't sound absurd They're to me at all that they would smithing. test their own work to see how sharp or efficient it is, and then just they would have some level of swordplay uh, knowledge. Well, it's, it's because the time is rough. clever, though. I mean, she's goading him into accepting that he's more than the station he says that he wants, but yeah. doing it in such a way that doesn't actually conform to the setup because this show doesn't understand how. I was gonna say, is it, would it just come across as patronizing? Because he'd just be like, "Ah, oh, yes, I'm the only Smith. Have you even met a Smith before, Galadriel? You're too proud. Like, would you ever lower yourself <laughs> to see a Smith? Probably not. <sighs> so we I would did like it. To, we passed I, that scene. I guess. Well, before we move on, let's uh, let's oh, compare this scene. With uh, to remind ourselves of something good, before a battle was going to happen at Helm's Deep, we had Aragorn, who met uh, a guy. I think like Hamleth was his name. I, I forget. Oh, but this young kid, um... he's nervous, you know, and and so he doesn't, you know, he doesn't show off. He doesn't use this as an opportunity to show how amazing he is and how how cool he is. He offers reassuring words, and he says, you know, you, you've got got something good here. You know that don't you know don't worry we got this. He, he's very encouraging. He's he's being a leader. He's not trying to show off. It's not about it's not about me me me. Aren't I amazing? Aren't I amazing? Funnily enough, there was a meme created on the Lord of the Rings memes subreddit that had it was supposed to be pro Rings of Power, and it shows Aragorn doing that with a sword, and the, and the sword is Rings of Power, and then he says this is a good show, and everyone's like woohoo yay fun meme. And everyone's Ooh. like wait. You do understand in context what was happening in that moment, right? He was like trying to provide a sense of hope and uh, reassurance to this kid who's got a sword that's <laughs> not exactly fantastic. It's not even close, actually. It's beaten the fuck up. It's like super old, but it's facing near certain death. Yes. So that's yeah. that. So it's just like, did you mean for your meme to be as accurate as it is? <laughs> like, or... <laughs> I don't think so. But uh, we call them happy accidents. Now. Off to Farazon, back to sh scheming. I said to to Rags after this scene, it feels like uh, when you watch House of the Dragon, which is very much like trying to focus hard on political intrigue when it comes to fantasy show about different houses and interests and motivations and stuff. This is like the McDonald's version, where it's just this one guy who has like this very simplistic sort of point of view that we've only ever heard of like right now despite it being this many hours into the series. Because um, like they do this thing where they start talking about things that are a little bit more complicated, and he like looks around and everyone just leaves. Like He has that level of power, and it's just like, oh, that probably would have been neat in like a good show. Like, that he is an understanding of Farazhan's influence, you know? But I say his name even from a sense of, like... I think it was... Wasn't it last stream... Uh, when you were here, little platoon, I kept asking you what his name was because <laughs> it took this long for me to remember it. It's like you need like it's it's crazy to me that he's going to be this uh, level of an important figure. And this is pretty much the first scene where we get to understand something about his character. Um, yeah, that he's sucks. Supposed to be, he'll go on to be, or he should go on to be, like probably the pivotal character. Um, and yet. I mean, even even this scene, though, is, yes, yeah, the first time we actually hear or see anything really about his character and his motives. But even that sort of undercuts itself because. You know, the only reason he's telling his son all of this stuff is presumably because he views his son as some kind of protege. Um, and it's not the first time that he's sort of shared information with his son in this way. If you're a skilled and canny politician and you're trying to bring up your son to be a skilled and canny politician, you will know what information to give him and what information not to give him because you should already know what he thinks and what his values are. And Game of Thrones would have done this and House of the Dragons would have done this. There's no reason for Farazhan not to know that his son doesn't agree with him about the war by this point. But if he does know that, then he has no reason to be telling him any of this information, really. And he should have done something about it before then, because this just this almost presents it as though these characters, who are father and son and are both supposedly either skilled or aspiring politicians, have never met each other except for maybe one or two occasions in the last however long it's been. And so all of this information, which should already be known, is coming as first-time information to both yeah. of them, or to one of them at least. 
it doesn't make any sense from a character perspective, and it makes Alf, uh, Alf Arizon even, seem very naive to be trusting his son with this stuff, given what his son then goes on to do, which Arizon should have known he would, because it's his son, and he's skillful at this. It, yeah, no. Oh, dude, that, you're reminding me of, um, I'm not sure how many people will even be aware of what I'm talking about here, I'm not sure who's seen what, but, um, Roos Bolton was someone I actually, like, kind of vaguely enjoyed in terms of a, a mind in Westeros yeah. that was more invested in doing the absolute most pragmatic decisions to get power. And, like, he knows how to manipulate people, he knows where his station is, and he'll always just, he's climbing the ladder nice and slow, but he's also a cruel bastard. He gets killed by his own son. It's like, okay, he was, like, hyper-aware of his son's interests and his goals, and there's even, like, an implication that he's, like, he's aware that he'll try and kill him. And then he's just, like, he's just, yeah, he killed him. It's like... Oh. Well, that's not very satisfying. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, why, I don't know why you set that up that way. Until that point, he almost guards against that happening as well, from what I remember, which makes it just seem even more of an out-of-character move. But that's what I'm saying. The same, yeah. dynamic, the same dynamic should be in play here, but isn't, because this show, it doesn't really... It doesn't really understand what Game of Thrones is. It just kind of likes that it happened, and it's it's using sort of the most superficial aspects of con of construction that Game of Thrones deployed. And it's just saying that we can do it too. Um, it's, no, you can't. This, this is like sports day for preschool kids compared to you know the Olympics in terms of the quality on show. And the reason he's telling his son in the first place is I I got the feeling like he compartmentalized the idea stuff because he's like, well, you don't need to know this. But when he starts to doubt it, he tells him the information to convince him. But then yeah. in the very next scene, he's even heard the reasons, he's heard the arguments. You'd think that would be enough to get him on board, and then just goes against it. And doesn't actually seem to have a reason why, except <laughs> I'm doing this because of a girl. Correct. Uh, yeah, uh, and this is insane because it's an act of terrorism. He could have like pe he could have been killing people. He uh, he didn't really check how many people might have been on board the boat, and uh, it's insane that he went to that well, extreme. Uh, where it's was that scene? Terrorism, it's treason as well. I mean, where was yeah, the many is... scenes? Where was the scene where Farazon finds out that two of the ships are destroyed, and then he goes to see his son, and he's like, "So you just yes. happened to be in the area when a huge sabotage happened on our our attempts to." You know, begin this war. Is that is that what, you, what were you doing there? And then he goes, I, I was fishing. That's the official story. And he's like, fishing. Really? Yeah, but one of them was fishing. That, then at no point do they explain why the sun's out there. He actually gives an excuse for the person he's with, but not himself. That's what I'm saying. Like it's it's so stupid. That you've missed out because that's like that's like interesting to have Farazon figure out his son was the saboteur, and then to actually talk to him about it, but not you know, you know, let people know. And kick his ass for it verbally, but we didn't get it. And hell, I mean, Farazan has a, a vested interest in using things like acts of terrorism to further his own position. So, again, as a competent political sort of nefarious type, what you could have done to sort of to start teasing what he will become, I imagine, in later episodes and seasons is to, okay, you've had this act of terrorism. He didn't necessarily plan for it, but he's absolutely going to use it for his advantage. So you can take that as the opportunity to start locking up his political opponents, for example, or like anyone he knows might not be on his side. But to do all of that, though, you'd probably have needed to actually build out Numenor to have other characters that we would recognize as being imprisoned. The main overarching problem with Numenor is that it's, it's, it's an empty city. It's a shallow place. It looks very pretty. There's maybe two people in it who have character, and there's a couple of other people who are only there because they need to be for the plot to happen. But there's no actual... Like, it wouldn't matter if, if Farazan actually did a politically savvy thing, like you know, capitalizing on an act of treachery, because... What's the consequence on a character level? We don't know anyone. Um, it's it's the problem. It's been building up this problem for such a long time by not spending any time or effort building out the actual city. It's supposed to you know be telling us is so important. It's it's like so many missed opportunities, but that's one of the big ones. Yeah, imagine he learns about his son and he gives up his son in order to curry political favor with people. Like he considers that more important. Well, or, hell, he keeps yeah. his son on side by arresting. Uh, say, I don't know, a sealed, well, this probably wouldn't work, but just spitballing, a sealed sister uh, who his son likes, and his son goes and confronts him about it, and he says, otherwise that would have been you. Yeah. And so these are the lengths to which you have to go, and the sacrifices you will have to make. I'm getting you off this time, and I will not do it again. And then he's not seen as being sort of taken aback by it, which he ends up being. He just sort of panics, or seems to panic, in the one scene we get after the explosion, when he says, oh, well, maybe we should actually call off the invasion after all, which he himself called for in, to begin with. So Yeah, and 
a sabotage yeah. wouldn't at all change his mind when the reasoning is as he's explained in this scene. It's all so confusingly fucked after they they do something that I appreciate, right? Telling us his motivation, like, finally, thank you. And then everything else that follows, you're like, wait, what? Ugh. <laughs> like, I don't understand. You get like one second of continuity, then it all just gets fucked. Yeah, they tried to insinuate that because that happened, it meant that the like he'd misjudged the people and he'd actually lost control of them and so he wanted to stay and solidify power before yeah and see and i anything. think if he had even half the brain cells that they're trying to argue he does he would have figured out immediately it was his son his son happened to be oh, there yes. and, uh, and even uh, if he didn't everyone else would have done yeah so that's th true, when he yeah. said no i think a saboteur did it it was like well was anyone there well these two people swam out the ocean okay it's one of them so one of them by the way who was frustrated he was. that he didn't get the role he wanted in this war it's like Hmm. Yeah. Both of them have a motive to do that, and <laughs> exactly. the other two people who were there. And yet, the line that's delivered is—is is it just we suspect at the moment it might have been a passing brigand, and like everyone just moves on? Yep, it's well, insane that anyway, they just someone yeah. made that up. They just yeah, just a, a guy, a guy just walked in, and he was a dick, and he exploded half our fleet, and that's bad. But moving on, what what passing brigand? Surely that the question to ask then is: Wait a minute, there are brigands around, and they've actually got access to our <laughs> courts. Isn't this an important thing to know that we should be forestalling ourselves against? But apparently not. That's just because the show couldn't be asked. And as was said in chat, the sea is always right. <laughs> Simple as that. So if your boat explodes, then <laughs> the well, the sea wanted it. Sea wanted it. So that's what the sea wanted. I there guess. was a little wave that just went up into the into the boat and was like, "I don't like this lamp here. I prefer it in the oil." <laughs> the sea always gets what it wants. What a stupid like. Uh, it's retarded. Whatever. It is so dumb. <laughs> we'll get what, to it. Even that, if you give him the the most generous of interpretations. I think the return they're talking about one of the Valar, which is sort of the god of the oceans. I think that's where it comes from. But they never explain any of this, and so it just comes across as a crazy comment. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a culty comment where it's like anything that happens in the sea was was the correct thing, even if it involves fucking drowning people or destroying ships. You're just like, that's uh interesting for the POV. Like uh, you can use it to justify whatever the hell you want. If you're anything oh, near yeah. the sea, if it happens, like you know, I attacked this boat and I killed everyone board, but the sea let it happen, therefore I'm justified. Yeah, and it's also... I guarantee you. Go ahead. It, that, it, the first thing that the showrunners would do, if you brought up the whole, well, Gladriel jumped into the ocean, and that would have, like, been complete suicide just doing that, because there's no way she would. But, well, you know, the, the valor of the sea actually pushed her and the boats together, because he knows that's what's needed, and they, he also made the Numenorians meet them at the same time. When you go in, that, I think that's why they keep pushing this whole... There's a greater power at work because it literally gives you an excuse for everything, no matter what the problem is, no matter how stupid it is. It's always a fallback excuse of, well, it needed See, to happen, and so yeah. they made it happen. I actually um, made this point quite early on, I think, in, in the video I did on episodes one and two. That Ulmo is the valor of the sea, I think, and um, like uniquely of all of the valor, he's very involved in the events of Middle Earth, even into like the, the Second Age, where most of them have retreated. And I, I used it sort of in the context of yeah her jumping off, but also in, in the raft exploration because it's a way of tying it into the grander universe that the show wants us to believe exists because it does keep referencing these characters, it keeps mm. referencing these concepts, it keeps telling us the valor exists and they have uh, they have will and they have a degree of agency and probable probably at least or at least they should be invoking them much more heavily when it does come to something like the destruction of Numenor. So like that's your opportunity to start actually tying these things together tying the sea is always right to Ulmo because that's where he comes from he's uniquely involved in the events of the world and has very he has a great sort of determinative capacity so that's when you would do it but the show hasn't tied any of these things together it just name drops them i think as we said earlier just to, to trick some people into thinking it respects the law more than it does but it doesn't marry them so they almost operate independently of each other which then creates nonsense like the sea is always right and then later when we hear other things that happened in the sea and certain notable people who die in it, well, okay, but the sea was always right, so we can't regret that, can't we? Yeah, I, I think it's literally to create, as I've said, that an army of people who use the vagueness of the story, which yeah. is there deliberately, to generate just excuses of, oh, you, you just don't comprehend, you can't comprehend this, you just don't know enough. But if you were as big-brained as I was, then you'd know that actually this story is really deep and complex, uh, and it, it aims to just shut people up by that kind of base attack yeah uh so uh another reason so he, he he makes clear it's about getting 
the uh, the ores, forest, trade, and tribute from the new sort of like kingdom that'll be built on top of the uh, ruler being added for the men in the Southlands, right? That's what Farazon's like. We'll have a great partner there. There's a great reason to do all this. They'll owe us. That's that's his whole reasoning, and this is why I feel like it's completely limited as a political move compared to better shows or better writing. It's like, what is Farazon's understanding? of the population over there. What does he know about them? How many there are and their likelihood of even surviving? How splintered they are? This guy and whether or not he can lead them and unite them? Does he know anything about this? Does he know what resources they even have access to as a as a vague group? Does he know anything about anything over there? Or is he just like, no, if we help them, they'll be loyal to us? Which he can't just... ask that question because that question's very inconvenient. Because if he does already know this stuff, then why has he not already advocated going and setting up trading yeah. places in Middle Earth, which he should have done anyway? Because in the law, he did. Like, Numenor is is intimately involved in in Middle Earth. But yeah, like, if he asks any of those questions, then he would already have done the thing he's now decided he will do belatedly, having opposed it for virtually the opposite reasons until this point. Uh, um. I would like to go and fetch a drink really quick, but uh, you know, oh. Rags, if you're here, you wine can, you can... or lamp oil. <laughs> <laughs> Will you why sup not, upon? Why not both? I can make a fireworks display. Hell um, yeah! Yeah, you've not got any you naked make one flames. Of those drinks, you? you light on fire. But yeah, to I mean, all that happens next is that uh, the king is like, "Don't go, daughter, queen regent. It'll be dark <laughs> over there," and she's like, "Oh." Okay. Oh, this, this scene. I know it's a really small scene. This one irritated me because it's, it's a really, really good example of the show's approach to dialogue. Like, it does nothing with it until it has to do something portentous to move the plot along. So, like, she goes to speak to, to Vegetable King over here. And then she's like, oh, it's good news. We're, we're going because, you know, we had the vision and this is going to save Numenor. But now it's time for us to get very serious again. So he just says, if you go, you will find darkness. And then, but okay, so. One of the things it hasn't done is really explain or show whether he's been driven to this state by his visions through the palantiri that they have. That would have been a useful thing to have set up because it explains his current condition, but it might also explain why he knows the things that he seems here to know. But then also she doesn't ask any questions about it because if he has been seeing visions through the palantiri just as she has, and he's come away with this interpretation, this should cause her to stop. Which... Yeah, I, uh, you're right. But like That would be a massive red flag for her, but she's like, oh. You're, you're okay. You're fine. It's fine. It's okay. Whatever. And then it also contradicts what the show has been trying to say, what the greater, you know, will is to save Numenor because the, the petals of the tree was indicating, go, go off to sales, help them. And now the father who has the visions is like, no, you'll find darkness and evil. It's like, all right, then what, what is the show trying to tell us now? It's you have no idea. I don't know that the show even knows what it's trying to. You, you know, like I don't know what the what I'm meant to make of all this. This whole plot line is. It seems to be just the most. I don't know. Is it? It might. Uh, it's it's tough to. Well, rank I mean, it's uh something that became really. I think it was when in episode six we didn't see the hobbits again. It's like we we are not moving very far at all. Given we're not how balancing our, our plots, it feels. Uh, we're definitely not balancing them because some plots seem like pretty obviously integral to the story, and then there are other ones that are just sort of um, sort of meandering about elsewhere. I'm I'm just I'm persistently baffled by how much time gets wasted in this show. For yeah. what for what at this point we're up to like five hours. How much has really been achieved, and how much that could have been achieved in in two with more expeditious writing. Yeah, um, not only that, be... what has been achieved is founded on complete stupidity. Like, oh, yeah, the yep. Mark of Sauron is really a map, and the, we had it here for the whole time, and no one bloody bothered well, to read. And all this, like, the plot that has been, you know, moved forward is just nonsense. <laughs> it, it is. And I think, um, it, it, especially by episode six, that. I think um, generally it seems to be a mark of a weak story when it's it's tied together by like like um, knitting string or something like really thin, like an incredibly thin, tenuous connection between two part, you know, two pieces of the broader story. And like, like the, the longer like the hobbits and the, or the Harfits and the Numenor well, stuff. I or... mean, the clearest example to me would be not checking the rag to see that the hilt of the sword. But we'll get to that. 
But like, um, you know, these incredible coincidences. Because, I mean, think about this whole plot kicked off because when Galadriel jumped out of the boat, she bumped into another boat in the middle of a massive ocean, and then they got bumped into by the Numenorians, and then that's led to everything that's happened here. Like, it's incredibly tenuous, everything that's built on it. And then it gets further propelled by characters making these really bizarre, stupid decisions, not really talking to each other. Um, it's, uh... It's it's so weak. <laughs> and, Galadriel's, and in Galadriel's entire story, she only ever moves from place to place because of a contrivance. Like every single aspect yep. of it is contrived. Like she finds the Northern Fortress where she happens to find the Mark of Sauron that she saw. She goes back and she happens to get told she's going back to Valinor. So she goes on the ship and she just decides randomly. Well, she to happens the ocean. to decide what the symbol means. <laughs> yeah, yep. she happens to decide what the symbol means. Happens to decide uh, to jump into the ocean. Happens to decide, or happens to be a raft that picks her up. Happens to be Cthulhu's gay fish. Happens to be Numenorean ship. Happens to be conversation with Elendil in Numenor that sends her to a library where they happen to have the piece of information that makes sense of the symbol. Where they happen to have the map which makes sense of the symbol. Where they happen to go back and get into an argument with the good. And it's just the entire thing is yeah. just. And this is sort of, it's a double problem when, you, when you're writing a thing like this, because if you are wasting so much of your time doing nothing for large periods, then you don't have enough time to actually build out these events to make them seem less contrived. Because you, you, can, you can sort of modify the effects of, of contrivances if you want to. You can pad things around them that make them seem at least a little bit more explicable. But if you're saving it to the last 10 minutes of every hour-long episode to actually progress anything that the plot needs to happen, then of course you're going to have to rush things. And it's it just it actually it's getting worse as this show goes on. I mean, episode 6 will be the, the, the sort of yeah. the nadir so yeah. far, but I'm sure episode 7 will be worse. Well, I think um, what, what you've highlighted is essentially that there is an absence of clear causality that's propelling the plot. It's Trey Park and Matt Stone, the, you know, but therefore instead of and, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, which is kind of what this story is. Yeah, you do not get a strong sense of one thing leads to this thing, leads to this thing, that it's all connected in some way well, yeah, as you were saying about galadriel coming out of that boat j jumping out into finding that rafts like all of that has led to the rescue of the the southlands or well, well rescue at first well, which yeah, we then. assume is not her plan uh, from the start so it's just oh i guess i'm here i'll have them fight the for the or i guess she didn't even meet uh whole brand then so her her mission was to go back to middle earth yeah, I suppose. What was it? What exactly was her plan? She wanted to jump back on because she she thought her fight hadn't finished, so she was going to jump and swim thousands of miles back without being killed. Yeah, but the only yeah, but reason like, the south thing comes about there... because it, it's another contrivance, which is that she happens to bump into the raft, which happens to have the guy on it who happens to be from the Southlands, who happens to relay the information she needs to know that that's where the orcs are. If she's um, going to the, the orcs, the mist, the mist clears ten seconds after she's there. All of this doesn't happen, but that's writing. Yeah, her whole motivation is, I want to find Sauron, I want to kill orcs. Yeah, and luckily for her, who she bumped into happens to fulfill that goal. Kind of nuts. And uh, it makes for incredibly satisfying storytelling, right guys? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm so glad we didn't what spend... was her original plan. Uh, that is her original plan. Up in the water. <laughs> she didn't have she... She, she knew she'd get picked up by... No, 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 her original her. plan was to go back to land and start hunting orcs and Sauron again. What we're saying yeah, is that by chat, yeah, whatever, it doesn't um, matter, right? She's um, crazy. But, uh, I guess, yeah. What, uh, well, she might go on back to Gilgalad and been like, listen, I've thought about it. <laughs> Can I have my armor back? Also, some men. Also, just let me go. We'll get to that I'm stuff. I'm not sure too. she would. No, she might not because... do it. She might literally just wander around Middle Earth asking if anyone knows where Sauron is. Well, in this same episode, she says that they couldn't. I uh, perceive a difference between they sent me away I was betrayed by them they sent me away because they couldn't differentiate me from the evil I was hunting so I think she's accepted at this point they can't stand her and she's not going to get anything from her so I think she'd literally <laughs> just go off on her own glad was like you know this keeps happening with all the people that I try and hang out with it's like hmm have you ever considered there's an x factor there Galadriel she's like yeah Sauron you're like right <laughs> it's everybody else <laughs> not me um, so we're back with the the Harfords and Gandalf, I not Gandalf, this. is like healing, quote unquote, his hand. I don't fucking know what he's doing. He's freezing water with his hand in a little pool, and then Nori is like, "Wow, you're freezing your hand. I better grab it." Um, yeah, 
like you'd, you'd assume if there's a mage next to you that he would understand what he's doing with the magic. He went off on his own to be away from everybody so he couldn't injure anybody. And she comes along, inserts herself, touches his arm, and then afterwards when there's a backlash, blames him for it. And the actors even said themselves, oh, this is where she realized that actually he might be evil what? and she assumed he was good. But no, this shows that actually he's bad after all. It's like, no, this is your problem, your fault, and you did all of the wrong things and now you're blaming him for it. Dude, dude, it's like, that I'm... is what this scene's meant to show, that he could be evil. Like I'm in the middle of cutting down a tree and someone just jumps in the way of the axe and they're like, wow, you're evil. <laughs> yeah, no, if so you sorry. ever want this show to get even worse, the, the deadline breakdowns at the end make everything even more of a disastrous of just the actors talking about it. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, somehow at this point, it's like a 95% guarantee that, uh, that the, the actors talking about the thing will make it worse, not better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. and... <laughs> This is a very odd way to heal a hand as well. Like, 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 yeah, I, I agree, don't, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I don't intuitely connect freezing your hand to healing. Uh, What's the I think it's more that his magic refreshing is power of, of spearmint. <laughs> like, and when yeah, he came um, down, his fire was cold, and so this is cold, so I imagine that's like the element of and what, his strength or something. What was she doing? It doesn't even look like she's trying to drag him out of the water, which, by the way, horrible idea, because you'll just rip off his arm if, if you <laughs> understand this to be the way that it is. Off. That would but, be um, very funny. As was said, it's just like, this is a crazy magic man from space. Let him do his thing, woman. What are you doing? Let the magic man cast his spell. He clearly knows what he's doing. He's calm and he's saying the magic words. Keep, keep your hands off. It was so unfortunate, because once again... The show was like, yes, Nori is indeed dead. And we were like, oh, okay. And then she wasn't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Triumphantly. It was magic ice, which means it's not cold. It's just nothing. <laughs> it's it's uh, not. During, no. during this entire scene, she's got a second arm that she does absolutely <laughs> yeah. nothing. I'd be like smacking him in the face. Now, like, wake up, you stupid. She's like, no, no, I'm just going to stand here and pull gently. <laughs> It's like it's dead. The the way this scene runs, it's like <laughs> it's just yeah. That's not an arm that she can do. Oh, there it goes. She's maybe now using it. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, she eventually grabs her old arm with that arm. But I'd be like, if you're trying to wake him up, like old slap arm. him or do something. <laughs> this is my new arm. That was my old arm. I don't want to play with you anymore. Who knows if it's a real arm at this point? Oh, they sh yeah. See, they do flashes of his fiery landing. I, they really are like, hey, audience. You know, you thought Adar was Sauron. What if it's the wizard man, and then they're gonna be like, turns out it wasn't either of them, ooh! Like, uh -huh. Yeah, she said this is like her realization that he's in some kind of trance-like state, he doesn't care about her, and he's not in control of himself. That's what you're supposed to get from this. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see them doing that more often. I, I think there's a couple of characters, Galadriel's another one of those, where, where they're gonna sort of play around with the, the, the flirtation with darkness sort of aspect with it. And if he's just arrived and it's not in full control either of his language or his brain or his magic he is of the same order of being as sauron is um power corrupts is a fairly simple narrative device you can use and they will claim that that's what tolkien wanted as well so you can sort of flirt with the idea of steve here becoming you know well maybe maybe he'll turn evil even if he isn't sauron he maybe he has things to learn about what being good actually entails um and you you could do interesting things with that it's just that i think they're only doing this again because they want to keep the mystery alive is he in fact sauron no he's almost certainly not but yeah we just, we have to run with it because they thought they had that really good idea and that's the only one they've got yeah it's like if you take the language thing that um he didn't understand language until she was saying the words but then the concepts that she intended came across into his mind you could do an almost kind of imprinting stage nature nurture that he came down as a blank slate and his first experiences are what would make him into the person he was they could do that yeah. but i i don't I, I don't think they have the talent <laughs> like i don't think they even <laughs> intend to do that it's always interesting being the ones like sitting here and saying well they could do this this might be good. This might be quite a clever thing to do. It almost guarantees they will not do it because that requires like a true. modicum. Rules it out. Well, I always felt it's an indication that we were never, any of us, in a position of we will hate this no matter what. It's like we keep doing it like, oh, why didn't you had all your things you needed to do this? Why didn't you do that? I would have liked that. But it's oh, just well. bad. It's poorly made. Very. I think they start that. with an end goal and try and reach it rather than start Looking with an backwards. interesting idea and see how it plays out. Yeah, they forgot to characterize people. How do you do that? To do that when you're doing <laughs> when you focus on other things. Yeah. Um 
So yeah, uh, I kind of, I find it annoying that that's where this scene is going then, that she's going to be like, oh my god, you're probably possibly evil when she has no reason to assume that at all, when he's clearly, once this ha- Like, if you thought for even a second, like, he must be evil because that was an attempt to hurt me or something, it's like, so why didn't he just, like, why would you even- He's clearly like, wait, what's going on? Hey, buddy, his method of hurting you was to put his hand in some water, then turn it into ice and hope you would grab his hand and then also have your hand <laughs> turn into ice. <laughs> he the deliberately leaves that? you. That's what he means. Because he knows Man, like, what he's doing might be dangerous. This show is so retarded. I just can't get over it. I'm saying, I, can, I can't be able to deal with that. To apologize. Like, what? He approaches it. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. If we get that scene, like next episode, she's like, "I don't trust you anymore. You, you hurt me." Blah, blah, blah. Then by the fa finale, she's like, "Actually, it's what like, you did was uh, an accident." Oh, like yeah. that—they're gonna treat that as like a three-episode <laughs> arc or some shit. Yeah, because she said that he was good, and then maybe he wasn't. Maybe so you're good, not good. You know. Oh no. Maybe he is good after all. <laughs> <laughs> you could just see one of the writers be like, "This is what we call character writing." Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can. You can always just imagine in the writer's room where you, they wrote this down on the whiteboard and he smiled because of how because of how smart it was. A lot of people wonder how we do this. Well, <laughs> I can see that it does Why take a lot of talent. Why do you think that's the voice that the writers have more? <laughs> Why oh, it's just a random voice. Like? Random voice plucked from the ether of voiceness. But I, I'm almost certain that's the one. 100% actually. <laughs> there, off she runs. Now we're over to the Dwarven Elves storyline, which we haven't touched in a while. Last we saw them was yeah. uh, when he was like, keep my oath, bitch. Right? Was that the last thing? From the last episode? I have a terrible yeah, secret. Yeah, was. have a piece of it. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and my god, that gets developed real good. And I, I can't wait to talk about some of the cope that was on Twitter from this one. Uh, so, yeah, we open with like, hey, Durin uh, from Gilgalad. He's like, so why are you, uh, why are you digging so deep lately? Hmm? What's that about? Hmm? 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 Seems a little weird. Seems a little unusual. What's going on there? And then he's like, oh yeah? Well, why are the elves expanding so much? You guys don't usually do that so fast. What's going on there? And he's like, hmm. And then uh, Elrond, like, interrupts <laughs> him from saying shit. <laughs> this show was very impressed with itself for getting close to saying the word shit, which I was like, Isn't, aren't they allowed to say that? I guess they're trying it, to keep it they're like, eyebrow. Oh, that could be yeah, it, yeah. Sorry. There are no just swear words in, in Tolkien. <laughs> they were just curses. Not anymore, baby. He all, he pretty much did say it. it just Elrond got in the way. Uh, yeah, I know. It's basically him saying it. Uh, and also, before him, just to point out the horrible dialogue, right? Um, the, the king, Gilgalad, he says, Durin, I should like to commend you. But then he doesn't go on to commend him, and he just ends up asking a question. <laughs> and it's like, do, do they not understand what they're saying in their own dialogue? And then they... Just jump from concept to concept without connection. It's so frustrating, this writing. Well, that's oh kind of what I'm getting at. Like, like Durin then goes on his table rant. And uh, before we talk about that, it was like, <laughs> hang on, mate. Like, we got two questions that were asked there. Nobody, nobody's gonna know. And, but this scene does indeed end without any reference back to those two questions being asked. That's, yeah, but that, one of them, that's the why the table was mentioned. Answer. It Sorry? was meant to be like emotional blackmail of the table. Like, look, you're offending me. And so he puts them, this is their, you know, political intrigue moment, that he's completely outplayed them by making them feel guilty so they forget the question that was asked. <laughs> I don't even know that, well, he had a question too, that he, I guess he didn't care for the answer for. We've moved on, I guess, we're not going to answer either of the size questions, because of this table thing, which, I have some criticisms of this whole table thing. This might be the one yeah. time in the episode where we what? jump forward while addressing this, because we need that one extra bit of information, okay? We do, we do, yep. <laughs> so, for those who have no idea what we're talking about, Durin is like, this table is made of stone that is so rare that whenever we find it, us dwarves, we only ever use it for tombs and uh, monuments. Like, it's very sacred. He's saying it grows, he's saying like it grows deep or only grows yeah. at certain, certain elevations. Depths. Yeah, at certain depths. So... If he's correct, if that's true, he's implying that they must have grave robbed, is the impression I got. I know, the that's the impression I got as well. It's like, well, you know, the stuff only grows in the places the dwarves are, essentially. So, if you guys have it, kind of suspicious. Yeah, the dwarves so... are uniquely difficult to steal gravestones from because you have to get into their minds to find it. That was actually something I was thinking about after I'd finished the episode, because I was just like, how do you even... How? It's not like they're just perched on some hills and left alone. It's like, stealing from dwarves is going to be real tough. Uh, is it easier or harder than stealing a dragon egg? Oh, I don't even... 
Okay. Depends I, on the dragon. I suppose so. Suppose so. Um. But yeah. Uh. I guess conclusion one. If this is true, and Gilgalad is entertaining it as true and knows it's true and is apologizing, then that just makes the elves twats. Like that's the that's one line of interpretation or conclusion, I guess, to make. Because nothing's really confirmed in that regard. But we already know the elves are twats. But yeah, they are kind of twats. <laughs> uh, it's it would just be like to know that as a truth. It's like yeah, we grave rob sometimes in order to take stone we like. It's like oof, rough man. But uh, lucky Durin's taken this so well. If that's true, it's like okay, yeah. Second interpretation is that Gilgalad does not know whether or not that's true. He has no idea where this stone is from, and so he's just saying, like, man, that, that sucks. I'm sorry about that. You can you can have the table. Which I think is the likely one that the writers want us to feel is the case. He has no idea where this table's from. He's willing to uh, concede to Durin that that's the case. A little, a little bit a little bit spineless, I think, from Gilgalad, which is how he's been characterized so far, so whatever, but just... To be like, uh, is that the case? Yeah. And he knows nothing about where this table came from. He can't find out where it came from. He's just going to concede immediately that they did something pretty horrible. Uh, because yeah, Durin has said so. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, this guy is how many thousands of years old? He was probably around when they got the table. He probably knows exactly where they he got it. I was there and when the rock was formed in the crust of the earth. And sorry, and it's I, was there, is, Warren, I was there. I was there three million years Gil ago. Gilgalad is actually old enough to have seen the world become round. Actually, he's like he's that old. He's like from the. Let me tell you, things changed. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when we find out the actual, you know, truth about this table, ruins everything because that means okay, where did the table actually come from? It's much more likely that Gilgalad knows where it comes from, and that this, you know, little trick Durin is playing wouldn't work at all. Uh, it's just, yeah, Correct. when he asked the question, do you know where this comes from? It was a massive bluff. And Gelgalad could have just got yeah, the market down the road. And because it's just <laughs> turned out to be a piece of rock. So it didn't even really make sense to play that way in the first place. They, the, the least they could have done is gone, well, it's a rare rock that we know you can't get access to. Yeah. Um, because that is the bonus piece of information, right? We find out later this this isn't at all what Durin said it is. It, for all we know, it's just a random fucking rock that can be found in many places. In which case, what a gamble from Durin, because if they knew he was lying, that really looks bad for him. That he would have, like, guilted all these people on a, on a subject that's pretty sensitive and very serious to accuse, like, the elves of grave robbing dwarves. Yeah, on what essentially is a diplomatic meeting, too. Yep. And why did he do this? Because he's, I don't know, he felt pretty smug about it when Elrond points out, he's like, oh, you lied, didn't you? And he's like, <laughs> yep. Because he just wanted to screw with them. Yep. Uh, and No, it was to hide the mithril. But that turned, like, in literally three minutes later, it turns completely pointless. So the entire scene was redundant in the first place. I mean, place. you say hide the mithril, as if it was so hard to say, like, why are you mining so deep? It's like, well, we've been We're up. looking for ore. We're, we're yeah. dwarves, we mine, we're looking we like... for ore, we're looking for gold and jewels and shit. I know, it wouldn't be hard, it's like, he could have just said, we like gold, you twat, what do you think? <laughs> we're dwarves, <laughs> we live in the mountain, mining is, it's what we do. Culture shame us. Exactly. Yeah. But no, instead he makes up this huge lie that could have cost him a shit ton more. I thought it was really Ab Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a really ball. It it is not a safe lie at all. This is a ballsy lie mm -hmm. to talk about the table this way and essentially insinuating that it was stolen from them when you have no idea what this table is from. Really, how the elves got it? How long they've had it? You don't know. That's a ballsy lie. It, you're like one of those. You're like one of those pastors who predicts the end of the world. You know, he's like, you know what? I appreciate <laughs> the audacity of you. To make a, a prediction that the world will end on a particular date, you're staking a lot. You're staking a lot on this one. Uh, this one guess of yours. I, I, in a way, I kind of respect that. The 2012 this also is kind of. Uh, sorry, guy. The people, the people who said about 2012, right? There was a shit ton of them, and then they were like, "Oh, mm. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. next time." Well, do you, I guess how many of you remember Y2K? I was alive then. Yeah. yeah. I remember. yeah. So <laughs> this also implies the dwarves or, or Durin is basically trying to claim all ownership of a type of rock that anyone could really find if they dig deep enough or anything like that. And what if the elves just found it? And it's like, you know, we like this stone too. You're saying you, we can't 
get the stone if we can find it ourselves. The dwarves suddenly own this type of rock and no one else is allowed to touch it. Yeah, unless <laughs> Durin was about to double down and be like, it's only found in our mines. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> oh, shit. Wow. I don't wow, know. Okay. I didn't know that. It's, mm. it's a special, yeah. It's a terrible lie. If you're going to give lying lessons, th this is not how you lie. You have a you have a, a lot to lose, and you have a table to gain. <laughs> Potentially, if everything works out perfectly, you get a table. So, next scene. This one's particularly frustrating too. Do you know, I, I I do this a lot. I've said it, but um, this opens with basically Gilgalad being like, "You've been lying to me, Elrond." And then everyone's like, "No, you've been lying to me, King." And I was like, "I <sighs> just." <laughs> Hey everybody! <laughs> what am I dealing with now? What is this? Basically, um, there's this line Elrond delivers here. Actually, I hope I can get the subtitle for it. Cause it was fucking blew my mind. Elrond is annoyed at the king because he claims that uh, oh. he went to Durin in like aid of friendship. Meanwhile, you, King, uh, like, 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 your goal was for sending me there was, the, it was, it was much more tangible. And it was, he's referring to the ore. And I'm just like, did this show forget what happened in episode one and two? You wonder if they legitimately forgot the entire, like, behind the scenes job of Elrond during that whole Durin Elrond plot. It, it, se it, it legit seems like they just forgot. Yeah, because the only thing that links in from Gilgalad and Celebrimbor is one line that said, you know, Durin's been a bit suspicious recently. It's like he's avoiding me. And that entire thing was their master plan to get Aaron to discover Mithril. It was... The... It means they had to know, have known about Mithril before even sending him. Well, yeah, but they didn't can you imagine him. how vague he kinda, a plan I mean, that is. It turns out he kind of... <laughs> they did? know about it before sending him? Oh, yeah, they definitely knew about it in a general sense. We'll get to that, because that's very soon from here. But what I'm getting at is that Elrond is like, man, we need to we need to build this thing faster, huh? How do we do it? And then Elrond's like, well, have you tried dwarves? And then Celebrimble's like, huh. He's like now recanting this story as though it's not true that he went to the dwarves himself with a proposition. He's changed the story to, I went to them with friendship in mind, and you were there for the awe. It's like, no, neither of those things are true. You I were know, there he's such... to get workers, you liar. <laughs> He's so full of crap, Elrond. Ah, oh, I couldn't. <laughs> I just like I You're legit was curious if they've forgotten. So yeah, he said like I went to think convention. that this was a secret master plan right from the start. That they knew exactly every single move Elrond was going to make, and so manipulated him. Really? So, for, for, so yeah, I think that's what they're going for. So from the start, they only sent him there to reconnect, so they could send him back and get him to discover Mithril. But they didn't even. <sighs> They didn't even the suggest the dwarves. It was Elrod. Yeah, yeah. What if Elrod just didn't suggest the dwarves? He was like, well, we could, you know, get some other elves from up there and help them out. We could get this done. And I mean, yeah, it's also, I mean, it's not just the mithril they need, because they do genuinely need the workers to build the, the forge at Eregion, which you then see being built. But it sort of guess, it's, yeah. seems yeah. like it's unintentionally making Elrod. I, I think it's having Elrond tells more lies than it realizes <laughs> it's having him tell, because. Yeah. So you've got this one, but then, you know, of course he gets to see Jiren and he tells Jiren that he's there because 20 years is too long to be away even for an elf. And then he comes back here and then the meeting after this one, he'll say, I lied. I, I didn't come for friendship. I came for ambition, but the ambition was other people's. But he, but Durin already knows that they had a plan and that they needed to build the forge and that they needed workers to do that because that's the deal he presented to him over dinner. So. Elrond is sort of I, I came for I came for friendship, but also for workers. But I didn't actually mean it when I said that I came either for friendship or for workers. I came for the other thing, depending on what the requirements of this specific scene happen to be. And it makes no sense. I think maybe Elrond is just shockingly easy to manipulate. But he yes. manipulates other people. He manipulates Jurin at multiple times. Every yeah. time Jurin pushes back on anything, That's he's just I'm your That's friend. The... That's the thing. It's like, oh, the manipulator is easily manipulated. Ah, oh, ooh, look Whoa. at that. It's, it's, it's not at all what they were going for, but, I mean, if you're a bad writer, you are, you're given results that you're not intending to. Oh, no, it's safe to say all the irony in this show is unintended, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was immediately scene. incredibly frustrated. I went to Casa Doom with a proposal of friendship while you were there for the awe. Just like you don't remember what happened, Elrond. You're making this you, shit up. You were, you were, you were there for the. It was never about friendship. It was never there. It was he so awful. Get, he turned up you with building a tower. He was trying to bank on his friendship to get the proposal in place, and then he realized, oh, I guess I have been away for I two decades, and you've taken that personally. <laughs> like, I good thing, good thing, Deza was there to really smooth things along shockingly well. Um, yeah. Or else this wouldn't have happened at all. So, um, this felt like such a non sequitur to me when he explains his issue with the king and how he feels he's lied. The king just goes, hmm, okay. Have you heard of the High Elves? Uh, well, he says, <laughs> uh, re Recite you... a story for me now! <laughs> when he says, are you familiar with the song of the roots of, I think it's Ethelgear or something like that? Oh. God. It could be anything. I just started yeah. laughing because it sounds like such a like you tell someone your big issue with them, then you sit down, there's a bit of silence, and then just have you heard of blah blah blah? They're just like, what? No, no, we're we're not we're not doing whatever that is. Okay, we're, we're talking about something very specific right now. Uh, but hey, I mean, why not? Right? Let's tell a story. Oh, this is so fucking weird. I thought that maybe this would be directly from. Tolkien's writing, so that I'd have to take the hard stance of being like, this seems pretty retarded, not gonna lie. No, it's completely invented, and it is still that retarded. So... I mean, it's... It's... Oh, God. The short version is, there was like an elven knight and a balrog, and they were right next to a tree, and they the elven knight put all of his good into the tree, the balrog put all uh, his uh, evil uh, into the tree. But wait, 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 the, the tree had a hidden Silmaril deep inside it. Uh, there's just another Silmaril uh, suddenly. And the Silmaril are really significant because they're the, you know, origin of the Silmarillion um, uh, and stuff. Well, that's why the book is named after him. And they cause so many issues and everything. And now they're just saying, oh, yeah, yeah there's another one. Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, so, and because... Why does the Balrog not just hit the elf? Uh, yeah, I don't... You don't understand the metaphor. It's another tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a ge it's a general concept of some sort of a struggle between two opposing forces. It's not like a literal. I fucking hope so, right? But it is I literal. Hope so. it creates it is, it's literal. It is literal, That's though. De it's definitely what is happening. Is it super metaphorical? Are you sure? Ex? You know, you know how elves are with their stories. They don't get boggled in the nitty gritty of tactics and strategy. It's, you know it's how I know you're wrong? No, no, because if we describe the events of this show, you'd be like, that must be metaphor. <laughs> There's no yeah. way that that's <laughs> This show is a very Rags. expensive metaphor. <laughs> I know you're being sarcastic, but the context of the show is that this is the literal explanation of Mithril, and Mithril yeah. can only yeah. exist if this story is real. If it's, it's metaphorical, all then so is the Mithril, and the Mithril is also... It's metaphor magic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. So there's good, good evil tree, evil, mithril, lightning, a Silmaril, and then a lightning strike hits the tree, and that makes Mithril a thing. Oh, what? God. <laughs> Seriously, I was oh, just I like, I'm not even going to begin to understand yeah. this. <laughs> and holy crap, they, they managed to ruin Mithril. Mithril now has evil components in it because the king's explanation of the ore is that it is as pure and light as good and strong and unyielding as evil. And what I heard, I was like, that's all. Dude, the well, that... because because good is not strong or unyielding. No, exactly, that's, like, a like, that's a trait of the evil. King, for the king to think evil is strong and unyielding is like, oh, okay, he's a villain. Because only I, a villain would believe. Yeah, that's, that. that's just what was most you like. The I have other rings. questions now that you've said that. <laughs> I wish it to explore so, your perspective on something. It is so remarkable how much this fucks up in past, present, and future at the same time in the space of about 30 seconds because like if it's supposed to tie into the lord of the rings films that means that frodo who has the mithril vest is literally wearing the light of the silmarils in which case no one can actually touch him or get anywhere near him because the light of the silmarils basically burns orcs to death uh, so no one can touch him for well it's that diluted reason. by yeah. all of the strong and yielding so, evil the strong and evil it's it's evil. A it's on it. orcs can walk out in moonlight right because it's not like it's sunlight but it's bouncing off something they else. dipped so it, it in the kind of really you know? thick oily wine and now it doesn't shine as much it, it the, the, show, the show it does it screws everybody because the Frodo show is trying to say flammable there, for all three movies <laughs> there is so much like magic light in mithril that it can save the elves who are now suddenly all about to die because yeah. the tree this has 
this is that and then plot the is that thing about the and then plot i'd have no idea about oh our souls will wither to nothing because the light of the valar we need these rocks the mithril <laughs> in, the, in this ore that came from this tree that got struck by lightning in this fight against good and evil and that there's a silmaril somewhere involved and I'm, I'm just like, what the fuck is yeah, happening? I mean, like, Are from you the perspective you of from show continuity? No one still knows what the Silmarils are, so like that makes no sense, you know, just from within the, the show's universe. Well, well uh, the Celebrimbor does. He mentioned them. Oh no! What I'm saying is that the the show doesn't. The show has not set up for the audience what Silmarils are. So like people there know they exist, but the show hasn't explained what they are, why they matter, what their importance is. Um, they're, they're sort of retroactively being thrown in here is well they have the light of the valor in them and well the light of the valor is leaving the elves and so we need to get the mithril because that has the light of the silmarils in it to save ourselves um Does which is say what the light of the valor is no <laughs> does it actually like explain what that is or is it just supposed to be like oh that's a thing that they need they need the light of the valor yeah, it's one of those think... law things that it's it's claiming it's throwing it in as a, as a name in order again to trick people into thinking that it respects the law more than it does. Like the elves have the light of the valor in them at this point in history, but the light of the valor very slowly and gradually leaves them, and that's what you see uh, the elves in the, the Peter Jackson films have sort of come to the end of their time in Middle Earth because the light of, of the uh, the light of the elves has faded, and they all have to leave and go back to Valinor because they've been allowed back in to to live essentially unless they choose to sacrifice their immortality as as uh, Arwen I think does. Um, so that that sort of it's the background kind of to that, but it, it's a perverted form of the background to that because that's that's complete horseshit. Like none of this works. It doesn't make any sense because, like, okay, let's say let's take the show's explanation of it. Mithril has the light of the Valar in them because it has the light of the Silmaril in it. Not that the show is established that the Silmarils have the light of the Valar in them, really. Why not? Okay, how much Mithril does it take then? I mean, does can Elrond just give a his lot. little piece of Mithril to people? Oh, he's gone. All right, what? well, enough oh, of that. It, so... it did say saturate in the light. But the thing, I was wondering, do you think this is like a rights issue due to the fact that they actually can't say anything about the, the Silver Reels or what happened or any legitimate thing, because it's in the Silver Reel, in which they don't own. So they mm -hmm. had to make up just a BS fake reason to put them in so that they could then describe them in their sort of fake new mythology, because then they're not breaking the rights. They were definitely just... proud of this. They thought this was really cool. Oh, I mean, it's, uh, I yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. But hang on, what were you saying before you disconnected? Sorry, yeah. Um, so if, if you need more Mithril than just the piece that Elrond has, could you not just say to the dwarves, hey, look, we're dying. Can we just come and, you know, just do a <laughs> pilgrimage to your cave, go through it for a bit, and then we're fine again. Um, the, by tying the light of the elves to the Mithril in this way, it invites all of these really basic mechanical questions that the show won't be interested in answering the way i think it's going is that they'll say well the elves need to forge the rings of power because the rings have mithril in them and they will use the rings as the way to stop the elves from dying and that oh, i think really? is where they will go with it which is oh my nice, goodness that's my read of it so far Ah, uh, because it's it seems so arbitrary that suddenly, uh, what episode five or something, all the elves are dying because a tree has fungus growing on it. I was like, <laughs> where did that come from? What? Hey, it was <laughs> set up in episode one no with a goo sense. leaf. Come on, uh, it, it was a it goo made leaf. No sense. Yeah, but it was the connection. Why does like scum on a tree mean the elves are now dying? That's yeah. just reasons. God, the evil what? is growing because the light is fading. Yeah, because it's not. It's, well, it's not even as if the light is fading, like it was a a, a product that was being used up. Because they thought it was war that was causing it. So it was almost yes. like a, an evil influence can destroy their light rather than them using it up as they kind of live. But to the mithril, he did say, "We need you to mine as much as possible because we have to saturate every single elf yes. in it." So that implies you could need a lot. Like does, you're going to have to mine all of it. Never mind that the interesting question is to how you saturate people in stone, but yeah. you know, I guess the light from the stone is, is, <laughs> the, is sit the, in a room. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so just sit. But that's the point. Then why not just go on a pilgrimage and walk through the caves? Just open up a cave, <laughs> and go, walk through it. Yeah. you're fine. Yeah, why not? And then you <laughs> make friends with the dwarves. It's all fine. And then the other thing is, okay, well, they know that their light is fading, and that means they will die. However. It's established in this show that they can just choose to go back to Valinor anytime they want. And Valinor still has its own light there. So why don't they just say, well, fuck it then. We're leaving and we're going back to Valinor. The king can determine that. The king sent yes. Galadriel back in the last episode. So like, none of this makes any sense and the show hasn't thought it through. 
But that reason there is also why Durin's um, decision to help makes no sense at all. Because when he's given the proposition, and it's that the elves, who are annoying little know-it-all, you know, uh, idiots, right? It's like, this will force them to leave Middle-earth, and it's all there for the humans and dwarves. You can have it all. That would be like, I thought Durin would be like, that's a great thing. All right, sweet. Off you go. See you later. Dude, Chad, and not then only that, even... it proved all of his theories right, that they were only in it for the orcs. Yes. Exactly. And so the re his reasons to helping out, not even there in actual fact, he could be insulted enough to not help. And on top of that, say they couldn't even go back to Valinor, right? They're, it's not like they're suddenly going to be wiped out. It just means they lose their immortality. And from Durin's perspective, I thought he would be thinking like, oh, so that just makes him on an even playing field to everyone else and makes him actually fair. I, I think he'd be okay with that as well. They can still have babies and their race continue and everything. It just means that they're not Im immortal anymore. The and and everyone's... Yeah. It's massively it, useful to the dwarves. The dwarves can demand anything in return for, for yeah, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, see, Durin was ruined for that, but I'm hoping his dad will, you know, put up more of a fight on this one. Yeah. Um, in character fight. Gilgalad does say to Alrond that if we leave, every other race will fall to evil, essentially, which is mo supposed to be Durin's motivation. Although I'm not sure he's ever told about that. But I would yeah. think that Durin and everyone, they're not going to believe that. What, we need no. the elves to just survive? <laughs> Oh, who who do you think you so, are? Kind of thing. The arrogance. Is, one of the things is like, I'm pretty sure you're trying to steal this thing from me, and they're like, Nope, I'm just here as a friend. By the way, can I have that thing? And you're like, No. And they go, Oh well, you know, if you a, don't give it friend, to me, the world will die. And you're like, Oh really? Oh my really? goodness, I better give it to you then. I don't want the world to die. Hmm. <laughs> oh, what a coincidence! Why didn't you tell me this from the beginning? No, so, there's there's too much of it to, to sort of really go into. But I mean, anyone who is 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 interested, go into the Silmarillion, and from, I think it's basically about chapter 6 onwards, um, is the alternative to this. So essentially, from chapter 6 onward of the Silmarillion contains all of the content, all of the material, all of these epic, epic stories, um, and the sacrifices and the betrayals and, and the rich myth and world building that this show has just replaced with there was a tree and there was some lightning, ergo mithril, ergo cool. Just go and read that bit, or listen to it on Audible, it's a really good version, and just see, like, sort of the extent of the desecration that this redone version actually amounts to, because you're, you're basically getting rid of the equivalent of Romeo and Juliet with vampires, werewolves, Satan, Balrogs, demons, um, collapsing cities, massive betrayals, three, no, two further kinslayings of elves against elves, the murder of elvish kings by dwarves, the massacre of dwarves by elves, all of this has been reduced to lightning tree mithril. Um, which is why sort of people who kind of like Tolkien get quite pissed off about this kind of thing. Do people who like oxygen get pissed off by this sort of thing? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, the, yeah, not, not counting all the reasons, <laughs> other reasons to be pissed off by this kind of thing. Back to the books, back to the books, back to the books. That was apparently their uh, <laughs> slogan throughout the entire thing. Um, <laughs> what's really annoying is he basically just says, Mithril. But without saying it, and then Elrond's like, hmm, hmm, so Durin was right. Which is like, probably shouldn't have said that, mate. Like, because you're already implying. Elrond is, is really dumb. But it's okay, all right? We're going to give him a chance. Like, he, he, he was too rash. He, he can still it's, rescue it's it. He like, can be like, oh, Durin was just right that you guys yeah, clearly have an ulterior like, motive. That's all. Yeah, then, does Durin have this thing? I'll never tell you where it is. Like, what, 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 what? No, don't say that. So, he was okay for a moment there, and then Gilgalad says, you know, like, so you admit it, there is an awe. But then Elrod's response here could just be like, huh? No, I'm saying that Durin was right that you guys are after something. But instead, he says, I only admit that I have a secret, but I'll keep it. Not a good idea. You could have just, this is Wong in, uh, in Multiverse Madness. Yeah, Manus. pretty much. You've, you've already, you've... You've said too much already. You've you fucked it up. I just like I hate it, and it's like yeah, well, it gets the door open, doesn't it? And now the secret's gonna come tumbling out soon enough. Yep. And then uh, and then something funny happens that happens in these shows every once in a while where the king's all upset. He just wanders off. And then Elrond's following him, and it's because he wants to tell him about this goo tree. And it's like, why don't you? Why don't you like act like real people? Where Elrond would be like, hello, what, what, what's happening? Where are we going? He's just walking real slowly to this tree. I hate that. I hate that in conversations when one of the characters leaves, and you don't know if I'm supposed to follow you, or is our conversation over? Are you... I, 
Are you mad I, at me? I guess I'm weak. <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we not friends now? What if Gilgalad turned around and Elrond wasn't there? He's like, oh, <laughs> Elrond's yeah, sitting I at the table maybe... just waiting. He's like, he went to pee, I think. He's like, yeah, I, I guess I'll just sit here and fucking mope. No. I, I don't even get this tree bit, though, because this is where they send, like, they stand under it when um, Galadriel originally gets sent off. But they say they sent her off because the tree was getting destroyed in the first place. Yeah. So every single person that stood under that tree apparently didn't notice that just black goo and mold was growing all over the thing to yeah, begin with. Nobody had a good look. It was only Gilgalad. Uh, or, or maybe some people noticed. They were like, oh, that's just the tree. That's normal. <laughs> some trees look like that. <laughs> that's the goo tree. It's fine. This is the goo tree. Yeah, that's right. But like, this, not this mine, is... of course. No, this of is course. evil goo. Oh, no, no, um, definitely not. Exactly. And mine is, is yeah. not that. Oh, no, not at all. Of course. And so Not the, the thing that I felt mm -hmm. that was uh, pretty funny here is like the just direct confirmation. This is already something we figured, but Gilgalad basically just says that, uh, you know, we saw this evil goo uh, before Galadriel had left, and we thought if she fucked off, that would, that would make the goo fuck off, but it but it only got faster. So I'd just be sitting there like, what was the logic there, mate? Like, what? You, you thought getting rid of Galadriel would get rid of the goo because, as he said in episode one, if the if the evil isn't being like hunted and attacked, then it won't accidentally be encouraged or something. Like wow, which is just, just I mean, retarded logic. It's like no. if we do nothing <laughs> about evil's growth, that'll stop it from growing further. It's like you what? <laughs> no, I, I I will defend them on this one, right? It, because if Galadriel mm. returns, you've all you've all met Galadriel, right? So if she returns yeah. and you suddenly your tree descends into evil, and you're like, well, that bitch has just turned up. It's definitely her fault. We better send her <laughs> off. It's like I'm fully behind that What's idea funny about that it? they thought she was so evil that she could corrupt the entire Elven race, <laughs> and she needed to be sent away. Well, the thing I'm is, he may still be right. Idea. He may still be right because she didn't leave. <laughs> She's still around. She's just a little bit further away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to tree. send her up even further. We need to kill Galadriel. The, the audience is a audience surrogate tree. Like this is the wilting of the audience every time she's on screen. <laughs> I too want to leave. But this uh, is but... one of those things though. When he concludes that, you're just with him. You're like, you just hate Galadriel, don't you? <laughs> it's fair. You can just say it. Like we, we all kind of hate. No, but it, then he's like, Everyone yeah, I he's like, hey man, it's okay. We all fucking hate her. <laughs> Separate to the log like the the meme logic, right? Which is all, which is fun. But Gilgalad's actual belief is that it is war that's causing the spread of evil. So I was gonna get Galadriel to go away, so the elves will be strong enough to wage war to stop the evil. And it's like, hang on, your intention is to wage war anyway? And uh, isn't that the thing that he was thinking was making evil grow? And then he admits that no, 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 we need the elves to fight back. It's like. What are you doing, mate? What were you thinking? It's just... <laughs> Listen, he's having trouble. He's, he's getting old. Maybe. Such a weird choice to the goo tree. Yeah, it's like this. It's like tendrils infecting it. It's not because when we talk about the light of the Valar and the a lot of the stuff doesn't seem to have like a physical like appearance to it. It, it's kind of spoken almost as if it's, it's symbolic, but this is a very real infection. Like you could reach on it and pull these things off the tree. Yeah, and it's come from is, somewhere. Very physical. Yeah, I, I guess it, it's, it's hard to know the state of kind of everything, the state of everything in terms of politics and where things are in time and place and distance. But stuff like this, when it leans so heavily into it, you just can't really follow what means what. And wouldn't the elves feel like this? Because they said this is an external representation of what's happening to us. Surely they should feel different. Cons like the, the damage that that tree's had to it. They should feel weaker or something by this point. That's the thing, because like, I think the light of the valor isn't supposed to be just this, this thing that shines on you externally or from an external source. Because I think the sun has the light of the valor in it as well, when the, the sun is created from sort of the remains of, of one of the trees. Uh, but it, it's point, actually, yeah. the, the, the elves are imbued with the light of the Valar because of creation, and so it's a natural thing. The further they are from Valinor, they lose the light from inside themselves. It's not a thing that they're bathed in from outside, and you can't replicate that by bathing them in it from the outside, though they find it very beautiful. Um, and but again, I think this is sort of a side effect of, of what happens when the show is forced or either either is forced or chooses to do away with a lot of this sort of lore world building stuff is that 
the more of that they do away with, the more they have to create for themselves and the more they have to rely on their own imaginations. And their own imaginations don't function particularly well. They're not especially broad or deep. And so the reason a lot of this doesn't make sense, even without reference to the law, it just doesn't make sense in universe, is because we are relying on the writers to give us this stuff and they haven't thought about any of it. So it's... Hard, it's like, yeah. I don't even know if it makes sense. I don't have information to work with. I'm just sort of like, just like accepting the things that I'm told without being able to... It's like, well, I, I guess that's okay. That's the way it works then. Well, or, okay, this is happening now. I guess. If we, if we were there me, so. with Gilgalad and he sees this, I'd be like, oh man, you're going to need to get like a gardener in here to tell you what the fuck's going on. Your trees clearly got rot. And he goes, no, this is the light of the Eldar fading. I'd be like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> you sure? You sure it's not worth getting this tested? Has this ever happened it's before? It's woodworm. That's it's what it turns out to be. And a uh, Gilgalad would be like, oh shit. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, so we're going to uh, cut the tree down. He's like, no. Separate to all that as well, it is direct proof that, like, some type of really bad evil is still present in Middle-earth. Very likely Sauron, you know. It's direct proof Galadriel was right all along. And their intent to try and fix it is to not I don't fight know. that evil. Think about if you're in Gil-Galad's position and Galadriel's going on about Sauron and your tree has got all this stuff on it. Like, could you draw a connection between her suggesting Sauron is still af out there and this happening to the tree? Because these seem the completely independent from one another. You know, I, I would agree you're right if outside of the context of, like, Lord of the Rings and the concept of evil and stuff and that, and that this is, like, like, evil has a corrupting influence and it's caused by some really bad entity and everything. And so the fact that this tree is falling to corruption in the context of the world seems to be an indication that something Morgoth related bad is happening in the world and you might want to do something to fix it. Yeah. I mean, when the trees in Valinor decayed and, and were killed, according to this show's telling, that was because of the actual existence of, and presence of Morgoth. It, they didn't die just because somebody suggested Morgoth might be there. They died because he was there. And so the elves with that experience would look at these two options and say, well, which is the most probable? Is it that Galadriel is simply mentioning the prospect of Sauron that's causing the trees to get depressed? Or is it that maybe Sauron is actually there somewhere? Well, given their past experience, there's only really one conclusion that's reasonable to draw. Well. I don't know. I think it's all very poorly explained. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, it, 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 it is true. that. It, it, it is very drawn, poorly. Because I'm just like, I don't know, is the fucking, are the fucking tree spirits peeved? Like, I don't know. What's maybe maybe this like, is a head is it's I like don't know. you guys suck. even real you don't feed He's me like water enough. Out of the planet right like, i don't you're, even you're, know mola your suggestion in on friday night tights was just a really excited orc is up the tree doing <laughs> something <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can interpret whatever he might be doing uh just yeah um so yeah so, gilgalad's yeah, like the... right then um oh wait sorry we're we gonna say something no, I was just gonna say it's, it's either like the orc up the tree or, or it's an ent that's having to sit there listening to gilgalad's speeches and it's just getting very miserable. It met Galadriel. It's like, it met Galadriel. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's like, so did the dwarves find the ore then? And Elrond's like, look, some oaths may hold little weight to some people, but to me, my soul is bound to it. I don't intend to let mine slip away. Which has now become kind of an interesting thought, because that means that Elrond really does believe Gilgal is telling the truth, and that the end of the world is nigh. However, he doesn't want to break his word that he would tell anybody about Mithril. Do you know what I mean? Like, we almost flip around now to, like, Elrond, oh, you probably should tell him if you truly believe what he's saying, which does sound a little bit absurd. At the very least, you could just go up to him and say, hey, man, the world's gonna end. Can I tell him? <laughs> that, like, you know? That is the obvious plan B that never comes up. Just never does. No, no yeah, character like, ever suggests this. Because if the uh, world's gonna end, I'm sure that he would be like, you know what, if the world is going to end, then yeah, you know what, I'm okay with you oh, telling people, it's chill. And to clarify, that does happen, but not before something yeah. else, which we are almost at. Yeah. And this is the thing that everyone got mad at discussing online as well. So, yeah, why aren't they focusing on the fact that the world's ending? That was like my whole thing. If, uh, if, because Elrond seems to be completely believing it, so at this point you should just be like, oh shit, I'm going to have to break my oath, right? Because I'd be retarded not to at this point, but... The only question he's being asked, he's answering anyway by saying, like, if I said, have you eaten a burger recently? And like, well, I would answer you, but answering that would break my oath that I wasn't going to tell anyone about what I did. Like, okay, so you ate the burger then. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. Even as yeah, if yeah, they have right. extra information about the myth. Yeah, well, if it's the answer yes was no, no yeah. If the answer was no, then you'd just say no. Like what? You yeah, exactly. swore an oath that you'd never say you did say fight Mithril. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. He, Elrond all but admits it because the, the line was like, "Jordan was right," and then he, like the king says, "Then you admit the dwarves uh, did find it," and he says, "I admit only this. I promised Jordan to never reveal his people's secrets." Which is he basically uh... saying, <laughs> <laughs> "So you reveal it? <laughs> you just revealed it, then you freaking moron." <laughs> yeah, you're right. So he's already broken the oath there, but he's going to break it again in a sec before he decides that he will break it. So, great. Um, anyway, over to a uh, little scene in the, I don't know, it's like a little tavern for the, or maybe it's in a ship, I can't tell, whatever, uh, in Numenor, where um, Isildur comes up to his, his, his friends that he got fired. And the friend accuses him pretty quickly of like, you're only here because I got promoted and you want to use me to try and get onto a, yeah, onto a like, ship. We haven't, Which is true. They haven't talked since the alley, right? I don't think so, they So, this is the thing. It's like, oh, this could be a good moment to prove that that's not the case because his friend's clearly upset at him still, clearly very paranoid about his actions and, and he sh totally should be. But like, the show takes seconds to basically be like, yes, that is true. It's like, ugh. Really? You suck, man. And then, yeah, the thought comes to your mind of just like, what has Isildur done to rectify his huge mistake in totality? Has he actually tried to appeal the decision to get those two fired for no reason at all? Because that would have been a really decent way to get him back in their good graces, right? I think it's this scene where he goes, well, I didn't think they'd fire you. And I'm still thinking, yeah, I don't know why they did fire him yeah, in no the one first knows. place. So it seems perfectly reasonable from his position. That's true. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, has he done anything as a result of it? I'm assuming not. Um, but it, it is hilarious. Nobody th understands why this happened, and it just, it did, and, and you realize, like, well, it's because we need a conflict between these two. Pretty much for this I scene know. and a couple of scenes extra. It goes what? back what? into the characters don't talk how characters would talk. This is all left so... This just isn't how people would behave if a situation like this came up. It, situation shouldn't even be happening. Exactly, yeah, they, this should have been resolved way. earlier. This should th Things should have happened. What's the point of this arc, though, with this character? Like, what purpose does it serve? What's the goal with it? Literally nothing comes from this scene at There's all. There's tension. Because... Whoa. Well, it, I mean, it, you end it establishes scene the him being able to join the, the you know, army as a stable hand, is, doesn't it? No, because he doesn't help him. He, no, he not punches yet. him and then yeah. says, yeah, I'm not going to... No, that's later oh, on. That's right. Oh, this, you're right. This thing yeah. is essentially him saying, I'm not going to help oh, you. Yeah. Sorry, bro. He basically gets allowed to be put onto the ship by being caught uh, as a reward for saving the guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a reward for the prime suspect. The ship just exploded. We're, we're, no we're, almost, we're almost it's, there. We're almost to that It's scene. incredibly <laughs> fortunate that that was able to happen when it did. Yeah. Just in um, the nick of time. On this scene, I, I honestly think it's just because they've done nothing with him and they think, well, we need to have him as a character. Characters need to have people around them and they need to do stuff. So <laughs> that's just, uh, fuck it, they have some friends. He has friends now. We're telling you this now in this moment. He has some friends and they well, don't like him at the moment, but it'll be fine later. One might say that they valued conflict over consistency here. They wanted to just mm -hmm. have something go on to make people interested, but they couldn't figure out how to do it properly. And so they just did it bullheadedly. Because, yes. yeah, um, there's actually something I like here, which is that if you ignore literally everything else, when. He's like, you can punch me, and then you can get me on the team, right? But he does punch him twice. And then he's like, so I'm on the team? And he's like, no. Why the hell would I promote someone who's like an idiot saboteur of, of at a very important ship that got several of his crewmates in danger, too? Like, obviously, obviously not. And I was just like, hey, good. Excellent. Good job, man. You shouldn't hire this guy. He's crazy. Um, there's also the angle, um, I think you uh, highlighted it, rags with how like how bad does it look that, that your first move as a lieutenant after you got ranked up was to bring in your disgraced friend and promote him that's right that's what i mentioned isn't that interesting you fight you get this promotion and the first thing you do is you bring your friend back hmm nepotism as your first line of order i don't know maybe uh maybe maybe i was uh not wise to promote someone on such <laughs> frivolous qualifications also, I don't think a lieutenant has the authority to recruit or to not even have the authority to determine who's under his command. So the show's yeah, just... Yeah, it seems like a decision that would be beyond him. 
Yeah. Like, that seems like a decision that would be made by somebody above captain. Well, I mean, an army would have actual, you know, recruitment officers well, and things and uh, in charge of training. And then after the training is completed, then you'd have perhaps a, ca a captain assign, you know, the divisions under whose command and things. And yeah, so, well, I think uh, generally sure. the way it works, right, is that like those decisions are made because it's, um, because there's captain is the highest rank of like commissioned officers, right? And then above that, you've got like generals and colonels and whatnot. And they'll make a lot of, they'll make decisions maybe about personnel, but like you just get your people and they're the people that you're in charge of. And also it's only been what, a day? And he's just here make, he's, he, he has the capacity to make these decisions? No way. So there's a reason they put this scene right before the next one, because this gives us the motive for uh, the sealed door to be somewhere. We're about to find out what that's going to be. Barazod's son. Sneaks onto a ship. <laughs> <laughs> We're finally here, everybody. So th this was a moment of just like, I was like, what, is it, what could he be up to? And uh, do you remember in parts of the Caribbean where a whole ship is disabled, at least temporarily, by um, the rudder chain being disconnected? Like they, they just ground, for lack of a better word, a ship because they've done something very specific and it's difficult to repair straight away. Like... Couldn't have been something clever like that, like cutting up several things that are important that can be repaired and the whole ship doesn't have to be compromised? Yeah, like he pulls the rigging off of a thing, or he... Like, something clever, I suppose. Something you could do stealthily. Yeah. Like, they all wake up the next morning and they're like, oh shit, where's the steering wheel? I don't have one either. Or he 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 puts a... He, he swims under the boat and jams the capstan or something, or, or puts a thing on the chain so they can't pull up the anchor. Something... So well, I thought his intention was was to blow up the entire fleet because he doesn't want them. I going think there it might be. I think it so might be. If it was something like that, Holy they could crap. go. Well, they'll just go tomorrow then. Which Man, defeats. So I guess he gets caught. Jesus. Yeah, if we, <laughs> I'll summarize it quickly then. So like he goes, well, he, he grabs a lantern, goes down into the lower deck, and then opens up the the casks, which oil or wine, whatever it is. He intends to set that alight, and then that'll explode the ships. And he's hoping to, I think, na he nails two. As a result of this, but he was hoping to get more. I think that's what the case is. But as he's doing it, he hears a cough, and he realizes that a seal door is hiding down here. And then a seal door, um, I guess, tries to prevent him from burning it, and in so actually happens to cause it to happen essentially. And uh, because his cloak is on fire, you know what? I'll I'll wait for that actually. And they, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they both jump out just in a nick of time. A seal door saves him. And then when uh, Elendil questions right. them, the story is Barazon's son was out fishing. Isildur was just, he just happened by just, and he yeah. saved him from an exploding <laughs> ship because that was just happening, I'm afraid. And then, as we said earlier, they conclude a saboteur of some kind, a brigand was, was doing it. Gosh yeah, darn. Not you two. Not you two, yeah. So, have <laughs> at it, everybody. Insane. There are so many things to criticize about this. <laughs> I don't is... know where to begin. Uh, like, uh, let's begin with him sneaking on the boat. It's insane that there's no one guarding it. Like, where, where is anyone on patrol? <laughs> the ships don't have shields because no one would be foolish enough to attack the. <laughs> <laughs> Why have a bodyguard when no one would ever try? Is the point. So yeah, good shot. Good shot. It would be funny. I could imagine the right of that. That a character was like, "Why would we have a guard when no one in Numenor would ever want to attack those ships?" That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Like, maybe they would. Maybe someone would. That's kind of the point, isn't One. it? That from this, they conclude that there are people in Numenor who aren't happy with the war thing. And it's like, you already knew yeah, that. That's something that you knew. In fact, it, this is a pretty unconventional, like, uncommon occurrence. I would say it's if anything, you default that there's going to be people who hate the idea of going to war. And who knows what someone might do. Okay. The fact that there's not even one person per boat, like, absurd. <laughs> but whatever. Um, so, I feel like I should pass it to you, Rags. You spoke of it so much, so frustratedly. The lantern situation? Alright, so, well, you know, ships are made out of wood, and wood is flammable, and that's not good. We don't want that burning, that ship. That would be bad. So, maybe it's not a good idea to leave unattended, lit fire lanterns just hanging around on the same deck next to your barrel supply of exploding flaming whatever this stuff is and it 
it's a wonder that your ships aren't just constantly exploding by negligence. Imagine, uh, like, can you imagine being on the seas and like, oh, there's a, a wave comes by and it knocks the thing off or or, or a, a spark falls on the ground and the whole thing just explodes. It must happen all the time. Half of their lo the losses of this fleet are just explosions. Just those explosions. That's why they believe the story straight away that they spontaneously exploded. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Just happens all the time. Yeah. Now, the did actor did say for this that he doesn't think his character the actor does say he doesn't think his character would have made them explode if he hadn't found the other guy, and he thinks it was only their fight what? that made him... Th yeah, this is from the actor himself. He says, if it wasn't for finding the guy in that fight, he wouldn't have thrown the lantern, but that provoked him into doing something. So what he was says, he there for? Well, he, no, he said he thought he would have been like so nervous and just thought about it and sat there all night and not had the guts to do it before he left. But he, he, he actually opens up the keg hood to spill the, the, the exploding TNT juice. I'm sorry, oh, but... Yeah. He is, when he hears the cough, he's literally about to throw the lantern and he stops and, because he hears the cough. And even if we put that to that. one side, <laughs> what exactly would the point of this scene be if that interpretation is correct? What's the point? Like, what is the point of this scene? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, do you mean, I mean I from like a character standpoint? Because the, the... Yeah, like from a writing standpoint, you get him to get on to the boat, and then he was just going to stand there all night and not do anything. He, oh, no, I think he intended he to, but the, like, he wouldn't down. have the guts. Yeah. He's going to sit down in the oil he had just spilled all over I the don't, floor. No, I, <laughs> this is the thing. He's making this shit up, because that, that, that wasn't in the show. There's no, like... <laughs> nope. He's, he's, he's so ready to do it. He's pretty fast, too. He gets all this ready, and it's just... The coughing of his sealed door that's like, oh fuck, someone might be on this ship, which then highlights the next issue. Motherfucker, you didn't check? You didn't look around to make sure you're not killing anyone? What the hell's wrong with you? Say hello? <laughs> Jesus Christ. He is, he is either a psychopathic murderer or one of the most incredibly stupid morons in existence. It's uh, yeah. either way, it's horrible. Yeah. Um and then of course you think, wait a minute. He would have made all that ruckus coming down the, the steps. He turned on these lights, which Isildur would more than likely have been made aware of. So Isildur doesn't want to be seen here. He's a stowaway. So the last thing he needs to fucking do is cough, right? And the reason I'm saying all this is fucking hell that was lucky. The one guy who never wants to be seen or hear, heard has no choice but to cough because of some situation he's in or whatever. And that's what alerts this guy that saves Isildur's life and in turn saves his own life. Well, I guess he would have been fine if not for all the... And gets animals. Isildur to say, yeah, which it yep. allows Isildur to do the thing that allows him to get to Middle-earth. And... Hang on, wait, 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 wait a second. He was about to throw the lantern on this TNT juice, and this is not a slow burn, right? It's an instant <laughs> explosion, basically. This show is a very so, slow burn. What are you talking about? So this is the thing. We have to believe that he didn't know that's how that works. What, and so he, if he's it wasn't committing for suicide, Isildur, yeah, he, he would have, have killed himself. <laughs> 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 this freaking show, man. I was gonna, so I was gonna, I mean, that was in the list of complaints. The, to curb your enthusiasm, music. <laughs> I was gonna say, like, if his intention was to destroy all the fleet, it's so funny because he wouldn't have gotten past ship one. He would have just killed himself. <laughs> dun, but Isildur dun, dun, is dun. right next to him as yep. he's breaking open these barrels. He would have heard the liquid pour out, and at no point thought. What on earth is happening here? Like, you didn't even question it. He just sat He there valued his stowawayness that much. However, a cough just escaped through. This is what I mean. It's so poorly done. <laughs> and he's so other... surprised when it gets revealed. Like, oh, you're breaking open the West kinds. It's like, yeah, you've just heard him do it. <laughs> what did you think was happening? But like, can we, as, I don't know if anyone else has highlighted this, but just, man, imagine he had attacked a different ship first or that Isildur stowed away on a different ship. <laughs> he just blew up. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, many kind of things of have to come together to just have this yes. th be a thing. Because we have the odds. We have the odds there. There was a one in five chance of him going on this ship. Mm -hmm. One in five. And then and then you had to factor in, yeah, that he coughed at just the worst moment. Oh, and oh also it's more the barrels than that. Right we both have to, to get the one out of five. That, well, that's true. That's, well, I guess if you, Frank, well, no, mm -hmm. wait, hold on. Sorry, you've confused me now. It's, 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 it's a one in five chance one of sealed or getting on this ship, and there's a one in and five, a one chance, in five that... chance of the other person choosing the same ship. Who's so name on, the don't first know person can choose what? any ship, so it's only the first the person. Can, exactly, counts. yeah. The first person, so, like, there's nothing that it, it is a one in five chance that the ship that he chose to board was the one that he was on. 
But yeah, that's the yes, one which was the already is, yeah, which uh, is already oh, assuming like, the one in five chance that a Sildur chose that ship. Why no? Because he could have chose anyone. Why are you doubling it up? He could have chosen any. Because yeah, exactly. Because, this, because the first people, roll doesn't it's different people roll. choosing the same ship. But the coincidence. The coincidence is ships that she's from. Why? No, no, no. That, but, no, because the first roll is an independent roll. The second one is contingent. I don't know why you. I don't know why you're saying this. Like the Sildur could have picked. He could have picked any ship. It doesn't. Yes. The, the point is that it's a coincidence yeah. that he that uh the other guy went on the ship that he was on. Yeah, that's that's the saying, coincidence. Yes. No, well, you're saying to... that it's twice over. Yeah, because he had to both... be on the ship before is he, before the yeah, other guy. We yes, know that, the ship on which but, to go to. Yes, they both but the co one out of five. The coincidence is that he. The coincidence was that he chose the ship that Asilda was on. It has nothing to do with the choice that Asilda made of which ship he got on. Yeah, there were I five ships. There was a one in five chance that he. I I I don't know why we're isn't doing the, um, this. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm, I'm kind of. I'm like. I'm baffled. Isn't the Dungeons uh, Freaky, and Dragons analogy? Freaky. It's a two d five roll. You're going to make here. Is that? I don't know if I don't. No, I it isn't right. because like whichever ship he chooses doesn't affect any roll whatsoever because it, uh, exactly. the the roll only even begins to occur when he actually exists on a ship. So exactly. he, the significance he could be, of he could be in a building in a city, it still would be irrelevant. No, because no, he, the, the, no, because the, it, guys, I'm scared. What's happening? The situation didn't even occur until he existed on a ship. The first one, like the only what? role, is the one that's contingent on the first one. The yeah, first so role could be anything. To, but the, but, exactly, but a role being it, contingent on a first role means two roles have been played. No, because it's yeah. like it's it's a bit disingenuous to even call it a first so, role. Like it's only once he existed in a place. You've, yeah, you've so, got two, so, you've got two wait, 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 so using the let's, same thing. The let's, significance let's of so, that so scene, <laughs> the significance wait. of that scene is the fact that Isildur is there in the first place, which means it relies on a contrivance, a roll of the dice for him to get there. Well, Otherwise, the second so, roll is pointless. So we all we all, so to to lay it the out. Point very is, clearly, it's a coincidence. Say, uh, no, sorry, no, nah, I want to <laughs> actually settle it. Yeah. So when so we say that there was five, which makes it it's a twenty like a one in twenty five. No, 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 so, it's five. Uh, all right, so let's back up. So I think what I said first is there was a one in five chance that uh the guy with the the lantern bumps into a silder. That's true. There was a one in five chance because it was five ships. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. That's the coincidence that he chose the ship that a silder was on. There's no coincidence or anything in terms of odds like is, with Asilda choosing any ship. The point is that he chose the one ship out of the five that uh, that Asilda was on. That's it. Why are we saying no, that there's all the one in the one in five? I agree like, with I that, but it's, it's the thing. Before, yeah, I, I agree with that part. I don't. I. I isn't this also? It's reliant on the one of the five that Asilda chose to hide on being this one as well. No, because he could have chosen any both of them. Choose they, no, they needed to both choose the same ship, well, right? Yeah, they needed to choose no, the same ship. No, only one person oh. needed to choose the ship that a sealed door was on, because only that yep. ship is relevant. But a sealed door yeah. yeah. only becomes relevant because he chose well. to be on it. Yeah, but it. But it didn't matter which ship he chose. Well, yeah, well, um, the, 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 no, no, no. The, may the may I, just for a second, guy, I'm yeah, going sure, to collapse this whole thing through some Wombo logic. If his sealed door had chosen the secondary ship that blew up, he would have died as well as this guy dying, right? Yes, because two ships, yeah. Because those two ships would have been burned down one. the same way because he's a fucking idiot and would have thrown the lantern anyway, which blown himself up unless, and then it would blow up the second ship. Unless Isildur picked one of the ships that survived. No, of course, that's what I'm saying. It's like, so yeah. there is an element of what he chose creates the ultimate result, right? Of what he sealed or chose and what this guy chose? Oh, I get what you mean. Like, in terms of if uh, if he had chosen a different ship, he would have just blown himself up. He will. He so either would have He either would have oh, yeah, blown up about them meeting or the... what's more likely well, yeah. is that he would have chosen a ship where nothing would have happened for a Sildur, and instead we would have had this guy blowing himself up and a Sildur would still be a stowaway. Sure, but yeah, that's Sildur, what about that one Jennifer in five chance of him happening to be on the ship that it, I thought that's what we were talking about. Yeah, that, that meeting, what right. are the odds that he bumped into a Sildur? It's one in five. That is the odds. It is one in five. There were five ships and that was the one that he was on. But just, to, just as a clarification, I assume if this satisfies everybody, if we broaden it out to the entire scene, the odds of us reaching the ending of this scene includes a shit ton of variables. Is that what the oh, yes. sure. that was never yeah, absolutely. Out. Okay. <laughs> it's really good writing. Out of curiosity, one and it's, uh, and it's not even location; it's timing. 
When you have two actions oh, that are, yeah, the timing was, uh, that yeah, are one yeah. out of fives that lead to a conclusion, is that one out of five times one out of five is how you figure that out? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's one in 25, isn't it? Yeah. I am just, I can't remember if I was ever taught this or if I'm remembering. Like... I, I, I think it's one in 25. Yeah, probabilities multiply. Because if it was, if there was four ships and they both had to randomly choose the same one, it'd be one in 16, right? Hmm. I legitimately am not like a math person, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, because you, you could argue, you know, like, you know, the gods not being there is another element of just like, the, what are the odds of that? And it's like, I guess it's not impossible, but we can't really construct odds for that in the same way we can for choosing a ship. So I understand why we want to isolate these uh, certain things. I think it's actually more uh, unlikely that he just happened to cough at the exact right moment. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, there's, I agree. There's I would say, that. I'd say it's less likely because I, well, I guess what's what's strange about it is that you would think that Isildur is now in a position where he is actively listening for people coming, so he would mm -hmm. do his best to not I cough said all of this. at the time. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then there was you were correct, Mahler. You were really good. Thank you, at Ragu. doing that thing. You did a good job. Uh, I've seen his shit. So good, it just needed to be said twice. It really did. <laughs> so, like the it's worthy of, of the consideration. Show. This, this little that tussle, is a it's like it. the little tussle they have is hilarious because the first thought I think you even said it out loud, right? Because I already knew what was going to happen because I'd seen when we were rewatching this. Uh, you were like, "So that lantern's going in the fucking oil, then?" Like close, because you'd actually, I'd forgive anybody for thinking that is what actually happens, but it drops, it smashes, and it sets his little his little cloak on fire. Doesn't get into the oil. Which, um, unfortunate. Now, if you were him, would you do that? I just showed it on the screen. You toss your cloak directly you into it. it? <laughs> <laughs> you had two directions you could throw it in. Toward the fire <laughs> or away from the fire. <laughs> you, you chose wisely. Well. You chose very wisely, my friend. And the best part is, like, you've already thrown it over. You can, you, it, it didn't land in the fire. Grab it. Yeah, just do yeah, it. Yeah, if, if he pulled on the back of it, the non fire part Don't right look now. look at it. Yep, we'd be okay, but they it. just Grab leave it. Guess what? The you're fact is, it's fire. <laughs> Your two That's options so at this very moment are grab that, which is right there, die. two steps away, <laughs> or run, and hopefully make it far enough away from the ship that you don't explode. The thing is, by them running, that implies that they know it will explode, right? Exactly. Which yep, means exactly. the guy knew he yep. was committing suicide when he was about to throw the damn thing! Can I just this say, this, 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 for this inconsistency, this is one of the worst ones. And it's so, like, you, why are you so bad at writing this? It didn't have to be this way at all. Not even close. Is this because they needed footage for trailers of, like, ships exploding? Is this we can why? make them explode. Yes. Oh, well, then again. I've said, so if you watch this show with trailers in mind, you can see it all makes sense. So there's another thing uh, I had to talk about, really actually. Does. Oh, Let's remember Farazhan's son's motivation here. It's to stop the war from happening. Does, is he too stupid to know what this could actually do? There's several possible results. One of them is you're unsuccessful to the degree that you only destroy maybe one or two or even three ships, and that just cripples Numenor's attempts at actually supplying aid to another place. That's, that's really bad. You just put them in a worse position is what I'm saying. But um, another outcome could be that you actually kill a bunch of people. You're exploding five ships in a dock. In fact, I would say you've guaranteed killed someone. It would be unlikely if there's zero people surrounding all these ships. He doesn't even check, it's, as we saw. Yeah, I the mean... crane horses? Because we've already seen crane horses being put on the Yes. How many of those the horses! The horses. The horses being loaded on... This one... Wait, sorry, were there horses in that ship? No, that's the thing. I think that this one they? was mysteriously vacant of horses. I was about to say, there's no way they would show us horses in here, is there? <laughs> Because you can flat pack horses, though, you can just put all of them on one ship. Oh, yeah, so that is just the stable. Yeah, pack them in, like, that sardines. is the stable, but there's only saddles, there's no horses. You yeah, know for a fact they wouldn't have had the balls to blow up all those horses. Well, you know what? That's good, because if this jerk blew up all those horses, because, like, what? what's your problem, well, my dude? That's, that's a better like, question, though. What was his plan? To stop a war, but, what was his plan uh, if there were horses yeah, in here? Was he just going to be like, well, I'm sorry. He was just going <laughs> to stab him in the eyes and say, sorry, horses, you got to go, see ya. Oh, that'd be <laughs> fucked up. And then yeah, it would be. Keeping... It'd be. It'd be terrible. You could have the, the shot where that... he's walking slowly through the ship, and he sees all the horses looking at him in the lamplight, and it reflects off their yeah. eyes. Yeah, and then play sad piano music, and then like... he just smiles villainously. 
<laughs> no, no. I refuse to no, accept no. the show's, you know, um, uh, demonstrate like the belief that there was no other person on this ship when the guy didn't even check. It's probably some other guy below deck or in the captain's quarters or something like yep, that. Probably. Uh, and he's dead now. <laughs> he's been yeah. to a crisp. Even if there was nobody on there, he didn't know that. So exactly, that exactly, he didn't. He didn't know. Yeah. It's it's so. Well, so this guy is like one yeah, of the worst people of the show. Like as this a result is a of this. I, I feel like this is worth talking about because we've had a lot of media yeah. recently where like people don't understand the nature of like moral culpability with characters. Yeah. Like it may well be that it ends up that the actions that they took didn't actually get anybody killed or injured. But if they could have, and they or or like they just didn't even know that they were putting anybody in danger and didn't care, says something about them. Yeah. It's really like it's like oh nobody got killed. It's like yeah somebody could have been. That's yeah, what matters. That's exactly. Yeah. And Absolutely. The question when you're studying this in, in sort of philosophy, it's called moral luck. Uh, the example is usually given if you're driving while you're drunk and you get home, are you doing anything better or worse than if you're driving while drunk and you hit someone? And the question is, is there a, what, to what extent does morality of, the morality of an action depend upon the actual consequence of that action? So luck, how much does luck determine moral, uh, the morality of an action is, is the question sort of at stake. Um, and it's a really interesting one to sort of delve into because in some examples you can quite clearly say, uh, well, at least you would conventionally say, well, okay, you did a bad thing, but nothing bad came of it. So actually our, our instinctive reaction is to say that that was not as morally bad as if something bad had come of it. But the second order and arguably yeah. more interesting question is- Retroactively, yeah. you, you have the knowledge to say, well, I guess you didn't do anything bad in that sense, but you're still completely morally responsible for that irresponsible yeah, choice you made. Conclusion, this, this guy's a piece of shit in many ways. Absolutely. Um, it'll be hard I, to I watch him going forward. And this isn't a character who's some stupid idiot, uh, like stable boy or peasant, you know, like you, you're the son of this, this political vizier, this, this very supposedly educated and smart character. And you are apparently wealthy in your nobility. I, I expect a little bit better from you, especially given what your father's trying to teach you. This wasn't very wise, this maneuver here. Well, so, that would have been a story, I mean, though, if the son uses the lessons his father gave him to further a goal that his father was against. That would be a story, you see. That'd be a we don't want to do that. Well, I guess what's... Um, the, the reality is that the purpose of this scene and blowing up these two ships, we'll later find out, was just to get a soldier on the, the expedition. Yes. That was the purpose. I guess, yeah. Itself. From the writing standpoint, that's, that's all. Also, of the just to finish Why off not? what I was talking about with uh, other possible consequences, you even think about if he blew up one ship, that might just galvanize the war effort. It might be the people like there are people who are trying to stop us from going. Yeah, now. saboteurs. They're standing so. in front of. They're standing in the way of our. You know what our politics has decided. What our what our queen is. What we're banding together to do. They're trying to kill us to prevent us from helping these other people. How fucked up is that? We really need it's to go. Not a sure thing. It's not a sure thing that doing this is going to advance the cause that you have. And we, we're probably, I, I'm curious if we'll get another scene of him discussing or thinking about any of this. Because this scene, as you just no, pointed I, I, out, I, I, its I, I, only I, purpose is to get a sealed door onto these ships. And it's like, I think yeah, we don't forget about, about it. We're yeah. done. We're done with it. I think yeah, this is yeah. finished. I think, I think this is all done. It served the purpose that it was meant to serve. And as far as I, I think that at least this <laughs> element of it, the ship explosion, I doubt it will come up again. I doubt Farazan will ever ever learn of it, or he'll or the or the son will tell anybody. It served its purpose. It's done. It's closed. Think, yeah. Between I mean, imagine so. if he'd gone to a sealed of sister though, that would be a very uh, advantageous play, wouldn't it? I actually I only I know I only met you two days ago, um, but I just blew up a load of ships for you, darling. Ooh. So maybe you might just think you're insane, but you can try. That would be <laughs> if they did that. They'd have to build up some sort of obsession he has with her for him to do that which would yeah, it, been... it, you're right because that, that tells well, us a lot that about him needs to have existed because he has done that at her bidding he's not innately an anti-war person um she's persuaded him to go and speak to his father to try and stop the war and his father said nah so he's gone to blow up the ships to stop the war but the impetus to the action came from his interaction with her to begin with so he already needs to be obsessed in order to justify the action he's just taken i but think he's... we got to work way harder to get to move him from into exploding ships in the harbor. Yeah, no, I I agree. yeah, no. Well, so that's actually gotta, the fundamental issue here. I think is that I don't think the show at all has justified him doing this. There's so many reasons to say that he shouldn't, and then there's all the craziness of the actual scene, and then 
Farazon and Elendil equally don't put the pieces together, fuck that. They both would. They both figure out exactly what happened here. It'd be you think so there'd be a big obvious. investigation. How many other conspirators are there? Are they in our ranks? Are they ready to sabotage us at any point in our journey? Or when we make landfall in Middle Earth? This is a big deal. Yeah, like, Two of our the, ships uh, just got exploded out of our five. There yeah, are way too so many variables at play. Like th for him to for him to commit to this course of action, considering how much of it is outside of his control in terms of controlling the direction that everything goes in. Like I feel like there's got to be better ideas than blowing up the ships. <laughs> like there's got to be a better way. Well, I guess that takes us to what I mean, happens. If, if the point of I guess, like, is the point of this character, right? He's he's sort of meant to be, like, in the political sphere, right? So he's probably gonna d have a life in politics. Mm -hmm. You'd think that he would try to, I don't know, like, uh, I guess, I guess, like, maybe... You know what? I'm not... I don't really care about this character. I'm not that interested <laughs> in presenting yeah, no, the it is. Is, like, how they could have yeah. written him. So we can he's move so on. boring <laughs> But also, I mean, just to emphasize again how insane it is that the two people swimming away from the burning boats are not prime suspects as to... <laughs> yeah. They're just... I can't believe it. It's like... It's oh, insane. Wow. Yeah. Their, their excuse for swimming the harbor. Their excuse is <laughs> bullshit. Isildur has a motive. Isildur is the one who is being told he can't go, that he has to stay here. He was disgraced from the 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 navy when they That's kicked true. him out. He does have that motive. The revenge, idea that he's against Numenor. Well, Farazon's son has motive too, right? They both. Are big he ones. does. Yeah. Well, and bullshit. they were both there, and they both had the means of that. They were in that area at the time when it happened. Yeah. It's uh. Motive means opportunity. You got them all three. I mean, it's just like, what do you think is likely? That they were just out for a late night swim in the harbor? Yes. Or that they were the ones who were responsible for this? You know? Uh, on Friday night times, I think it was as his response. Someone questions like, what, you were really just out here, you know, fishing? And then they're like, we were having sex. It's like, that would be more believable. You were rocking yeah. the boat, so to speak. <laughs> And so, what what's so what happens after that is they swim <laughs> they swim up to the uh to the to the harbor and his dad's just like looks at him like oh yeah he saved my life it's like some mutual agreement I guess they've come to that they're gonna like apparently keep they this must, it must between have been, themselves must have been telepathy I guess also, I guess I have a problem with that, it's still they're not telling what like that. I guess, that well, yeah, right, because what does it say about him, right? Yeah, yeah that he, I, I... he sees that this is a position that can advantage him, so he's going to seize it. He's going to seize sure does, that opportunity. Though. Like, if he'd just gone, I just, th this guy exploded boats and I've just stopped in and caught a criminal for you, surely that exactly. would be even that's more responsible. Well, I guess uh, yeah. maybe the guy would say, like, oh, well, I mean, yeah, but he was trying to stow away on the ship. You know, so by both of them keeping it to themselves, I, I don't know, maybe that's the logic. But this thing, you know what Isildur has to say? It just was that, no, I wasn't. I saw you sneak aboard and you were trying to do something bad and I stopped you. I was, you know, just looking at fishing. the boats, reminiscing, wishing that I could go with the the, the uh, Navy, saw this guy being suspicious so and stop him. with everyone else, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, it, it's... At the end of the day, what we can say is that he didn't take the L here. He wanted to, he saw a way that this could benefit him and advance his goals, and he took it, which is his biggest problem throughout the whole series. That's like his main flaw. He doesn't give a shit about anybody but himself and what he wants out of life. Well, well, I mean, and Rags's point is very true here as well, because there's a terroristic psychopath who tried to just sabotage the, the fleet, right? And this usual doesn't turn him in because it can serve his own purposes. Like, wow, that makes yeah. him look so bad. Yes, yeah, there's a couple of things. I mean, so I don't... From the perspective of the characters involved, so let's say uh, Isildur did choose to try and dob him in, and he said, well, okay, but you were stowing away. I, I guess, but then again, whether Isildur would have known this, but nevertheless, I'll run with it. Um, the problem there is, of course, that, you know, Isildur, uh, his reputation versus the reputation of the son of one of the leading politicians in the country is much less likely to be believed. I think that's a very, very hasty uh, pace in which to make that calculation, but that's at least a counter-argument against him trying to dob in Farazan's son. That could but, be a threat that the son tells Isildur. Yeah, Who do you but think that's... Believe? Um, that would have, uh, yeah, and that would have required maybe one extra scene. But the, the problem, the problem with them not the problem, well, sorry, words. The problem with them doing it the way they did it is that you've established kind of a 
a bond of, of loyalty and or at least a bond of debt between them which can't ever be fulfilled because you're about to separate these guys off and so there won't ever be a payoff from this exchange because Isildur is about to fuck off to Middle Earth and Farazan's son, whose name I still don't remember, is going to be staying in Numenor. So there's no opportunity yeah, for any actual consequence of this like on the spot alliance to emerge. And it's just a really well, peculiar decision. It's kind of what I guess we already concluded. That it's served its purpose. It's gonna get him uh, a foot in the door to get back into the guard and like go on the voyage. That's it. That was the only purpose. I guess other than maybe like some thinly veiled purpose in the follow-up scene where they have like a debate about whether or not they're going to go. But I mean, they do end up going. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of feels like a retread of things that we talked, that were talked about in the previous episode anyway, debating whether or not they should go to Middle Earth. I mean, this is like, another question that they did ask the actors. Why did a sealder not do it? And the guy that went to blow up the ship literally just said, I guess he's not a snitch. So I don't uh, think they even have a reason oh, for themselves. Oh, I don't that's, think all, that's, that's all that they've got. He's not a yeah. snitch. I guess, I guess he's, not, he's not a snitch. So it's like he made it I up on guess. the spot. That's true. I guess. Yeah. You don't it's even not even, know. yeah, like, the, like Isildur has a character. He would not snitch on someone else. He would not. He's like, I guess he's not a snitch. I, I learned that today. I mean, I don't know what... He seems to me like the kind of guy who would screw over basically anybody if he thinks it would advantage him. I mean, look at what happened to his friends because of him trying to... Like, he, he's not above duplicity. No, so, eventually they'll have to set him up to be an especially duplicitous character, or at least somebody uniquely vulnerable to the corruptions of the One Ring when, when we eventually get to that point. So like, that would be a way of starting, starting him down that journey, but they don't take that. Just also the level of understanding that actors apparently have of their roles know, these right? days. Just... Uh, that's we just of, did. We that's just did a whole. Crazy, isn't it? We did a whole load of speculation on actual viable answers for this, and I was curious as a result of that, ignoring the fucking input from the actors. Uh, Rags, were you <laughs> suggesting it is out of character for him, or that it was immoral that he did it, and that's just a part of his character now? Um, it it's kind of tough to say because we don't get much. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's certainly. I feel it's an immoral thing. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you. I I think that especially if if you're in the position of a silver who seems to want things to go well for Numenor, not giving up this saboteur when you don't know the extent of the plot. Yeah. You know, if there's corroborators exactly. is very very He goes free now. Irresponsible. Exactly. He goes free. We don't know what he's going to try and do again. We don't know if there's any more people. And if the concern was not being believed, if Isildur just told his father, hey, yo, like that, like, I know it's my word against his, but oh. your father, listen, I, I saw him try to blow up the ship. I was barely able to stop him. And I'll, I'll come clean. I was stowing away on the ship. I wanted to go despite, you know, all the protests. I'll, I'll, exactly. I'll admit to that. How how well would have reflected on him if he owned up to the fact it's like I was stowing away. Yeah, I was doing that. Like if he if for the first time in his life he actually just took the L and just admitted it, that his mistake. Well, that I was, might be I was said. It's it's why would you what it the, we needed that scene where he goes, I'm telling everybody what you did, and then you can you'd have to characterize Faraz on Sons as a piece of shit. But he'd be like, I'm telling them if you do that, I'll tell them what you did. And then he goes, what, then stowing away? Up. And then he goes, no, that you blew it up. And then he could be like, mm. you know, pause for a thought, and then he's like, they would never, and then it's like the disgraced son who's desperate to become a part of this war, trying to stop everyone else from going, I can sell that in a heartbeat, that sort of thing. The yeah. reason they couldn't have that scene is because they wanted the boats to explode. And so, <laughs> on a burning ship, you could have had that, but to get that impressive explosion, they, they would have been like, well, if it took that long to, for a set on fire then uh, you could have stopped it so they literally couldn't have a scene yeah, in the middle much. oh well uh so yeah the next scene is really pointless by the way that's the impression oh, the oh. oh they get you get the <laughs> you get the whole like oh there's a brigand which like i said farazan would have figured this out in a heartbeat absolutely no no yeah. chance he knows exactly what just happened after the conversation he had with his son what the fuck is his son doing there? Like, yeah, okay, you, you totally just, you just, yeah, sure. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and they say that we could have lost all of our ships. And it's like, oh, <laughs> mad, really? Your, like, your really? ships suck. 
It's that TIE fighter what? thing. No, not the TIE fighter. The bombers is. in TLJ where one of them blows up and it destroys the two decks to it. Man, <laughs> remember that? Remember that? Oh, <laughs> a, a classic. That was made. It's classic oh, it's indeed. already a classic. <laughs> I can see it now. Yeah. Ugh. Like you don't you don't expect like sailing ships to be what we would describe as like volatilely chain reactive. Like you blow up one and then the others explode around them. I was like, I don't know, man. That, that so, just doesn't seem I mean, seem if, right. if one There's blows up and sends fireballs out, then the fire has to somehow drop through a hole in the top deck of the next ship to where there is other kerosene or oil or wine, whatever it is, already lying on the floor because I guess it's leaked from another barrel or someone else has opened it already. Like the number of events that have to come to being or to come into alignment in order for this to happen, to have a chain reactive event. It's not unbelievable that a ship could explode. Fire oh, hang on, hang on. in that era was sort of a mainstay fear, but the idea of the chain reaction requires a lot of uh, assumptions to be made. There, There is actual historical precedent for chain reaction. The Spanish tried to invade um, England at one point. This was during the reign oh, of Elizabeth. Yeah, and uh, and they sent out like like ships on fire to the Spanish fleet and set the whole thing on fire because of a chain. The one ship got on fire; they were too close, which caught another ship on fire and stuff. Yes, but that's that has um, that's got the that's got the gunpowder consideration to play. Um, yes, it's, it's yes, yes, yeah, the and exploding. Yeah, you're right. As opposed to exploding kind of just, wine, like with an <laughs> yeah. explode. Yeah. Well, <laughs> why even have the second ship explode if you're a writer, right? The only reason to have the second ship explode is so it looks better for the trailer. Yeah. There's no well, yeah, reason for that second we ship light to blow up. Well, something that we later see as well is despite two ships being blown up, it doesn't seem to substantially impede Changes nothing. Uh, their, their goal. So it's like, okay. Yeah, you'd so think really that if your army... They get packed if, on those ships lost, like sardines. You just lost 40% of your ships and assumedly all of the cargo and provisions and storage space that yep. came along with those ships. Well, I guess we're you... still going to go along and do it. No I biggie. figure that when you say that we have five ships and 500 men, that you're not just screwing around and taking superfluous ships. I figure that you need those well, ships. One of the ships is 200, the other ship is 200, and the third ship has the rest of the 100. And the other two ships, those are we backup just... ships. The backup ships that we're going to take with us. In case of them explode. To you know how ships are. You know how these Numenorean ships are. They, they do just explode. So you got you to gotta bring spares. I would not want to be on a Numenorean ship. <laughs> just like, no. It's a scary Which, guy. Oh, so by the know. way, like, we're only two-thirds of the way into this episode. We are, and we are four and a half hours into the stream. Excellent. And this isn't the this worst is episode. <laughs> no, this is the one I had less to say. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. You know, I'm one. not sure I'll make it uh, through the next one because I only have like so much time left, guys. I'll stick as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, of course. Four I, and I, a half hours. I appreciate everybody anyway. <laughs> being here for this long, even. Yeah, this is obviously yeah. it's not really limits set. That's how it kind of. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and Farazon, you know, says, like, this is kind of evidence that things might not be quite right. You know, a kingdom should be led, not dragged. I'm just like, everyone seems pretty in favor. We've had, like, over, like, like a strong amount of support. One guy who he should have figured out was actually his son who blew the shit up. Um, but yeah, like, this, this, basically, this gives them pause for thought. Which, actually, in, in fairness to the, the, this plotline, pushes them to believe that uh, it's going to be, we really need to get Holbrand on our team. I think Galadriel actually mentions that at one point. Like, it might be him saying that he's willing to go might turn the tide on whether or not they actually go through with this uh, traveling to Middle-earth, which, why? Everything I thought... about this is wrong. Like, everything about it. Like, we've already seen, actually, there's quite a lot of public like support belongs, against... Yeah. No, I mean, but there's a lot of public support against the war. I mean, you have those scenes of Farazon yeah, in the corridors and people shouting against him. Farazon's a cheerleader for the war. He's explained his reasons for wanting to go there. Why is he the first person to be reluctant to go now that something aberrant has happened? Like he should, if That's anything, he should be the person saying enough. we shouldn't give yeah. in to terrorists. That sort of thing, right? He should be saying that. Yeah, or well, finding any excuse, because his reasons for wanting to go to war are not honourable to begin with. He, he should be the last person who's trying to agitate against going now because of this minor setback. It makes him look like a weirdly inconsistent coward. And then the idea that a guy, again, who's been in prison yesterday should now be the only person who decides whether we go to war or not is just compounding the problem that we identified right at the beginning, which is that 
all of this is hinging on the actions and beliefs of the of the least likely people in this entire kingdom to actually be placed in this position of responsibility. Agreed. Um, but yeah, and then Galadriel's like, our enemy grows stronger every day. We cannot wait. Which I thought was really funny, because by her own logic, she's been, what, going for like oh, more than 100 years? <laughs> so, uh, what's a few more days, Galadriel? Chill out. Jesus, we've got a whole city to sort out. Gosh, not everyone's about you. Uh, but yeah, the, the I think is so. Just to clarify, I think this is the case, right? They went from five to three. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. But we have this wide this shot here hurt. of the two blown up. It looks like we got one, two, three, four. You're five. right. <laughs> but of course, we saw way more than that earlier, anyway. So I just, I just don't get it. What's, I really don't well, understand. They only, Presumably, they have more they than five ships, decided. right? But, yeah, they only decided to bring five for some reason. But they, yeah, they five set was... five out of their total to go to war, and then two of them were blown up. And it's like, okay, so we move two from our stock into the war ones, right? And it's like, no. Oh, that would okay. be crazy. We don't I, have we of all the countries that probably have expansive navies. Is there, I I am lost because those ships aren't there for a luxury of their going to war. They're there logistically, so like we have to replace them, correct? And the show just hand waves it don't oh. worry about it it's only it's only 40 percent of our fleet <sighs> and it, it's not even as if they're worried about sort of defensive concerns or anything because we've basically shown that they don't have an army because the moment they needed one they had to just recruit from random people in the street that's weird so it's not like they're constantly fighting people and it's like well no we, we can't spare these because they're needed for other people so uh we then just opened a seed I, I was so fucking blindsided by this uh, Celebrimbor is handing Elrond back Mithril. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's broken. It's like, oh, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> good, good secret there, Elrond. But the, like, the thrust of this scene, however, doesn't address that. He just says, like, sorry I didn't tell you about the whole world ending thing. And he was like, yeah, it's probably, you probably should have told me that. And he's like, oh, I wanted to, don't worry about it. And then, um, Celebrimbor is like, yeah, so anyway, the Mithril, yep, it's our salvation. I've tested it, it's amazing, it can saturate every last elf with light, it's, it's really the only thing that's going to save all of us. And I'm just like, how did you, have you been testing this, this rock? Like, the, did you get, did you do all of that with Elrond's Mithril? Really? Did you have a, uh, when did all this happen? Unless, of course, yeah, he's been testing Mithril that he has, but I don't think that makes any sense, does it? No. That's no, Elrond's bit of Mithril. One. Yeah, I don't think it makes any sense. And so, so it might have happened. Yeah, we're stuck at Elrond just passed him the. So Elrond was like, "I will not give uh, Gilgalad the ore. I will give it to Celebrimbor though, and you can do whatever you want with it." Well, the so, weird thing about the oath is, I, I I won't tell you about it. There was never an oath about the bit of Mithril that he got given. <laughs> that was the stupid so, thing so Elrond, giving him in the first place. Elrond threw it to him, and he was like, is this Mithril? He goes, don't know what it is. Could be anything, I, I can't tell you my own. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> he just handed me this. I don't know. It was weird. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has anything to do with anything else. Mercury, for all I know. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, then there's this fucking... Sometimes you wonder. He's just like, that's so hilarious. Uh, Elrond is like, so, I must break my oath to save my people. It's like, broke it already. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> What are you talking you know, about? What would have been? I guess something that just occurred to me is Celebrimbor is that Celebrimbor is like this master legendary craftsman. It would have been really interesting to have a scene where he is introduced to Mithril and he realizes like, oh shit, like this is amazing. Having him say it, there would have been a, there would have been a lot of weight behind Celebrimbor saying these things about this incredible material that even he in all of his years hasn't seen anything like. But like again, that whole scene about the testing and him being shown it—it it just wasn't. It wasn't in the time. That time was way better spent doing other things. He skipped it. Need it. He skipped it. Um, and yeah, so in response to Elrond saying that, he says, "Your father was once asked why he must do a thing that he didn't want to do, and 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 he said because he was the only one that could do it." Which doesn't really address Elrond's issue at all. Uh, well, yeah, it it goes back to conversations try to use emotional appeals and flowery prose in order to convince people of things instead of just being practical with them and saying reason A, reason B, reason C. Yeah, it, it's the same thing as like, I don't know, if I wanted to go save somebody who's on a raft out there in the ocean, but I don't know if I can even do it, I might kill myself. And the response is, well, the sea is always right. 
I see is always right. That you just be like, does that? Are you saying are you saying I should kill myself, or that they deserve to die if they die, or that? What are you? Where are you going with this? Because like, it's been I, like, yeah. Elrond, you are the only person that can break your oath. It's like, I know that. That's. Can anyone break your <laughs> oath but yourself, Elrond? He's like, I, no, I, I guess not. Um. What? But anyway, yeah, you just like you're just waiting for them to just be like, well, just explain to the doer in the situation. All you gotta do. And if he's like, I don't care. I hope you all die. It's like, well, well then you got a bit of a question. Case, in case, I'm, I, yeah, then I suppose. Maybe I'm gonna break my promise. You're a dick. And then we get to the "I'm sorry I manipulated you." Now I would like to manipulate you. Scene. Oh my goodness! The thing I love about this scene is that it doesn't go on forever. That it does eventually end, and this hellish torment can cease. And you'd be you'd be forgiven for thinking it never ended, but it did eventually end. It, it does go too. on a while. I love having two characters that I actively do not like talking to each other in their own self-righteous fucking ways about how wonderful <laughs> they are. It's just, I, I just don't. What a, what a useless pair of losers taking yeah, up um, valuable screen time. Basically says that he doesn't want to do the stuff she wants him to because everyone will eventually find out what he is, who he is, what he's done, and uh, he can't be handling that. And he's done such horrible, horrible, horrible things. And then she's like, well, sometimes to find the light, we must touch the darkness. <laughs> oh, I hate that <laughs> philosophy so much. So basically, yeah, uh, you have to be evil to do some good sometimes and justify the means. It's like, holy crap. I, mean, he, uh, I didn't even get that. I didn't even know what the fuck it's supposed to that. mean. I, I yeah. think that's a fair interpretation. I just, I when it's I heard like, it, I, I was know like, what evil is because I've seen darkness or I've been around evil. So I'm aware of what goodness is. Like, what are you, what are you actually saying? Yeah, because if she's saying this you have a, to do a little bit of evil to know what doing good is i'd be like what the fuck yeah. <laughs> okay uh, yeah and then, and then uh he's like what do you know of darkness who did you lose and she's like my brother he goes what happened and because there's a pause it's kind of funny she just goes he was killed <laughs> and then it's like, a, it's like <laughs> he was killed by death um, <laughs> eventually says you know sarah did it and then he's like why do you keep fighting and she's like because i cannot stop I, just break that down. It's like her reason is basically because because because, because I yeah. can't stop is no reason, and so she literally is her answer is like because it's like you infantile moron. And she's a child. She's actually asked if it's revenge that's motivating her, and she says no. Um, but revenge is the only thing that can explain the fact that she can't stop. Well, and yeah. It's what a else would it be? Denial to make. Well, but, I mean, the threat of the end of the world, right? Not even. Well, she, does, that, that, she could have that? said that. That there, there's a lot of justified reasons that she could say, like you know, I don't want anyone to experience the pain of loss, like I have seeing you know the battle uh, that they're fighting Morgoth or a brother. I think that could have worked. Or you know, we can't let evil spread. There's so many easy answers, and she just says because, and it's like, oh, because wow. I can't stop because me, 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 because me. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm not trying to save the Shire or the world or our kingdom. Well, just to, to stop like, evil. Just, like, They're evil creatures. They hurt people all the time. They take things from people. Yeah, I want to stop I've the evil. It could have just been that. Something. For me, that is such an obvious, easy answer. Yeah. It feels like the writers are intentionally trying to make her the worst character possible. <laughs> oh. I mean, you know what would have been really neat is if Galadriel was like a lot of elves and was a fucking racist. And then she went. Eventually, went to Numenor and got there and spent time with them. And like, actually, these are they're they're kind of nice. You know, they've been nice to me, and I, I see a I see a kindness in man that I've never known before. And they, you know, I, I thought all the elves are. I want to save men too. It's something that shows that she's grown or learned something or changed for the better. I'm so, I'm still sticking to this idea that what they are trying to do is introduce darkness to her because the darkness in her is the thing Sauron exploits, and they'll have this. Uh, they'll have the moment where they, you know, they, they get close over the course of multiple seasons, and then immediately as Sauron is revealed to be himself, he does that join me and together we can rule the galaxy as husband and wife moment. And then she'll do that, I'm not like you, and he'll say, oh, you are just like me, and then she'll say, no, I'm not, and then they'll go and fight and all the rest of that. Like, I think I'm they've sure they wrap that up. I think that with episode six, I think they've wrapped that up and it's mm. done, and it'll mm. never be a problem for her again. I think this show thinks that it solved that issue. 
I don't know. I, I always got sort of the impression from six. Well, fuck it, we'll get to six. But I mean, I got the impression that they were still going to carry on doing that. But but that doesn't even this scene doesn't help even that interpretation though, because like if you're wanting to give Sauron something to manipulate about her, then having her admit to the to revenge, revenge being a base motive, introduces a flaw to her character, but also a fear she has, and also something for him to exploit. Whereas if she says it's not revenge. Well, then, A, why the hell is she still clinging onto a dead brother's dagger? And then, B, what exactly does Sauron have to go on from just because? Just because isn't something you can work with as a manipulator. It's actually, it's it's, it's kind of a remarkable achievement in that this scene is actually obfuscatory rather than revelatory. It, it does nothing. Wait, she, it actually does less. She's just bloodthirsty. Is that what they're going for? Well, well they kind of say that in the next episode. That yeah. I actually only found peace when I was killing people next to you. But <laughs> even in this, yeah. I, I don't think they actually understand their own motivation. Well, I don't think they even understand the conversation. Because when Halbrand's asking her, why are you doing this? He's supposed to have, like, it's supposed to be, like, a battle of wills, and he's the one which is, uh, that's his retort to her. When he's, he's just asking, why are you even doing this to me? And she projects her own emotions onto him. She's like, well, I can't find peace here, so you definitely won't be able to find peace here. You've got to come with me and do the thing that I he's want for you to person. ever have peace in the first yeah, place. Yeah, she's awful. She she even says you'll find peace in no other way apart from across the seas. Like, holy crap! Well, she's a horrible influence. It's like, wow. But the show doesn't and, know that yet. Well, everything that Hellbrand does from this point onwards is all Galadriel's fault. Because if he just wanted to stay in Numenor, he just wanted to grill, just make swords and everything. Yeah, just wanted to grill yes. in Numenor, <laughs> then grill some swords. And I don't think they know that that's what they're about to do in the story. And because if they do, that that's such a monumental uh, moment that it should go th all throughout history. It should have been the original trilogy and everything. She should feel so much different than how she actually feels at those moments. This actually destroys the entire future of Lord of the Rings in this one conversation. And yeah. I don't think they even understand. I started a war in a foreign land for personal reasons. No biggie. The only other interpretation, which is not one the show invites, but is the only one that's halfway sensible, is that Sauron or already has these aspirations, and he's been trying to manipulate her into sort of uh, committing to them on his behalf. So, like, this is this is the excuse that he will give. But she's not actually prompting. She's not providing the impetus uh, to action. He's been trying to manufacture this setup from the beginning. But that's the only one that I think would make any kind of sense and fit in with the story as we know it happens right. much later on. I think it fits but, very well with like anything he's actually well, no, doing. He's, he's not doesn't. done anything to facilitate that, really, other than just go, I don't want to. I, I think I know. I have a feeling that the show is just. I think that's a missed opportunity as opposed to uh, something they're working against. I think they just haven't thought to do it, and that's going to be one of those instances where you've got this one missed opportunity that then compounds itself over subsequent episodes and seasons. Mm. Um, and that's that's incompetence of a different sort. I don't think I, I would be really surprised if, in the end, it turned out that Galadriel had provided Sauron with the impetus to be evil again. I don't. I can't imagine. Well, maybe I don't because think I have so. to. Uh, but it's just. I think, I think that she, it will be coincidentally her fault, but she will be morally in the clear, and it will not be a mark against her character. The show will just say it was kind of a secondary side effect of her doing this that has nothing to do with her moral standing or responsibility, so that they think they could get the best of both. I don't know, the thing is, this scene, though, really establishes that Sauron here doesn't want to be bad again. He doesn't want to go back to that life. He doesn't want to return to that world, that place. And it's all Galadriel's selfishness here that's pushing him back into that. I, I agree with Disparu. I think this is actually setting up that he will become Sauron and do all the bad things because, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and stuff. And it's now Galadriel's fault, thanks to this I, scene. It's unbelievable. Sorry. I think I agree with Rags that that will that may well be the consequence, but it won't. The story won't impugn Galadriel for it. No, that, yeah, well, of I, course, I, no, the, the story thinks Galadriel is faultless, but well, it, it, I, it, I, it, I, I think that's what Rags was saying was that uh, hmm. that he thinks that that's how it will play out, but the show will not treat it as being her fault. It was something that happened, and it stemmed from her decisions, but it was not a direct consequence. Yeah. Of, of her decision and not something that should reflect badly on her. I think yeah. that's... Isn't it yeah. tragic that while you were being a hero, exactly. you yeah. inadvertently did this thing? Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. yeah, and it'll match Gilgalad's so. comment that in trying to stop evil, they accidentally emboldened it. So like, we shouldn't have done yeah. anything, I get. I don't know. Okay. We haven't set up that if she would have done nothing, things would have been fine. So it's hard to sympathize with that. 
it, this wasn't like a one-off line in one conversation that he had. Like, even when they first arrived, he's like, can you not just let me have peace? I like it here. I just want the peace. He's repeated it time yeah. and time again. And that she comes here. And I, I hate how she apologizes and then just doesn't yeah. care about her own apology and goes again. That's what really pisses me off. I'm sorry that you don't well, agree it's with just, it's, it's <laughs> garbage I'm sorry you writing. were wrong. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I used you. I need to use you now, though, please. Like, yeah. well, and it doesn't, now, that we've, now that we've settled that, I do need to use you. It doesn't stop there, by the way. You, yeah. We also have um, another part of this conversation that drove me nuts. When she recants the episode one events and says, my men mutinied me. It's like, no, they didn't. <laughs> they, in fact, you mutinied the king. You fucking took your own orders. You were like, nah, fuck it, I get to do whatever I want. And they were like, no, we are months over our uh, orders, we're going back. If anything, you're the crazy rogue. But she remembers the events as she was mutinied. It's amazing. Yeah, she is the victim. It's like, mm, She's, gee, But like, uh... that to me, I think the writers would tell me like, well, no, they did mutiny. I'd be like, no, 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 you, it's too late. You've written it. So that she has recontextualized events to sell herself as more of a victim than she actually was. She's a piece of shit. It's too late. You've already ruined it. <laughs> and she has no idea why Gilgalad sent her away at all. Like, that was no. a reward for coming back. At worst, she could have thought, well, they didn't want to send me off to go back up the air again. But she agreed to it. So this whole idea that anyone thought she was as evil as Sauron, at no point in episode one and two was that even suggested. You know what's funny as well is if she did manage to swim all the way back to shore, then she climbs like all, wherever she needs to go to get directly to Gilgalad. She's standing there like incredibly wet, covered in mud, like these crazy eyes with like red veins in them. She's like, "Why did you send me away?" And he just goes, "Cause you're fucking nuts. That's why." <laughs> <laughs> I figured you would have figured that out by now. But yeah, she just continues to be the most awful person. Uh, again, her and her and Jen Walters com competing with each other every week. Every week, yeah. <laughs> like, oh bit. yeah, I can outdo you with this. Have you watched the new episode yet, or I have not. No, I have. Neither have I. Yeah. It's it's uh because I mean for this, I I actually held off on watching these two episodes until I only had two hours before I wanted to go to sleep <laughs> to get up for this. I just I can't be asked, and it's the same for She Hulk. It's just like, oh shit, we got to talk about it. Yep, all right, better get caught up. That's a great sign. She and goes this to therapy show... in this one, so you got a lot to oh, look God, forward to. Oh, God, she does. <laughs> <laughs> this, this show, though, so... I mean, if you're right in your interpretation and that the Galadriel is responsible for Sauron becoming evil again, it does clearly answer the question of who is worse, Galadriel or She-Hulk, because the um, worst She-Hulk does is, is be incredibly narcissistic and, and self-centered, whereas in this case, Galadriel is, according to your interpretation anyway, she is actually bringing back the evil yeah, she which will know almost she's doing destroy that. the world. No, but narcissists never do know that it's the full consequence of Well, sure, but what I'm suggesting is that She-Hulk is almost equally narcissistic, but she doesn't have world-ending consequences as a result of her actions, which, to be fair, she probably could ah. if she's in the MCU, which, if she does anything <laughs> yes. wrong step in the right place, and she does end the world. True, but we're going back to that moral luck question earlier. Is, is the action morally bad just because of the results that it has? Yeah, I um, actually... Or is it made worse by... If results? someone went out, like a friend yeah. went out drunk driving and didn't hit someone, I would condemn them like crazy for doing that. Hmm. And best yeah. case scenario, With Galadriel. Is she is knowingly destroying Hellbrand's life. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, Hellbrand is like, I want, I want peace. I want, you know, tranquility. And she's like, no, you need a, you'll only find peace doing what I say, which is so self-serving and so narcissistic. And she has no guarantee that that would actually give him peace because it hasn't given her peace. It's bullcrap that she says she found peace that way. And so it is all manipulation. Uh, and at at his expense, and so she is happy to ruin someone's life to serve her own ends. And I haven't seen Jen do something that extreme yet. So, oh, yeah, so Galadriel's <laughs> worst. Just, yeah, no, that, I, that I'm happy question. to concede Galadriel's worst. I just find it funny because the two new shows coming out with female leads are just—they're both horrible people. <laughs> I was just going to ask quickly. So, like on on this subject of um of Sauron and who's manipulating who. So I, I'm finding your argument distressingly compelling. The thing that's holding me back from it is, A, I, I refuse to believe the writers could ever conceptualize Sauron as being good. But now I've said that, they almost certainly could. The only other thing I'm thinking I about... What they're is, doing is, with the orcs. I think they're is, making an attempt there. Mm. There is that, yeah. Um, I think there's different reasons for that, though. The, the thing that's holding me back, though, otherwise, and the thing that's sort of in the show itself is, 
you have those lines, you have that exchange with him where he's explaining to her exactly how he is manipulating her. He gives her lessons on manipulation. So if he's having agency in manipulating people and the, and the show is giving very sort of overt references to his manipulative nature, how does that square with the idea that he is the purely innocent party in this that's being manipulated by Galadriel? Because the I writers think... are so incompetent that they can't execute it. Like, like, if they try and say that this was Sauron manipulating her the whole time, I'll say, bullcrap. What you showed was not that at all. It might have been your intent, but this is where I would play Death of the Author card because you did not have the competence to play it off. You have shown Galadriel manipulating him. And uh, it, it would be like they were so desperate to try and uh, um, throw people off the scent of Sauron's manipulation that they now have not betrayed him doing any manipulation at all and there's no sign at all. No, yeah, they've done an yeah. awful job of setting up that this guy is... I don't know what how it's going to work. To just... If they do the thing of, like, I'm Sauron, by the way, lol, 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 I'll be like, wow. <laughs> That's it? Really? But if they have, like, I don't know, a big old shadow appears around him and then absorbs into him and just goes... And he goes, oh, I'm Sauron now. I'll be like, right, that makes a little bit more sense, I guess. Because I, I, I don't think but they've set him up as the Sauron at all up to this point. Uh, yeah, because I, I don't really think he's been manipulating her at all. He's kind of been begging it. No. There have been times where he's manipulated other people, like Farazon, to get what he wanted. But he, if you if you say that he's manipulated literally come from being quotes. Sauron, then I don't think getting like a, a guild a crest or whatever is is that big of a deal and it, like yeah he, he's trying to find peace he's on the road to redemption he wants to be redeemed and wants to change his ways i think you can you have like the odd like lie or whatever along the way it's not like because ev even in the in the alleyway yes he did batter them but only after he was pushed to a point where he couldn't really resist so he fell into his old ways he was trying to tell them please just leave me alone or okay. the, the entire thing has been him going, I don't want to do this. Please don't make me do this because I know where I'll end up. So in this than... reading, his manipulating of other people occasionally is just evidence of his latent evil, but nevertheless the thing he's trying to overcome. Yes. I, I, I think that especially when you've been that bad, doing something like lying, you'd probably consider yourself not to be... Like, that's a big step up for you on the... <laughs> Because, yeah, if it's going to be that he's actually evil, Sauron is manipulating Galadriel to do what he wants, how does this scene, you can't explain this scene, like his lines where he says, I don't want to go back to what I was doing, I swore to never return there. Why is he saying that? Because all that's doing is trying to convince Galadriel to not go and fight, but he, that's what he wants. And so... Well, yeah, I'm assuming you're mean... suggesting she could have at any point been like, okay, I understand, then leaves. Yeah. And he'd be yeah. like, oh, fuck, he... my whole plan. Ah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I wasn't serious. Yeah, he, only, he only goes after she's told him that he will not find peace, which is what he said what he was here for. So he kind of just goes with her and he's like, well, okay, if she says, I'm not going to find peace here, my only chance at it is with you over there. And then that's what drags him back into his old ways. But I, uh... if he could actually be right that he could get peace here, then she's the one that caused all of it. I just, I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm now sounding like I'm doing a lot of work on the part of the writers. Um, but, but the line in the prison, which I think is the most instructive one, when he's teaching her about what manipulation is, and uh, and he says, what was it? He says something like, "You you show people their fears, and and you." She says, "And you exploit it." And he says, no, I think he says, you give it to them. I think that's what he says. Give you the, the, um, the weapon to fight it or something, and then you master the... It, it, was, yeah. an, it was an analogy of the One Ring. Give them the mm. thing uh, that they want, uh, and you make sure you have ability to have mastery over that thing, and you will master them. Or something yeah. So, like what is he, yeah. so what is he yeah. doing in it, this scene, then? When he's talking about... When he's talking to Gladriel about uh, his refusal to go, he's established that what she fears is peace. He is giving her peace. He is establishing himself as the tool which can be used against her. She, he is the very thing that she refuses to accept could exist. That's what he's presenting as. But that makes him integral to her plans because then you get to the point where they go to the Queen's Council and it's his word against everybody else. His word is the one on which everything in the future then hinges because he's established this position of trust and influence precisely by portraying himself as being against the thing that he secretly wants to happen and therefore playing up on Galadriel's fears of peace, which is what he's, he's showing to her. I, I'm There's now no aware that that sounds that. way too nuanced for the writers, but like that would be how I'm seeing this. No, he's denied that at every single step of the way. No, every time she's ever asked would. him, are you this? My point is he would deny it. That's the, that's no, the key to the manipulation. Said, 
No, because she said, you're the king, I need you. Then he could be like, yep, and go along. And if he just said yes right from the start, and how would he we'd got... still be in exactly the same place as we are now? I don't know. Like, like if, if he true, like, because if, if, right? if this was Sauron's master plan, that means Sauron really does want Galadriel to go off on this war to potentially either spread war, corrupt or whatever, set himself up as the leader in, uh, in the Southlands and everything. He could have done a lot of things to help that goal uh, more than what he's done. In fact, he's tried to work against it at every point. He could have just said, oh, you're right, I am the king. I don't really, but maybe with your... And so... That's what I mean. If uh, if this was supposed to be his master plan, that he manipulated Galadriel to do that, he has been actively working against it at every point. And his own actions have supported his own story. Like, yes, he lied to somebody to get what he wanted, which could be slipping back into his old ways, but that was only to get a guild crest because he wants to forge and forge and gave him peace. So his actions, which don't really have... Any, like, she doesn't care whether he was forging or not at the end of the day. So his actions back up his own sort of internal desires rather than some hidden narrative. And they might try and say there was one, but I, I, I don't think they've actually Yeah, I would it. call bullcrap. I'll be like, all right, where, where was he actually subtly manipulating the, the, the thing to achieve this result of Mount Doom exploding and all that bullcrap and everything? When if you actually just, what he's doing, he's constantly trying to do the opposite. And it's like, well, he's either the worst, you know, person to uh, orchestrate his plans or they're full of crap, you know? Yeah, I think the defense about this is this is from the same people that said that Gil-Galad and Celebrimbor's master plan to find Mithril was to say, Durin's been acting a little bit weird, hasn't he? And then you're supposed to find out that's an intricate plan to get Alrond to do exactly what they wanted. So it, it could, yeah, they could just come out and say it and hope everyone believes them. Yeah, you make a convincing case. I think maybe you've just exposed that I have a misplaced basic element of faith left over that the writers will not completely <laughs> fuck up the future. It's a really shit scene. Does not help her <laughs> at all. It, it makes everyone incredibly confused as to what the fuck Holbrand's going to be up to in the coming episodes. But we'll get more on that as time goes on. We now cut to you know you remember all the the the, the first hour of this stream where we talked about how a bunch of people decided to swear fealty to orcs. Um, we're going to catch up with them now. See what they're up to. So you got uh, they're led by uh, what was what was Oldman's name again? Forgotten it, isn't when it? when mm -hmm. uh ha Wodalg Hodalg oh Waldrig Waldrig Hodalg <laughs> close enough uh, um Hodal. <laughs> yeah so they turn up and uh this is funny because the axe is like lift us up lift us up <laughs> and uh like I am I pledge my undying service to you Lord Sauron and uh, it was such a moment of um. At least to me, anyway, that he like frowns at him, and you're like, "Oh, this is gonna be like a, a weird move from him, right?" To imply is he is he Sauron? And the next episode, he's like, "I'm not Sauron." <laughs> They're really enjoying making people think that Holbrand isn't Sauron, I guess, because it, 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 it's all such nonsense, right? Like trying to bait that it's uh, not Gandalf or Adar or whoever else. When it's just like, it was that the whole point of this show? Just to be like, which one's Sauron? Which one? I mean, Adar like, would just... He would have just told his orcs he was Sauron, right? Well, he's not, though, right? So he's, he's... Well, I mean, if if the show was trying... I'm saying, if the show was baiting which one is actually Sauron, why wouldn't Adar have just told his... Why wouldn't he be going by that name to his own orcs? Well, they very deftly would have, uh, have said Sauron goes by many names. Oh. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. he goes by many names. All Adar is one of them. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. All right then. Um, I go by one name. Well, yeah, fair enough. Well, he doesn't. So that that was enough okay. for for everyone to go. Ooh, that could be Sauron. But yeah, um, and it's kind of baffling because he's like, you know, uh, he like grabs him by the throat and pushes him over, and he's like, are you are you not? Sauron? Okay, I'll find I'll, whoever you are. I, I'm loyal to you, I guess. <laughs> I just kind of found it. It's like one of the most genuine human moments in this whole show was <laughs> Waldrick just being like, dude, I don't, if you're not, that's fine. I didn't mean to call you whatever. You, it's, I'm saying I'm your slave, okay? It's, it should be okay. I, are, you, are you chill? Like, what's, what's going on? I didn't mean to upset you. <laughs> like, I don't know. 
You wanted my allegiance. You got it. All right. Here I am. Let's go. Um, let's go. I don't know. Build infrastructure or something. I don't know. But then something awkward happens. Uh, Ada, like, you got to. The only bond is blood, and you got to draw blood, and they give him Waldrick a knife, and they suggest he's got to do something to kid here or, or teen guy here. What did well, everybody remember. think was happening here exactly? That he wanted know, just... Waldrick to kill this guy in order to show that he really was loyal. Yeah, yeah. that's what I got from it. Yep. Um, you think it's worth if if he just cut him and was like, "There you go, I drew blood." Would Ada be like, "Ah, uh, not what I meant, I... buddy." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, if it's blood, you said blood, not like death or killing or you know, sacri. You know, you said blood. I'm going by what you said. I'm a I might not I might not look it, but I'm a bit of stickler for you know protocol here. So <laughs> it's not really the spirit of what I was saying, Waldrick. I want you to kill him. And then Waldrick's like, well maybe you oh, should have been more we, specific. I don't know. Maybe we should kill one of the old old weak <laughs> ones that can't fight good. Why would we kill the young, super healthy guy again? Ada's like, it's about the point. It's about the message. It's not it's not, it's not about old or young. We gotta, we gotta I am make not sure an you Uruk that is loved. Um. So uh, yeah, I guess he does it because we don't see this kid again. So, rip. He was uh, he was your well, favorite character, right? Done. Somebody, somebody's favorite character here, I think, was that guy. He's Fringies, yeah. Yeah, Fringies. Sorry about I mean, that. I'll say for him, he he's a better actor than the main teen guy is. So possible miscasting. Um. Yeah, I think. Also, that yeah, more true. more reasonable explanation. Would it be funny if the the most common conclusion is the only one that was well cast was Disa? <laughs> it's like she she's alright. She's kind of fun. We like her. It's like oh, well. I mean, just everybody else. There's a lot of wooden acting in this, unfortunately. There is no more than we the don't guy even have left ants. here. So, go back to the watchtower, mm. and uh, and they're they're practicing some archery. Um. Fire and arrows into a wooden door, which I rags right. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be, pra I imagine that if if you're spending all this time and effort sharpening arrows, making the arrowheads, getting them all nice for this battle, you're practicing from twenty feet away by shooting at a hard wooden door. Like I don't know, man. I feel like you're gonna lose a lot of your arrows doing that. Do you yeah, have like a, that, that... some straw to shoot into. Oh, rags. I'm stuff? sure they have plenty. They must have loads. Remember, they have all that food, so I'm sure they had plenty of warfare resources <laughs> too. The elves wouldn't have taken That's that true. when they left the watchtower. They would have left all of their uh, warfare weapons there, right? It's, oh, it's a works. it's a good and it, it's good that you're practicing at such short range at an object that will clearly damage many of these arrows. Therefore, not being able to use them against orcs. This is a this is a sound strategy. And he gives them a little uh, pep talk, I think. Or rather, no, they're, they're like talking about why the elf is uh, is here, I think. And he's like, because you guys hate us, and it turns out that we are pretty evil, I guess. Um, cause it, yeah, he said that whenever we had a knife too sharp, you would you would come down on us. And the elf guy was like, yeah, well, among, every, among the knives, I heard whispers, and I learned to trust some of those whispers, or something like that. And I remember being like, what said, He just said a... He should have just been up front and said, yeah, but in our defense, we are racist. I, well, they're both, like, both teams have loads of racism in it. It's just like, yeah, well, whatever. Like, if he said, like, why are you here? You hate all of us. I'd just be like, I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how <laughs> you did just go swear fealty to orcs, so maybe okay, we were Shad, justified. <laughs> well, that comes I'm up, and it's the best, up, the best part of this fucking conversation. It's like, why would you trust us? Half of us left. He goes, but half of you stayed. I mean, he's not wrong. What? He's a he's a glass half full kind of guy. <laughs> I mean, his entire instruction on archery was aim higher. So I don't think he's quite good at advice to begin with. He's tangling up all these metaphors. It's just like, oh, he's it, in this moment. He's a personification of the whole show. It's just like he's tangling up shit and trying to come across as in, intelligent and insightful. Also, the, the forgetful aspect of kids' gripe is that the elves have been watching the humans too closely, but apparently not closely enough that they spotted huge tunnels, burned down forests, sick <laughs> cows, um, like all of these massive world-shifting things the orcs have been doing for the last however long it's been. Sure, but they did notice the whispers among the knives. Yeah, see? It's like you, it's like you ignored that because you're bad-faithing. He clearly said something about whispers and knives. 
He definitely did, but I, I then I'd question why he's listening so intently to the cutlery drawer and not actually opening his eyes. <laughs> what did his elf eyes see? Nice. It's just so painfully boring. <laughs> it's like, oh, I do not care. Let him die. Get rid of him. But like, just just to, you know, you said he was a half a glass half full kind of guy. If if the whole conversation is about whether or not the the men are worth saving, and then his like counter to them as a collective is that half of this whole fucked off. If the counter is half stayed, he's like, I know that. That was implicit in my statement of half left. I'm saying it's really bad that half left, okay? And he'd probably be like, oh, yeah, no, I agree. That's pretty bad, actually. He, sh <laughs> like he should have been a bit more explanatory with him focusing on the, you know, being the optimist side and that sort of thing. Is like, do you think, you know, another people, you know, half of you would have stayed to fight or something like that? Or I... Like, like something also, to try and turn it around the narrative this reveals how much of a low opinion he really had of the humans that is impressed that half stayed it's like, i thought only one or two of you were gonna say i thought you're all gonna be going over the evil but <laughs> half stayed i'm impressed i i believe in you <laughs> well, yeah he could have just said, like something very opaquely about having you know higher loves than whatever it is that you know the base loyalty for example but at least you could do it a slightly more subtle hinting at his relationship with whatever his woman's name is as opposed to the really overt and tedious and very cringy flirting they do later oh yeah gonna, it, you often get... forget that they just have a relationship these two like love each other it's mm. something you legitimately forget mean, because it's Rags, so we're... poorly Five hours in, you must have had plenty of content to understand their relationship at this point. That is true. I have a lot of context yeah. for why they like each other, how they met, what they see in each other. Just so much. It's a very thoroughly explored relationship. And so, so relatable. Eo is like, hey bro, check out my cool cool hilt. And Elfman's like, oh my god, what a hilt. I, I've seen this before. And then like moves ten steps to the left. Oh my like, god, this fucking scene <laughs> you know the, th the bigger thing that was funnier to me was the fact that him walking over to it and fiddling around with some vines the whole town are like oh my god what have you done hey, what is that this? guy oh, fiddling whoa. with vines hey got gary check out this guy it's the elf's fiddling with some vines he's like yeah that's that's what they do it's the Simpsons meme, where Grandpa Simpson sits on a stump, starts talking, and then Milhouse goes, Look, everyone, an old man is talking! <laughs> and they all just run over and start listening. <laughs> That's what? a good reference. That's a good reference. The same thing, yeah. they're all just fascinated by the fact that he's pulled away something that's always been there. It's just... And then, yeah, no one's so... noticed it. The elves in the hundreds of years they've been here, him personally here for 79 years, never noticed, noticed that there was this creepy-ass fucking carved wall right here in the courtyard that signaled the doom of the world that's it's a <laughs> hard to miss you know but i guess you, you can't catch them all i suppose i'm glad and you got is... the whispers among the knives that was important that was good. Just to be in that writer's room it's like okay well, we need <laughs> we need the next thing to happen so well, what can we have him do where has he seen this before i don't know um next ne like right next to him just stick it on the wall there. That's good enough. <laughs> but who, who the fuck wrote this? It's it's staggeringly contrived. It's even it, this... more baffling when you find out what it means. Oh, it's like, like <laughs> I, I thought that this was gonna be like maybe a dark doorway entrance to a tunnel that leads to the bowels of Mount Doom that Sauron set up previous end, and the elves found it and built their tower to block off and protect it and make sure no one could find it. And holy crap, That's... could I have not have been more wrong? I was just like... saying, like, that, that errant thought you're having about the potential storyline these writers are going to come up with is so much better <laughs> than what they come up with. So... <laughs> it, instead, it's a key to open a spillway, and it's like, what, what, Sauron made this evil mural for, like, a very functional kind of mechanic of a dam? <laughs> it's just like, so you know for a fact that if Sauron had a lock. toaster, it would be red and black, it would have horns. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's just how things work, Shad. <laughs> it's always been. Like, it's not, at, like, at this point that they don't know what they've got, because Arendon knows it's a key. So the first question would be, well, where's the lock? And the lock is right at their feet as they are standing here. There's a big <laughs> hole that would fit a sword. And they're both like, oh, just nobody look down. Otherwise, we're in trouble and we'll destroy our entire story. Should we Which put like a so rock in there or tough. something? Maybe some mean, sand man. or gravel? We, we have had to put a bunch of, of bullshit in there. to deal with this problem. Yep. 
They could have plugged it with something and that would fuck up the entire plan, but that's fine, don't worry about it. I'm sure the chances of the key going into this hole are so small that we don't even have to bother with any sort of defensive precautions. <laughs> but when you find out what the key actually does, it turns out you don't even really need the sword to do that to open the spillway. Just like, hit it hit it with a couple <laughs> of solid hammers and you've got the job done. And, it, it, and what's weird is, like, Adar, he actually seems to know that's what the purpose of the key is because he sends what's his guy name to do it. And then it's like, you didn't even need the key. You didn't even need to go to all the trouble. The elves abandoned the tower. No one was there. And you chasing the humans to, like, no, you could have just walked to the dam and yeah, opened that's... it up at your leisure. It's That's so irresponsible to leave the tower and not, you know, not what 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 was that thing where you um you you did you spike the cannons essentially with this uh, yes this, this yep, keyhole. Yep. Feel like before we left. By the way, we, we never got any. The elves never came back to investigate what happened to all no, the elf I did. Oh, it's warriors so here. We were... They totally. They just left. And none of them care that all of them had have been killed. <laughs> It's just like, ah, oh, whatever. We're dealing None of the with... elves at home mention it. We're building a tower right now. Go away. Also, that, that's all. That's all. Minds. Think of that as a big old next time on EveFap sort of thing, because uh, that, that's that's going to be all episode six. And uh, unfortunately, we're still we still got like ten minutes of this episode left, so we're not going to be able to cover the other one tonight. All right. I'm sorry, chat. You know this happens every. But having seen episode six, I now know to book Monday off work. Yeah, <laughs> blossoms into problems. We think, oh, five. It wasn't that. It wasn't that meaty. And then you start looking into it, and you're like, fucking hell. It really <laughs> was just rife with issues. Every scene. There hasn't been one scene where we can just say, yeah, that was good. Well, so <laughs> you think back, uh, Rags, for anyone, when we first covered this show, like episode one, it went pr pretty fast. Uh, Fairly fast. Mm, I think the, been... those first two episodes were a bit of an anomaly in well, terms so of emptiness. I, I think that what's happened is that the longer the show's gone on, the more time it's had to fuck up. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, basically that's that's, right, it's yeah. that. The story has expanded. More characters are thrown in. More factions. More decisions are made. Plot yeah, complexity is starting to. Things are you know it's all coming together. Because I. We said it, you know, there were, for as little was achieved in those first two episodes, there was definitely a lot of breaches anyway, but now they've managed to establish more and breach, like the inconsistencies have just piled on to where the show is pretty terrible, I would say at this point. Um, Absolutely. I, I don't think it would be worth praising in it, and there's a lot to criticize about it. So. Oh, yeah, and it's worth mentioning yeah. uh, for the people who don't watch the show and watch our coverage of it instead, or anyone's here. Uh, this is pretty atrocious, and the worst episode is the one we have not covered yet. No, yeah, because uh, episode six is is man, <laughs> holy shit! <laughs> That's a way to sum it up. Well, yeah, for Gladriel. Um, so yeah. we have yeah the little chat between um lady girl and elfman, and so they they're gonna talk, and and he says to her. Your son has what the enemy leader needs to take over the world and become a god, basically. And she takes this information really casually. She's like, hmm. It just go. Right. It just follows. Theo's been. I mean, that that's Theo. You know. Yeah, I mean, Theo's gotten caught all, up in something. He, he we're always all gets with his, it. Boys will be boys. We all know, you know him. I'd be surprised if it wasn't the case. Yeah. Uh, I always knew that Theo would be the death of the world it annoys me that teenage boys am i right she doesn't have every question on her mind like where the hell did theo get this thing from in which case theo should probably mention to everybody i got it from waldrig he actually is the one that had this in his barn and he's very much loyal to sauron so better be careful with that guy i mean it's a bit late now <laughs> he's already gone but whatever <laughs> um secondly but if you see him in the future hanging around after mm -hmm. a battle or something yes. maybe we should stop him and not let him run off stab him in his face over and over again maybe just put that in the baby pot uh, uh, oh, sorry more that stab twist gut more. gut the face <laughs> 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 that's orcs. with men it's gut twist stab oh i'm sorry yeah that's yeah that's here. orcs it's 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 complicated formula. The order is important. She said she'd keep yeah. it simple. This wasn't simple. This was difficult. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, she doesn't question the whole become a god part. She's just like, hmm, yeah, we better stop that from happening. It's like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, fine. Uh, I guess th there's no curiosity as to how it'll all happen or why they definitely believe this is true. She just, she's like, yeah, sure. 
And then, of course, just, like, the nature of the fact that the enemy leader of this army of demon things is after an item your son happens to have. Takes that so well. I just, I just don't get it. And, by the way, this might actually be consistent. You remember her reaction to that whole village being annihilated? Was like, mm. Oh, yeah. You're right. <laughs> just... At this point, it's like, is it the actress? Is it the directing? Is it the script? Maybe it's all of them. All of the above. So, well, um... so what are they supposed to? So, like, the, the conclusion they draw is, well, we have to hide this thing. Um, he doesn't seem to make a very much of an effort to hide it. I think he just keeps it in his pocket. But <laughs> I'm sort of thinking, watching, it's like, you know, if you've lost your, I don't know, your car keys, that's, that's just fun. just in your front room, you've lost your car keys, and how it can take hours to find them down that particular part of the sofa that they've fallen down. You've got an entire world you could take that thing to. You've got ample time to escape. It's only one. There are no copies. Just give it to your fastest runner and tell them to run away. And Sauron, or Ada, is basically fucked for the foreseeable because it's going to take him a long time to find it, an even longer time to find it than it's already taken. Yeah, that, That's if Ada doesn't realise that he could just break open the dam whenever he wants with a couple of strong hammers. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> jumping ahead. <laughs> but yeah. but, uh, but uh, if, yeah, if they really wanted to get rid of it and, and they actually had an even shorter time, there's a really, really deep dam like you're right next to that, you know, just throw it in the middle of that thing, swim out a bit, drop it, and holy crap, no one would ever find it again. They it's... actually say at one point, give it to the Numenorians so they can drop it in the ocean. Yeah. Well, they've got something kind of similar to that. It's right next oh to you. God. Just... It's effectively I mean, you know, that like, scene. Just, holy fuck. You, yeah. you could just go out into a forest and dig a hole and bury it and nobody would find it. Yeah, because there's no there's Your no option. tracker on this thing of any kind, right? It's not even like the ring where the people are drawn to no, it, it anyway. Seems to be, uh, it seems to be that it is an object that you need to see to know that yeah, it like, exists. It's, it's and no if different, that's the case... No different than any well, it's no different really. than like a, Yeah, exactly. So like in that case, just go out into the forest, dig a really deep hole, and bury it. Even like before you do that, encase it in concrete, yeah, color like it a different... Box. Like put it in a brick. Put it in some wall. Yeah. Just do do something other than just fucking around like in this in this little fort. You have so many options. For the stakes, what they are, yeah, you should probably be like one person needs to. Your only job yeah, is to. Yeah, and, and remember, when you do bury it, if you decide to bury it in the rag, make sure you like unfurl it and check that it's in there first before you bury it. You wouldn't want to. You wouldn't yeah, want to misplace it. it. I don't understand. Why, why would you say that? Any person would obviously do that. Why would you mention that? That seems weird. Yeah. 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 yeah, you're just saying you wouldn't be able to tell instantly just by the weight yeah, and shape obviously. of the thing. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. I mean, so, well, I mean, maybe that's the thing, right? You would tell by the weight and shape of it. It's like, I don't even need to open this. I know with, like, absolute certainty that this is not a tomahawk. <laughs> This I will stake the fate of the world on my certainty. I'm so I will, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so no sure that I will. We could possibly be referencing. But what? What can we? Well, I mean, we're not referencing. We're just floating some ideas. Just, by, I, by. I, just hypothetically, if that was to yes, be a thing, hypothetically, it's you should be watching out for. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, that's good to yeah. keep in mind. I, I don't think any of these characters are going to make a just mistake like that. No. I'll be I know. I saw that such a unique like, hilt. That exactly. It would be obvious. How retarded, astronomically stupid would you honestly have to be to not be able to know instantly? Yeah, I think uh, you, know, you, pick, you yeah. guys should have more faith in the writers. They're not that stupid. Yeah. Especially when, you know, <laughs> like, the consequences of erroneously, you know, the consequences of mistaking a tomahawk for a hilt in this case could entail the end of the world, yeah. Uh, eruption of a massive volcano, for instance, but I mean, that's just Basically, one of many points. The really. apocalypse, the apocalypse in 3,000 years of misery. But Yay. that's it. <laughs> so, um, All rest on your certainty of the shape and weight of the hilt. So then, oh. uh, then the purpose of the scene comes before the characters in it again. This is something I want to work backwards of. I don't typically do it, but I'd, I'd like to do it for this scene, just in, in general. The end of this scene is uh, Bromwyn saying uh, something like, uh, you know, it's, it, it's pretty much over. They, they've they won. This tower will fall. And then she has, like, a look. And uh, when I was watching with Rags, we, we both hadn't seen episode the next episode yet. So it was like, oh, so they're gonna, they're gonna topple the tower on purpose to try and use it as, like, a weapon. 
And immediately we were like, I don't know if that was, first of all, how are you going to set that up? And secondly, like, how's that even going to work? That seems pretty unreliable. You know, just all the normal thoughts, but I guess we'll put them to all one the side. All the thoughts to rise Yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk about that. I, you know, I did not pick up on that. Like, you know, this tower will fall. I thought it was just them saying, you know, uh, being overtaken, well, like, like defeated no, in yeah, battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's what, I think that's like, what she is saying. If, they're trying to be clever writers. She has the realization. I think that you're pointing it out. I think the writers is actually foreshadowing that out. It pointed out, and it just makes it more stupid. Yes, for me. it really it's does. Like, but really, the point I want to make is they wanted to get her to say that line to then very cleverly be like, nah, "It will fall, but not in the way that you think." How do we get her to say that line? It's like, well, we needed to despair a little bit, right? So let's have the conversation go that way. And man, they went insane. This is a lady who, like, constantly is the leader and the hopeful person and will take you through everything, la la la. In this conversation, when he explains, like, oh yeah, we've got this sword, we've got this, 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 this is our resource, this is our situation. She just, like, 180s her personality to the point where she's like, we're all destined to be horrible, horrible people. We joined Morgoth, as blah blah blah, a bunch of us have left, we're not going to be able to beat them, it's all over, we've lost, we're dead. And, and even Alfred's like, dude... <laughs> yeah, calm down. What the hell? <laughs> and, uh, Where she, did this come from? She is says it a lot. Is it that? Is it that time of the? Are you? She walks out into the like public square, <laughs> and just starts declaring that we're all fucked. We're just dead. It's like what the? F <laughs> you, it's... Just a reminder: we did not elect you as our leader. <laughs> Don't it's listen to her. You didn't even elect her. It's fine. It's not just because you private. get to wear blue doesn't mean you're better than us. Like, to do this in public, in front of the people, yeah. that you just let it, they, you are the reason they're still here. Yep. And now you walk out into the crowd and say, yeah, maybe I was, maybe I was wrong, maybe we are all just dicks. And, and so, let's just give up. <laughs> just, no. Like I said, I'm almost certain they assassinated her character in order to have a line they thought was clever. Where she was like, they're gonna topple our tower, <laughs> yeah, wait. You say they assassinated her character. I do. Um, I'm claiming that, and I'm sticking to it. She had did, something did we, of a character. She was just she annoying. She did have a character. Oh, my question she was going to be, can you can you kill a dead thing? Uh, it, it, <laughs> that's a character. <laughs> <laughs> can you kill a dead thing? I mean, you can kill thing? vampires, right? They're dead. Oh, so they're undead. Yes, yeah, so you undead. can kill an undead. And then, and that brings in, oh, well, then she's so undead. Much, <laughs> so much fine text on the bottom of that one. We're not even going to have to get started about that. I actually don't think she's inconsistent if we take it as a uh, you know what she is kind of because like the fact that she's so caring about getting everybody to safety and stuff but then she'll simultaneously not give a shit when people die in the other village it's like that's already pretty bad yeah and it just like it seems to come out of nowhere this character who's really big on we gotta do this gotta do that I've got a plan you do this all of a sudden no, all is doomed all is lost yeah and, well, they, they broke her again is all I'd say then I guess. <laughs> but they break everybody all the time so whatever I mean, they'll break her back in I don't know if you could I don't fucking know. Which takes us to the realization that the table thing was indeed a lie. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha ha? Yeah, it's such a... That's dumb. Um, explained why. And so Elrond is trying to get the thing that he wants to say out, and um, Durin says, Enough with the quail sauce. Give me the meat and give me it raw. I can't believe that! Uh... Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line, boys. That's a great line. <laughs> they must have known when I they wrote agree, it, right? Give, like, me that, yes. give me that meat raw, Elrond. It, <laughs> I mean, it makes everybody think of stuff in particular. That's fine. Dude, you know? I you prefer like, my meat raw. I could they, excuse yeah. a couple of naive people that might not have such, you know, dirty minds and everything, but that it ain't about dirty minds. It's pass just... through a lot of people before. <laughs> I had no one, no one said. You, you, you do realize what it well, sounds actor, like, right? The actor, when he was, you know, he was thinking it when he was saying it. He's like, <laughs> oh, this is just like, this is like a come on. He even gets on a stone to announce it. <laughs> like, You've got, I'm, I'm rock line. hard for your raw meat, Elrond. Enough with the quail sauce. I don't even know what that <laughs> means. <laughs> Enough with that the quail sauce. Already... <laughs> I know that's just stupid, but there's already enough like well, gay sauce sexual tension fine. between these two, and then he comes out with that line on top. Of it. I think in this uh, in this analogy, quail give me sauce the sauce is, with is, your raw meat, all right. Quail like sauce is lube sauce. in this analogy, I'm sure. Uh, okay, he's like lubed up enough. Now give me the raw meat. Yeah, yeah okay. Done, that makes sense. Harvest <laughs> only the slipperiest of quails for their <laughs> sauce. 
So, uh, yeah, then Elrond says... Seriously, Elrond is actually brain dead. He says, I thought I came for friendship, but I came for the mithril. And it's like, what? No! No, you didn't! You thought you were coming for a proposition to get the mining job done. Then you were told they have a secret thing you should probably try and find. You did, because you eavesdropped on them. And then you said, I promise not to tell anyone. And then you did. You're just a bad person. <laughs> like, you just, you're having <laughs> trouble figuring it out. I don't know. And honestly, like, Durin's response here should be like, you scumbag. You yeah. lied to me the whole time. You lied to my face. And you think I'm just going to let it go. And that, But that's what they do. He just, like, Durin doesn't even let blink go, at this. Let it go. Yeah. It's really annoying. Because this, this was the foundation of all of this stuff, even being able to get this far in the season. It was like... I don't even believe you are. Because remember on the, the elevator ride where he's like, ah, there it is, a proposition. That's why you're actually here. And then he's like, no, 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 no. I, you know, we're totally friends. And then, and then he's telling him now, right now, like, I thought it was for friendship, but it really wasn't. It was for the very thing you thought that I was secretly coming up here to do that you made you hate me and the elves. Like, hey, oh. Clever. He doesn't explain it. So he doesn't explain that Calabrimbo and Gilgalad were manipulating him, and that's what he means. So all Durin should think is that actually he was knowingly manipulating him from the start. So he mm. actually has a decent excuse to use, but for some reason just no one takes it that way. Durin knows because, you know, he's read the script, what the other conversations were, and so he's not bothered. And this is the thing that I, I find beyond frustrating as well. It's like, we've got all the truth out there, so what's Elrond going to do to convince him? He's like, well, you see, you need to save my entire race by providing that mithril. Durin accepts that 100%. He doesn't for a second go, wow, that's pretty convenient, isn't it? That yeah. you can justify yeah. <laughs> all of this by saying that if I don't give it to you, you all die. How do you know that? It's a fucking it's a mineral. <laughs> I don't even know how to classify it exactly, but how do you I know might... that this thing is saving your whole race? He's like, trust me, bro. I have sources. My mind, <laughs> my mind flashes back that. to the scene in, in episode... I've already forgotten which one it was. Four. Where's the one? He goes. He goes down into the mines of Moria. He he finds out that they know about the Mithril, and Durin comes as he's sneaking around the tunnels, and he makes him swear on the sacred rock thing and on his mother's life and on everything else yep. that he will tell no one about any of this, and that he was in fact just here for friendship. And Elrond says all of this. Yep. The show took time out of its day to make this clear, um, and. There's no payoff for any of this. It doesn't remember what it did. Elrond doesn't seem to remember what he did. And he doesn't understand what's happened well, to him. You know what? And apparently... Jiren doesn't care about the thing that he insisted Elrond swore on to begin with. So, uh Apparently right you thing. don't remember something that completely sets that up perfectly. In episode two, mm -hmm. Elrond swears that if he loses the, the stone-breaking challenge, he'll be banned from all Dwarven lands forever. And then he wasn't. So there you go. Oh, nothing means right. anything is the whole point, right? Anything. The value of promises in this world are wow. They're well, Durin's just an absolute pushover. Like everyone can do anything they want with him, and he just he like he can talk a bit of a big game, but he just he gives up eventually every time. It doesn't mean any of this stuff, and it's really annoying because like you know that if he did have a spine, he could probably rise to being the best character pretty quickly. But mm. oh well. <sighs> Yeah, and I thought it was funny that these two were, like, joking and laughing and trying to get all this stuff done. They're like, all right, let's go back. Let's get this mithril sorted out. We're going we're gonna to do it. And, like, I thought it was hilarious. There's just this shot of Gilgalad watching them from above where he's just like, my whole fucking world is about to be destroyed. And these, just, these fuckers are just laughing. <laughs> like, about, like, sort out this mithril thing. Just like, Jesus Christ. He, look, he does look disappointed. I think he was hoping that they got up to some other thing, you know? There was meat uh, <laughs> being mentioned, and he's like, yeah, oh, yeah. come on. I gave him Gilgalad, what are your elf eyes here? Elf ears here. <laughs> he's like, I think you're talking about... I, 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 I don't know. I, I must... I can't quite hear him. Well, maybe he's just, re like, reveling in the fact that this is an insane world. We thought we were about to all die, but luckily the dwarves, like, found the exact thing we yeah. need at the Five bottom of the mine. Five minutes ago, they found yeah. the thing we need. Always, always just standing up there thinking, I really fucking like that table. Yeah, and, and he just found out that he was lying. So he's like, wow, what a dick, but I'm not going to say anything because yeah. I need the mithril. Yeah, just and plus, we had elves, elves bring it back. I had to send yeah, elves, elves to bring it back. Manually. <laughs> with ropes around their necks, with just ropes around their necks, that's not going to be. That's not comfortable. Now, think about what it. Think about what it's like. Hundred miles down the road, you're going to be fucked up, mate. No. Oh, hang on. They give it. Give me the meat. Give me raw line, right? I was just thinking, how could that have slipped in? And I was reminded one time when, like, um, 
put down. Like a friend of <laughs> I had a friend who was trying to write a story and it was like, what, what, what's a good way to write a story? And I just wanted to mess with him because I knew he wouldn't know the context. I said, you could start it with, it was a dark and stormy night. It was like, oh, that's great. And he writes that down and he goes, <laughs> right. and I'm wondering like, you know, there, there was a riot, writer's like, <laughs> all right, we want Duran to like, you know, get upset. What could I say? And someone just was because mess- they know that they have no idea. Yeah. What about this line? <laughs> Knowing up the subtext and the writer's like, that's great. And they, put it in and it's just this the, the rise like, like do people eat raw meat like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. they actually prefer yeah. it raw a lot of the time yeah <laughs> dwarfs like, oh, don't okay. have to cook their meat if they do it's just for flavor they can eat your, they can eat yeah, raw yeah, meat yeah. Raw. That's fine. Seems... yeah so halbrand clearly the men eat raw meat they're just slathered in dirt all the time they probably live in caves <laughs> And, um, and so for those who who don't know the context, um, it's been considered that uh, it was a dark and stormy night is the worst uh, beginning to any story ever written. And mm-hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, saying it was a bright and sunny day is uh, actually the best way to start a story. Oh, yes, indeed. So Halbrand's considering it. He's like, mm, what do I do? What do I do? And the way this is sold is that it was like almost like a coin flip. It came so close, but he decided, yes, he will go. And they skip to literally him on his horse and the war's about to go off and start when yep. they told us that uh, his decision to become king and lead his men is going to be something he needs to speak on in like the council to convince Numenor to really go through with the war. And we didn't see any of that. Nope. We totally lost an opportunity to get his perspective explained to other people yep. uh, as to why he made this decision, why he kept it under wraps. Maybe what he was afraid of, maybe what he stands to gain from this, his acceptance of his duty, any of that stuff. Could have had that, could have had the other characters reacting to it, could have had the Numenorians, you know, reactions to this being told to him. Hey, now we have a man, not an elf, who has a legitimate, like, royal claim to a throne in the Southlands that we're trying to, all that, nah, don't need it. We got boats to sail, bitches. I don't even know that they recognized that was a missed opportunity as a writer. They'd probably be like, no, I, why would anyone want to see that as I boring? I don't think so. They just wanted to skip to the... They, they just wanted to skip to it. He decided it, and so they're sailing. Well, yeah, and, and, and that's what we see. These This shot. So they got... Is it three ships in total? That, that really, truly is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, three. And uh, I don't, I don't see why they would have reduced the overall amount of people who are heading to this war. So that means they just packed the five people's... Or well, five ships worth of people onto three ships, right? Oh, I thought, I, they to, I thought they'd just have to cut 200 people. Yeah, I thought they'd I, go down to 300. I can't, I just, I just can't believe that. You're, you you start up this war effort, you have 500 volunteers, and then you're just like, well, two ships got blown up, so you can't come now. And it's like, well, well nah, they said they had more than 500. You would have chosen 500. 500 for a reason, right? I thought, like, yeah, I thought they actually did filter yeah. them. In theory. And, even with and then, 500, And we know they have more ships, but they're not willing to spare them. I guess the city's like, no, we need it for transport and trade, and you just can't. Also, you had 500 men, and you're sending your queen regent aboard yeah. to a foreign continent. I thought even with 500 men, that was a bit of a risk. But now you're going to send yeah. her with potentially only 300 men, untrained, as we've now seen, with no idea what they're doing or what they're up against. And you're sending your ruler on that ship, which might yeah. just combust at any moment. So The uh, might of Numenor. Right. And in the terms of the size of medieval armies, right, I would think the very bare minimum for this expeditionary kind of force would be 5,000, and I'm not kidding. And like a full-size army would be minimum 10,000, 20,000 is where you get to the, all right, Especially now you Especially if you don't know how many orcs there are. You have no I know, idea the size of the force insane. you're going against. Absolutely so like, right. Yeah. Yep. This is because this, this is, is this is not billed as a recon team. We're gonna do some reconnaissance <laughs> and scouting. We'll bring some ships yeah. over. They'll disperse. We'll come pick them up in three months or whatever after they give a look around. They're supposed to blend in and lay low. No, this is this is like a, a fighting. This is cavalry. And, and also, right, it it would not be out of the ordinary for uh, the orcs army to be in numbers of a hundred thousand strong. They have no idea they what their no numbers clue. are. Yeah. No idea. Imagine mm. going to war against a foe that could be anywhere from 100 men to 100,000. You have no Cause, clue. Because remember, e- it's not even the numbers of the orcs. It's the existence of the orcs that is alleged. Yeah, it's not even the numbers. You're right. They have no proof of opening, anything. The opening monologue in episode one, Galadriel tells us that Sauron is there and he's been biding his time and he's been gathering his forces. And 
like she knows well the monologue would have us believe she knows mm -hmm. that there are orcs and there are a lot of them and they've been gathering their forces for hundreds if not thousands of years so she's the one advising this... the queen to go to Numenor she's the only person who can realistically say this is the kind of force we might expect to come up against like she's the only one who has any foreknowledge of this at all she's apparently fine with them sending 300 men and a queen to go and well, to meet potentially thousands of orcs which i mean is... that bit makes sense for galadriel because at the start of episode one she was going to take on this same amount of people with like seven elves so <laughs> this is a step up for her I was, I was about to say you know for a fact that she would she would annihilate all of mordor's forces <laughs> just to <honor> <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually half expecting it to quell Mount Doom with the sheer coldness of She'll her throw a sword into Mount Doom, and that'll be the, the arc. She'll be like, I'm a warrior, but I will sacrifice my warrior-ness. And then she looks at the screen and she goes, that's why you don't see me doing it in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And then the, the I did it to close Mount Doom forever, but then it woke back up, I guess, at some point. I don't know. Shut up. Leave me alone. I'm awesome. That'll be the end. <laughs> and yeah, uh, as everyone keeps saying it's just like uh there's, there's a little bit of a horse problem if you want us to believe that you've got 300 men on there on those three ships like okay how are you getting 300 horses across there <laughs> yeah like 300 men is a stretch 300 horses is like piss off not a chance <laughs> you've got you've had to crane the horses onto the ship are there cranes on the other side to get them off <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're just a, the they just, they just chuck them. cranes. They just chuck them. Yeah, they wow. make a slide a or catapult for the, the horse. For the <laughs> horse <laughs> catapult. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why well, I can't believe they put horses on cranes. Um, I thought it was flying when I first saw it. I'm like, what the fuck is that a horse? <laughs> the, the I noticed a little roach. I think the first thing that flashed into my mind was Jurassic Park when they feed the cow to the raptors. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the official word is that Elendil did approve of Isildur coming onto these ships, and so everyone's like, wow, that is nepotism then. And he's like, nah, -uh, I earned it. And if anyone, this is what I mean, like, if you're just one of these guys, you're just on the ship, and you go, oh, how, how, how did he earn it? What did he do? Like, has there been a fight or something? Like, what's going on? You go, well, apparently, someone was fishing, and the ships exploded. And he almost died, but a sealed or jumped in the water and saved him. And you just be like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? So that's what? all we have to do. I, well, not even that, just what an absurd scenario. Who blew these things up and why? To go, a brigand. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure, whatever. So, okay, all right. And Elendil knows he did all this. It's like, that's what he told him. Right. And if it is such a prestigious act to be worthy of like a reward like this, of a military position, why do they put him as the stable hand, which seems to be universally renowned as sort of the insulting position? Well, it's weird because it shouldn't like, be. Oh, yeah, you're a stable hand. <laughs> it's weird because that shouldn't be. The, it, it's annoying that they would all be like, hey, hey, you're a, on a loser roll. It's like a roll that's necessary. But it's yeah, and and unit, also, right. stable hand, and he ends up being in the Queen's Honor Guard next yep. episode. Man. Yep. <laughs> sure, <laughs> okay. Wah, wah. They, they don't care. Um, stable Hand could be an incredibly important position. He could be the one who is in charge of the horse crane or the horse slide. Like He's the one who has to put it up. So actually, it's an honourable position for him to be in, because without him, they're not getting those animals off the ship. Yeah, would the horse catapult even be built without him? I don't think so. Oh, good point. And yeah, how crap level. does their armor look? It looks, it like, looks so uh, shit shed. It, their it's helmets like don't paper. match their outfits. Their I know. Outfits are just, it's so crap. It's so crap. Unbelievably so. And it, what is it made out of? Like foam paper? I really uh, don't it's, like it's... a lead deal specifically. It just. Ugh. And the people posted pictures of comparing the way he looks here and how he looks in the prologue for Lord of the Rings. It's like, it's fucking. Yeah, Night and day it's... doesn't cover it. Yeah. It's a, it's the sun <laughs> versus the abyss. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> oh. And the creators, oh, yeah. honestly, oh, I, I yeah. they think it's awesome. The creators are like, look at what a great job we did, guys. It's like, did, did none, can none of you even see? Are you all blind? The answer is yes. <laughs> I can help you out on that one. Um, and speaking of armor, guess who has theirs back somehow? The magic of editing, I don't know. I guess. Who could it be? Go, 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 Ladriel. Oh, wow, you Holy found crap. it. Oh, <laughs> you, my God. It finally washed up on shore somehow. <laughs> it washed up on the shore. <laughs> the, the only explanation. The, too. the Numenorians who hate elves had, like, a specifically set 
of elven armor set aside that's perfectly tailored to her size and proportions that happens to also have the uh, symbol of uh, the guy who made the Silmarils on it, the person that she hates. But okay, Fair sure. Enough. Well, someone Saying just said that's, that's different armor. It's like we we weren't actually suggesting that her real similar armor washed upon shore. Trust me, that's not what we're suggesting. Obviously, it's got got made. It's just why why in the world would this have been made? And I just the 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 smiths like her enough, even though the smiths are all the people that were at the elves a horrible uh, parade festival, whatever the fuck get together. It's just funny. Maybe Halbrand we yeah, one could have made it. Yeah, Halbrand did it in a couple of hours probably. So, the thing is, though, clearly, they no one would... They hate elves, they wouldn't make elven armor, so they must have had it just lying around. And it's like, okay, then why are they keeping elven armor around if they hate it so much? It's just... Ugh. Well, what the, what she did was Galadriel said, I need some armor, and they're like, okay, um, fine. And that was that. Well, they, and, oh, they said, why can't you make it yourself? And she says, because I cannot. Well, because that's a lowly position that she wouldn't want to associate with. Yeah, they, they the fucking queen gave her some bullshit or whatever. They're like, well, just maybe make they, her armor. They gave her the normal armor, and then she's like, I would like not to wear paper, please. And then they're like, okay, we'll give you steel, I guess. If this is weirdo. She would have to very accurately convey what her armor looked like to these guys. And they're like, so do you want this random male to be sticking out between the shoulder and the chest piece? And she's like, oh, absolutely. It looks cool, right? Absolutely. It's, it's like, messiness it's like as part of its design. It's like metal hair. It's armor hair. Oh, do you think that's what they're going for? Or are you just memeing? I don't I can't know. Tell. I really don't. Is it the third guy with the best expression? One of them. Like, everyone's impressed and amazed. And I oh, know. The fourth. One guy, what she walks past, he does not give a they're damn all... that yeah. she's even there at all. He just looks so <laughs> bored. Me and, my sword and they've got it the angle of the sun the... hitting them at the same time as they're looking like as if she's the giving off the light it's like oh, why this is also, so the great the show friggin man i will the say the show loves galadriel so much and they're having it like everyone is just like getting mesmerized like, wow look at her and it's amazing it's like, come she's off so it incredible it just makes me hate her more <laughs> yeah it's so it's right, someone so indistinguishable hard. from humans unless you can see her ears Pretty much, yeah. Especially because so she's indulgent. tiny. It's like she probably passed for like a look. That guy there in the back, the tallest scene. one. He does not care at all. <laughs> He's like, yeah. what is this? This is this the bitch that's gonna get us killed? It is, <laughs> isn't it? This is her. Okay, all right. And that's so, great. after nearly six hours of breaking down more rings of power, we're at the point where they're leaving the harbor to go to war from Numenor, which you'd be forgiven but for this thinking. Time... That's what was happening at the end of last episode. But nope. But Halbrand's going with. Yeah. So that, that took an episode. Halbrand was given specifically different colored armor because re reasons. He's given man armor, okay? Main character <laughs> armor. Yeah, armor doesn't look yeah. terrible, at least. Oh, it still looks pretty bad. Not as bad as the white one, you're right. But it's yeah. so, in, it's, in, it's, compared to them, this shit is fire compared to that. Yeah, awful, in comparison. Awful. There, there's, they have a scale obsession, I think. It's, they it's, do. The, which, the scale which mail is, like, is awful. Which is like, okay, it's not, it's, it's fine, but take it easy. Not everything has to be, it, you can have it, but it doesn't have to be everything. They're, well, they're so obsessed with the scale that they even have it printed on the queen's undershirt. So it's yeah, that was that's awkward. <laughs> it couldn't have just been cloth. Just have it be a cloth shirt. I know. Yeah. Do they like, expect her just... to actually go into combat? <laughs> Fucking calm down. <laughs> just give her a nice regal-looking, bright, a, a, a Numenor color, the blue shirt underneath it all. Would have been fine. Some type of padded, like thin, you know, uh, arming doublet underneath. Problem solved. Say, do they ex expect her to go into combat? I mean, she is about to be attacked by a volcano, so anything yeah. could happen. They really I mean, need I, I'll do the I was paper armor is going to be really bad against the volcano. Works and kills a bunch of them. I was ready yes. for it. Oh yeah. I thought she was going to lead the army when they charged the village. Oh yeah, it because you, know, you, you know, you know they wanted. <laughs> that episode is so bad. This episode was so bad. <laughs> it's all so bad. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Like, they're still amazed. Oh, she's shaking his hand. Yeah, we're gonna oh, do it, guys. Goodness. Yeah, let's go uh, save the world. And in that shot, you got to see kind of all the guys on board and and the size of the ship. It is like, 
is there what maybe 20 men <laughs> i know right and it's like so 80 or below i guess boats and stoves boats and stoves at this point to get everybody in they'd have to have like the lifeboats on the side just row it along with them and then they trade out who's in those every so often because they just don't have enough room they call them, they call them window seats the people underneath <laughs> would have to be stacked side by side like the slaver ships of you know oh yeah. the mm -hmm. there, um, there might be some mariners in the chat who will disagree with me but I'm, I'm sort of questioning the wisdom about trying to sail your way out of an enclosed harbor um Gotta they be put the very down. skilled because that, that thought came to my mind as well. Where's the wind coming from? Like they're, they're backed up high on the walls behind them. There isn't going to be wind in that. They've harbor. got a really That's why big the fan. Built like that. A really big <laughs> fan. <laughs> Get the entire town together and blow. <laughs> like, <wee. laughs> That's why they. That's why they needed to get the approval of the people to go to war because they need the the blow oh, power blow. of us. <laughs> I'm just thinking of you go in and out of, of these arches every time a ship has to come and go from the harbor, which is like amazing defensively. But you think the 99.999 percent of the time we're not under siege. Man, this is going to be how many boats have we ruined? Just bumping into the sides of the canyon and hitting the bridges. I guess they're really good at it, supposedly. So you'd think they'd row cool. though. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Rowing would have been the way that they did it. Also, like you saw the bridge in perspective before, and I was like, are those boats even gonna fit through those arches? Because barely like you saw them go in. Uh, originally when they entered, mm. they came in and they were lowering the sails as they did it, but it's almost like the sails are designed with the bridge in mind. Because they they have the they have the tism sails where they're sort of in like these two sections like that, so and they're curved, yeah. so that's supposed yeah. to fit I think in kind of inside neatly. That's bizarre. Because also on the size of like ships, these are these are pretty small. You tell me, so Numenorans have no bigger ships than these, and it's because they just so they can't get oh, out we can't fit it through the bigger. bridge. Well, yeah. That's true. Yeah. They're trapped in the harbor forever. They built the bridge before they, rem they remembered to get the boats out of the harbor. So they're just there now. They're just party barges. They just got converted into restaurants and things or something. And just to get from one side of the harbor to the other. They can never leave. That's episode five. Only three left. Wow. What a it's really mess. Good. It's really good. I mean, it's really good. Uh, uh, this show is so bad. Like going through it again, I, like we found a lot of stuff in addition to all but, like the things that I thought was bad in this episode. It just gets worse. This is incredible. Yeah, um, it is pretty remarkable. Yeah, <laughs> and it is pretty good work on their part because so little happens. It's like wow, you've got millions of issues and you don't even make much of anything take place. N not the same thing I would say for the next episode, of course. Uh, it's really interesting to summarize the first five hours of the show versus the sixth hour. Because you'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's that's what happened. But, um, yeah, since we're at the six hours, we figure that uh, we will now move into Super Chats and then end the stream at a quote-unquote reasonable time and instead pick up coverage of the next episode as early as tomorrow. Crazy kids in chat since we're trying to get this all done in one, but failed terribly. Which I suppose is a good thing. To a lot of people anyway. Um but I will say since we're at the the sort of like the halfway mark, or not halfway, but uh we're at a break part of sorts that I would offer any of the guests if they wish to uh leave at this point, because you have been here for a good six hours. Reasonable if you need to, you know, do life things and stuff. Completely up to you. And the I will be one of those people, unfortunately. I better duck out, guys. But it has been Thanks. tremendously fun. No problemo at all. Thank you so much Lovely. for hanging out. Thanks so for hanging out, good sir. Before you leave, tell everybody where they can find you and what you're up to. Well, 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 I'm up to something pretty cool at the moment, guys. I've got a graphic novel that's available if anyone's wanting to check that out. You know, I think I, it, people really enjoy it. It's a uh, uh, graphic. I don't know. I, I, I've loved comic books my whole life. And so having, you know, being part of making one is pretty awesome. And also making one that's just top tier. Like if you see some of the art that Marvel and DC are doing, it's such good garbage uh, uh there's been people sharing uh, the art of a recent robin Ho robin you know batman robin comic it is ah uh, 
unbelievable cringe. And then I get to look at this art by that Mike has done for me in this graphic novel. And it's like, holy crap. It's so cool. It uh, is. So it's pretty cool. You want to um, throw me a link? I can get it in the description. Yeah. Goes yeah, back man. up. But, uh... Absolutely. Um, so yeah, check that out if everyone interested. That we're selling the hardcover for the price of a soft cover, so it's a good deal. But if you're wanting as well, uh, you can you can get something special and get the uh, the leather bound. I'm doing leather bound for the graphic novel and the second edition version of the novel as well, and they are oh, they look good, top top tier, beautiful. And then of course you got Night's Watch, right? Yeah, Night's Watch is just exploding. It's going great. And uh, we're doing re you know, in-depth reviews and everything. So you can check me out there. And, of course, Shadowversity, looking at all the medieval stuff. And so uh, I've already reviewed the weapons and armor and rings of power and the f gladial fight scene. Oh, it's so bad. Uh, it's, we've been, uh, we've it's been, fun to review. We've been... Isn't, that's not the word, is it? I was about to say spoiled with bad content. <laughs> it's more so we've been... Spoiled. Tacked with bad content. I don't know. Blighted, if anything, blighted, cursed. Blighted, maybe, yeah. Violated. <laughs> Subjected to. But hey, we're nearing uh, the end. There's a light at the end of this tunnel in terms of uh, She Hulk and uh, Rings of Power coming to an end. And, yeah, uh, and once gee, House of Dragon ends I'm as well, next season. he'll just be Andor, who's chilling out on his own. That's what's going to be happening eventually. Yeah. I might need to yeah. take a break after Rings of Power and House of Dragon. It's been full on, and hey, it's yeah. good. I'm not complaining, but oh, I need to take take a break. I think afterwards. Yeah, we've like doubled up EVAP episodes. We're gonna have to. We're gonna take a week off here and there. Saturdays, you know? Yeah, it's gonna happen. Um, but uh, yeah, man, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, legendary as always. And um, if I don't catch you on tomorrow's one, uh, I will obviously see you with Gary for yes. House House of yes. the Dragon. All right, guys, it's been awesome. I'll catch you. See you, dude. Catch you. Bye, bye. bye. Well, well. Um, I assume little platoon, you're gonna you're gonna be hanging out for the whole thing. I think, right? Is that what we said? Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Unlike Shadow, I don't have a life, so yes. Um, no, I, I'd love to, unless I'm unless I'm intruding on your private chat time. Absolutely but, uh, I'll not. That. Well, I mean, several of these may very well be to you. Who knows? Uh, mm. And uh, Disbrew, how you doing? Uh, yeah, I need to head out because if I'm back here again tomorrow, then uh, I've got a video to start and finish. So sorry for cursing to... you in such a way, but we very much appreciate your company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been great. I, I, I did enjoy the story. Like this, this episode will be really fast. We'll we'll fly through this Absolutely. one. Absolutely, into the big one. It's like wow. Okay, I never thought six hours on that episode. Oh, I um, guess it just takes a little bit longer. But yeah, uh, before you go, of course, well, since you're a brand new guest, nobody even knows what's going on here in the uh, Leaf. Tell everybody about what what it is you get up to. Uh, yeah, a disbrew on YouTube, I tend to focus, like, I kind of do think it's sort of spoilt by bad content, because I think bad ones make the best reviews and the best videos, and I think they're by far the most interesting to talk about. You, you get something that's really good, and I'm like, yeah, okay, that's good. I think you should watch it. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you, though, so that's not really much I can talk about. So on live streams, I think uh, good content makes better live streams, because everyone talk about it, you know what it's there. But for videos, I would rather just rip something apart. And when it comes to that, She-Hulk especially, I've had some of the most fun times making videos for She-Hulk. Oh yeah, uh, dude. It's, we've... it's it, rapid fire disaster. <laughs> like they fit more into three minutes of the start of the last episode. Was well, it safe to say of... like your your life has probably been strange for the past, let's say, month or two-ish? Because like your name has come up a lot more than usual for me. Uh than it has ever before, and it's like you, you've got all these TV shows to cover at once, and I keep seeing you on loads of different streams. Do you, um, do you happen to go outside and breathe oxygen, or is that not a thing? Not, not the last couple of months. Really. <laughs> oxygen <laughs> is indoors, Mahler. Checkmate. Prove it. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my, my kind of channel has exploded. I think in February, I had 2.8k subs, and now I'm at like 87. So wow. That's excellent. That's fantastic. excellent job, man, yeah. Well, I have no idea, like, what's been happening. It's kind of been a, a roller... Well, not a rollercoaster ride, because it's just been an insane upward thing. But, uh, yeah. All these streams that I used to just watch, I've been on. Like, Friday Night Tights, I've watched for years. And uh, it's been kind of a surreal journey, especially the last few months. 
Yeah, man, that's, that's one of the things that's really cool about Rings of Power, She-Hulk, and the others coming out, is that a bunch of new creators can now come out as a result of being passionate enough to sort of be like, okay, this is shit, by the way. <laughs> I'd like to talk about why. <laughs> well, it's one of the opportunities you get with all this sort of stuff, but... um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and I, I only started reviewing stuff because uh, I was really into Wheel of Time. I've, I've read the books over like decades, and Amazon came along and just annihilated that. Uh, and so that that's trial everything run. else. Yes, I, I genuinely think that was a trial run for this. A lot of the marketing was the same. Mm. A lot of the kind of the mystery box. Oh, guess who's the guess who's the dragon? Guess who's Sauron? Have been the same way through. Um, I think they did see that as their little mini project. Well, now here you are reviewing incredible shows every night, every day, even possibly. And uh, <laughs> yeah, like I said, um, I don't know whether to apologize or not, but uh, it'll be lovely to see you tomorrow as well <laughs> to yeah, talk about apology, the other episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I will definitely be back. Hey, a anything that lets me see Galadriel get hit by a fiery cloud of ash from a volcano. <laughs> well, that's that something that can't happen. be missed. That's absurd. Why would that happen? That would never happen. That would be... Where would that come from? <laughs> Why would you, they wouldn't just invent a volcano to do that. That would be crazy. Uh, it, what, can you imagine, though, if, if they did just... Kill it? They led everyone on. <laughs> oh, no, they, we're doing this in five seasons, and then just end it halfway through the first... That's all you're getting. This was the plan from the start. Yeah, <laughs> this was the story we wanted to tell, yeah. <laughs> so that would be one hell of a twist. We call it anymore. subversive. A lot of you guys uh, really liked that. And we experimented with it. What are you trying again? Uh, I mean, if they pulled that on this one, I think that people would genuinely cheer. So might be the first one that people actually like. Well, I mean, if we're being completely honest, if it was announced tomorrow, no more episodes are coming out, what would the reactions be from, uh, certainly from us a lot would be like, okay. All right cool. then. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Nothing ventured, <laughs> like, nothing gained. Uh, yeah, like, <laughs> I, I, okay. And this will uh, be remembered by no one. What a shame. Why? <laughs> it's like, oh. But that's my favorite thing about it. It is a case of, at this point, you're just kind of seeing how much money they're willing to throw away, like knowingly. Because at first, like a billion dollars, we could make something amazing. But then the reception that this has got and what they've ended up with. They now know what they're going to get for future seasons, and I, I don't see how they can turn this around unless they just get rid of so many of the people that made it. And so it's going to be how much money, especially you will, how much House good of the money Dragon are you willing to burn? Just keeps going and going and going. Mm. Yeah, because Wheel of Time's got a season three, and season two isn't even out. And I think they're doing the same thing with that. So Ugh. they're not beyond just throwing away piles of cash. How um how much can they keep that going forever? Wheel of Time have they got enough to adapt that they can just keep going? Uh, there's so many books. Yeah, they could Ugh. do it for like 14 seasons if they wanted to. They sorry, weren't, sorry they Wheel of Time fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the first season, it's so, because in this they were like, oh, well, you know, we've chosen something where we think we're, we're just filling in the gaps. But Wheel of Time is literally specifically written down word for word, action for action. And they, after the episode two, did an entirely different thing. Not unrelated to the books in every single way, changed the magic system, changed everything about it. So the whole idea that, oh, no, if, if this was detailed down in a book somewhere at Tolkien's, they would have followed it? No. No way. Well, so, uh, good luck, of course, with that as well, covering season three of fucking Wheel, Wheel of Time. Because you said you got started with Wheel of Time, right? So I imagine that you'll definitely be covering Oh, that. yeah, I'm not. I, like, if, if, what, if the only person that sees those videos is me, I'm still going to do them. That's, <laughs> I am heavily into Wheel of Time. But yeah, I assume the same is for Rings of Power. We got five years of that, at, at least. It could be a gap year, who knows? <laughs> Well, yeah. If they, well, if the, considering they're moving countries now, and the stu this like the studio isn't built, it's probably going to be a two year gap between seasons. So this could go on for ten years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ten years of rings of power. <laughs> ten years until we're allowed to let it be it. forgotten. That's, that's how imagine that chat. It's twenty thirty two, and the season, <laughs> the series finale for the rings of power. Uh... <laughs> I'm like crawling out of Joseph Fritzl's basement, sort of wondering where the beatings have gone and why they've stopped. That's just, oh, that's going to be a really strange experience. We're all going to be like old men by then in 10 years. Be like, <laughs> finally, we put Rings of Power to rest. <laughs> <laughs> We've defeated it. We've At that point, there's like 30 story. viewers and 26 of them are reviewing it <laughs> like negatively. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably Shield's current situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I get that impression. 
Alrighty, I, I do uh, like there's that one Twitter account for She-Hulk is just like the most rabid defender. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, dude, they like, like, out... there's just one person holding the line. <laughs> they've put out some hyper cringe, haven't they? They're desperate. Oh, what an account. Good luck to them, I guess. That if you want to revolve your personality around just a, a She-Hulk of all things, you go right. <laughs> all the things to defend. <laughs> that that's where you've pitched your tent. That's the hill you're dying on is She-Hulk. Priorities. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for uh, for hanging out with us. Six hours. No six problem. hours is still a long time. It's not twelve, yeah. but um, normal shows actually do run. I I don't know if you've heard about this. There are some podcasts that go for an hour. You heard about this? It's, it's a myth, as far as I'm concerned. They exist. Big whispers on the wind. I can't imagine yeah. that. Only podcasting for an hour. Yeah. Why would you, you have a podcast get... that's just intro? What's that's the our point? Intro. Yeah. yeah. Seems weird. I haven't covered anything. Well, yeah. So thank you very much, and I suppose we shall see you tomorrow. Oh, uh, yeah. Pleasure to be on. Yeah, Cheers for see you later. me. Thank you so much. Cat. Oodles. Catch, dude. Which leaves? I'm, uh, oh, go ahead. I will say, I'm drawing, and I drew over my sketching layer. I drew it on the same layer, so all that work is gone. I have to redo it. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm feeling pretty sad about it. I'm at, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not happy about that. Well... <laughs> You learned something new, which is, I don't know, don't have a lapse that causes you to do that. So there's not really anything I can do to account for that. Yeah, really what was the, the lesson ever. here? You just have to be angry. The That's lesson so cool. is just, yeah, a little bit, because it's kind of nothing. It's like, you got to do it again. Yes. Could you have learned from it? Not really. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of uh, worthless. So, I mean, I guess I got, because as, as chat may have, because it hasn't been acknowledged yet. <laughs> Cassowary friggy for Halloween. Gary. That's uh that's the um that's the yeah. I see little platoon. That that you don't have fun. anything scary. Where's your little horns or something? That's what you gotta do. Oh. Um yeah, I've been meaning to actually ask the guy who does uh the channel art, I need to actually yeah, get him to put some horns on me or something. You've got plenty well, of time, so it's not not a you so know, just not too... started October, it's true. It is, yeah. I we know, we take it, take it very him... seriously here at EVO. <laughs> it's very Halloween important. Is, Halloween know? is a thing to be taken seriously. It's a very fun festival. But no, by the time I ask him, by the time it's done, it could well be Halloween itself. And then, what, I've got like two days to use it. So, no, I should actually get on that. And, and next we'll year. Back. Uh, yeah, true. Yeah. It will be reused. We get mileage out of there. ours, that's mm -hmm. for sure. A pumpkin head or something. Which people would know um, from pumpkins seeing are pretty good. our avatars on Karen EFAP Movies, which is out, by the way, chat, who did not know. Uh... It released today before the stream, and you'll be getting an EFAP movies per week until the final week of Halloween, where you get two, I think. Yeah, that's final destiny. Be excited, because you should, because if it's out, that means that things went well, because Final Destination 2 is still getting uh, pushed back with copyright. It's a nightmare. Um, the latest one was weird. It didn't get clipped for like two days, and the message I got was it has been manually reviewed, and they have found a six-second clip that uh is, is like enough to block it worldwide. And I was just like, um, okay, you seem a little obsessed at this point. So uh, yeah, for anybody who sees maybe a little bit of an obsessive protection of copyright on any of these films, that's why. But hopefully, anyway. Uh, I'm going to start reading these Super Chats then. Yeah. Well, all right. All right, the first one of the night is, I love you all, this is a threat. All right. I love you. I love you. He got like a knife in his hand. Yeah. If Gladriel told me she loved me, I, f I feel like that would be a threat. Dark comedy idea. The vegan cannibal. He only eats vegetables. Oh, no. I get it. Or he it. only eats vegans? No, vegetables. A vegan cannibal only eats vegans. Vegan cannibal only eats vegetables. That's what they said. That wouldn't be very sporting. No. But because carrots can't run away. No, no, yeah, I suppose it's no less sporting than... Vegetables. <laughs> plants eating plants, I suppose. Uh, invite random film talk. I'm not sure who that is, but who knows? Maybe one day. Uh, I could take a look. Uh, 
Fuck Mary Kill, Angel Season 4, Phase 4, and Jaws 4. I mean, we gotta kill Phase 4. The worst one, okay? And that's how this usually makes some sense. Uh, I guess, well, out of all three, I guess we'll keep Bill Season 4. There's some stuff in it that's actually pretty good for Season 5, all right? Well, it's just, yeah, that's kind of the nature of it. You can't have Season 5 without Season 4. So I guess Jaws 4 will be the, the one that gets fucked. I have no idea what that means, but there you go. Man, at the, at the time when I was watching that, I really didn't see how it could, it could be saved. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. I, I thought it was doomed. No one can. Uh, so, like, what happened to Karen's kids? No parents, no uncle, no other relatives? The film just forgets they exist. The film doesn't care about them. They don't matter. Uh, it's not a very good movie. <laughs> you could say I that. I haven't seen it, by the way. Oh, I the... haven't seen it yet. I just Sorry. woke up and pretty much did this. So. I haven't seen it either, yeah. I'm going to watch it while I make dinner. I think the people were pretty happy with it, as was I. It was, uh, it was a fun one. Glad it came out it well. Movie. Man, I learned to think lot. that we we may not have even watched it. Oh it's yeah, there was loads yeah, of just uh, on a whim from uh, yeah, on a whim from Jay Longbone. Loads of appreciation for Jay Longbone because it's in the video where she suggests it, and we all go, yeah, sure, okay. And it's like, oh, never would have happened. Simply you struck and... gold. Uh, have a nice general conference, Shad. Uh, hope he did, or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Alright. Shad, imagine when training in episode 5 she said, Control is more important than strength. A hard strike means nothing if it can't hit. Took me two minutes. That would be uh, stronger than, like, discounting arms when it comes to fighting, yes. <laughs> uh, arms are pretty overrated. You hey. see, if Saren would have paid attention to his arms in that fight, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The top comment on the Karen uh, Eva movies right now, by the way, is an extended comment trying to figure out how much effort Karen would have gone to to get Confederate soap. Well, it probably isn't <laughs> easily stumbled across, is it? No, it's just funny. <laughs> you specifically have to, yeah. Well, you she, when she goes on Amazon, it's like soap. Oh wait, sorry, Confederate soap. <laughs> That's right. Let me go to Amazon, look that up. Confed <laughs> soap. And now you're on a watch list. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's just normal soap. It's as if the word Confederate was never involved. I'll put Confederate flag soap. And if you want to know the context to this, you can go watch the Karen Efat movies. Trust me, you'll love it. What's the um the Chinese version of Amazon called? Is Ali is it Alibaba? I think I've used that once. You can find all kinds of weird stuff on there. Probably on there then. Or eBay. Wish? Uh obligatory She Hulk's feet super chat. Yum. Alright. Do you, I suppose. She has large green feet, that is true. Um Hey, Morley, did you like Matosis's God of War 4 video? I think I did when it came out, yeah. Um, I can't remember if I agree cool. with everything on... I feel like I often disagree a lot on... I feel like that people are way too harsh to the mechanics in that game, especially when comparing it to uh, the original trilogy as if there are no problems with the original trilogy's ones for the design choices they have made. Uh, to help maybe explain what I'm trying to say is that People highlight a lot of restrictions that happen as a result of the choices they made in God of War 4, as if that's not the case for literally every mechanical system, that whenever you choose to do anything, that you've given yourself things that are difficult to overcome. One of the most common things that everything has to face when it's like an action game of third-person nature of some kind is camera. Camera's like one of the first camera. main ones yeah. that fucking gets in the way. I've only played three quarters right now of God of War 1. The camera's been an asshole, like, in almost the whole game. And it looks different in small ways, but sometimes in ways that we really didn't need to be, like where they chose to aim it. And uh... camera's difficult. It's um, it's kind of just a. It's I think uh, Matthew Matos has talked about it in his most recent video about uh, context sensitive buttons. That um, one of the difficulties of transitioning from a two D to three D game is that um, just by virtue of like how much complexity that adds, it just makes things more challenging. And one of them is cameras get more difficult in 3D. Um, 
because like in a 2D space, it's always from the side. Well, generally it's from the side or it's from the top with a really clear view of what's in front of you. You can see clearly what's in front of you and behind of you and there's no input to control the camera. It's always going to show you everything that you need to see or the mechanics will at the very least be built around this limited space. Right. But then once you throw the camera in, it's like, oh, well, um, I, I guess the challenge with uh, something like God of War is that the I don't I haven't played enough of four, but I imagine that the old games use the face buttons for combos, whereas the new game, it's kind of hard to have face buttons serve as like the way to do combos and attacks because the button, the finger you need to use the face buttons is always going to it's going to be the same one that you use to control the camera. Correct. And so, like, any point where you need to move the camera is a moment when you're not fully in control of our... Um, so uh, that's attacks. the reality, though, right? That's almost the binary. Either yeah. the game has control of the camera, and so you can focus on fighting, but that means the camera doesn't always go where you would personally choose for it to go. Or you can give the player full control, but then they need a third finger. Or a third... Um, you know what I mean? Well, uh, or you just have to account for for that. You just have to account for... Um, yeah, it, it's it's the reason why in the PS3, 360 generation, the uh, triggers became way more prominent in games. Yeah, yeah, because like a shooter like does that, right? You move, you uh, aim well, your camera, shooter, and then you have your, yeah, your attack buttons are most shooting. of the time shoulder. Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas, because uh, I mean, there was a trend... No, use Ratchet and Clank as an example. I remember... Uh, in the old games, you press the circle button to shoot, um, but then Deadlock changed it to you can use circle, but you also can use the uh, the shoulder buttons. Um, and obviously, the reason why they did that is because that game was combat heavy, and it just made more sense to use the shoulder buttons. And it's just like the more that games move towards that combat heavy focus, because you see an old like Crash Bandicoot has a fixed camera. You don't control the camera; it does the fixed camera in the same way that um. Cool. 2D platformers do essentially. Uh, the difficulty is that in a 3D space, judging depth is uh, tricky. Right, yeah. Cause... It's, it's kind of why you need a lot of visual cues. That's why Crash 4 had like a highlighted circle beneath you so that there was like absolutely no confusion as to where you are. But the fact that it even needs that kind of says something about um, navigating a 3D space. It was a it was a part that think of just I'll remove most of the context to try and make it as simple as possible because it would be so much easier if I could draw it. But think of just four straight platforms that go one in front of another, in front of another, in front of another, and you just have to jump across them. And the camera is behind Kratos, obviously, and as you move across them, it follows him. It's exactly let's say three meters behind him, and it just follows him across all of them, easy. But this is God of War one now, and then you need to go back. And so the, they haven't made it so the camera does like a 360 or 180 flip so that now it's behind you on the other side so you can, you know, jump. It just backs up as you head toward the camera. If you understand what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I know fucking exactly hate what you mean. that. I absolutely hate it. Yeah, it's that like, sucks. Um, there's not, not enough right. space. <laughs> I can't, like, feel in control of the platforms at all. I just have to kind of hope and pray that I am, I am remembering it right. Well, it's um, one of the challenges of making games, how much control should be afforded to the player versus how much should be entirely in the hands of the developer in terms of what you can see they, or do. They'll have several segments where they go bird's eye, and I think they just want to not go bird's eye because it's not as, dare I say, cinematic. It's more gamey. Um, there might be a few factors. Cinematic uh, resources, maybe bird's eye is a bit too uh, intensive because there's too much that you can see. It could I mean, be the reason why God of War would tuck the camera in so close is probably because they yeah. wanted to pump the visuals up. Yeah, I'm almost certain that is a huge motivation for it. But that's that's I guess what I mean. I just consider it a really dull take to be like because of the fact you have to control the camera, it means that you split focus on the camera and attacks, and that's what ruins like the whole system for God of War Four. And it's just like yeah, 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 but. Can well, least... it's it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? You well, there are benefits too. Different. Like, yeah, why did they make this decision? To every presentation, exactly, so. and that's what I was trying to say: is that any mechanical system you choose, there are going to be drawbacks and pra points of praise for like you know why they chose it and how well they executed. But um, yeah, the the first three because like there was another one where um the camera was set to think of like a map that is a half a donut and uh. You are on like the left edge, enemy on the right edge, and they're coming to meet in the center. But wherever you are, the camera will like horizontally have you as you're moving through the donut aimed 
let's say always aimed with the donut would have been split. This is I feel like this is gonna be so hard to understand because I yeah, I don't think I follow. Donut. You got that right? Ring donut. donut. Ring yeah. donut. Think of that but as a map. So all of that is walk onable. Now it's a two D space. Think of it that right. way. You can't go in the middle. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, but you can go in a big circle. Now cut it in yeah. horizontally in half and remove the top half. Now you go to like a U, right? Okay, yeah. A U spawn at the top of the left side, enemy spawns at the top of the right side. Yeah. All right. The camera, think of the object of the camera existing on the bottom end of the donut, but it points up to where the donut would have been cut in half. But it's, it sits on its uh, Y axis, sorry, X axis uh, to wherever you Which are. Which one is X? X is across. Okay. It sits in, uh, it'll always be lined up to where you are at the time. And so, hopefully, that translates. If you come down to the center of that half donut as a character, and the enemy is coming down also, he might just be off. I can't see him necessarily because the camera isn't zoomed out enough. It's too close to me, and he's just outside of it. And so, yeah. he might have a big ranged attack, and it just hits me off camera. And I'm just like, oh, well, great. And, and it's like, yeah, well, it's your mistake for not, you know. And then they do the thing, this thing that I fucking despise. Oh, great, the focus system doesn't work on this enemy. Yeah, well, don't use it. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Like, if, um, if the game glitches and, like, you know, guns just don't work on one random enemy, you have to use grenades instead in this moment because the boss is glitched and the response is just, yeah, just don't grenades. use a gun. Easy. And it's like, what if I don't have grenades at that point in the game? It's like, yeah, well, what, what if I rely you on focus for my combat? And it's like, and it's supposed to work. It's like, yeah, well. I don't really complain about it. And that's the other thing. I wish people would just be more willing to be like, yep, that's not a good thing. But that's there. Unfortunate. You can get people really defensive. Like, nah. -uh. Or offensive. Like, uh, game discussion. Maybe we'll have some more of them as, uh, once Callisto Protocol uh, and the Dead Space remake come out. Or the Resident Evil 4 remake. Oh. Resident Evil 4 remake is next. Dead Space year, was alright, considering, um, it was so, it was kind of close and over your shoulder. If it's close and over your shoulder, then it's harder to have it be Tismi. Uh, but yeah, the further away you get from a character, then that's where you start to have the problems more and more. What do you mean? Also be argued though that the further you get well, away, the more clarity you have in general. Oh well, yeah, that's the part I'm confused. Funnily enough, I, I mod my dead space to push the camera way further back, so I don't know what you mean. Um, if your camera is, in terms of like clipping against environments and stuff, the closer that your camera is to like a first person view, the less likely it will be that you're going to get clipping issues because it's closer in to where your character is. Uh, but as you pull the camera back, there's more and more opportunities. It increases the distance where obstacles can exist between the character and your camera. Um, that's one aspect, yeah. That's but obviously, true, there's but... like the whole idea is it gives you a shit ton of benefits by having the camera further back. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, and then obviously you'd have like adaptive cameras that move with the location, or they'll blur out the walls that you end up putting between you and the camera, so that you can still yes. see you. That is something that happens in uh, games. One thing I've never understood: Mario put silhouettes on walls that were between you and the camera just to let you know where your character is. And it's like I wish all games had that at the lowest Mario's level. Mario's been doing that for ages. Yeah, Mario's Why been couldn't, doing that like, for a long time. I'm not expecting everybody to be able to do the perfect system ever, but can you at least do that? Just that, instead of the Dark Souls one where the camera shoves itself up right in between your ass and the wall and just goes bleh, 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 bleh. It's just like, yeah, that's great. That's real great. I'm glad. I wonder that... if it is just a matter of, um, because I'm pretty sure everybody knows this, but like Super Mario 64's development went like this. They spent a year figuring out how to make Mario fun to control in 3D. And then they started building levels. I don't know how many games are being made where you are like fundamentally working on like that core. And trying to streamline it, uh, trying to figure it out and basically make it like as, as good as it can possibly be. And then from there you start building content. I'm not sure if they still do that for like the newer Mario games, maybe not. But I can imagine like an Odyssey that they spent a long time just making Mario fun to control and figuring out how to make sure that he could interact with the space. And then, you know, start building levels and, and start figuring out what you need to do. Not all geometry is made the same, Mola. Good thing I didn't say that it was. 
<laughs> I remember you specifically said that all geometry was the same. Yeah, yeah I remember. A big bun- well, you really bungled that one. You shouldn't have said that. When you I, said I, I, I regret saying that. Same, I held my tongue because I knew that someone in chat would point out how stupid that was. That thing Luckily, that they did. Said. And I can now say yep. I'm sorry for saying all geometry is made the same. That was my bad. Uh, Hi, Rags. Hello. As Little Platoon read the 1967 essay by Roland Barthes called The Death of the, the, Death Author, of the Author. I have, yes, I believe, well, I haven't read it for a long time, but I have read it before. Are we, right. are we at Death of the Author part of the evening? Well, no, no this is, I'm guessing they're just <laughs> curious to ask you that anyway, because of the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I know. I, I was. I was genuinely. I was apologized that I was basically. I didn't pace myself properly last time. So I was about a bottle of whiskey in by the time we got to death of the author. I, I was just kind of interested in, in sort of your guys' take on how strictly you apply uh, apply that term. Yeah, we're 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 absolute on it. Extremists. We're crazy people. But uh, most people, I'd say, push it to like ninety percent. They'll they'll let slip in. I think the most valued like a most intelligent most in touch artists that have the best takes they'll be like no their take is gold and they should be considered like almost canon and then you have people like i said who would like twin perfect who are like just absolute whatever artist says whatever about their work that is the truth which and is... that is a, that's just not true <laughs> nobody holds that perspective they no, don't. I, I to be fair he might he, he actually like nah, he might be insane no enough way. to <laughs> no, I don't believe it. Well, so, but I don't believe. Well, how do you deal with a person who will bite those bullets without realizing what they mean? <laughs> um, because all you need to do is just find the one example where they'll change their mind. Well, we did with the the George Lucas one, and then he like went back on it in his Discord. He was like, "No, that's a stupid example now." And it's like, oh, okay. I, I guess it's just that there will always. I think that you always believe. Uh, uh there's. It's kind of like the same as when somebody says. No, there's no such thing as good or bad, like, and then they'll always default, like, you would default to it at some stage, because everybody, to some extent, believes in death of the author. Yeah. I don't know what it means to engage with, because if you don't, then what is the point of even watching the media? Just watch the interviews or the things where the author explains what it's about, and then you got it. Because when you say it's zero, like, 100%, or zero percent death of the author, it's like, what is the point of the work? Just well, ask and... the author what they think about any given topic. Like, and then that's it, you got it. And I wouldn't look to hurt anyone's feelings, but I think if you really dug on this, like, dug deep on this concept, you can't choose anything other than 0 or 100. Pretty much. I don't, I don't know what the sense. middle ground looks like, really. No, I don't. Because if, if the breach is something they say casually versus something that is in the book, those two things are always going to be... Like, what is the halfway point of those? A leaflet that is comes with the book, maybe? <laughs> it's like, is that canon? Maybe. Well, I know that there's no definitive middle point. My instinct is to go for middle point, though, with, with anything like Death of the Author, um, because... You fool! I know, I know, it's a wishy-washy liberal position to take, but uh, I have to have yeah, a couple yeah. of those. Um, so, but the, like, my, 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 my fear with anything to do with Death of the Author is, you know, th this comes from a particular school. It's actually born of, of critical theory, Death of the Author. I mean, it comes from... Bato in, in the 60s is developed as a concept as we now know it today by I think directly by Foucault um, and and by uh, Derrida as well who has quite a lot to say on on death of the author um, and so and you can trace it its roots back to it goes back to sort of Kant's aesthetics but Oscar Wilde sort of popularizes it in the 1800s because it's an outgrowth as the, at least as I understand it, anyway death of the author is this outgrowth of this concept of aesthetic autonomism and that's the idea, as Oscar Wilde put it, and he put it like this for legal reasons, that you cannot judge the author of a work by the moral content of that work. In other words, that's sort of the, the groundwork that separates out moral content of work from moral intent of author. Oscar Wilde sort of does this for like quite practical or pragmatic reasons, because he had to do it to try and stave off lawsuits. Um, but it's developed sort of in, in the 60s. And my issue with it taken to... Uh, taken too literally or taken uh, in too great an extent is that I'd argue that's sort of the that's where we are at the moment. The, the problem with we have with so much art at the moment is precisely that we have abandoned any conception of authorial intent. Rings of Power is quite a good example of this. I mean, if you were to say, well, Tolkien quite clearly said and thought and believed this about the world, and this quite clearly impacts how he writes and therefore the moral underpinning of The Lord of the Rings, you would then turn to the Rings of Power and you'd say, well, that's quite clearly contrary to authorial intent, um, which I think is a, at least a sustainable position to take. 
the problem if you're going for 100% death of the author is that you can't really criticize bastardizations of uh, the work. You can't really draw a distinction between interpretation and the work itself because the work exists independently in the mind of any reader. Uh, but then I how think, are we um, to judge objectively our artistic merit based on artistic intent, which I think has to come into the question of artistic merit? What I would say is that I think that, um, I think that the goal that I would have is to try and separate them into two different discussions. Like where you could have the discussion about authorial intent or, you know, questions of what ought or ought not have been factored into an adaptation or, or like when choosing to, I don't know, do a follow-up to a story. I think that all those questions, are, I think it's a conversation that's worth having. I just think that when um, the conversation gets uh, merged with a discussion about a story's like merits internally, that you can just end up in some murky area where it's kind of hard to work through disagreements on those types of things. So it's just, I find it's easier to try and make them two different discussions, basically. Yeah, and obviously we we went over it last night, but there's there's so many problems to have to deal with, including but not limited to if the author provides a contradictory statement about the state of being in the world or any particular item or thing in general, uh, which, yeah, which I mean, statements you, to be taken as true. You have that problem quite sort of uniquely, I, I think, with Tolkien, the question of sort of can... But it sort of verges into questions of canonicity in that sense. I mean, Tolkien wrote multiple versions of multiple myths. Many characters have multiple names, multiple lineages. Um, and then the job is you know, to decide, and it is up to the reader to a degree, or in this case, I think it's up to Christopher Tolkien primarily to decide which of these are canonical and which of these are apocryphal or which of these are sort of ersatz versions of, of what Tolkien wrote. But I don't think that really answers the question of whether or not the intent, the moral intent behind it can be completely separated out from a work of art. That's why I was sort of saying I, I'm sort of instinctively minded toward a middle ground because I think we should bear it in mind. It's the old sort of critical approach sort of pre, pre-1940s really, which takes the meaning, the moral purpose of the author much more strictly than we've, we've come to take it today. Um, George Orwell wrote this essay called, I think, I think it's The Frontiers of Art and Propaganda, uh, which sort of sketching out part of the, the difference in approaches sort of pre and post-1940. Um, and he sort of celebrates the idea that new criticism, as it was emerging in the 40s, is much more focused on reader. It's an understanding of the political uh, inspirations of author, but not reducing works to the author's uh, sort of moral and political opinion. I'm I'm sort of with Orwell in that it's a kind of a, it's a bit of a paradox, but I think it's a sustainable paradox. I think you can hold a middle ground on death of the author. I don't think you should ignore it because ignoring it leads you to the place we're now in. But I don't think you should hold too strictly to it because that denies the validity of artistic interpretation. So my my sort of stubborn middle ground, undefined, ill-defined, sorry, though it is, would be uh, have regard to, but don't be restrained by. I would argue Rings of Power think, isn't um, a result of ignoring Tolkien, it's completely fucking up Tolkien, because they've clearly got some stuff in there correct. Like, they've actually got, it's um, almost what's frustrating is that they actually line up some things, even if they're small. No, well, what are we talking about here? I mean, I think superficially, yeah, yes, sure. they use some of, the, some of the correct names, but if you're talking about, I mean, the, the Sauron argument from earlier is kind of a useful example. Let, let's sort of say for the sake of argument, we don't know it yet, but for the sake of argument, that... Uh, Disbrew and, and Shad were right, and that Galadriel is going to turn Sauron evil by her own manipulations. Now, you can say there's a superficial uh, alignment with Tolkien, and that both of these people existed in his works, and they have the same names. But my point would be, if you understand what Tolkien was getting at about the fundamental nature of evil, which is really what he is writing about, that complete that's not just sort of that's not a, a fucking up of Tolkien that is a betrayal of Tolkien I think you can say that's a betrayal precisely because you have adherence to the moral intent behind the Lord of the Rings uh sorry so I'm I'm saying that you you were in intend that it, uh assert that it's death of the author that links to that that the Amazon writers would probably em employ it and thus that gives them the power to make such a horribly bad unfaithful lack of accuracy adaptation I would consider uh, I don't those think things they would disconnected. Deploy it. I don't think they would deploy it. I think, but I, but I think that that's the pervasive attitude toward art is death of the author. What? So it's not that they would consciously sit there and say, "Well, I am using death of the author as a defense for um, fucking up Tolkien." It's you know, like um, uh, it's Lord, oh, sorry, sorry for Love and Thunder or anything like that. Where where Taika Waititi says, "I'll ruin your mythos in a minute, baby." I would probably mm -hmm. agree with you if you said death of the author is a way for the Taika Waititi might be using as a, a way to just fuck up the thing he's adapting. 
even including things that are part of a continuity. I would probably agree with that one. Not quite with Rings of Power. I think that they would all claim when making it that they're like, no, we love Tolkien. We're adapting his work. It's just some stuff that needs to be updated. So he's I mean, not I would say is that I, uh, I actually think, I don't know that I would say that Death of... I get the impression with um, some recent media that you are kind of expected to view it and consider it in relation to like the broader landscape or the statements of the creators rather than taking it for its own thing. Like I could imagine that a lot of the ways that people watch, like for instance, I'm not sure that anybody could actually tell you what like the theme of Thor Love and Thunder was without referencing interviews or anything. Same with Doctor Strange. Um, what was it? Knives Out, right? Like a lot of people's praise of Knives Out is like word for word, just the Ryan Johnson's explanation behind the motive of making that film and like the structure that he wanted to do. I get the impression that like Death of the Author might actually be less prevalent now than it may have been a while ago, where like people will be very quick to reference statements that are made about a film by its writers or directors. Um, so is it uh, that's a cop out? You know the writers don't care about Tolkien. That's not actually like I don't this, actually know that. I don't know that. Yeah, I, I can't know that necessarily. Even from looking at their work, I can't be... know that. No, yeah, they could just be bad at making TV shows. They might love true. Tolkien, but they're just bad at their jobs and, they, and remember we can have people who love the same work for completely different reasons and think that they're respecting yep. it when yep. they do completely different things absolutely yeah i mean well then you're sort of veering into the complete subjectivity of death of the author itself in that one just just picking up on what fringy finished saying i think you know there's a difference between something that's being created now and the adaptation of something which predates it or pre-exists it. Uh, I think you're probably right in the sense that if it is a modern production, which makes absolutely zero fucking sense, but so the director comes out afterwards or the writer comes out afterwards and say, well, I intended this about it, mm -hmm. and the film only makes sense with that reference, then yeah, you're probably right. For that new creation, it sort of subsists on the on the, the uh, application of Death of the Order. Um, I'm talking about uh, adaptation, I think, probably more than the creation of brand new works. Uh, and we are we you know we are in a world of interminable and unending sequels and prequels and adaptations and reimaginings. Yeah. But when you get to the point where you're saying, well, of course I I adore and I respect Tolkien, but I'm updating him for a modern audience. Well, I would I would think I would classify that in in some sense killing the author in the act, and that's like that's the verb um, form. Of I guess maybe word. that's a different because I I. In my mind, I don't know, like, whenever I see the thing where it's like, we got to adapt it, we got to update it for a modern audience. I don't know if I would say that that's death of the author or rather something else. I don't know if Wait, I... what do you uh... do when you kill the source as opposed to the writer of the source? Like, when you don't Cause, cause care the about what's in the Because the principle of death of the author would be, like, the, the uh, authorial intent is not something that should be factoring into... I guess I could see how they're somewhat related in that you're essentially saying I'm not taking into account the authorial intent and in, in what I'm making. But I guess the thing is, I imagine a lot of people would counter as, well, no, I am. I'm just updating, <laughs> you know, I'm taking what they meant and I'm, I'm updating it to, uh, to modern audiences, which I mean, to some extent that might just be like an impossible statement, right? How do you, how do you substantively change it? without changing it you know if someone remade like, it's, it's kind of circular you are changing it by virtue of making changes to the material yeah and if someone made a new hope today by necessi necessity it would have to be different than when it was made back then for just all kinds of reasons technology notwithstanding there's lots of other things but when they come to the scene where han is going to shoot greedo if they engage with death of the author then han will shoot first Yes. And so that creates a, um, a bit of a problem, I think, for the people who value Death of the Author because it takes, it like respects the stories because th th it creates a tangle. Because that's, that's an example of when Death of the Author is actually damaging. And I saw someone say, I don't believe in Death of the Author except when the author is wrong about the content. So you do. Wait. Uh, so you do believe in death. That's, of the that's author, what death then. of the author pretty much engages in. It's like we're going with the source. Is... If we're checking the author's statements against the source to see if they're right, and we'll only believe them if they are, then the source is all that matters. The whole point of death of the author is that you can disagree with the authorial, yep. like the claims of the creator. That's that's like the point of death of the author. So, for instance, if the, I don't know, if someone said like, yeah, the theme of my story was about love lost. You know, it's like, well, no, it seems like the theme based on the story that you've told is actually about like, I don't know, 
the dangers of unchecked power or something, and then you have all of the references to support it, you just say to the author, okay, you say that, but, like, I just fundamentally got, disagree. They two people written. in chat just said the author is never wrong. Two different people said that. So is George That's, correct? Did Greedo shoot first? The, the author is never wrong. What does that mean? Well, yeah, I'm sure nobody actually agrees with that, right? At least the thing you were so, saying just like, earlier. If, if, um, <laughs> so if Zack Snyder thing. said, like, yeah, the main star of Man of Steel was Green Lantern... It's like, ah, we'll see, he's never wrong. So Clark Kent is actually, I don't know, Hal Jordan. There is. And it wasn't a blue suit, it was a green suit. It You're was, because the the he said so. They just said yes. Greedo shot first. That's... <laughs> ah, all right, yeah. I <laughs> not you, you don't. Though. No, you, you don't. You don't believe that. There will be an example that you disagree with. How many with lights are there on? I'm sorry, Han shot first. That is canon. <laughs> Credo didn't shoot first. Fuck Max him. Snyder isn't an author. So when you say death of the author, you're referring to the creator of a like yeah, creative specifically work. Specifically a death and not so specifically it does include author. directors and screenwriters oh, and absolutely, yeah. artists. Dude, I don't know why. One of our prime you, examples what, you think was James Gunn. Really applies to books? What? James Gunn about <laughs> Suicide Squad. He's a director and a writer. So that's what we're referring yeah. to when we say death of the author. And you know this as well. Like, if, if you if you're disagreeing with that, I gotta I gotta quote uh, Andy Dufresne. You're being obtuse. You're but being Han very kill someone in cold <laughs> blood. The whole idea is that Han knew he was there to kill him, so Han took the first shot because he's that fucking yeah. cunning. We didn't need to edit him awkwardly with his head jutting out to the side, dodging a, a shot to then <laughs> shoot him. God, that was awful. <laughs> Abyssal. It's terrible. <laughs> hard um, shot first. Hard shot first, yeah. And that's the thing, it's 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 hard shot first is death of the author as a I would call it a primary example that everyone engages in, but I can understand the trepidation with engaging with it because I would never associate Rings of Power as a consequence of death of the author, but I guess I understand someone believing that that could be the result. Is, uh, it's um, not quite I guess how I, I could see them. it in the sense of maybe the conclusion that comes from the perspective of death of the author is because we've tried to lay it out when we talk about it is like you can talk about the respectfulness and faithfulness of an adaptation we just think that it should be a different discussion from its merits as its own thing maybe if you fully subscribe to death of the author you start to completely disregard that but like that's that's a I guess that's a choice at the end of the day, right? Like that's going to be your subjective value judgments about like what matters to you in a story, and maybe faithfulness doesn't matter that much to you. I don't know that you could argue that somebody is more or less correct for having that perspective. Um, I though I, I mean, yeah, sorry. Oh no, I was just no, well, go, I'm go if, for if it. there's a if there's a solid distinction to be drawn between death of the author and disagreeing with the author. So if you take like the Han Greedo example. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so well, we know what the original author's uh, the author's original intent was. Sorry, um, the author decided to uh, update the depiction of his intent. Uh, we can disagree with whether that was the right choice, but we are still disagreeing with very much a, a living actor, and I mean a living actor, not in the sense of George Lucas is alive, but also that he is you know, still creating. Yeah. The works that he is um that, that we are arguing over so that you can disagree with his choice in that regard and you can say i think aesthetically and for writing reasons for all other reasons this was the better the original version was better uh, i don't know that that's necessarily engaging in death of the author in quite so strict um, a way as to well to help it. out the discussion would be on like what canonically happened in the story of star wars did han or greedo mm -hmm. shoot first if you ask george lucas the author he will tell you greedo shot first or i'm not even sure if you'll say that today but for the sake of the argument let's say he's still saying that and uh many i was about to say we many of the fans would say no george han shot first doesn't han matter if you first, released yeah. your definitive edition your ultimate edition which usually supersedes in terms of canon i mean it's up to the creator what thing remains canon right the IP holder. Um, so you can say, like, I don't care what you have to say about what is canon, which is kind of the attitude we have with Disney Star Wars, a lot of people, but, you know, we've been over how, like, defining canon, it's going to have very little meaning outside of your own head canon if you, if you say it's only what I think happened. But yeah, that is a case where we say, uh, no, nah, you're good. You're good, George. You can have your ideas, we'll have ours.
difference yeah. is uh, George changed his mind. So, like, yeah, that's the thing. If if the scene remained the same and there was no additional version released, he w he could say that and it wouldn't change what happens in there. And so that would be a case of just he's describing events wrong, but he's still the author. That's uh, why it creates problems. So that, that, then there's, there's a sort of a subordinate question there as to, you know, the question of death of the author and sort of the the ongoing authorial interest in a work. So, like, I don't think to say that George Lucas changed his mind about what he would have done with the original version of Star Wars does not change the fact the original version of Star Wars is what it was and bears the the uh, sort of the, the, the lowly stamp of his original intent. Um, I don't think that you could say, well, because he changed his mind on this and we don't agree. Uh, the the fact there are contradictory versions of events means that authorial intent doesn't come into play. The original work of art stands, and the intent that's behind it is still uh, it's, well, it's still imbued with the intent that was behind it. Um, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm I'm still sort of very clumsily sketching up that this sort of middle ground that I claim that I hold without being able to define it. But that's All a right. consideration. Uh, someone asked me by the way, how do I define canon then? The Basically, I think it's derived from property rights, right? That's where I'm getting it from. Yeah, the owner. That's, yeah, that's the it. And I've, I've admitted that there's problems with that because as soon as your IP sort of protection runs out, well, how is canon defined then? It's like, I don't think there's any meaningful way to define it at that point. Is Winnie the Pooh blood and honey? Uh, exactly. Um, and if someone idea. said, it's very meaningful to say whatever your head canon is, like, no, no, of course, you can run with head canon. I was just trying to find anything to appeal to that's more definitive and less subjective. And I think well, yeah, because, property rights is the like, you can get. Instance, I think I've often said, I just can't treat Solo as canon. I just can't do it. Like, it's not, that's not like a conscious choice. I just don't believe it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's canon. It is. At least it's canon right now under Disney's ownership of Star Wars. Um, well, when, when someone says, like, in the future of the Jurassic Park series, were they escaping fire locusts or something? You're just like, no. <laughs> Well, no, but on the other hand, they are, and they did, and they were. Um, I, I guess the, the, my problem with the full, the wholesale acceptance of, of Death of the Author is simply that it is, I cannot see a way, or any check or balance, which stops that leading purely into the realms of subjective interpretation without reference to any objective standard. I mean, it was, it was developed along the lines of, it's, it's subjectivism sort of writ large. That's the school of thought it emerged in. Uh, it's it is part of critical theory. It is a subjectivist idea, um, and I'm saying, but it's born of objective roots, or at least attempts at, at objective roots. So, like this middle ground I'm trying to stake is between the old-fashioned aesthetic autonomism and the critical theory developed death of the author, which I don't know that you necessarily have to go down that. But if you are going to go 100% death of the author, I think then you have to explain how you make any objective judgment. Uh, about the quality of the work of art or the intent of the work of art or the message of the work of art? Um, I think that you can, I think that, well, I guess, uh, like, let's say that we have a story that was written by, as far as we can tell, that there is no known author. It's just a story that was written by Bill, no last name, and there's mm -hmm. no references at all to, like, his political perspective or his moral framework or anything. And then all that we have to go off of in terms of judging, I guess, the moral of the story is uh, what's in the it. story. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, how do we do that? I, or, or rather, can we, is that impossible because we don't know who he is or what he believed in? I think the answer to that would be, no, it's entirely possible to pull meaning from a story that has no... I mean, I feel like we could just point to examples of fables that exist that we don't know who invented them. Um, we don't know who came up with them. How do we derive the morals from them? It's like, well, just from what's in the story. But then you're deriving the author, the author's intent, though, aren't you, by doing that? Um, well, I mean, let, let's put it this way. I can look at a film and not know anything about what the author actually believes, and I can still make judgments about what they probably intended based on what's in the story. Yeah, and, um, What happens if I watch The Suicide Squad and I conclude the intent with Polka Dot Man and then I get told by the author I was wrong about the intent? So if he was dead and was unable to tell me that, would I have just been wrong about his intent the whole time? Without knowing. I'm not sure I quite follow. Uh, sorry, so I quite follow. If we derive intent almost from the assessment of the stories, like mm -hmm. even if there's no reference to this person outside of this one work, but what if it turned out Bill was risen from the grave and he was like, your interpretation of every one of my intents of the story is actually wrong. So what was I holding on to at that point? Just wrong interpretations or in intentions? Arguably. Um... 
or the uh, projection of your own intent onto you know events that you're witnessing. But then like, just to clarify, you, in that world, you'd have no way to be able to tell, right? I thought. Sorry, I thought you said if he came back from the dead and told. No, you if that, he didn't. Well, sorry, before he comes oh, back from didn't. the dead, you'd you'd not have any way of telling. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. That's fine. Then you wouldn't have any way of saying for sure what the intent was. I mean, it's a, that is a matter of ultimately subjective interpretation, but not all subjective interpretation is is equivalently uh, founded or well supported in argument. That's Douglas Adams' thing on opinions, isn't it? Not all opinions are equivalently worthwhile they're not all as well supported by the evidence or the argument you would have to look through and you could say based on the available evidence of the story in front of me these are the values that seem to come through this is the value system that i think emerges from that therefore these are what i would take the author's political or moral uh, suppositions to be but that would be my best guess but that's still referring back to something isn't it that's still referring back to the question of authorial intent uh, even if he's dead literally and can't um correct you well, I mean, maybe this might be an interesting hypothesis. Like, let's say, uh, you know, tortoise and the hare. Um, mm -hmm. What is the moral of tortoise and the hare? It's like, well, I think it's safe to say that the point of it is slow and steady wins the race. That's like the point of that story. What if uh, your boy Aesop said, nah, the point of it was, uh, I don't know, it was like a critique of postmodernism or something. I don't know. It's just like, d d what does that mean? Like, if that's what he said, that it, it that its meaning is totally different from, like, what is in the story. Like, what, what, am, what am I meant to do with that, you know? I mean, well, I mean, the fact that not every uh, presupposition is contained within the story doesn't mean that it, it, that story contradicts the author's intent. So, like, Tortoise in the Hare doesn't leave room for... Oh, well, well, uh, what if, what if uh, maybe, what if we use, like, a, I, I, let's do a better example. We'll use that story... But he says, no, the moral of the story is slow and steady doesn't win the race. It is like the antonym of what the point is. Um, it's the total opposite. What, what does that mean to us? Uh, I, I think the same, the same response holds. I mean, there's only a certain amount of room contained within the story for any uh, authorial intent and opinion to be uh, added to it. What you could do, of course, is to go back to Aesop's time and look at the, the state of affairs in which he lived. Uh, the politics of the city-state in which he lived, any particularly notable events that he might be parabling, if that's a word. Um, Animal Farm is quite a good example of that. Uh, Animal Farm is ostensibly a, a children's story, and you can interpret it strictly as a children's story, but you can also look at the time in which Orwell was writing and the things he wrote alongside it, which give you some indication of the type of parable he was telling and the targets that parable was aimed at. Um, well, it sounds like what you're leading towards is essentially, a, now this might not be what you think, that, um, that basically having an awareness of authorial intent and then judging what the story is helps you figure out whether it's good or bad. I wouldn't necessarily I say good or bad. I mean, like you, you could do, um, say if, right. if Stephanie Meyer had written 1984, I would probably say, no, that's not a very good book because she can't write. But that's making a, an aesthetic judgment as opposed to arguing whether the intent behind the book is is uh, relevant or not. Hmm. Um. So out of curiosity, would it would it be correct to say you uh are not confused, but like you kind of reject at least in partial in, in part death of the author because of the fact that in assessment of the story you're always going to have authorial intent involved. It can't. It's just not possible to remove them. To a degree, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think don't need to, the Lord of the Rings... Don't need to elaborate, because to be... um, it's going to be a bonus question. So, okay. if that's true, but we did um, talk just a little bit earlier that I could have come to conclusions on intense, and then the author comes back to life and he's like, boo, no, you got all them wrong, it's these. Mm -hmm. so, and I asked, like, what was I holding at that point? I guess a better question is, was I not engaging in death of the author at that point then? Because all the intentions I had drawn had nothing to do with the author's intent. Would it then uh, it not be possible? Well, it depends on how the impressions you uh, you have were formed, wouldn't it? I mean, if, if you're trying to say, if, if you're going back and you're trying to understand the context in which the work was written and the messages that it might then be conveying uh, that are relevant to that context, um, you might be wrong, but you're still referential. I mean, you are still referring back to your imagined version of the author's intent. But the, the fact that you might be wrong about the author's intent doesn't mean that you weren't making a sincere attempt to refer to the author's intent. So in that case, I've almost um, constructed an author in my head 
about his intentions with the story, and thus it can't be considered death of the author, author still. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, yes in two ways. I mean, yes in the sense that you are referring uh, to the author, and you're only going based on the best available information. And all we can do is paint the picture using that best available information. But secondly, because whether we're right or wrong about how we interpret a work of art, my ultimate position is that that work of art could not come to be without expressing some element of authorial intent. Um, the only the reason the story exists in the first place um, is because the mm. author carries into it, into the telling of it, certain uh, presuppositions, and they are usually presuppositions and prejudices as opposed to um, in the traditional meaning of prejudices. I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, you know about the, the, the monkey typewriter thing? Like if you put a million monkeys at a typewriter or something after it, or a monkey at a typewriter after a certain amount of time will create like the best novel ever? Give it an hour, um, it'll produce rings of power. This is true. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Uh, how how do we apply death of the author in that case, where it is literally just a, a monkey typing a bunch of like random letters, and then they just well, be the same. To create a don't even need the story. monkey. It would be the same at that you point. It's the same same question I asked. Text the ghost author given. at that point, you'd imagine them in your head. Well, oh, sure, but yeah. I like the monkey example, so let's go with the monkey. <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying it would be the same answer. He's already answered that technically. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, there, there might be a subtle variation with the monkey. Well, the variation, I guess, would be is your knowledge of the fact that no one wrote it. It was an algorithm from, well, not even yeah. an algorithm, sorry, it's it's monkeys. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, it becomes a bit more like, I don't know, take like modern art, for example, like the most egregious example of modern art, where uh, someone just like decides, or actually, or even the mistaken modern uh, modern artwork. So someone drops their sunglasses in the corner of an art gallery, and everybody thinks it's an exhibition. And so they go and take photographs of it, and they, they think this is a really profound thing. That, that's an act of pure subjectivism in art, but there is no authorial intent behind it because there is no author to have intent behind that. That was a pure accident. Okay. Um, modern art often doesn't have intent behind it. Quite often, the, well, besides saying, I want everybody else subjectively to fully load this thing that I've sat on the ground with meaning, with, uh, with import, with purport, with all the rest of it. Um, but even then, that, there's an element of authorial intent there, which is just pure exploitation and laziness. But I, my, my problem with like, Death of the Author, I think, is that it can too often lead to pure subjectivism of the modern art variety, which means that you can look at anything and you can say, well, uh, there's no need to refer back to the moral impetus that gave rise to its creation. All we need to do is just to say, well, I think this about it and that's good enough for me. I find that interesting, though, because you've, you've said you've been a fan of our work for some time, right? We yes, tend not to do that. We don't do that. Well, yeah. I don't. I don't know that you, uh, you. Well, this was part of the reason that it was so interesting last time, and I was sort of regretful I wasn't in a fifth state to have the conversation. Um, it was. So the interesting thing about it is that obviously you guys are big on, well, at least fairly big on objectivity and art, and judging art aesthetics at least by uh, an artistic technique by objective standards. And the thing I was really interested in was that you should take essentially a subjectivist standard like death of the author and how that can be married and i think it probably can be married but how you choose to marry that to the idea that you can make objective judgments about uh the work of art in general um because of course you can make objective judgments about technique irrespective of, author of authorial intent or at least i think you can but uh, broader questions as to the worth of a work of art my suggestion i guess would be the maybe we are just operating slightly on cross purposes uh, as terms of what we define death of the author as being oh yeah because um, we clearly like all the cast today um i think disbrew even has, has said in other streams that like you know he sort of alluded to it there that he doesn't like covering things positively because it's nowhere near as entertaining and his metric for what is the worst content versus best is how entertained he is so the most boring will be the zeros out of ten which isn't lined up with us at all however mm -hmm. myself shad disagree on loads of things we disagree, blah, 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 but all six of us came to almost identical conclusions on Rings of Power. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting, right? Like those foundations being having these really important yeah. differences, and yet we all come out with similar results. Definitely, but then there is more to a work of art than authorial intent. So, like you could be, you could fundamentally disagree on whether authorial intent is even important when you're discussing anything to do with Tolkien, but you could still look at it on terms that have nothing to do with authorial intent and make judgments on its quality of writing. Like, do events logically follow? Do character decisions follow from the information we have about them? Yeah. Uh, it, does motive exist? But none of that kind of really has to do it, with... That's, that, I guess that's at the heart of it, is like, as long as everybody in a conversation can agree on what framework What's they're using, yeah. whether or not that means that we're referencing authorial intent, 
then you can have a discussion where everybody kind of under because ultimately i guess the most important part of the of of this process is that everybody understands what everybody else is saying and so that there's like no points of confusion and, and ideally whenever there's disagreement you're disagreeing on something that can be resolved by just going over the material in the story or the framework that's relevant to the type of discussion you're having rather than getting stuck essentially because we can't even agree on like a fundamental framework it's, it's the reason why i don't think it's like i don't think that it's in uh worthless to discuss authorial intent at all i mean no yeah we did like, it I, I don't know if you, i don't know if you watched our uh, my, our halo coverage um but i mean it's kind of hard for me to not talk about what i think that they they intended and yeah. like what i know that they intended based on their interviews because of course like that kind of pisses me off well, can... um <laughs> like it's uh it's it's normal i if think can... i think it's like totally normal to talk about it's just always important to try and not get those conversations confused i think mm. if we can expand author to include the actors as well as in the characters they're portraying on screen is a work of art and that they are defining that work almost so when the actor says like oh he was clearly hesitating he wasn't sure he'd do it and he probably like he wouldn't have if not for the fight he has with the sealed door we can all be like fuck that that's not in the actual show you've made that up <laughs> oh but, god yeah. yeah but i i wouldn't i think i would reject the suggestion you can include uh, actors as, as authors in this in that way or at least in a strict way like actors are performers and they are performing things that have been well, written yeah, for them he could have performed that performance. right that could have been something he actually portrayed he could have gone to throw pulled it back and then heard the cough that that could have been something but he didn't or rather they didn't include that cut <laughs> if if, the, if that cut is in there mm -hmm. um and then of course the question would just extend then because it's like it sounds like you're like well, yeah that's being rejected but if let's say he was correct though You'll be like, oh, well, yeah, I guess he's on board. But whether or not we're disregarding his opinion isn't actually in, in focus or not. We're just listening to him as a source for what is in the actual stuff, and then we verify it. And that's kind of how I would treat the author. Let's, in this case, say the director or writer or whatever of that episode of Rings of Power, they say, yes, he was hesitant, and he wouldn't have done it if not for the fight with Isildur. We'd again be like, no. That's wrong. That's the, you didn't portray that at all. That's not in there. I'm sorry, Mr. True, director. No, but I'd agree, with, I'd agree with that, but that's, that's because they're not portraying clearly stated authorial intent but then again you're, what you're criticizing isn't authorial intent and whether that's relevant it's simply assuming that it's relevant and you're saying does is this what is depicted on screen but you can't make that judgment without reference to in that case in if um if they said if the creators said he was thinking about not doing it but he didn't go through with uh you, you know he opted for going through with it and uh, that's not something that had crossed our minds at all we thought he was just 100 percent on board with it the whole time I probably would entertain that because there's no way to disprove it. And if there's ones like like, but I wouldn't care to include much of it in in an assessment because it's so up in the air. There's so few references. Like, uh, mm -hmm. if they said, for example, it was actually a scroll that turned into Bronwyn for that scene where she says, "Oh, we're all gonna die," and then the scroll left seconds after that, and she was she was put back. It's just like that that that. I mean, there's nothing necessarily. I didn't think scrolls were in this universe, but like, you know, it's just like that. I've, uh, <laughs> You know, like we're technically speaking, there's nothing stopping that from being impossible. But I would still reject that, even if the author says it and it doesn't conflict with anything in the show, necessarily. Yes, and I, I, I think I'd reject it too, but I'd still deny. I, I wouldn't deny that the intent existed, but I would reject that it. Hates yeah, and, the show. and that's the thing. I think uh, Freem was kind of mentioning it. it was like we do value uh, what the author has to say but it'll obviously mm -hmm. come under a microscope, just like everyone else's opinions. And that's kind of how we want to employ Death of the Author. That if we have, you know, you, Fringy, and James Gunn talking about Polka Dot Man, I'm going to disregard his f first out of the three of you's, let's say, testimony or whatever, as to what the idea is with Polka Dot Man, because his is so far away from it, um, even though he's the fucking creator. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's where I use it. However, he could have had the most accurate and insightful one that actually points out things that everyone missed. And I should be like, oh shit, he's the most valuable one. And then someone could be like, well, duh, he's the creator. I'd be like, well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I think I'd broadly agree with that approach. But uh, again, all that stress is that that is still referential and that is still making reference to authorial intent. That's a judgment on the validity or the worth or of the authorial intent, but that's about it really but i don't think we basically do probably agree it's just uh it's more of a i'd say we definitely seem to agree in practice because we rarely ever come across disagreements in the conclusions of any one scene 
Yeah, exactly. But there's going to be ones out there that may happen that are blurry enough, and then you would have you'd maybe opt for whatever the author has said is is the correct answer. Well, we would say it's ambiguous, and even if mm -hmm. the author says, well, no, it's it's X, not Y. I think uh, didn't Destiny say like, um, uh, what would you do if if Christopher Nolan said that the uh, the spinning top does drop at the end? We just ran out of film, we oh, couldn't cut it or whatever. Like it, you know, and it was just I think we just said no, nah, reject it. Uh, not yeah, in the film. it's not in the film. It just isn't, and so anything that exists beyond that, it's just like I'm not even a fan of that ending. That in. What of the where it does actually drop? Or... I think I remember not being oh, a fan you... of it because it didn't make sense. But I could be wrong. I'd have to go back and watch it. Well, I'm curious about Inception and how well mm -hmm. it holds. How well Inception <laughs> holds up? Yeah. Ages. Yeah, because I think I've mentioned it before on stream. I'm not sure that the kick scene at the end makes any sense at all. I think they got it backwards. As, as If I understand kicks and how they work in that film, I'm pretty sure they got it backwards. Because if you remember, the whole point of like, go, the, the whole point of their heist was that they were so, um, they were so, uh, uh, fuck, um, sedated that they couldn't kill themselves. They'd go to limbo, but they kill themselves to get out of each successive dream state when the whole point of the kick was that it comes from the level above, not the level below. That the kick above will wake you up from uh from that dream. I'm pretty sure it doesn't make any sense, but you know, I feel like <laughs> we any can rewatch re that another time. If ever we were to do a Nolan for Evap movies, that might be one where like Disbro, I'd need to watch it before we do Evap movies for it, just because with every last word of every character's like dialogue, you need to take it in yeah. to make sure you catch all of the craziness. Yeah. Or, or, sorry, all yeah, of the I great think... writing. I didn't mean to say craziness. Well, that slipped down. It's all of the great writing across all of his films. Exactly. Right. All of his films and characters. Yes. Including... Yes. Mm-hmm. That one, too. Mm-hmm. I'm glad we've included yeah. all of them. Great. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, there you go. There's our Death of the Author Part 2. I'm sure there'll be a Part <laughs> 3 tomorrow or something. Yeah. I'm not sure. The Money Laundering Rings of Power... Possibly. Cannot confirm. The uh, people do it's wonder where all the money went exactly. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Not to the script, I'll tell you that. <laughs> all the actors. Uh just watch two towers. Every character struggles to survive and every clip of Galadriel and Rings of Power shows her not even struggling. Yeah, uh, she's amazing. I'm trying to think of, does she struggle at all in, in the last episode, the latest one? She does some like mm -hmm. stupid Super awesome moves, right? Where she like falls off her horse, but then does some. I don't think she struggles at all. Yeah, she hangs off the side of her horse to dodge incoming projectiles, and then she's just yeah. amazing, even yeah. from the side of her horse. Even, even, yeah, even when she's faced with a, an exploding volcano, she just stands there and lets it come at her. <laughs> because there's a tempest inside of her. Oh yeah, <laughs> cause new problems, indigestion. <laughs> that volcano better watch out. Uh. Oh, Cyberpunk Edge Runners is by the same studio who did Visions. It gets very contrived, bad dialogue, but fun characters. Four out of ten would be generous. Oh my. Mm. Had lots of recommendations. I think that's the first, the more critical Super Jam we've had of it. I, I still haven't watched it yet, I, 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 but I've heard recommendations from mostly everybody at this point. The new cool kid on the block. Apparently. Mm -hmm. Revitalize that game. Uh, Wings quote of the day. Thanks for the two dollars and fifty cents. Uh, that he, he thanks the account, which is Wiggs hopes my family dies. Which for uh, oh well, that the, might be true, but what well, could be the automobile not... crash one, right? Yeah, automobile wreck. All right, right, right. right. sorry, I got it wrong. <laughs> automobile wreck. <laughs> I mean, maybe he does wish your family was Automobile. dead. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Automobile wreck. That he said that instead of car crash. I don't, yeah, I don't I've know heard what car wreck. Is. I've never I've heard, heard of a car crash. Wreck. I've never heard of car automobile wreck. Automobile it's a rare wreck. combo. Uh, He's so bringing it back, Mahler. Bonus. No, I've never drunk milk so fresh it felt like someone's tits in my mouth. Well, that's... that's, that's... <laughs> Why would <laughs> he's he's such a character? He's such a such a character. He is the character. Apparently, there's talk of bringing in Harrison Ford as a recast Thunderbolt Ross in MCU. There's all sorts of things wrong with this, if it's true. I heard about that. Um, 
I don't even know how I feel about it. Uh, he's he's. I think William Hurt was great as as Thunderbolt Ross. It's just that he doesn't have. He has, he like simultaneously is not a prominent but also prominent role in that he's showed up so many times technically, but at the same time he has very little screen time. So I like Rhodey, but I guess you wouldn't recast him now. Well, now Rhodey's getting his movie. Armor Wars is going to be a movie now instead of a TV show. Oh, I saw oh, that. Good yeah. for him. Wow. Well, I think it's because Blades collapsed, right? <laughs> like Blade. <laughs> what? Dude, I really want to well, see what it would have been because it sounded fucking horribly bad. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's kind of a when you find out it's like Blade was going to be P. Well, it almost certainly will be PG thirteen. It's like right, Marvel. Man, are we sure Deadpool is going to be guaranteed? And even if it's yeah. guaranteed an R rating, what about what limitations are going to be put on them? Like in terms of what they can or cannot do. Um, I don't know. It's uh the the sludge pipe. I don't know if anything escapes. We'll see. Guardians three would be the one, right, to really test it. Yeah. Hello, EFAP. Devil Fruit of the Week is the super super fruit, which enables the user's body to gain characteristics of a steel blade. Characteristics of a steel blade. A exchange, super super fruit. In exchange, you can't swim. Is that is that one again? What characteristics? Because if I'm just going to be rigid, what is it? Is it like T one thousand or what? What's it called again? The Suba Suba fruit. Suba Suba. Uh, let's see. Uh, that, 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 that makes the user's body smooth and slippery, which in turn makes most attacks and objects slide off their body, protecting the user from harm in most situations. If one is overweight in any way, they will become slim by having the excess fat slip off. How, how, what? How well, does fat slip off? Fat is inside. It slips out. Or... <laughs> it um, just comes out of your butt. Oh, no. Uh, you just so someone said you can basically fat. change any part of, into blades. So if, if we go best faith assumption here and it's T-1000 powers... Um, in exchange for not being able to swim, and I guess everything else stays the same, you can just temporarily turn your fingers into a, a knife, your whole arm into a big <laughs> knife. Uh, I guess, but I don't know when that will be really useful to do. I mean, I, yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably just keep a pocket accessed. knife on me, and then I can still swim, I guess. Yeah, I have a, I always have a knife on me, and if I'm doing kitchen stuff, then I have kitchen knives. I never need them outside of... Yeah, I I just I don't know when that would be useful. I'd have to be able to hang on to the more... fruit, and then if it comes up, I guess I'll eat it. But I need blade hands. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I just Seems feel unlikely, like we have... though. Yeah, we have tools for all the things that I would turn my arms into. Yeah, I'm trying to think of it, even a scenario where I'd need it, and it's just I think so. Uh, Disparu and Shad? Give me the meat and give it to me raw. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, yes. Just like Kyla's ferrets. Hail EFAP, also Hyrax. Hello. Virgin Red Letter Media, who reviewed some parts of Old Track versus Chad Lawrunner, reviewed all episodes of Old Track, searched how many episodes there even are of Old Track? A lot, as far as I know. He has a bunch. Um. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I wouldn't... I mean, we haven't reviewed all of Star Wars, you know? The, you know, different channels do different things. I think um, you've seen their the coverage of their favorite TNG episodes of all time or something, right? RLM. Yes. I haven't. I decided to avoid those ones because I feel like I really should watch those episodes, not watch reviews of them beforehand. Yeah, that's fair. They're quite coveted. Those those pieces of content. Hey, it's been on my mind, but the last super chat catch up has strained my curiosity. What's the beef with Bojack Horseman? P.S. If you do watch Edge Runners, it it's be it's not better than Arcane. E. The beef with Bojack Horseman. No beef, as far as I know. I There's just no don't beef. Think we just think good. it's not good <laughs> <laughs> compared to the acclaim that it tends to receive. Yeah, I think it has a lot of I prestige of that it shouldn't necessarily have. It I don't think it earned the prestige that it has. No, uh, I don't think so either. 
Obviously, I used to think that, but my opinion changed on a rewatch. Hey Shad, this week I mastered sword fighting. It's stab, twist, gut. It's so easy, it makes your channel look oh, like a joke. Also, oh, I'm all Tempest. Technique. Jesus Christ, this guy's all Tempest, and he has swords apparently. That's a lot, that's a lot of Tempest. That is terrifying. Don't kill anyone, alright? Bad. Please don't kill but anyone. But it's cool that you mastered swordsmanship, that's all you really need. Disparu, I knew it was only a matter of time. I mean, yeah, if, especially if the networks involve me. I mean, both Disparu and Little Platoon, I was able to sort of start conversations with thanks to Open Bar. It's uh, neat when crossovers happen. You can start cross-pollinating. <laughs> Little Platoon is back. Perfect fit on EFAB. Oh, I think you, I don't know if you checked the comments. You got quite a few compliments last stream. So congratulations. Oh. Sir. Thank you, Pollen. Very much. Raw. <laughs> oh, no. If you had a... Pick a single storytelling trope to discuss in depth. Which would you pick? I have intense desire to destroy veganism. Hi, Morla. <laughs> really? Hi. Is that a storytelling uh, trope? <laughs> I didn't. As a it trope should of be. vegans. So uh, this almost sounded yeah, to me tough. like the question of like a, you're stuck on a desert island. You're only allowed to talk about one. You know, like like you got to choose the one that you can get the most mileage out of. Almost. I mean, Storytelling trope. I almost just want to go for a really broad one so then I can talk about all the components and stuff. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd have to really sort of see a list, honestly, to just go make for sure. The good guys win <laughs> so that I can talk about everything, basically. It's not even untrue. Like, it is fun to watch films. Uh, me and Fringy had this uh, about, like two years ago now. I was about to say recently. Film called, uh, well, I, I almost hesitate to say it now because like, I'm implying what the result of it is. Let's just say a film with a very conventional story, and then it like takes a pivot on exactly what kind of way it's telling it. And then the end, every component is in place for it to be like, woohoo, we did it. But the main character just fucking breaks down and uh, accepts the fact that their life sucks and that they, 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 they were victorious way too late. Um, yeah. It was an interesting film. Yeah, and I really appreciated the ending. And it could almost say it's like, yeah, because it's a it's a more raw it's a meat it's a raw meat ending, and they gave it to me. Yeah, yeah. Like there was a there was no there quail was a, sauce. An emotionally no quail easier sauce. option <sighs> that they could have taken and they chose to take the more honest one. Yeah, and I appreciate it when they do that in story stories. Especially when it's like I was gonna say almost a surprise, because but I think that's drawn out from the trope. Uh, I assume uh, if I'm if I'm allowed to call that a trope, it's just like I was expecting it to be the normal like, yay, we did it. But I was like, oh, oh wow, wow, they went there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, maybe that's my legitimate answer, and it allows me to talk about all kinds of things for ages. Who's next? I don't know. Maybe something regarding characters just being stupid, because it's it has such broad swaths of consequences, and it manifests in so many ways, but. I'm not really mm. sure if I'm asked off the top of my head, but yeah, the just just general stupidity of people in stories so that plots can happen. I really have a disdain for that, and I hate it. I like the idea that what modern if... writing is its own trope now. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, yeah. What exactly was the question? If you had to pick a single storytelling trope to discuss in depth, which would you pick? Uh, in depth, so it could be good or bad. Like, it could be positive or negative. Hmm. Uh, storytelling trope. Um, I mean, I do find the whole active and passive character thing pretty interesting, as well as that characters must change. I find that these are perspectives that are worth evaluating more so than just accepting wholesale as, like, active is always better than passive, or characters must change, they can't be static. I think that these are commonly accepted, essentially, limitations on the possible stories that you can tell. So I think that it's worth examining that um, more thoroughly to maybe hone in on a conclusion which I think is more fair, which is active characters are generally a better choice to make, and characters in a story generally should have arcs, but these are not requirements. Your story is not made worse for not doing these things. Necessarily. Yeah, basically. Not necessarily. 
Um, maybe the hero's journey, though. That's like a nice big one <laughs> that you could talk about. A chonker. Since it's such a... Yeah. All right. Anti... Well, I don't know if character yes, types are a trope, guess. but I, I'd go for anti-heroes. I like anti-heroes as an idea. Yeah. Okay. I'll pick anti-heroes just because you can do so much that's brilliant with them, and almost nobody does them well. So that's sort of broad enough to, to go on with. I've started working on my first video explaining why every single YouTuber, except you guys, are wrong about a certain video game franchise. Advice? What franchise? <laughs> like, we, what one are we might, right yeah. about that everyone else is wrong about? Are we talking about... Infinite? Bioshock? I, I know plenty of people who don't like Bioshock Infinite. Yeah, lots of people don't. So, hmm. Uh, yeah. Game I don't, I don't take know. that we are right about no one else's. Dark Souls? I don't think so. Um, Amnesia Rebirth? Pretty sure everyone fucking ain't. <laughs> Why would anyone like that? Can't be Last of Us 2. Last of Us nah. 1? I don't think I would take was that. Alright, well, you know, I'd be curious to... As for advice, you know, just uh, the usual stuff. Stay passionate, stay on the stuff that you really, really care about, and then, you know, double-check, get your references right, and maybe give a redraft to that script of Rooney. Hmm. I, I'm not sure how you're going to format it, if it's about how everybody is wrong. I guess you're going to try and break it up into topics? Well, you could pick a few, like, very big-name creators, and like, pick five, for example, and identify an aspect each of them has, has picked out and contradict it. But don't, like, overdo that. Don't do pick too many. But like, there's, like, a series of counter-essays as opposed to a, a big, sort of, flailing one. I'm so happy the writers of the show killed off Galadriel with the pyroglastic plastic flow of the eruption. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool of them to do that. Right? This, this is, is this is how we know it, they're listening to the fans. Anyone who put it in, who who betted from the beginning that she died in pyroclastic flow from a volcano, you win the pool. You did it. I don't know how you knew, but that's one hell of a guess. She Hulk is awful. Now that this is out of the way, I want She Hulk set on. That on my face, I want Hulk see so bad. Anyways, James Bond arc with the UK lads when? Um, that's that, that could happen at some point. Why not? It would be cool to get me as the Welsh one, Drinker as the Scottish one, as as the English one, and then we'll have to find an Irish one. And we can that would that would mean it's that's good. That's that that means it's a good thing. How that works. Veganism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love listening to EFAP ripping crap entertainment. Little Platoon. When can we expect part two? Looking forward to it. Uh, I'm assuming that's Rings of Power. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully next weekend. Tentatively, though, next weekend, because... It was my birthday week this week, and so I thought, I'll take a couple of days off. And then those couple of days off, I ended up doing Andor. And then Andor became longer than I thought it was going to be. But that's almost done. It might be out tomorrow. Assuming that's out tomorrow, if I can get two and a half hours of video done in a week, hopefully next weekend. But given the last one took a week to get past Amazon, maybe two weeks' time. But within the next fortnight, hopefully. Wait. Uh, the plan is to grab Helios like the little clown boy he is. That's something I'll be doing uh, not too long ago now until I get to God of War 3. Uh, you know Helios, is he... the like? Uh, am I like... What's with my memory right now? I, I always... I partially remembered him as Apollo, and then I was like, no, he's Helios, so... Uh, is Apollo a Greek god, or am I... Am I just messed yeah, up? Apollo, uh, Apollo, Apollo is a Greek. Greek. Yeah, Apollo is yeah. a Greek god. So who's Helios? Helios? Is on god. So uh, the, isn't oh, Helios, um, well, yeah, because, uh, Helios, that, yeah, because, like, in Deus Ex, you got Helios and Icarus and Daedalus and all that, yeah. Apollo is a descendant of Helios. Oh. Apollo is Roman god. Is he? Uh, no. No, Apollo Apollo is Greek. Apollo's Greek. If you've seen Helios Troy. is Roman? Okay, now I'm getting, I'm pretty sure Helios is Greek. No, Helios is also Greek. Helios is the son 
um, that we are a heliocentric, a heliocentric solar system. Uh, I don't know what the Roman sun god is. I'm, I'm bigger on the Greeks than the Romans One in many more. ways. Uh, Mercury would be the equivalent for Roman, is it? Uh, uh, Apollo had no direct Roman equivalent. Oh. Because, yeah, the later Roman poets often referred to him as Phoebus. Is it safe to say, well, because I was just, you know when uh, God of War 3 starts, you, you have uh, Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Hermes, and Helios, I think. I'm curious about that choice. Uh, is it just me, or is, is Apollo more well-known than Helios? Apollo seems to be more well-known. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty imagine. sure. I'm curious why they made the choice, or maybe it doesn't, maybe there's a reason I'm missing. I might, Apollo's chariot draws Helios about the sky. Because Helios is using a chariot, I think, in that game as well. Apollo is truth, Helios is light. Well, it's all good. It's all good. We'll, we'll, uh, if you... Apollo anyone... is lots of things. He's one of those gods that covers a lot of different bases. He's hogging up all of the names of things. Music, medicine, the sun. Yeah, you know, things, and then you just got, yeah, you're the water guy. Sorry, buddy. Well, I guess water's pretty all-encompassing. Water's pretty great. Yeah, they all cool. have such... Considering they, they got do, awesome they do. Their names. names are really good, really cool yeah. names. And and then someone could be like, "Well, maybe their names are just cool because you associate Hazed. it with them." And then you're like, nah. "Oh no, I think they're just cool actually." Nah. <laughs> I they're, they're cool names. Like yeah. you know, there's no if there were a god that was as badass as called... Poseidon, Zeus, and Hades, and he was just called Flemp, it would it wouldn't <laughs> like that. Yeah. We wouldn't go, off oh, Flemp, man, yeah. what a cool name Flemp is. It's like, no. The great titan of the sky, Dookie Dookie. <laughs> You're like, ah, I don't know, man. That's, cat. we just call you Double D. Um, but yeah, just, uh, oh, these, these are, they're strong as fuck names. They're really cool. Uh, I like them a lot, and it's cool that God of War takes so much advantage of just being like, ain't it cool you're killing these guys? You're like, yeah, pretty cool. That's why I'm I'm building up my uh, my expectations and excitement for finally fighting Thor and Odin. It's gonna be so cool. Please be good. A lot of people in chat, bringing have been saying that we could be heading the Last of Us Two situation. I was like, oh my god, why? Why would you even tempt fate? Wait, uh, with what? Sorry, with what? With Ragnarok. Um, why? Why is that the expectation that people would have? Terrifying. Why would the, Why would we even entertain the idea? Like I said, uh, uh is it because like. Because I think Corey Barlog is producer. He's not directing. He's he's working on something else. But he said um, cringe things, right? Uh, what him or like other people who are working on I it? I could have sworn people have been saying even Corey Barlog's been saying. Stuff. I don't know. I guess well, we'll like find cringe out. stuff about the game or just what in general? <laughs> like, uh, possibly I that I I haven't gotten anything more specific. That's, I was kind of hoping maybe chat will enlighten me. Did say cringe things. Um, yeah, because, well, like, is there an example that might be something that gets you worried? Because, I mean, you know, you could just have cringe that's totally separate from, from that work, right? Kratos and toxic masculinity. Uh, yeah, but uh, this could be a hot D situation, guys, where they say it and then you watch the show and you're like, that's fine that you said that, you, you keep that to yourself, though. <laughs> You said Civil War is the worst Marvel movie. <laughs> <laughs> Damn um, you, Corey! I guess it's something that's probably worth. I, I think it often gets lost in the uh, discussion about the story. The Last of Us Two was like not a good video game, um, and so like if God of War is at least mechanically as good as what the the first game, then like it kind of can't be a Last of Us Two situation. Yeah, which is kind of nuts, because my main, and we'll see if this holds true when I play them, but my main appreciation for God of War 3 is like a, I would probably want to say a 70-30 split of mechanic story, while my appreciation for God of War 2018 is probably a 60-40 split of story to mechanics, if not a 70-30 split of story to mechanics. Right, so really it does hinge a lot on the story. Yeah, so if Ragnarok has a really shit story, poorly done characters, but like mechanics that are even slightly better than 2018, I wonder if that'll even be able to stem my hatred at all. I don't know. Because yeah, you're right, so The Last of Us 2, gameplay-wise, like, I wonder if it was just because of how bad the story was that it started to really not have an ability to hide how much I don't like the mechanics in the world of The Last of Us, but... I think, I think that's totally it was hard like to a look fair to the thing scene. to say. Yeah. 
Like, for instance, I, I mean, I guess, in, like, I wonder with the Uncharted... Well, I kind of felt, because Uncharted 4 at the beginning is quite slow. It has the problem that a lot of modern games have where, like, the replay value is significantly compromised by how, uh how much the narrative dictates the sort of uh, gameplay scenarios that are presented in the game. Um, but I mean, as long as you're enjoying a story in a video game, I think people can put up with a lot. Um, whereas, yeah, if, if like this, if the story isn't delivering and you're just left with the mechanics, it's kind of, a uh, yeah, nothing to hide behind in a sense. Hot take Kratos should have stayed down and they come up with a new protagonist. He wasn't dead. At the end of God of War 3, they do, they confirm he's not dead. He's gone. The blood Also, stain. I don't think that's ever going to happen. He's too iconic. I don't even... This is the thing. If someone said, well, you should have killed him at the end of God of War 3, then you shouldn't have brought him back. I'd just be like... I, the, if we knew that they were going to do what they did in 2018 with him, I would absolutely agree we shouldn't kill him. Because, uh... Right. I fucking... I, I love where they're taking him from there, but I'm, I'm curious how we're going to shake it out. I... I don't even know at this point, there's, there's talk of prophecy, right, that you'll be... There's loads of references to sons killing their fathers in 2018. And um, and there's even... This, there's a bit of that prophecy sees on a wall where it looks like he dies in favor of Atreus in some way, shape, or form. Um, <laughs> Joel was iconic, too! <laughs> <laughs> Joel was iconic. Uh -oh. That's true. Well, well, no, remember, he, he wasn't a beloved <laughs> He yeah, he wasn't beloved, so it's character. fine. Kratos is beloved, of course. Of course. He kind of is, which is funny because I'm pretty sure Cosmo Variety House argument was he's not beloved, he kills people, he's a brutal, he's like, that's not gonna stop someone from being beloved, my dude. Um, anyway, you got all that stuff happening, there's, what if, like, Kratos is killed in the end of Ragnarok, but he ends up in, like, the Egyptian underworld? You know, because he's right. escaped the underworld in every fucking realm at this point. <laughs> you can't... That's considered one of his greatest achievements, is that when he was killed, he was so angry he climbed back out of hell in, in the Greek yeah. world, so... It's this pretty is the thing. funny. <laughs> it is really funny. It's, he's too angry to die. That's like Kratos. Um, so yeah, if he was to be killed, it really would probably confuse the fans. You'd be like, I'm not sure how that happened. It's just like, yeah, it just sort of did. Which, to be fair, you die all the time if you play the game. Uh, all these bad content, like The Hobbits and this show ruined R.R. Tolkien's books. It's time to reboot it. Lord of the Rings, The Ring Awakens by Abrams and J.J. We Trust. Ugh. You imagine <laughs> Ring The Ring Awakens. I could believe that, too. Oh. Uh, I do believe it. Yeah, fuck me. It's gonna be so cool. Too much British, I feel like curious? I'm watching Top Gear. What? It was only <laughs> three Brits. What? What? <laughs> how did it feel to be, like, three Brits and two Australians, Rags? How are you feeling over there? You're feeling great. Oh, there you go. See? Feeling really, really great. He's not feeling colonized or anything, it's fine. No, Little not. pumpkin? He's like, really comfy. not. Having a great time. He someone said it would be fun to play Atreus in the sixth God of War, and it's like, I want to play Kratos in the Egyptian pantheon, I'm sorry, I, I deserve it. <laughs> you have to give me it. Legally, you you're required. But not like a Moon Knight shit version no. of the Egyptian pantheon, but a, a right, proper, actual Egyptian pantheon. I mean, the big difference with the Greek era and the Norse era is it looked like they took it way more seriously. Like, they actually tried to stay accurate, at least to some, a much higher degree of how the Norse mythology shakes out. There's a lot of things that, they obviously fuck with a lot of it too, to fit in their own OC. But like, you know, it works. The Greek one, they just do whatever the hell they want. And then they randomly reference like things from Greek mythology, which is fine. Again, you can do that. Um, the differing results, of course. Because uh, like the third God of War was like super cinematic. It was like everybody get ready, fucking destroy Mount Olympus, buddy. Here it goes. No, your son has returned. I bring. <laughs> he yells so much. I it's like great. that, but like, dude, <laughs> I fucking love Zeus's opening monologue in that game. Like. There's uh, a lot of cool lines in those games. It talks about like the, the erection of Zeus the... never gets old. It's really funny. Yeah, no. <laughs> he like... said, when he shouts, they show the cutscene of him shouting at Ares like four times in the first game, and it was funny when I was streaming it. <laughs> Ares. 
Zeus. 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 <laughs> Zeus. And it's so interesting to watch him younger <laughs> and so aggravated and angry and fucking killing everything in his path. And then you go to the 2018 one where he's this like clearly aged guy who's just like fuck I've been angry for so long <laughs> like it's just yeah. it's just yeah. hard being angry all the time. Uh, where are we? Glad to see Shad, Disparu, and Little Platoon. Uh, Shad and Disparu, aren't you in exhausted after Friday Night Tides? Dude, this is the thing. The people who are like circuitry around all the different streams, myself included, but like Chad's one of them. Disbrew has been on like a stream every day. It's like, it does get ridiculous sometimes to even keep track of all the streams you're supposed to be on. Uh, good for them. I'm glad, I'm really glad that Chad agreed to be on. I was, I was, I was expecting he'd be like, bro, I got your Friday Night Tights and then Hot D the following day. If we get him tomorrow, that would be pretty, that would be pretty neat too. Um... But yeah, it was really cool to have Little Platoon back and Disparu. Real cool. Time to be back. Any time. Mega pints all around. Hell yeah. Ooh, I'm, I could use some mega pints after all that. Also, isn't the whole reason these people are being watched by the elves because of the blood oaths to Morgoth? So yeah, why not try to tempt them to turncoat and join the bad guys? Oh, you mean like on the part of the orcs? Like, why not tempt them to try and turn? I mean, I guess they did, right? They gave them a chance. Yeah, they, yeah, I suppose they did. I took out half of them. Yeah, and they didn't even really try that hard. They were just like, they, they do really it. They didn't. I'm like, okay. It, it was just this elf came back. This elf came back and said, yeah, if you go to him and you... No, it was just a guy suggesting it. Yeah. <sighs> I knew that was going to happen. I was going to call it out, and then I was like, no, nah, it'll be fine. As a Norse pagan myself, I hard disagree that they're faithful to the mythology in God of War 2018. Pagan detected, opinion discarded. It's funny because I said, like, <laughs> no, no, I had, like, qualifications right. all over what I said. So it was, like, <laughs> to some degree. And then I was like, but they fuck with it, and you're allowed to do that. Like, do you really take from what I said that they were just faithful, like, with no context added? It's like, come on. Give me some benefit of the doubt. Even I, <laughs> I haven't read Norse mythology, but I'm pretty sure Kratos isn't in it. <laughs> okay, I'm not mad. I'm not mad at all that the Greek universe exists side by side with Norse and that I'm simultaneously being told I, I'm, it's not faithful. It's like, I, I know. I'm aware. It's okay. But when they have all those murals and the stories and Jormungandr is going to have a climactic battle with Thor that is adjacent to Ragnarok, it's like, clearly they're working with events from the, from the lore where the Greek one... I don't think they gave a shit. They could, they were just using the characters. And even then, they were fucking with the characteristics, so. Well, yeah, the... that was just a playground, basically. But the, the, the Greek pantheon kind of is that. So there is no one established Greek canon in terms of its pantheon. Hesiod's version is vastly different uh, to Homer's version. I'm... I'm sure Disney will buy the rights to the Greek mythology anytime soon. <laughs> oh, I'm really no, like, don't, don't suggest that. I'm really well, curious if they're actually going to they're going to explain what it even like because that's actually arguably an issue. Like, how does Kratos get from the Greek pantheon to the Norse one? How, what is the nature wow. of that? You say that because I remember Secret from tunnel? the. Uh, the uh, the raising Kratos thing, where apparently like people producers at Sony were like. I don't really understand, like, he put on a backpack and, like, just walked to, like, Norse mythology, and apparently <laughs> Corey, like, well, he doesn't have a backpack, but yeah, basically, that, like, yeah, he just... I, my theory has <laughs> always been, they don't, like, they're not overt about it because that that might be answered at some point, they just need to figure it out, because that's, that's a tough Maybe. one. Because what you um, need to do is yeah, make because... it so that it's distant and secret enough that no one else has used it, but it's still accessible by Kratos. Well, it's just maybe another place in the world, and each place ha uh, it's it's always going to be difficult to reconcile, especially well, because I believe that the most powerful entities of the Norse and Greek universes would probably be interesting. Because I think Mimir was like aware of the Greek gods, just like so. This mm -hmm. so how does that work? What's what's going on there? You know, and then what happens when they because God of War is probably never going to end. Like the, God of War is one of Sony's most successful. I'd be happy for so. it to go on forever if it stays entertaining. <laughs> Oh, it's just that it's just going to be more variables because they have said that Ragnarok is the end of the Norse saga, which means that next up is probably Egypt. 
It's like, yeah, how are, how are you going to factor in Egypt as well, being uh, part of part of this world? If it's Egypt and it releases on PC, I might actually get it. I'm 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 big into Egypt stuff. And it needs to be. Uh, I would, it'll it'll release on PC at some stage. But I would hesitate. Not just make sure it's the kind of game that you have any interest in, though, because the God of War's combat is very uh, specific. <laughs> I was really I ranting to Rags I've last night about something. Like, to a, I don't think I'm I'm not opposed to the concept of like third person action sort of stuff. Uh, it just so happens I don't play really any of it at the moment. But I think it's more coincidental than anything. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, do you intend to tackle the Lotus Eaters commentary on Snyderverse? Praise from the other political aisle of bad media may require inspection as well. I've been critical of many of Sargon's media takes. You'll find disagreements all the time in our fucking EFAP movies that may release some year <laughs> that we've got cooking in the background. But uh, One day, one day they'll come out. One day. They're there. Um, yeah, praising the Snyderverse movies. Look, I would just... I just you go right ahead. Don't you go right You're, ahead? It okay. is... You, are free you have the right. That. You have the right to you do, do that. You do. Um, that is wait, one, do one author I'd happily see die. Jesus. <laughs> metaphorically, <laughs> obviously. Metaphorically. In Minecraft. In Minecraft, he means... Yeah, like if you were playing Minecraft as Zack Snyder, you'd push him into like a little death hole or whatever they have in those games. Yeah, it's it's fun to do that with your friends. It's not okay. Sargon, it's someone else who works for him. In that case, that's fine. You know, it's fine either way, but it's fine. It's fine. It's fine, let him be wrong. Morla, Rags, Fringy, Shan, Disparu, the little platoon. What a lineup today, everybody. Good to see all these fine gents destroying Rings of Power together. Oh, oh yeah, we got a much. great group for this. Yeah. It did a have, pretty good job of that really itself. Don't. Oh Big. yeah, we, we we don't enjoy this show much. We're not not too keen on it. My brother still somehow likes this Garbo. He just started a YouTube and his first video is on it. If anyone has a free moment to roast him, I'd appreciate it. His channel name is I'm not gonna do that. Like come on. <laughs> Here's wow. his channel shit on him. <laughs> Listen, okay, this is fine. We don't need to we don't need to be like, hey, go get him. <laughs> it's like Jesus. No, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why, but for some reason I always thought Sauron was an elf, lol. Uh, I thought he was too. I was not one I of his really many ever... visages. Yeah. So when yeah, he's, I never really um, thought about it. He's Anatar, I think, and he, he comes as an elf to the elves when he wants to convince him to um to create the rings of power in the first place. So he can he can present as one up until the point at which Numenor is destroyed. And then saying, he gets... we'll see him in season two, three, four, or five. Well, five, yeah, he'll probably be played by a celebrity. Um, but yeah, James Numenor Corden? gets destroyed, he Don gets Lennon. struck by lightning and drowned, and then he has to lose his ability to take fair forms ever again. Man, I hate getting struck by lightning. I know, it's a bit of a... If you're a tree, though, when that happens, and people have been plowing good and evil into you, and you have a Silmaril in, you, in the center of you, <laughs> oof. And end well. Yeah. Uh, Galadriel's favorite wine is Pinot Glycerin. Gl Glycerin. Nitroglycerin? Is that because of the explosive wine, I guess? Yes. They I guess. packed a lot of it on the ships just for her. Like, it's understood <laughs> that she is a terrible alcoholic. And, she only <laughs> and it's the only way to keep it from attacking other people. <laughs> from going into a rampage. Yeah. If she gets upset, she will single-handedly destroy all of Numenor. Unstoppable, the plot demands that she succeed. She so they have sways. to keep her boost up. <laughs> she sways drunkenly, saying, All shall love me or despair, and despair even. I Give her that explosive that. elven shit so she doesn't fly off the handle. The short story uh, Platoon was talking about was probably The Appointment in Samara. Very short read, but it's nice. Hi, Rags. Hello. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but perhaps, yes. On this episode of Rings of Power, Mount Doom finally gets the origin story it deserves. Yeah. Which, by the way, I think I was messaging either, it was either Shadow or Disparu, but I was like, this one, like, I realized pissed me off a little bit more, and I think it was because of the fact that that's Mount Doom. Like, it's, yeah. it's like, get away, get away. Like, and it's just like, <laughs> you know this, don't you? And it's like, I do. What are the things I do I know, know what Mount Doom is, and look at what you're doing to him. 
touching it. You're getting all your fingerprints on it. Stop it. <laughs> you are. <laughs> you, you got your Cheetos laden fingers <laughs> all over Mount Doom. Like licking the mountain, like, nah, it's mine. You're like, no. <laughs> Mount, Mount Doom's crying. <laughs> <laughs> Reached out his little, little, little volcano arms, like, help me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Arya Stark versus Brienne spa scene is the pinnacle. It was right. I remember that being okay. And that was that was <laughs> season was so... eight as well. It's all right. That's I, mean, all I wouldn't call got. it a pinnacle. <laughs> right. But hey, it would be cool to see Shad uh, give an assessment of that. Maybe it's not as bad as I think, or rather, it's better than I think it is. I don't know. Oh my god. Lord Longbong of Milchington Abbey. Is there any good chance of a Kong fap of Peter Jackson's Long Kong when there's less going on? It'd be a movie fap for the ages. Yes. Oh yeah. Hello, Ragsies. Scritch is for the good boy. Oh, hello. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll have to be later because October is just so yeah, busy. Can't, cannot be this month. Probably not next no, month. But who knows after yeah. that, you know? We're just slamming through them. Busy, busy. House of the Dragon is mid. Maybe. I'm going to wait until it's done before I'm going to want to try and tackle that. I would also like to refrain from talking about it in more detail until Rags is now caught up. Yeah. Because now you're unfortunately in a position where it could be spoiled for you. Oh so I my suppose... goodness. And I, and I actually care about it being spoiled. I was about to say, it can always be spoiled though because of the fact that it's going to be three seasons and the full story is already out in book form and some other forms, so... I'll just not look up stuff. And I yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of standard. So. There's, that's the same thing for a lot of adaptations, but uh, in, the, in the sense of me trying to talk about the show, though, I'd rather wait until you put up, like I said. Yeah, yeah. Willem Blackwood skipped the second step on old Bracken. That's how you know he's not yet a master. Still killed old Bracken, but not an orc. Does that mean anything to you guys? No. no. I'm not following that. I'm lost. Sorry. Um, you Galadriel tanks a pyroclastic flow to the face like a Chad, and she'll survive. The bestest, most badass girl boss ever. I have a feeling that we won't see why or how that's possible. That we'll just get the the aftermath we'll get her dirty. immediately. Yeah, she'll, she'll be, just be dirty. Everyone will be walking around crying, screaming, and we're like, "Oh God, this is terrible!" And but it'll have settled. It won't be any more like giant clouds. She'll still be beautiful, but dirty. A little bit dirty. One little patch of mud, and that's it. Maybe a beauty scar. Ooh. You know, not anything disfiguring or prominent, but like or on the permanent. cheek down below, you know. Oh, it definitely won't be permanent. No. Mm -hmm. um, stab, twist, gut. Galadriel teaches the Numenorians the combo of how to beat the soda Popinski and punch out. Oh, I hope it works. Oh, because uh, they might have to fight soda at some point. Well, Galadriel's line, stab, twist, gut, is more ignorant than the one from Mask of Zorro, pointy end goes into the other man. That line is meant to show ignorance. Hers is trying to imply intelligence. That's actually a great point. You remember when um, the experienced Zorro is teaching the up-and-coming one, and he's like, do you know how to use that? And he says, pointy end goes into the other man, which, yep. that's true. It's just obviously more complicated. And it's like, that. Ah, that's a great foundation. Hers is stab to his gut, which, as you, as you heard today, <laughs> there's some issues with it as a line. Uh, the sea is always right, and wet, and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> I say that about the ocean all the time. Mm-hmm. I wish I was born in the desert. That's it, that the Numenorans are the only people to whom the line, I grew up surrounded by water, would actually be relevant. Because they were. Well, and yet I haven't heard that yet. He, but to be fair, Boba Fett did grow up surrounded by water. I just don't know why he told anyone that. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> There's a time and a place. Yeah, what benefit was there to saying that? I don't know that he even knew. He was just like, well, sometimes I just like to talk. Like, okay. <laughs> I, heard, I heard someone mention it water, you know, kind of reminisce. Yeah. No, oh, water, that takes me back. Oh, yes. To the good old days. Off topic, but watching 205 and thought y'all might be interested to know that an Italian artist sold his immaterial statue, uh, Lo Sono, for several thousand dollars back in 2021. His immaterial statue, so I assume like the 
Wait, you know, what, serious. It exist? You? Please don't that tell it's me immaterial. That's not real. Uh, I assume that's what they mean. Oh no! Looking at images. Oh. What images? That's a, the 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 great question is how are you looking at images of it and it's like exactly. <laughs> Man. I mean. Yeah, this is apparently it. But to be fair. <laughs> oh god. You see the statue? <laughs> oh, it's not what I thought it looked like at all. <sighs> Come on. Mine has more of a, I think that more one actually might be the number inside. one example. I wish we had had it where it's like. This is really testing the limits, isn't it? <laughs> like, you're buying mm -hmm. the statue, and it's like, yes, but it makes you feel, doesn't it? And it's like... Eh. <laughs> 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 fine. 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 What a neat statue you have there. And just, like, the, the, like, the person who, like, organizes the entire gallery is just crying in the background. The destruction of art. <laughs> Just reading the, um, the subhead, despite lacking any physical form, artist Salvatore Garau, I think that's right, said that the immaterial sculpture titles Lo Sono, meaning I am, very much existed in its nothingness. I just, uh... <laughs> yes, I agree with that statement. Just, Aliens yeah. need to stick to pizza and submachine guns. They shouldn't be I mean, dabbling about in this fucking art. It's they haven't made anything mistake. good since about the third century, so that's probably true. Next up, please explain reasons why you believe Hullbrand equals Sauron. So I do feel bad, because there's a lot of people out there, and I think um, uh, I think Dev is one of them, there's a couple of others I've spoken to, where they're like, what? Hull Hullbrand is not Sauron, even to the point of assuming that um, not Gandalf is Sauron. So I, I have the unique benefit of, number one, being told by people who have been told by people who have been told by people who have been told the story, and it's lined up fully up to this point, that he is Sauron. Um, and I, I was told that very early on. And so then you just keep a lookout for how they could build the story to be that and match it, like, you know, times that by their incompetent writing that we've seen. And and things are slotting more into place in terms of how you'd expect them to tell the story. And then there's a couple of references that are kind of undeniable, right? Like when he fights the dudes, that scene is definitely portrayed in a way to be like, ooh, that was a little bit... It wasn't like a heroic type fun character defending himself from those those assholes. It was more like you went a bit far and you hurt them more than you needed to, buddy. Like, what does that mean? We had this with, um... What's her name? Pennyworth in Batwoman. Remember? Where she killed someone when she didn't need to? Uh, and the show was like, ooh. Yeah, but we never did anything her neck. with that. We, we, I don't think that went anywhere. She'll never tell everyone. Oh yeah, it was never at all mentioned in any way. Whatsoever. So you got that. That woman is the show that's even worse than Rings of Power, so. He's super interesting in Forge and shit. You got a, um, and which, you know, just matches the whole, makes the, the Rings part. You got a, he's got, like, a lot of awareness of all the shit that's going on in the Southlands. You got his, his lines about how, in order to, like, control people, you need to find out what they fear, give them the ability to master it, and then master that. Which, as was said earlier, that kind of just describes the one ring. Um... There's a lot of things going on, and knowing that he's Sauron from the other thing is just this just how it's directed the conversation. But uh, don't worry, don't feel like you've missed something. It's 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 just bad. So like, you know, when it when it's revealed, it's not like we're gonna be like, told you so. It's just this is something I was told. So I'm just like, yep. So Galadriel can't feel or smell out all evil. Great. What? What's that gonna do? With all that? right. I mean, fair enough. I can't. I was gonna say I've tried. Well, actually, but... I'm a dog. The trope is accurate. I can. I was about to say, yeah, dogs definitely. <laughs> I can. Like, they bark at evil things. Cattle. Yeah. I'm what about zombie dogs though? Animals, zombie dogs, uh, individual basis. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming more of your gas mask means that you're the least able to do this. Um. It, well, the it filters out bad control. things. I can I can change the filters to filter in whatever I want. You know. So if I filter in <laughs> the smell of evil, I'll be able to do that. Fair enough. Very specific filter set. Oh yeah, they're great. <laughs> they might be trying to corrupt you by giving you a mask that has that specifically as a filter setting. They're actually uh, there's mithril in the. Did, <laughs> did Halbrand make the, your mask? Yeah. They're strong and unyielding is evil. Yes. <laughs> really weird that he said that, but yes. <laughs> Very strange. 
Hey, uh, hey, Gilglad, why did you say evil was strong? He's like, huh? No, nothing. No, no, I meant both of them were strong. Both. You get good and evil. No, sorry, good. I mean, good is strong. Words too. I don't support it, of course, but it, I mean, we gotta face the facts here. We're pragmatic. <laughs> it's sort undeniable. No, we're not. Yeah, they're just like, but you agree that good gives up where evil doesn't. He's like, no. Um, <laughs> like, so, uh, so about that table. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is Yeah, Durham would be the evil one in that because he's lying. Manipulating. Yeah. Yeah, and Gilgalad's a cuck. Uh, Hulbrand's smithing scene is BS. That hammer's twisting the metal to a bad curve. That blade is going to be bent. Um, no, he's the sword master. You're not. You he suck. made something that the smith man was like, whoa. Wow. So you must be wrong, person who's commenting, because I was shown in the show that he made something amazing. In the lore, no one can see the rings unless they are ring bearers. Really? You I can't even see it. That's, um, that's so, only true of the three elven rings, I think. Oh, okay. Because they were 20. The elves make three in secret, and I think those are the three. Naya, Nenya, and the other one that I don't remember the name of. Those ones are invisible unless one is a ring bearer themselves or wearing the one ring. But Sauron doesn't actually know that those have been made. All right. I'm three hours behind, but if you guys have talked about the 10 out of 10 IGN rating, just remember they also gave The Last of Us 2 10 out of 10, so I don't know if it's really weird. They give a much. lot of things 10 out of 10. Yeah. IGN is, I'm certain that they were financially compensated. Maybe. <laughs> I think that's, the, yeah, the, I'm not even, I wouldn't even, what I was thinking about when you said that was more so that they make these reviews, not necessarily because they have direct communication and they are paid off, more so that they know it's There's more beneficial. Yeah, it's more beneficial. I think it's a very, very well understood from both sides, back and forth, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, nod, nod, about what they do. You could um, also look at the writing credits in season two and see if any former IGN employees are on them. It would be funny if that were the case. Uh, what? The theme for Rings of Power is plot twist, MacGuffin. And it's not a MacGuffin, but instead a more underwhelming MacGuffin. Sauron's sword is just a key. Mithril is just magic lightning, but the, the mark of Sauron is a map. You say these things as if they're not much stupider than that. Like, <laughs> Sauron's sword is just a key? It's like, yeah, there's a lot more that's really dumb about that, actually, in terms of what, it's, what it does specifically. But the key, the keyhole, what it does. Oh, it's just... We'll have so much to talk about next time. Oh my god. Uh, that's the sound of forgiveness, Elrond. Explosions and then silence. They take the explosive wine when they go to battle, or it's just what they drink normally? Do they explode if they burp or fart near a flame? <laughs> yeah, so, first off, yes, obviously. Uh, two, I have no idea. I thought that was like lamp oil or something. Yeah. I, I would not have guessed it was well, wine because it looked so thick. So I think I the argument was describing them as being in casks made people think it was wine, but that ultimately you could store theoretically lots of things in a cask. You don't have to store yeah, wine. And it Especially came out pretty thick. It looked thick. Yeah, if if it's a oil meant for burning, then having it with a spigot makes sense if you just want to put a little bit in a, a lamp or a, a torch yeah. or something like that. You don't want to be able to, you don't want to dip like a bucket down air because it, it get all over your hands and now you're, it's just messy and icky and the dirt sticks to it. But it's, it's the ethanol. Wasn't... It's the ethanol content in wine that burns, isn't it? I'm sure wine, no wine, even undiluted wine that sort of we drink today does not have a high enough uh, ethanol I don't, to I don't think it, yeah. I don't think it's... I've never thought of wine do. as Some that flammable, yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, I don't think wine's flammable. I think there's some really hard liquors that might be. Like vodka but... would... Most spirits would be mm -hmm. flammable, right? I actually don't know. Yeah, I, mm. Depending on how much it's cut with something else, but it has to have a high ethanol content, so it has to have a high percentage, like ABV percentage, I think. No, pe so, people are saying oil doesn't explode. Idiot, we saw it explode, so it must It exploded. Do. Whatever, oh, that's why, that's, that's the source of the confusion. If it just burned the ship down, then it could be all sorts of things. But the fact that it was explosive... Yeah, I mean, it, that, I, that, that depends on the thing it's in and, like, the air pressure within the thing it's in. It's like, same thing with the Mount Doom thing we'll come on to whenever we get to the next episode, is that... It, would the water have the effect that it has? No. I think the explosion... 
not quite yes, but well, no so, is to be fair, Sorry, my exasperation there was because it's magical bullshit too, right? It's not just a normal volcano, but yeah, I, I, I see what you now. mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, the light, like what Fring was referencing, right? There's weather effects inside the pyroclastic flow. It's like, it's like oh, I think I think that does happen though. I mean, like electricity because. Yeah, because you've got, uh, well, it's not electricity generated by the thing, but it's charged particles within the pyroclastic flow. So I think you do actually, in real volcanic eruptions, you will see lightning because there are charged particles within the pyroclastic flow, which then arc the energy between themselves. So I, I'm sh I think that does actually happen in real life, that you can see artistic um, depictions, and I think photographic depictions as well, of real life volcanic eruptions where you will see lightning in them, either generated from within the pyroclastic flow or because of the interaction between that flow and the clouds above them, which have charged particles in them. Well, that sounds really cool. <laughs> I know. How are they alive? <laughs> if you add that on too. Yeah, I think also, it's supposed to be like 3,000 degrees Celsius in there, though, so they should be dead. Yeah, because like, it's just like adding even... I don't know. All right, fine. Yeah. Um... She'll be fine. She'll be a little dirty. She'll have to take a bath, but... You'll be fine. The theme for Rings of Power is... Oh, wait, I read that one already. Oh, wait. Wine explodes. Oh, yeah, well, they could have been just C4 on, uh, in storage there as well. I think that was around that time, right? They would have had that Secrets technology. Secrets of Numenor. Yeah. It's like uh, Saruman's um, gunpowder stuff. It's mm -hmm. uh, Orth uh, the Fire of Orthanc or something. It, it, that, Numenor had their own. They just did not follow proper safety protocol in its storage. <laughs> and that leads to it. accidents. Or they drank it to make them more angry and fierce in combat. Guy tries to grab Sauron by, or kill him by grabbing him and burping into a candle. Uh, I could get him. Could do it. Who's more unlikable, Rings of Power Galadriel or Kate Kane? Mm -hmm. So I have a probably Rings of Power um, Galadriel. I like there's something the, funny about yeah, Kate there's Kane. something about Kate Kane yeah. I enjoy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be upset seeing her again. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> want to see, want to see Kate Kane again. Galadriel makes I me agree. sigh every time I see her. I'm like, no, because both of them try so hard, but I, I don't know. I guess Kate Kane just fails so in such a funny way. Um. That it's just more entertaining and it makes me smile. I miss her. Uh, since they are forcing the Galadriel Hullbrand thing, is it possible they change it so that her daughter, Calabrian, is the product of her and Sauron? I feel like they would never do that, but area things have happened, I suppose. And, uh, you know, the, all bets are off as it goes on, I think. They're probably going to get more brazen with their. Uh, Reaches of lore as they go. Just all Karen, and I'm seriously pissed they didn't address what happened to her kids. Kyle and Sarah. Legit, the two best characters. Sorry, dude. Nobody cares about I can't that. help you. I cannot help you. No one can help you. I know lots of people are asking for Long Kong, but I'd love to see you guys do Godzilla vs. Kong, a movie that manages to be horrible and stupid despite having five writers. I don't know if in this day despite. and age you can say despite having five writers, yeah. Spide, if anything, have, five like, writers is... Well, Rings for power a film, has, like, four. Well, TV shows tend to have a good chunk of writers. I guess with a film, usually, like, if there's more than two, it's usually like, ooh, that's a lot of, uh, yeah. that's a lot of hands Bumping in the kitchen. Bumping into each other here? A little bit. It's just, it's just that very often when you find out that a film is, like, cataclysmic, like, you look at how many people wrote it, it's like, oh. It's weird. I've been meaning for ages to sort of go through and try and sort of do a little short term -y kind of study thing. Like, what's the average size of a writing team these days compared to even the 1990s or the 1980s? Um, because it, it does genuinely seem to be that like the more you have, the worse it gets. If you compare, say, like 2001 A Space Odyssey has Arthur Clarke and Stanley Kubrick working together. So there's two of them. You compare it to a modern film which has anywhere between four and twelve writing writers on it, and the quality is evidently so much worse, but it's so reliably so much worse that you wonder why it is that they have these workshops as opposed to trying to find individual sort of creative people to to hem the whole thing from start to finish. Uh, he's expressing her Mordor guilt. There's going to be a lot more. 
for the next episode. Her getting on the boat was embarrassing to watch. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, when she's getting the armor. Yeah, yes, yes. It was horrible. It was terrible. I don't know why they made such a huge deal out of it. It makes you think bad things. <laughs> it's like I, I when we watched it, we were both thinking the same thing. Just indulgent. Yeah. Uh, pick a Dark Souls power. Stamina and its recharge rate. Um, ability to drink orange juice and recover health fast. Iframes at will. Or learnable sorcery. Learnable uh, sorcery. So we can knock out temporary iframes because I feel like sorcery might just be able to cover those sorts of things. But if we say that it's sorcery except being able to go temporarily invisible, in, invincible, recovering health fast is pretty cool. But does that just mean healing fast, not yeah, healing? It depends how that manifests. You know, is it just recovering from cuts and wounds or is it. Like, your body is just constantly regenerating and replacing itself. Does well, that also, lead to immortality? That was specifically, you have to drink orange juice and you recover health fast. Very strange. I'm not sure, exactly sure how that works, but I feel like... I guess like, it's fine because orange juice is always available. It's not, yeah, it's not that. It's just, it's, I just, I'm curious mechanically it's how odd. it rolls out. But yeah, I think uh, if I were deciding just based on what it says here, I'd go with the sorcery, yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, if there's any different answers, let me know. I'll just give a chance. Okay. Even we though I'm All right. even though I'm more of a Christmas person, I'm definitely looking forward to your final destination arc. Happy early Halloween. You should. It's gonna be funny. Those movies are very funny. Especially the fourth one. I'm looking forward to that one coming out. I am I am very excited to see these come out. This is why you lock your layers, Fringy. Lesson learned, lol. Fringy says, you are 100% right, and I should have known that, and I'm a bad man. Just said. Fringy just typed it out, yeah. yeah. My master, Mulrod the Great, bids thee welcome. Who has authority to treat with me? Ah, Amazon, I have a token I was bidden to show thee, and then it's one star rating. <laughs> wasn't that um the Mouth of Sauron thing, I think? Was, but that wasn't in the theatrical cut, was it? It wasn't, and... Shit, man. Uh, the part where he shows the shit and Merry and Pippin start like saying like no, and they start crying, and Gandalf is like, "Be quiet, be quiet, silence. Like, don't say anything." It's like so interesting because yeah, they could they could so accidentally give vital information in the case that this shit was just taken and not Frodo. Mm -hmm. Like Gandalf holding out hope, and he says it in such a way that implies that he's still fighting the fact that he's like, "Oh shit, is Frodo actually dead?" Just the, the, um, imagine the, the amount of sort of import that that scene has, the cut scenes from the theatrical version of The Lord of the Rings versus the included scenes in Rings of Power. Even a short scene like that just has so much more, or Saruman's death, although to be fair, Saruman's death scene actually really does detract from the theatrical version by not being there because I think so. it's the only one that... I think it's, it's incredibly well, important, that, that scene. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't explain otherwise how they got the palantiri from um, from Isengard without that. But, but just the, the idea that a few... Well, a couple of minutes of cut scene from Jackson's films just outmatches anything. Even the most important scenes in Rings of Power is pretty <laughs> good comparative to yeah. see how far it's sunk. Wait, someone in chat said, I hate that scene so much. Are the Sauron scene? You hate it? Why? What? Why? Ooh, weirdo. Freak. Hey, don't call him that <laughs> until he has bad reasoning. <laughs> then we can say it, okay? No, I'll, I'll hedge, hedge my bets. I'm curious. <laughs> Saruman doesn't die in the theatrical? Technically not, yeah. Do they make any reference to Saruman being dead in the theatrical one? No, you don't see it. I think there's a reference to the, the sort of the situation being resolved, but he's, it's not mentioned that he dies um, in the theatrical version, from what I remember, but it's been a year since I've last seen the theatrical version. Doesn't fit his character. Mouth of Sauron's character? That's his only scene in the movie. I guess if you're yeah, saying it doesn't fit right. his book character, maybe? No, it does. Quite, quite accurately. Maybe Saruman's scene, maybe? But even that fits his character reasonably well. In that case, yeah, I'm not sure. Alright then. Watching Hot D and Nerdrotic streams makes me want to watch Game of Thrones. Worth it even just for the first few seasons? Hi Rags, what's a good first pistol? Okay, right before you answer that... <laughs> Like, should I watch Game of Thrones? It's like the, the first answer is, 
You could go as far as season four, but then, like, do you really want to do that? Watch, because that's the that's four seasons is a lot to be invested and enjoy, and then just to be like, well, now stop. stop. Even though there are still good scenes in and among season five, six, even seven, I think I'm not sure about eight, maybe in the first two episodes, but um, yeah, <laughs> so. It's really hard for me to recommend Game of Thrones at all. It's really difficult, and I, I'm not even sure I've decided yet. But as for Hot D, not going to recommend that until either the end of Season 1, and I can figure out a way to do it uh, because it's good enough, or, or I'm going to wait until all three seasons are out. Um, oh, I've been very definitive about this. How good it is does not define whether or not I'm going to be recommending it just yet, all right? That Aragorn's character, not the mouth of Sauron? You think Aragorn hmm. is out of character in the mouth of Sauron scene? The scene where the mouth of Sauron's holding up Frodo's shit, you think it's out of character for Aragorn to kill him? Everyone's everyone's saying it apparently. Is that, is that, does, does, how do you guys feel? I never considered it uh, bad. The mouth of Sauron's evil. And he's talking about how he, they tortured Frodo before they killed him. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't. Yeah. Look at how he stopped Theoden from killing Grima. I, I mean, so I thought that was a weird choice, actually, in two, two Towers when he stops him from killing Grima, and it has serious consequences. Him doing that. It does, but th th there's a difference because the, the whole sort of setup to the Grima scene is that the, you know they realize that Grima is not sort of the the originator of the evil in that scenario Grima is the person they're actually appealing to Theoden does appeal to Grima oh no wait no you're talking about in the two towers right yeah well in the same sense I, I guess because Grima isn't the big bad in that scenario Grima is as much manipulated by Saruman as uh, as Theoden has been in a way and that's why you get in the deleted scene in Return of the King they appeal to Grima's uh, sort of better nature against Saruman Theoden tells him to calm down so that's part of Grima's own sort of aborted redemption arc uh, the mouth of sauron is simply that he is the mouth of sauron he's, he's one of a horrible monster person things. yeah in fact i don't even know what yeah, species he's, he's supposed to be a... yeah he's odd um there's probably an his element too of gross. grima was begging for his life on the ground helpless as you know and so that might have you know and and as like an actual like a man clearly mortal creature that isn't some magic bullshit then you know, there is there is probably that element of, you know, it, you probably shouldn't kill him. It would be, you know, it's not. I mean, is the I assume the logic is that he's almost like a messenger, and you shouldn't kill the messenger. But I imagine Aragorn doesn't feel that um, way about orc messengers. I think it's just that we've we've broken the spell. He's helpless, and he can't hurt us anymore. So to kill him here. No, no, no I'm talking back about like, Mouth of Sauron again. Oh, I, I assume that he's virtually an enemy commander combatant who is, like, I guess, evil in some different sort of way, who still represents some kind of a threat, um, operating in a more, I guess, official capacity. I think you have to also apply a variable of Aragorn's mental state. He's not exactly chuffed with the news. Yeah. I think that is a totally fair. This yeah. was, I, I, wouldn't, I definitely don't see it as out of character. Um, seems very I don't upset. Either. Um, but uh, it's interesting to hear the perspective. Um, Anti-whiteism ruined Lord of the Rings. Mm. I don't know about that. Did it? I think it's shit writing. I mean, I'm guessing they. Hopefully, they mean Rings of Power, <laughs> not Lord of the Rings. They've just said Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I assume so. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I skipped over the question. Uh, Rags, what pistol? What did you say was a good first pistol? That was the other question. Oh, I'd probably go with... I don't know, there, there's plenty of good choices to make, honestly. Uh, a lot of it will be determined by how it fits in your hand. Uh, so for that, I can't really make much of a recommendation, but there's plenty of pistols that are A-OK. -okay. It's kind of like buying cars. Like The vast majority of them will probably be just A-OK. -okay. Um, I have, uh, I like Glocks myself. I like their simplicity. I like the way they look. Um, I think they're easy to shoot. Um, so that, that's certainly an option that you could go with. You can get plenty of police trade-ins, uh, that are pretty cheap if you need something on a budget. 
Um, I hear high points are not bad at all, especially as a cheapo starter pistol to get you into just the basics of gun safety and things of that nature, you know, knowing, you know, having one to own and maybe any, you know, considerations that come along with, you know, desert eagle. Of a firearm. Oh, dude, as someone who shot a desert eagle, like the full thing, not the 357 version, but the 50 AE, do not get a desert eagle. That is excessive. It's it's fun to be like, wow, this is nuts, but you will no, don't, don't, don't get a desert eagle. No. Oh. Don't get a desert eagle. Even if they can shoot through anything, of course. Don't don't get a desert eagle. Uh hey Mola. Have you seen Don't Hug Me I'm Scared TV show yet? Since you're from British Lands, so I'd like to hear your opinion on the show. I have not seen it, but I've heard a couple of people asking about it. I'm surprised it's gotten to that level even of, of just people discussing it at all because it's it's like a parody satire thing or, or rather an adult version of a kids program like a bunch of muppets they're talking about maths and things but everything's just a bit off and creepy and then a more overt things happen i think as the show progresses and it's kind of a f fun idea i'm pretty sure it started as just like a casual quick youtube video that was like an idea like, like a full uh, th i could be wrong about all of that by the way i'd have to check the wiki but yeah Give Fringy five dollars for defending the honor of probability and combin combinatorix Com combinatorix. All right, well, yeah, I, I do my best. I mean, I'm I'm not sure exactly what the conclusion of all of that even was. I I because I had missed like the opening of it, and so I came in just listening to like percentages, fractions, wee wham. I wasn't sure. I think, as is so often the case, the conclusion was it was shit writing. That we can all agree. Author is never wrong. Then TLJ was flawless. <laughs> well, no. I don't think. I don't think. Yeah. Even, to be fair, a little bit too. I think he's saying that if the author says the work is awesome, that it is. I don't. <laughs> I don't think that that's how it works. Even though Ryan would probably say his work is awesome, he did say that none of the criticisms hold up. Yeah. <laughs> then he's wrong. Oh, man. He's very wrong. Very wrong. Has anyone asked thoughts on Andor? It was refreshing to not have any fights in an episode, but I'm disappointed to see people call it boring and bad. I'm um, disappointed to see people call it boring too. I, I want to I leave people alone on the boring people. one. Everyone's entitled to find anything boring. It's whatever, but... I'm still disappointed in it. What I'm disappointed in is, is suggesting that, like, there needs to be more things that connect it to Star Wars, and that if it didn't have Star yeah. Wars on it, it wouldn't be anywhere there. near as watched as it is. And it's like, okay, that's fine. Like, if you wanted to say, for example, um, Cloverfield Lane, 10 Cloverfield Lane, nobody would have seen it if, if, if it wasn't connected in the Cloverfield universe or something, I'd be like, well, that doesn't change how good the film is. Um, up until, like, if you if you discount, because I guess that's a part of the film to a degree as well, but I guess what I'm suggesting is, like, if there were more X-Wings, more lightsabers, more ray guns, I said ray guns, and blasters. <laughs> if there were more of those, then, you know, it would be more Star Wars-y, and that would be better, and it's just like, guys, I thought we just spent, like, the last million years talking about how much they, they involve random Star Wars shit to just keep you involved. Like, that's what those other shows were. And I'm I not suggesting... An outright ban on Star Wars items in a Star Wars show. Just bring in what's what should be there. Yeah, I mean, we know we're going to get them even from the trailer. You see Star Destroyers and Stormtroopers and Death yeah. Troopers, I think, as well in, in the trailer. Like you, you're going to get that stuff. But if you're suggesting that it can't be Star Wars unless it has those things all the time, then you're sort of arguing for exactly what we've had up until this point in the Disney era. It's just member berry shit constraining the universe. I, I, the reason I like Andor is is because it expands it believably. I've never looked at Andor and thought this doesn't look or resemble Star look like or resemble Star Wars in any way. I think it actually, to the extent it's good, it actually adds le uh, depths and layers to the Star Wars universe in quite a Star Warsy way. My problems with Andor, to the extent I have them, have been largely to do with the writing. Like a lot of the payoffs in Episode Three don't actually uh, stem from the build up in Episodes One and Two, which I think is is something that's legitimate to criticize i think it's been a pleasant surprise so far in in that it's been quite mature and adult and it doesn't treat its audience as though they're idiots which is a good start um and you can't complain about the bad writing and the formulaic nature of marvel products for example 
and then criticize the show just because it doesn't exhibit the same traits, which I think a lot of people have been doing with Andor. Like just I mean, because there is an action every five minutes. Well, okay, but are you happy with phase four? No. Maybe then you should give it a chance. And to clarify, there are plenty of criticisms for Andor that involve consistency and uh, character criticisms and just, just general, even talking about pacing to more detail than simply I am bored. But uh, yeah, I've just been seeing a decent chunk in several videos being like, what is this show? It feels like a show they just made. And then they said, by the way, this is in the Star Wars universe, which is fine. I've seen that a lot. And it's like, that's fine. Uh, it's, you're allowed to have that perspective, sure. You see, we talked about this before with superhero stuff, right? And we were like, like, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. Like, you could never make the father in the superhero universe. It's like, but you could, though. You just like you're just so far away from it as a as a thing that you think it's almost impossible. It's like, but just having like a famous superhero who's reached that age and Professor X is like, I can just start referencing Logan. It's like we're already getting close. You just go down. It's like, yeah, but it has to have action. It's like, does it? And you could still have flashbacks if you really need it, and you can you can tie them in to how this character at this age is losing memories and losing control of their brain and. It can still be very allegorical. It's just like, the, those are the experiments I really want to see. Even if they're bad, it would be cool to see them. As opposed to, like, failing the same way, which is what Phase 4 feels like to an extent. Um, and or... Yeah, uh, you know, I would say that the sentiment for EFAP so far is that we're impressed. Because we never expected Disney to come out with this. We thought they were stuck in a, in a particular sort of mode. And to be fair, this yeah. doesn't actually mean that they're not stuck in that mode because this was created before that main mode was solidified so they could still be in that mode but for now we get a whole season of not that yet so it seems to have escaped that yeah and it seems that most if not everybody agrees okay yeah it's not like it's not like kenobi or boba fett okay well at least we're on that but yeah the main criticism i'm seeing from everybody is that it's boring it's very boring um the only way to really <laughs> get an answer on that is to I think, because, like, I, I had it on Friday Night Tights, so I was like, I'm not going to be able to... I, I can't talk you out of finding it boring. That's impossible. Uh, the the way I would have to do it is to get you to tell me which scenes have nothing happening in it, and then I would have to see if I could argue what we were learning in the scene and what was important in the scene, and then see if you agree or disagree. There's a couple, but, I mean, that's bloat rather than boredom. So th there's a few unnecessary sort of introductions um, of people and or knows and has seen before in his daily life um i'm thinking the it's either the second or the third guy uh, who turns up in the street in episode one i think uh, to whom andor owes money he has the alien friend as well um we never see those characters again i don't think it adds anything new to the dynamic we already understand this about andor he is in debt and the sort of uh, the, there's a net tightening around him, but principally from below as well as above. So you have the investigation by the police above him, but you also have this declining charity amongst the people below him, and he's running out of options. He's running out of other people's charity. We've had that. We had that two or three times before we got that scene, and that wasn't very long, but it was there, and it didn't need to be. And it introduced another character who we'll never see again, and took up time that could have been better spent, I think, developing some of the more important characters who were, there aren't many of them, but there were a couple who are underdeveloped in the first three episodes, chiefly Tim. Um, and you could have spent a bit more time with him and less time re-emphasizing a point that's already been made. So th there's a couple of ev uh, little bits of bloat, but I wouldn't sort of criticize it any more than that. Though. No? Those things do serve a purpose in showing how Andor treats uh, people he owes money in different ways, depending on their relationship and what they're willing to do for him. And they could also turn um, up in like episode five or whatever. Um, I, that's true. No, I, I, see, I see that point. I think my, my point is that we've already established that thing about Andor's character would be my only... It's not even a very strong criticism. It's just like, if you're going to try and economize anywhere, I would have economized on that because it's already been established. We've seen two or three other people to whom he owes money. And we've already seen how he deals with different people differently, depending on who they are and how much he owes. We don't necessarily need the fourth and the fifth person. And that sort of, I think that can give the impression that it's taking longer than it really is to get to its point. So that, I'm not saying that's a massive flaw. I'm just saying that that's something yeah, which, if you want to avoid the accusation of boredom, maybe you would economize on that area. Well, the funny thing is the senior sign, um, a couple of people uh, in the Friday Night Tight stream who did find the show boring were saying that they liked that scene because of the funny alien thing. You told me to stand here. You remember that? That's, that's that scene, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, as someone in chat mentioned, it's just like, yeah, you just have to find out which scenes they found boring and how they define sort of... Because that's the thing. Boring is useless. It's it's the underlying stuff that you can actually get into and dig into and figure out what... Because different people find different things boring, right? Like, I, I could... Someone... There's someone out there who said Doctor Strange 2 was boring throughout. And I'd just be like, you found it boring? Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's possible, I guess. Because if you're just overloaded in action and nonsense magic and stuff, you're just sitting there like, I don't care. You know, it's, it's possible. You just have to, you have to dig a bit. But yeah, there are, even from EFAP's point of view, there are plenty of criticisms for the show. I just, um, I was just, I just didn't want to see that as the main criticism. It, it is a bit reminiscent of Bly, not quite the same thing, because I think Bly is heads and toes, heads and shoulders, sorry, <laughs> ahead of, of, of Andor. But at the same time, um, there was a lot we were we were getting interested in scenes wise, and it's like, oh, people find this boring. It's like, I wouldn't even mind giving it quite a few more episodes before trying to rip into it for anything in in any way, just to see exactly where they were trying to go with everything. Because one of the things I I think is really true, YMS uh, felt this way about movies. I think uh, that you haven't really really consumed it until you see it more than once in terms of. Like, have you really gotten everything? Do you really know? And and you could say the same for seeing a season of TV to go back and see what they were, what may have seemed innocuous is now very meaningful because you know what it was leading to, sort of thing. It's yeah. possible, um, but at the same time, hey man, if everyone finds it boring, I guess it was kind of boring, at least in that in that metric, and the, that that has to be you have to come to a point where that has to be accepted to some degree that a lot of people just find it boring. What I will say is there will be consequences to that reaction. <laughs> it'll it'll tell Disney stuff, especially if the message from Kenobi wasn't that it, you know, like if they were like people didn't find Kenobi boring, they just thought it wasn't very well executed in a couple of ways. And they're like, ah, oh, so you want more Kenobi? We just need to fix up maybe the action, or maybe because uh, the, they don't want more Andor. They're finding that boring. That's the worst thing is boring. You know, it's it's possible this could have really bad results if everyone's like, eh, fuck Andor. And when it could be the one chance to be like, this is a better direction, Disney. This is a better direction. Uh, will there be an EFAP mini for Andor? So the, the problem I'm having is I have literally got no time to make them. and I'm But I, I might try and make them so that they're all, it's a Hill House style. They all just release as one big video. And they're a lot less low, lower editing uh, style. So that you can at least get our coverage of it in that format. Um, but, uh, because I don't think I can release them as individual minis right now. The Halloween arc is still not ready to go, and it's releasing, so. And I got loads of other stuff to do. You know how it works? halloween -y times. Anyway, any of you guys checked out Resident Alien? Really good character development. Resident Alien? I do I've heard not about, know that. about that. It's Alan Tudyk. Uh, I've, never, I've never heard of it myself, so I don't. I think it's a show on sci-fi, though, so, you know, make of that what you will. Uh, you guys seen Shin Godzilla? I might have. I can't remember if that's the one I've seen. I don't I think, think so. I have seen it. Well, all right, then. Bringy, favorite Trios of Horror episodes? Um, man, five is, is really good. That's the, uh, the one with the, the, the running joke of Willie getting axed yeah, in brilliant. the back. Dude, I would, I would actually uh, go as far as really saying good. seasons like three or four up to like season ten or something. Just all of them. Yeah, it, there there were a lot of good Treehouse of Horrors. I'm uh I'm a big fan of of that one though in particular. That was a really good one. <clears throat> Remember when the Gremlins on the side of the bus? Yeah, <laughs> that was a good one. And then. Otto, there's a gremlin on the side of the bus in this mall, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no problemo, Bart, dude. I'll take care of it and smash his He just fucking kills a man because Bart says yeah. it's a gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, like, he, he, he manages to just softly roll into a ditch as, and then his car Ooh. explodes. You have, to, you have to include that one part right before he explodes. Yeah. He just goes, Ooh. <laughs> And then just blows up. <laughs> oh, man. Uh. They oh, were three C. I because I had my this is this is see this is consistent with my character. My favorite collection tapes of of any Simpsons were the Trios of Horror ones. I, I treasured those uh, ones the yeah. most. 
Treehouse of Horror was was um that was always one of the things I really enjoyed in The Simpsons. Like Treehouse of Horror was so much fun. I remember. I want to see if I can find it. Actually. The tape. I see it in my head. I think it was the family, but as um the Adams family or something. It was like a collection. Yeah, of I remember that one. I think I had the 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 hell one. Do you remember that one? Heaven and or Hell. It was like it? Heaven and Hell. I think was. Yeah, the that collection. was one of my favorite yeah. tapes as well. It had a really good selection. It, on it. had a uh, Home of the Heretic, which is a really great episode. Yeah. So. They yeah they are the Adams family or at least no way I'm not sure actually. Or the is, monsters. Is Maggie's like an alien. Oh, it could be the monsters. Yeah, actually that might be it. Um. Anyway, that that tape had Trials of Horror 5, 6, 7, and 12. Interesting collection. 6 was a really good one. I think that's the one that had the, uh, when the, the, the billboards and stuff came to life, right? Uh, which one did you say, sorry? I think 6, six billboards when they came to life. Yeah, it's got, in this Halloween-themed anthology, advertising icons go berserk and attack at the 50-foot eyesores. Groundskeeper Willy invades the children's dreams. Right. That's a fucking great one as well. And Homer enters a 3D world of computer animation. Yeah. Yep, that one's great too. Oh, dude, the, the one with with Willy, the, the smart weather. And then, March, what was it? Yeah. Do, not touch, do not touch Willy. Good advice. And then he turns up the thermostat. And then... Willie catches on fire. God, please help me! Willie, please. Mr. Van Houten has the floor. And then, oh shit, I can't remember what he even says, but it's really funny. The, the thing that Van Houten is, like, complaining about. Oh my god. I'm getting nostalgia heavy from this fucking tape. So, the final one, Dress of Horror 12. Hex in the city, a gypsy curses Homer, bringing misery to everyone he loves. I remember that, because... Marge, like, grows a beard. Bart's neck goes all floompy. Yeah. Lisa, does Lisa turn into an animal of some kind? I can't remember, but the second one is when Pierce Brosnan is uh, Hal in the house, and he falls in love with Marge. And do you know what I associate that fucking episode, that specific individual episode's event? Like, because it's three stories per one, right? I remember when that one starts, I have a distinct feeling of, oh no, the tape is coming to the end. It's so weird. <laughs> right. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, and then the last one is the Harry Potter type one, Wiz Kids. Bart and Lisa are students at a school for wizards where they try to foil the evil Lord Monty Mort. Monty Mort. Oh, that was a good tape. That's a good one. Mm hmm. Alright, anyway, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I wouldn't be surprised if I if I have us do like a just just me and you watch Simpsons in mini format <laughs> someday. Maybe great. like one yeah. per week or something. That would be fun. It'd be easy to edit and talk about. Why not? Uh, uh little platoon. Did you know that England is your city? No. England is my city. What it says. You said it. I did not know that. No, but now I do. So thank you. Sweet. Also, I see Fringy changed his profile pic to a blue bird, embracing your bird heritage, I see. That's my Halloween. I'm cassowary. That's very scary. Yes. It is scary, yeah. I, th I thought it would be uh, a, a fun... I hadn't organized it ahead of time, foolishly, stupidly. Do they all have red eyes, or just uh, yours in particular is particularly They have devilish? kind of like brownish eyes, but I decided to push up the, the red a little bit. But yeah, they do kind of have brownish eyes. Muller, although I do love Rhapsody of Fire, Epica has become my favorite symphonic metal band. Also, X-Files is to me as Buffy is to you. Everyone should have an equivalent of what Buffy is to me. That, that's... Uh... Good to have, you know. Super fun. And I never saw X Files other than a couple of episodes, but I'd like to. As far as I know, that show's pretty cool. Do 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 do. As for Epica, maybe I'll try and listen to some of it. Thanks for the suggestion. Uh, you called it follow the. You qualified it by saying the Greek games were less so. It's absolutely the other way around. Neither are exactly faithful. There's no fucking way that you could consider the Greek games more faithful than the Norse ones. You'd be insane. Okay. There's, I don't, there's what universe where they just say, like, 
This is Pandora's temple. Pandora's box is in it. The gods want you to kill Ares because he's destroying uh, Athens for some reason. Like, that's just happening. Meanwhile, the amount of lore, the sheer amount of lore in Norse, uh, the Norse version, right, with all the different things you can read and pick up. Now, it's not to say that they didn't completely change the events to match what they wanted to uh, adapt. But it would be absolutely insane to say the Greek games are more faithful when they'd, like, the, what they use from the Greek stuff, at least in the first... No, I'd probably say all three of them. The most they do is just reference what we're familiar with, which is, like, Zeus fires lightning bolts. He fucks a lot of people, I think. <laughs> so, something that he does. Pandora's box was just given to some dude. Um, well, the thing is, because Kratos isn't exclusively made up, right? There's some things that he's vaguely based on, as far as I know. I didn't know that. Uh, it's like, it's like, uh, there's like a, a, an equivalent that begins with, it's like C, like instead of K, there's a there's God. Someone in chat might know. Um, mm. But yeah, uh, it sounds as though, as someone who's not partial to either Greek or Norse, it's like, just by playing the games, you can tell which one they delve deeper into to try and uh, sort of match or form the game around. And again, I don't blame them for that. They can do whatever they want. They can adapt it just as much or just as little as they want. And you get varying results. Like a Waititi did it. Worked out. He did. Yeah, that's, uh, he sure he just did. Didn't, he didn't give a shit, did he? No, he, he just... didn't. Doesn't seem like he did. Yeah, it's a shame. Man, uh, though I will say, in in a certain sense, it was a good thing that he did that video where he's making insulting the visual effects artist work because it's like, just reminds people like, yeah, this system of making films is really bad. Where even the, where the director is there criticizing work that they didn't even have enough time to do. And you got uh, Kratos, B-R-A-T-U-S is the... He's like, uh, some people are saying he's an enforcer for Zeus. So again, it's, it's, this is what I mean. It's like loads has been heavily edited. And then uh, there's not much reference to the events in the Greek world, even in the trilogy. Meanwhile, one game in the Norse one, th this is the thing, they've changed their approach. Everyone can tell this from, from the original trilogy to the new game. And it's neat, it's different, but... Um, like to say it's the, the 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 least faithful would be the Norse one. Uh, I just go as far as saying it seems almost impossible, if not hilarious, as a statement. Um, seems I'm like willing to lie. I mean, or I'm coping and deceiving. Yeah, I, like, I, I'd be happy to concede neither are faithful in the strictest sense, but we know which one is more faithful. Uh, Little platoon sounds really, really gay, or just really British. Is there a difference, really? <laughs> no. Unclear. We'll have to find get our scientists on it. Ask again later. <laughs> God After of War, Assassin's Creed, Dante's Inferno. I've experienced these games only in their punished forms on PSP. Konnichiwa, Ragzu. Oh, hello. Hmm. A PSP. A PSP. You mean Assassin's Creed for PSP? Um, I meant so. Assassin's Creed for PS Vita. Ah, that might be was it good? I'm assuming I no idea. I have no clue. <clears throat> it was probably good for PlayStation Vita, which is an interesting oh. sort of standard. Well, because uh, hmm, because Killzone Mercenary I liked. Um, that was like a portable Killzone game, but like I liked that for as its own thing more so than just like, well, for a PlayStation Vita game, yeah, kind of you know it's kind of the same with the Uncharted game on PS Vita. It's like yeah, it's cool for a portable game. Uh, it wouldn't have been hard to say it should have been wine, but it was some fire water. Easy intrigue plot that would have better led to the next story beat. Why could it just be um, oil? Isn't fire water whiskey? Why it's Why not just make it oil? It's like liquor, yeah. Oil used for the lanterns and for war purposes or whatever, I don't know. I didn't even need to have it at all. He could have just started yeah, that's true. fire they're to They're made the, of wood. Made of wood, you don't need to explode them. He could have just started a fire yeah, in the that lower deck. Cool in the trailer, though. Maybe he, maybe as an accident, the, the smoke wakes up Isildur, 
uh, and uh, Isildur waking up distracts the saboteur who maybe bumps his head as he's trying to escape in haste. Now he's starting to panic, something like that, and Isildur has to rescue him. Did you play Age of Mythology? No. Is that the so. Age of Empires expansion? I'm not sure. It might be. Mythology. It is um, Age of Mythology da, 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 da. released in 2002. I don't know. It looks like it's its own thing. Developed by Ensemble Studios, published by Microsoft Game Studios. Well, Ensemble made Age of Empires, so... It's it's in the Age of Empires series wiki, so I don't know if it's like a spiritual sidestep from that series, or if it's technically a part of the series. I just, I'm just not yeah, sure. It sounds vaguely familiar, but I couldn't place it. Yeah, it says... Yeah, it looks like it might not technically be one, but it is one in essence. Hi, Rags. Hello. Did you like SCP-3000? Look at SCP-2764. 2764? That's where it says. And... I have to double check. Uh, SCP-3000 was all right. Yeah, I think I liked... I did like SCP-3000. Yeah, I did like it. I thought it was a really neat idea that was presented in a decent way. Um, I'd have to look up 2764, though. I'm, I I haven't read this one. Apparently, Age of Mythology has Greek, Norse, and Egyptian all in one game. Sounds cool. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, as for, as for, I was just thinking, surely the... Adaptation for both uh, the Greek and the Norse would actually just be considered nil because he's Curtis is going to kill every god in both pantheons. So I'm going to assume that's not a part of their law. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's clearly way more present in the Norse games. For they'll even have like you know the story of when Thor and uh, like a, a, a giant from Jotunheim fucking fight and uh uh you know for, for whatever reason that's completely disconnected from the events in the actual game and i would assume i'd have to check because they don't have any reason to contradict what i'd imagine is in the actual norse myths uh are accurate or at least to a degree because through translation which is another thing i heard by the way that norse translating the norse myths is like complicated and there's several different things you can read in terms of uh exactly what events transpired which goes the same for greek too Hence why they're considered myths, right? As opposed to, uh... How does something get defined as a myth? I have no idea. Couldn't tell you. Um, I don't know. It probably depends on, you know, who you ask in the time periods, but it... This definition says a traditional story, especially one concerning the early history of a people or explaining some natural or social phenomenon, and typically involving supernatural beings or events. And hmm. the second definition is a widely held but false belief or idea. All right. Uh, superhero vision of the father. Everything the same, but he's also now actually pretty dangerous as his mental powers and physical power can lash out. Yeah, like, that's why was sure, the, the Logan reference is coming in, yeah. Obviously, Professor X's deterioration has a significant effect both before the events of that movie and in it. Hi, people. Please check Wonderfrau 1917, the trailer, an EFAP meme starring the EFAP crew. Oh, do we need to save that for a meme episode? Possibly. Take the title of a song you've heard and add In My Ass. Well, I'll keep chat busy until the end of the stream, I'd imagine. I was thinking, uh, the Twilight, my ass. In oh. Twilight, in my ass. One of my favorite um, songs is Emerald Sword, so... That's not good. You no, don't have those it's not good at all. Well, I'll go Summer for, Night um, in Sausalito, In My Ass. Muse, Supermassive Black Hole, In My Ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uprising. In My Pants, In My Ass. <laughs> uprising In My Ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the implication is. 
Uh, for example, Crazy the Disney song name, title yeah. "Someday My Prince Will Come." You put Someday in my, my prince will come from Snow White. Yeah. Digimon. <laughs> Someday my prince will come in my ass. <laughs> the Snow White's. Yeah, she she likes it. Yeah, you, you can tell. You can tell by looking at her. Assuming she's eighteen and a consenting adult, of course. I don't know what the fucking. So Stay Digimon the of the day though. is Palmon. P A L Mon. Oh, okay. this is one. This is one I remember. Yeah, this is the one who turns into the cactus, and then the cactus turns into a fairy. I don't know. You do. I don't know. <laughs> At least the fairy is vaguely flora themed. Yeah, it it you have the weird plant thing here. Then it turns into a cactus with punt with boxing gloves. Then that turns into a somewhat plant themed fairy creature. That's evolution, folks. Yes. Unfortunately, don't have the money to qualify this. That's about the how it's more faithful to Greek than than Norse. I mean, the fact that you introduce yourself as, like, familiar more so with Norse mythology probably explains why you think they're more, uh, they're more caring when it comes to Greek. I'd imagine anyone who's super familiar with Greek would find the first three God of War games to be insulting, when really, they're just having fun with Greek and Norse. But they clearly read up on their Norse uh, when they made God of War 2018 compared to reading up on their, uh, their Greek, because... It comes across God of War 1 as more so a game that you could have made with like any group of friends coming up with and they're aware the awareness of the gods and you know because the thing is they contradict themselves man like all the gods look completely different in the first game compared to the third one um they changed their minds as they went on this is exactly what they were going to do and of course Kratos killing them all for revenge I don't think that's in any of the myths uh as well as, because this is the thing, I'd have to go read them all, but I'm, like I said, I'm just going from a cursory glance, pretty sure there's a hell of a lot more effort related to the lore of Norse than there is of Greek, which would imply to me, naturally, intrinsically almost, that the accuracy is going to be more so present with the Norse. Um, but I suppose if I was adapting Tolkien's work, and you compared mine with Rings of Power, and all mine was, was, a, was just like a forest, and Gandalf's in it, and he's just walking around, and that's it. That's my whole story. You might consider mine more accurate than Rings of Power. Because there's, l there's less to get wrong. But I don't think what, what they did with the Greek era would be considered accurate. I don't even think it would be considered close. Um, but maybe this, maybe I'm completely wrong about that. Um, I'd have to, I'll have to go look at Reddit threads to see what the experts say. Familiar with both, just don't have the money, then don't you worry about it. Well, no problem. Kratos will continue to butcher the gods until he reaches his ultimate form, Pontius Pilate, where he will lose against Jesus' respawn. Hi, Fringy. <laughs> Fringy, Fringy would have said hi. He's just a little bit busy. Yeah, he's busy. Um, versus matchup, Mario versus Kirby, games only. I think Kirby wins that, right? It's unfortunate that during this question, Fringy is unfortunately tending to something and he's away. Um, well, we can, we can chat about something until he comes back, I'm sure. But my guess would be, to... would be Kirby. Kirby is, like, incredibly resilient and possibly a supernatural alien creature that's Potentially Lovecraftian, from what I've heard from lore? Or is it that Kirby just battles Lovecraftian enemies? Not quite that Kirby is anyway Lovecraftian, but... Mario's quite killable in all of his iterations. Kirby is too, but at the same time, Kirby just seems like it's... It's harder to kill Kirby, it seems. But, uh, don't worry. What was the question, sorry? I missed it. Who wins? Mario versus Kirby, games only. Kirby wins, from what I understand. Kirby Destroyer of Will. Something like that. Ooh, Kirby beat, it, beat Karl Marx in the games? Is that in the first one? I, look, I'm not an expert on Kirby lore. Hmm. Well, um... 
that 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 is it. We caught up with the super chats for the days, obviously. Which oh, means hey, what did that happen? All right. Um, I, I was gonna say that that that's just uh, we're probably gonna wrap it up there because now we're gonna need to be able to eat food, go to sleep, and then go back to streaming and talking about Rings of Power. Because uh, <laughs> that's that's what it is. Oh, another one came in saying Fleems. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um. Yeah, uh, uh, what was it? What, was it? what needs brains a little bit melty? Uh, um, well, lots. Uh, like, do you got any put your plug, plug your channel? Uh, <laughs> yes, what I'm actually even doing. <laughs> oh, well, if I have time between now and going to bed, I need to finish off my hour long and or video, which will hopefully be out tomorrow. Um, I'm just filling in like little expression shots and stuff, but that will theoretically be out before Eve up tomorrow, and then it's back to Rings of Power. I'll have recovered, maybe, probably not. I hope the same goes ah. for all of us. Uh, another one just popped in saying, "Name one media where no one has managed to properly criticize it, and uh, and it gets unfair Hopefully. criticism or undeserved praise. Nothing in the middle." Um, my brain isn't working very well at the moment, so I'm struggling. I th I, hmm. I, my head keeps going to overrated stuff, but then I'm like, well, that's not going to. Same. Um, Inception? No one said Endgame. Hey, Frankie's right there. <laughs> And we are right yeah, here. <laughs> we are right here. We we share his opinions on that movie. That fine, fine film. Someone said ukulele, right? And it's like, I don't think many people are saying that game was a masterpiece. Most people are saying it was shit. Sonic the Hedgehog. Under or overrated? Well, that's the, so we're looking for something that either people say is a masterpiece or terrible when the reality is it's in the middle. Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe, um, Maybe The Last of Us? There are people, there's a lot that of masterpiece one, ratings, yeah. and then there are plenty of people who'd say it's absolutely terrible, so. Maybe that's the one. We will go with that. For now, perhaps there will be better answers as time goes on. Yeah, maybe. Um, all right. Well, yeah. So, um, the plan right now is that you'll get this EFAP will probably release on Monday, I think, and then the one that we're going to be making live tomorrow will probably come out the following Saturday, and that there won't be another EFAP then. Because we've already doubled up like twice, so we'll just instead actually have a day where we can do other things in life instead. Um, and the Wednesday that's coming up, we'll still try and spend to do some form of catching up. If you don't see it live, it's because it's offline instead. It'll just be dependent on uh, different factors. And then, yeah, so that that I think that will make sense. And then it'll be tight, but as soon as we're done on EFAB, it might have to get cut off early so that I can go on to the the hot D discussion portion. Um, but I'm hoping we'll be done by then because that that will be two hours ago uh, tomorrow. That's what that's what my limit would be. So it, we would still it would be a seven hour stream at maximum. So we should be able to get through that's the episode, right? <laughs> Hopefully. There is, a, I feel, a, a little a logistical limit on how long we could actually go, right? It would, it would, I'm pretty sure we won't be able to max out that far, so we should be okay. Hopefully. Uh, they said Christmas ha versus Halloween pick one. We, we asked you this on the, when you were on the previous one, right? I think your answer, little platoon, was you're a Christmas uh, person I mean, for the sort of events, but the media, you'd be a Halloween person. Yeah, Halloween has better films. Christmas is a nicer, like, festival. Um, we should have asked Disparu. That was a mistake. We might, if I can ask him tomorrow, I'll try when I remember. If I remember, maybe, maybe, maybe you can make it. Um, yeah, and then of course, so other than that, you got your there's there's the the schedule for the EFAP Halloween movies arc is is in the end of the Karen 
and Final Destination trailer, it'll, I'll tell you. Um, and there's going to be a mini that's going to come out in the middle of all of it. I don't know if you remember it, uh, Rags, bringing the um, Now You See Me thing. Yeah, oh, I remember that. That, that is finally going to go out, because it's at a suitable oh, time. Wow. So yeah, you'll be getting this weird 17 minute, I think it is, or 11 minutes uh, mini that's pretty highly edited. It's the most highly edited mini you'll ever see, I think, out of all of them. But it was pretty funny, and it happened in between recording movies. Um, <laughs> So you got that to enjoy. And then, yeah, we've got just loads of other stuff that we'll be doing as well. So, um, is Jay Longbone in it? She is. Well, as I think she won heads in it. I don't, I think that's the one that, was YMS in it for that? Well, it doesn't matter. You'll find out. Uh, so yeah, uh, Fringy Rags, is there anything you guys wanted to mention? No, I don't think so. Um, man, new video is real close to being done, but I just, I'm still, there's just a few things I want to, finish up with it so can't give you a date but it's it's real close to being done is it worth mentioning for them to not set their expectations to a video like endgame it's it's pitiful polemics right pitiful polemics a little smaller video so it's probably close to like 10 minutes it's uh topic focused the big critique i'm working on it but it's not you're not getting it soon um <laughs> it's it's uh same goes for yeah. my next one as well uh, as for this one, it's more so just that um, I'm happy that every time I think that there might be an opportunity to like spend more time on it to get a better joke or, I don't know, just make it better, that I'm seizing each of those opportunities. It just means that it keeps getting delayed. And for this one, right for the end, I've decided to do something that might take way longer than I think it will take. So, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I, I like the idea, so... Yeah, it's soon, but I can't I can't say when. Sorry. <laughs> um, is that is what we is that it then? Is it is it real? Just making sure everything's been said that was meant to be said. If if it's good, I think so. Um, I think so. Last I think one, one more super chat came in. Yeah. What about extraordinary gentlemen EFAP movies? If you mean the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, uh, that's been recorded. Right? We did record that. What did we watch it casually? I'm sure we did. I'm trying to I'm remember. Sure yeah, it was part of, our, a part of our little arc. Yeah, we talked I about it. I think Drinker was on it too. Yeah. Well, if it was yeah, if it was recorded, you'll get it one day, but that's not being worked on right now, so I can't promise when that'll ever happen. If I, Yeah, I'd rather not promise anything. Um, there'll be more clarity about the nature of a lot of different productions once a lot of things are set in motion. The, the first big milestone for me is going to be the end of December where I get my new setup, what I'm looking forward to. Now I'm still on my scuffed setup, as one might refer to it. Uh, and did you play any Legacy of Cain? No, I did not. Nope, I have not. Not me either. Nope. All right, and with that, I bid you all adieu. We play sleeps now, and you all can sleep too if you wanna. We'll be back soon enough. To cover the next episode of the Rings of the Lord of the Power of the Rings. How exciting. I can't wait to see what happens next. Woohoo. Okay, yeah. bye. Yeah, bye, bye. bye everybody. Bye. Bye.